Chapter 13 The Octosphere and the Arbiter The semester unrolled like a carpet. James spent a few nights each week teaching clutch magic to his new friends under the canted ceiling of the attic common room. Bump, the house poltergeist, was quite different than what James had expected. Unlike Peeves, whose gleeful mischief and imp-like appearance were Hogwarts legend, Bump was barely a wisp of human-shaped smoke and a vague scent of mould. His primary method of communication was a variety of sneezes, wheezes, annoyed moans, and the occasional hacking cough. "'Sounds like the ghost of someone who died of the sniffles,' Ralph had commented, a little put off by the roaming, cranky spectre. "'It's a good theory,' Wentworth agreed. "'We thought the same thing, so we had him tested. Some teensy old lady from the medical college came over and took an ecto-sample. According to her, Bumps a guys through and through.' "'She sure was teensy, wasn't she?' Jasmine concurred. "'Her glasses were bigger than her head. I think she had some dwarf somewhere in her family tree.' Gobbins poked his wand towards Bump, who moaned irritably and snaked off towards the bookshelf. "'She said that there wasn't much point in checking, really,' he added. "'She said that there hasn't been a real bona fide ghost of the Aleron for decades.' "'Really?' James asked, curious. "'Hogwarts is full of them. One of them used to be our history teacher. Why aren't there any here?' Wentworth shrugged where he sat by the door in an old, high-backed easy chair. Nobody knows. Maybe because of the time lock. Maybe ghosts just can't keep up with the way the campus roams all over the centuries every day. But there used to be ghosts, Gobbins countered, a long time ago. I've heard stories about them. Percival Pepperpock was one of them, even. And that old janitor, Freddy something or other. He was always trying to scare people, but he insisted on wearing this old stripy sweater and fedora hat, which is pretty hard to pull off, even if you aren't trying to be all spooky. So what happened to all the ghosts then? Ralph asked. Jasmine shook her head. Like Went said, nobody knows for sure. Maybe they just don't make ghosts like they used to, eh? Muckthatch grunted and barked, anxious to get on with the lesson. Things went well enough, and James's initial concerns began to wear off. The third time the group met, however, Norrick appeared in the attic common room, having heard about the clutch magic practices that were secretly taking place there. Grudgingly, James allowed him to stay, so long as he kept the lessons a secret. By the next week, however, two more members of the team had appeared on the long couch beneath the room's single window, grinning eagerly, their wands in hands. I didn't tell anyone! Norrick said defensively as James glared at him. It's all over the house now. You can't keep secrets very long around here. I even heard Heckle and Jekyll arguing about it downstairs. Heckle thinks we should be learning some tandem spells, by the way, just to mix it up a little. James sighed. The truth was that he didn't really mind. Team Bigfoot's clutch magic was coming along slowly, but surely, even if it was fairly standard stuff. James sensed that Professor Wood was still somewhat uncomfortable with it, but he had not yet said anything about it. Perhaps this was because the team had not yet won a match, even though the final scores were growing increasingly close. The last match, in fact, had ended in a tie. James had been disappointed to learn that, according to the rules of Clutch Cudgel, a tie game translated to a win for whatever team had had the best record coming into the match, thus giving Team Pixie a technical victory. It had been a moral win for the Bigfoots nonetheless, and there had been raucous celebration in the locker cellar following the match. As the team carried their good cheer with them back to Apollo Mansion, James recalled his dad's stories about Quidditch at Hogwarts, and felt, for the first time, a deep sense of pride that he was living up to his father's image. In fact, According to the old stories, Oliver Wood himself had been quite the formidable player, and had been madly passionate about winning. Perhaps Wood's reluctance to use offensive and defensive magic, whether or not it was rooted in his insecurities about his deceased parents and their disapproval of his participation in the Battle of Hogwarts, was held in check by his much older love of sporting victory. James hoped so. He still had more things he wanted to try. All right, you lot, 
he said, now speaking to slightly more than half of the entire Bigfoot clutch team crammed uncomfortably into the attic common room. That's everything I know. Time for us to get a little creative. Your homework over the weekend is to research something new, something that the other teams will never expect us to know, and come back Monday ready to teach it to the rest of us. Got it? There was a rumble of eager excitement throughout the cramped space. Bumped lurked by the bookcase with a large encyclopedia in his wispy hand, as if he couldn't choose who to throw it at. Across the campus, the leaves had all finally drifted from the trees, carpeting the lawns with orange and yellow. The trees scratched their bare branches at the sky as winter settled slowly over the campus, bringing gusty winds and an increasing chill. James broke out his heavy cloak and began wearing it to classes, buttoned dutifully beneath his chin, its stiff collar sticking up around his ears. Very dashing, Lucy had said on one grey day, smiling crookedly at her cousin as they made their way towards administration hall for lunch. You'd fit right in at Vampire House. Cloaks are all the rage this year. Along with plastic fangs and black hair dye, Albus grumped next to her, walking with his hands stuffed into his blazer pockets. Lucy clucked her tongue. You're just mad because you lost the Quidditch tournament to us. The tourney's not over yet, Albus countered stridently, and I'm rooting for Zane and his zombies to beat you all in the final. Lucy shrugged as if she didn't care. May the best team win, of course. Albus bristled, but didn't pursue it any further. James knew that his brother's experiences in Werewolf House were mixed, and this was contributing to his natural moodiness. Sometimes Albus spoke very highly and proudly of life in Ares' mansion. Other times he seemed sullen and dejected, slinking over to sit with James, Zane, and Ralph in the corner booth at the Chiton Quay, rather than joining the long table near the fireplace where the rest of the werewolves often gathered. Once or twice James tried to question Albus about his new mates, but Albus always replied defensively, claiming that nothing was wrong. He loved his house, and couldn't a bloke come and sit by his brother every now and then without being grilled about his personal life? Eventually, James gave up asking about it. Petra still appeared regularly in Professor Baruti's potion-making class, and James was glad to see that she generally seemed to be in good spirits. Apparently, Izzy was settling in well at the small campus grade school, which was mostly attended by children of other teachers and administrators. The two of them lived in a small apartment on the top floor of one of the houses on Faculty Row. James saw them occasionally at dinner in the cafeteria and sat with them whenever he did. Strangely, those were the times when he felt the most homesick for Hogwarts, even more so than when he talked to Rose, Scorpius, and the rest via the Shard. Sitting with Petra and Izzy, Ralph and Zane, laughing and talking, reminded him almost painfully of his days in the Great Hall and the Gryffindor common room. Sometimes, on these occasions, he felt the strangest feeling of loss and worry, as if he might never again return to those halls, might never again see all those familiar people and places. It was silly, of course, he'd be returning soon enough. Still, the feeling lingered, and sometimes, especially late at night, he'd find himself thinking of his last conversation with Professor Trelawney. He'd recall her distant, haunted eyes— and her frightening words. The fates have aligned, night will fall, and from it there will be no dawn. Occasionally, James saw his mum and dad and sister Lily. They came to some of his clutch cuddle matches, although not as many as they wanted to, according to his father. Harry Potter's work was becoming more and more hectic, he said, and James could see it in both of his parents' faces. There was a quiet tension there and an unspoken worry. No outside newspapers made their way onto the campus of Alma Aleron, but James sensed that things were not at all well in the outside world. Don't you worry about it, Harry told him when James asked about it. He smiled at his son, but James could tell that it was a thin smile, put on mostly for his benefit. You just keep at your schoolwork and your clutch cudgel. Keep an eye on your brother, too. Your mother and I are a little worried about him and those new friends of his in Werewolf House. James shrugged and nodded. His dad was masking his larger worries with concerns about how Al might be fitting in with his fellow werewolves. It was rather unsettling, but James determined not to make it his problem. He had done that enough over the last two years. 
I've heard of this Professor Magnuson bloke, James told Ralph and Zane the following weekend, walking along the cold flagstone footpath and kicking piles of dead leaves. Back during our first year, remember when I told you about sneaking out with the invisibility cloak and following my dad and Chancellor Franklin around during their midnight meeting? Franklin said something about Magnuson, made it sound like he was a real troublemaker, compared him to that umbrage witch that Dad told us about from back in his own day. That's pretty bad, Ralph considered, frowning slightly. I remember those stories. But Magnuson's the key to the whole thing, Zane insisted. He's the one that found the key to the Nexus Curtain. We can look him up in the archive, maybe figure out how he did it. If we did that, then maybe we could follow him through into the place between the worlds and find whoever it was that attacked the Vault of Destinies. Zane's eyes boggled with excitement, but James sighed. You're a complete nutter, he said dourly. We're done with that kind of thing, all right? Ralph and me, we got it all out of our system last year, chasing down that horrible gatekeeper thing. Rose, too. If she was here, she'd probably cuff you on the ear for even bringing it up. Ha! Zane replied, unperturbed. I've spoken to Rose about it already through the shard. She thinks it's worth checking out, at least. So there. Ralph spoke up uncertainly. She says we should just tell James's dad about it and let him look into it. It's his job, after all. Mr. Potter's got his hands plenty full already, Zane answered breezily. I've heard he's getting loads of flack from the local authorities, especially the Magical Integration Bureau. They're making things pretty tough for him, keeping him out of the loop. What? James exclaimed angrily. Where do you hear that? I eavesdropped on your dad and Chancellor Franklin in the Kite and Key after Al's last Quidditch match. Some of us don't need any invisibility cloaks to pull that off. James was rankled. But why would the local authorities shut him out? He was sent here to help them, wasn't he? Apparently they're suspicious of him, Zane replied. Remember, here in the States, the progressive element is all over the place. Not everyone believes all that drivel about how Voldy was just a revolutionary thinker and a champion of the people put down by the magical ruling powers of the day, but enough idiots do believe it that it makes trouble for people like your dad. They think he himself might even be behind some of that WULF stuff. Apparently they questioned him about the disappearance of that muggle politician and the Chrysler building. They even think he might have been in on the attack on the Vault of Destinies. Apparently, since the missing thread managed to vanish without a trace, and they've had no luck tracking it down, even though it'd leave a magical trail a mile wide. They think that your dad hasn't found the thread yet because maybe he doesn't really intend to. Like maybe he's covering for his own cronies or something. That's idiotic, James fumed. He's here to rout out the gang that did that stuff and stick them all in Azkaban. Ralph was thoughtful. Well, he said slowly. I'm not saying they're right, of course, but if he was involved with a group like the WULF, it would probably be the perfect cover for him to be on the team that was supposedly meant to investigate him. If you think about it from the progressive element point of view, that is. Zane was impressed. All that time you spent on Corsica's debate team really sunk in, didn't it, Ralphinator? You can think just like him when you need to. That's idiotic, James said again, kicking at a particularly large pile of leaves. The progressive element is idiotic, Zane replied. Once you believe in that kind of stuff, other stupid stuff becomes a lot easier to swallow. But why would they think my dad would ever join such a bunch of awful people? Ah, Zane said, smiling ruefully, that's an easy one. A lot of Americans think that the WULF is just a puppet organization run by the Ministry of Magic and specifically the Aura Department itself. They think that it's just a big scare tactic, meant to keep people afraid and willing to keep living with the old laws of muggle magical separation and all that. Ralph shook his head. They must think people like James's dad are a bunch of really twisted sneaks then. Zane nodded. The three boys stopped as they neared the octosphere. The big black orb floated in its watery bed, which was now pasted with dead leaves. A dull, nearly inaudible rumble came from the slowly revolving stone. According to legend, Professor Magnuson invented this thing, Zane commented, resting his foot on the low stone wall that surrounded the pool. Did you know that? How do you invent a big black ball? Ralph asked quizzically. It's not just a big black ball, you knucklehead, 
Zane replied. It's an answer machine. You ask it any question you want, and it'll tell you the answer. That's some pretty serious magic, James admitted grudgingly. Are the answers always right? Always, Zane nodded. But they're never helpful. That's probably why it's right out here in the open for anyone to use. If the answers were useful, this thing would probably be the most valuable tool in the whole magical world. You can bet that that's what old Professor Magnuson meant for it to be, if the legends about him are true. Why aren't the answers useful? Ralph asked, peering closely at the slowly revolving stone sphere. Zane shrugged. It's all quantum. Magnuson was president of Igor House a century or so ago, and he was apparently a super genius about technomancy. He was a big believer in this thing called the Wizard's Grand Unification something or other. Yeah, James said, warming to the subject. Franklin talked about that when he took us on the tour of the archive. It's called the Wizard's Grand Unification Theory. He says that people used to believe that if you could measure everything everywhere, then you'd be able to predict the future. And if you could predict the future, then basically you could control it, Zane finished. Yeah, that's how I heard it too. Apparently, Magnuson was crazy about it. He spent his whole life refining the theory, trying to make it work. The legend is that he used some really horrible methods, although nobody seems to know what they were exactly. At any rate, this is one of the things he invented along the way. It uses the grand unification Watsit to tell you the answer to your question. There was some big flaw in the design, though, so that while the answer you get is technically right, it's almost always completely useless. Watch! Zane turned to the slowly revolving stone orb. In a loud, carefully enunciated voice, he said, Oh, great mystical octosphere, will Zombie House win this year's Quidditch tournament? James and Ralph leaned forwards over the low wall that surrounded the pool, watching the sphere. After a few seconds, the sphere settled to a stop, and something seemed to move within it. Blurry white shapes swam up from the inky depths of the orb, solidifying until they reached the surface and became words. The three boys stared at them thoughtfully. They read, As the moons of Kthal align with the great horn of Ipsus. After a moment, Ralph asked, So is that a yes or a no? Nobody knows, Zane said brightly. That's the point. My guess is that Kthal is a planet on some unknown galaxy and Ipsus is probably a constellation or something. Or maybe it's even a real beast with a real-life horn. Either way, it's impossible for us to know whether or not some crazy planet's moons line up with it. So even though the answer is correct, it's still completely useless to us. Ralph asked, So how do you know it's correct, then? James thought it was a very reasonable question. Zane nodded. Watch this. He turned again to the octosphere. Hey, you! Who won last week's clutch match between Zombie House and the Igors? James and Ralph watched as the letters faded from the octosphere's surface, and it began to turn again, rumbling faintly. You don't really have to say the oh great mystical octosphere part, Zane admitted as they waited. I just thought it would sound more, you know, impressive that way. In the center of the pool, the black orb stopped turning again. Two words faded up from its depths. Zombie house. See? Zane said, gesturing towards the floating orb. If it's an answer you already know, then it just gives it to you straight up. And it's always right. I see what you mean, Ralph frowned. That's not very helpful at all. Zane nodded. I hear it drove Professor Magnuson crazy trying to figure out what the problem was with it. They say that's what drove him to seek out and open the Nexus curtain, although no one knows why. Maybe if we can retrace his steps, we can find the answer to that mystery, too. No way, James said resolutely, sighing. Mum was right. We've got enough on our hands, what with school, clutch, and everything else. Whoever this Magnuson was, if there's anything there to find out, I bet my dad's already working on it. He'll find this Nexus curtain and chase down whoever attacked the Vault of Destinies. You watch. Zane seemed reluctant to let the issue go but he didn't say anything more about it that afternoon, or even the rest of the weekend. On Monday morning, Professor Bunyan took the class up to the museum at the top of the Tower of Art, where he showed them portraits of many of the historical figures they'd been studying. 
Crouching under the museum's archways, the giant professor indicated paintings of famed American battles, showing how the secret magical contingent of the United States Army, led by an American wizard named Quentin Harrow, had assisted in the fight. As James passed a portrait of General George Washington, he commented to Ralph that it was a shame the portrait couldn't talk. Who says I can't talk? the portrait asked, affronted. James, Zane, and Ralph spun around, surprised. Zane answered first. But you were a muggle, right? What, pray tell, is a muggle, young man? Washington asked sternly. Uh, James said, stammering. Someone who's not magical. How can you not... He gestured towards the portrait's gilt frame. You're a talking painting. And what of it? Washington responded, raising his chin. Ralph shook his head. I'm confused. Just then, Professor Bunyan placed one of his huge hands around the boy's shoulders, leading them away from the portrait. We try not to talk to the portraits of the Mughal historical figures, he said quietly. Someone thought it would be a good idea to magically preserve them for posterity, but being only vaguely aware of the magical world, many of them find the experience a bit hinky. James nodded, glancing back at the portrait of Washington. The president watched him stoically. James knew the figure was only paint on canvas, but he felt a little sorry for him nonetheless. He determined to come back later and keep the painting company, despite Professor Bunyan's words. That evening, James, Zane, and Ralph entered the cafeteria to find that it had been decorated for Halloween. Floating over the long tables were dozens of jack-o'-lanterns, grinning, leering, and occasionally swooping down to chomp a slice of pizza from an unsuspecting diner's hand. The skeleton from Mother Newt's whiz home ec classroom had been commandeered, hexed a rather ghastly green, and installed near the main entrance, where it distributed trays to the students as they lined up for dinner. Professor Cloverhoof, the fawn president of Zombie House, stood in the back of the room directing a pair of girls who were busily hanging orange bunting from the low ceiling. Hi, Professor, Zane called as the three boys sat down beneath the floating pumpkins. How's everything coming along for the costume ball? Swimmingly, Cloverhoof answered distractedly. A bit higher, Miss Worrell. There's nothing quite so depressing as crooked bunting. There we go. The Jersey Devil is taking his duties very seriously this year, Jane said in a stage whisper, turning back to James and Ralph. He's chair of the committee for this year's Halloween ball. Last year Mother Newt did it, and we all about drowned in doilies and lace. Ralph glanced up at a floating jack-o'-lantern that seemed to be eyeing his plate. They have the costume ball in the cafeteria. Zane shook his head. No, no, this is just where they have all the drinks and refreshments. It's always quite a spread. The actual dance takes place upstairs in the main ballroom. It's huge, with chandeliers the size of Wocket, and a big stage at one end. Don't tell anyone else, he added, leaning forward secretively. But we got Rig Mortis and the Stiftones to play the show. Should be a killer. I've never heard of them, James said, rolling a slice of pizza and biting off the end. Yeah, Ralph added. Only anything like the Boggart brothers. I like them a lot. No, Zane answered curtly, clearly annoyed. The Stiftones are only like the most popular band on the American Wizarding Wireless. You do make me want to cry, I swear. I've heard of them, a girl's voice said. James glanced aside and saw Izzy plopping down next to Zane, clunking her tray onto the table in front of her. I like them. Hex on My Heart is my favorite song right now. Finally, somebody with some class, Zane sighed. How are you doing, Iz? James asked the younger girl. We good, Izzy answered, nodding towards Petra, who was approaching with her own tray. My teacher says I'm already reading at fourth grade level, whatever that means. It's very good, apparently, considering I've never gone to school before. Zane nearly choked on a piece of crust. You never went to school? Are you serious? Why not? My mother, Izzy answered stoically. She didn't think I was smart enough for it. She said it would be a waste of time for me and everyone else. Petra settled in next to James. Tell them what Mr. Quandary told you today is, she prodded. Izzy smiled crookedly. I get to play the Snow Princess in this year's Christmas show. Cool, Zane grinned enthusiastically. You got your wings and halo all picked out yet? We have plenty of time for that, Petra said, 
beaming down at her sister. She's just getting used to her wand for now. Her wand? James blinked. But Izzy's not... Uh, how are things in Bigfoot House? Petra asked, glancing aside at James and smiling. James is teaching magic to the Bigfoot Clutch team, Ralph interjected proudly. Looks like the Bigfoots might win a match for the first time in, I don't know, ever, maybe? James meant to downplay this detail, but then he noticed the way Petra looked at him, obviously impressed. That's excellent, James, she said, nudging him. I've noticed how Team Bigfoot's been playing lately, much more confident than when the season first started. Are you really responsible for that? James shrugged and looked away, his face reddening. Well, you know, I... yeah, it's nothing, really. Nothing, he says. Zane grinned. James took that team from zero to hero in no time flat. We haven't even won a match yet, James said, trying to suppress a smile of pride. But we did have one tie game. You watch, Zane insisted, ignoring James's protests. My boy's going places, maybe even pro. There was a guy last year, a werewolf named Stubb, who got drafted by the Hoboken Hobgoblins. I bet James is even better than he was. Stop. James exclaimed, his cheeks burning. Look, it's nothing, all right? I just taught them a few basic spells, that's all. For some reason, Wood wasn't coaching anything by way of a magic game. We're just catching up to everyone else now. He's so humble, isn't he? Zane said mistily, nodding towards Petra. Why, it breaks my heart, it really does. James rolled his eyes. Fifteen minutes later, the five of them made their way towards the cafeteria doors, talking excitedly about the upcoming Halloween ball, and James was gearing himself up for something. He felt wound so tight that he thought everyone else must see it, as if he was physically vibrating. There was a knot of people near the door, milling around some unseen curiosity, and James touched Petra's elbow as they stopped to watch. Petra, he said, trying not to blush. I was wondering. She turned back to him and brushed her hair out of her face with her hand. Yes? Uh, he began, furious at himself for how awkward it sounded. He took a deep breath. You know the costume ball that's coming up? She smiled at him wryly. The one we were talking about just now? Sure. What about it? James ran a hand through his hair. Yeah, well, I know you're not really a student, like, We've known each other for some time now, and I thought maybe we could... The crowd near the doorway parted at that moment, and somebody backed into Petra, bumping her. Make room, everyone, a voice announced. It was Professor Cloverhoof, his hands raised in the air. James took another step towards Petra, trying to catch her attention again. Anyway, I was just thinking, maybe you and me could... Stand aside, Mr. Potter! Cloverhoof said, touching James on the shoulder. James glanced up, annoyed, and then sidled up next to Petra once more. Go on, James, Petra said, smiling slightly, her eyes twinkling. I'm listening. James smiled back at her, feeling harried but encouraged. He opened his mouth to speak, but another voice cut him off, piercing the air like fingernails on a blackboard. You! The voice cried, so high and shocked that it silenced the entire room at once. James startled and spun towards the owner of the screeching voice. A thin old man with very white skin and balding black hair stood in the centre of the cafeteria doorway, supported between two witches in pale green robes. James recognised him vaguely, but couldn't remember where he might have seen him before. <laughs> The man screeched again, drawing the word out like a howl, his voice ebbing away as his breath ran out. James felt a thrill of panic as the man raised a trembling hand, the index finger extended. He was pointing at Petra. Mr. Henry, one of the green-robed witches said, firming her grip on the man's arm. Try not to get too excited. You're still very weak. You've only been thawed out enough to walk for a few hours. It? Ha! Henrydon shrieked, tottering on his legs. She was the one! James took Petra's hand, tried to pull her away, but she was rooted in place, her eyes frowning, narrowing. I dreamed of you, she said, her voice barely a whisper. 
Every eye in the crowded room had turned to stare at her. You're confused, Mr. Henreden, the second green-robed witch soothed, obviously shaken. You've been through a terrible ordeal. Perhaps we should get you back to the medical center? She froze me! Henreden shouted, his voice cracking, his eyes bulging in his pale face. It was her in the Vault of Destinies! Her and some other horrible woman, but she's the one that did it! Her! He crumpled then, and the green-robed nurses struggled to hold him up. Others rushed forwards to assist as pandemonium broke out. Voices babbled as students backed away from Petra and James, forming a widening circle of staring, frightened faces. She froze me! And Reedon continued, weeping, his voice growing lost in the increasing rabble. She came out of the vault, smiling like a demon, and she froze me! Within an hour, Harry Potter had arrived on campus, and a gathering had assembled in the faculty lounge on the main floor of Administration Hall. In attendance were Harry, Chancellor Franklin, Professor Cloverhoof, Petra, James, and a man James had never seen before, who had arrived on campus only minutes before Harry Potter. The stranger wore all black robes, gloves, and a black hat with a very wide, flat brim. He had a pleasant face, although James thought there was something vaguely unsettling about it. As the man sat down on the bench near the dark window, James noticed that he seemed to be almost completely hairless. His face was as pink and smooth as a baby's, with his hat pressed down onto his bare scalp so firmly that it rested on his ears. He smiled at James as he smoothed out his robes, and James glanced away. It goes without saying, Chancellor Franklin began, still standing and stoking the fire with a long poker, that this is a very serious and rather shocking accusation. James glanced at his father, but Harry Potter's face was as inscrutable as the poker in Franklin's hand. The man in the wide-brimmed hat, James noticed, was looking at Harry as well, smiling a small, pleasant smile. Franklin slotted the poker into its stand and turned around. Mr. Henreden is one of our oldest and most reliable trustees. His service to the school has been entirely spotless. Thus, his allegation cannot be downplayed. If the confrontation that just took place had not occurred in front of much of the entire school, this would be somewhat simpler to address. As it is, direct and decisive action must be taken. But it couldn't have been me that froze the poor man, Petra said. I wasn't anywhere near the archive when the attack took place. I was asleep in my rooms. You were on campus, the man in the flat-brimmed hat clarified evenly, which places you in the vicinity of the crime, regardless of your specific location. And being asleep is not what one would tend to call an airtight alibi. Excuse me, Harry interjected, turning to the stranger. I didn't get your name, sir. I haven't given it, the man replied, still smiling pleasantly. I assumed that that was the Chancellor's honor. I'd hate to overstep my bounds. Pardon me, Franklin said with a note of impatience in his voice. Mr. Potter, this is the Honorable Albert Keynes, General Arbiter for the Wizarding Court of the United States. Mr. Keynes, Harry Potter is a representative of the European Ministry of Magic, visiting us in his pursuit of his duties as that entity's head auror. A pleasure. Keynes nodded smugly, obscuring his face for a moment behind the black brim of his hat. "'I'm impressed that you were able to be here on such short notice,' Harry replied, unsmiling. "'General Arbiter sounds like a rather demanding and important post.' The man laughed lightly. "'The title sounds more grand than it is, I'm afraid. There are, in fact, many of us stationed all around the country, performing our given duties to the best of our ability. My station covers only Pennsylvania, but I admit that the metropolitan Pittsburgh and Philadelphia areas do take up most of my time. I was in the vicinity when I received the message from Chancellor Franklin. Harry asked, You represent the American Wizarding Court, then? Before the man could answer, however, Chancellor Franklin spoke up. 
We have a rather more hands-on approach to legal matters in the American magical world, Mr. Potter. A holdover from a time when magical individuals were scattered, finally, all across the country, making it necessary for the law to go to them rather than the other way around. Mr. Keene's, in effect, is the American Wizarding Court. Judge, jury, and executioner, Professor Cloverhoof quipped darkly, buffing his nails on his lapel. Keynes nodded. Crude but accurate enough, Professor, he said, and then turned to Harry. I am an arbiter, Mr. Potter. My job is to make impartial judgments based on examination of the evidence and interviews of everyone involved in any given case. This is why I have requested that your son join us. I understand that he has observed much of what has taken place in connection with the attack on the Hall of Archives. You need not fear for his involvement. I am trained to be utterly fair and objective. I'm glad to hear it, Harry replied. Can we expect a quick end to this matter, then? Keynes clucked his tongue. The role of the Arbiter is simple, Mr. Potter, but we are trained to be exceedingly thorough. This is a particularly difficult case, as it is a matter of Miss Morganston's word against that of Mr. Henrydon's. Judgments in such cases have been known to take months or even years to reach. But this is just stupid, James interjected, his face reddening. Petra was with Izzy when the archive was attacked. That proves it wasn't really her that froze Mr. Henrydon. Proof is a ticklish concept, my boy, Keynes said, shaking his head sorrowfully. The young lady in question is the defendant's sister, rendering her testimony suspect at the very least. Further complicating matters, I am given to understand that this is not your first encounter with the law, is it, Miss Morganston? Petra's expression cooled slightly as she looked at the man in the black hat. I don't know what you're talking about. It might have slipped your memory, Keynes admitted with a nod. It was the muggle police, after all. I understand that such mundane authorities might not command the respect of someone like yourself. As I mentioned, however, we arbiters are very thorough. On the way here, I perused the police report regarding what took place on the occasion of your last day at your grandfather's farm. Granted, I had to read between the lines a bit, but there is no question that the events of that morning resulted in at least one death, and quite possibly two, although the second, I admit, is pure conjecture on my part. Do you remember now, Miss Morganston? Petra stared at the man, her lips pressed into a thin line. After a moment, she nodded once, curtly. This is the first I've heard of these things, Franklin said, peering at Petra and then Harry. Might I inquire as to why a known criminal was allowed to be offered a position at this school? Harry didn't remove his gaze from the man in the black hat. Petra is not a known criminal, he answered evenly. The Aura Department conducted an investigation into the events at Morganston Farm, and there was no indication of foul play. Warren Morganston took his own life, as even the Muggle police report must show. His wife, Phyllis Morganston, formerly Blanche Fleur, has indeed gone missing, but since she was wanted for questioning regarding the deaths of both her first and second husbands, this is no great surprise. Keene smoothed his robes again as he said, Your own investigation notwithstanding, Mr. Potter, these factors must be considered when rendering judgment on this most delicate issue. I will be calling upon many resources and interviewing any number of individuals, both as witnesses and as character references. I may even need to call upon Mr. Morganston's widow, if, as you say, she is still among us. It may be months before I reach my verdict. James didn't like Keynes one bit, and felt quite confident that regardless of how long the verdict took to reach, the man would find Petra guilty in the end. What will happen to Petra if you decide she's done what Mr. Henrydon says? Keynes leaned back and laced his fingers over his chest. The law is very clear in such cases, unfortunately, he said with undisguised relish. Attempted murder can mean anywhere from twenty years to life in prison. Add to that the use of dark magic, the attack on the Vault of Destinies, and the thievery of a priceless relic in the form of the missing crimson thread. And yes, I do know of these things as a member of the American Wizarding Court. Not much escapes my notice. Then it seems inevitable that Miss Morganston will spend the rest of her days in Fort Bedlam Maximum Security Wizarding Prison. Her sister, Isabella, will become a ward of the state. 
As a muggle, it will be up to the Magical Integration Bureau to find her a new home in the non-magical community. She is underage, fortunately, which means that the authorities at the Crystal Mountain will likely move to have her memory obliviated. This would probably be the best for all involved. What kind of awful person are you? James exclaimed angrily. You act like there's nothing you'd rather see. James, Harry Potter said sternly, placing a hand firmly onto his son's shoulder. Keane smiled again at James and tilted his head sadly. It is true, young man. There is nothing I prefer to see more than for justice to be done. It is a mistaken kindness to coddle the guilty. Some day I hope you will come to see the truth of that, although I have my doubts. He glanced at Harry and sighed. James saw that Keynes's upper lip was sweating lightly. Petra spoke then, her voice strangely calm. What will become of me and Izzy during your investigation? Keynes brightened a bit. It is customary for the defendant to be handed over to the arbiter in charge of his or her case until such time as a judgment can be carried out. Therefore, from now until I reach my verdict, you shall be in my custody. Your sister, however, will be sent to the Wizarding Orphanage in Pittsburgh. My sister, Petra said coolly, will be staying with me. I am afraid you are in no position to make such requests, Keen said, his smile widening. It is a muggle American tradition to deem the defendant innocent until proven guilty. It is a quaint notion that has no place in the Wizarding Court. Until such time as I may find you innocent, you are a suspect in a capital crime. Thus, you are considered a potential danger and a flight risk. You will be happy to comply with the rule of the law. Franklin cleared his throat. Let's not be too hasty, he began, but Petra cut him off, her eyes still locked on Keynes. Wherever I go, Izzy goes, she said. It's not a request. Her voice sounded so calm that it was almost surreal, and yet James sensed a sudden chill in the room, making him shiver. Waves of cold seemed to be coming from Petra herself, where she sat next to him. Such obstinacy will not do you well as I pursue your case, Miss Morganston, Keene said, his smile growing equally icy. You may wish to alter your tone, lest I decide you are even more of a risk than I had heretofore envisioned. I doubt that would be a mistake. Petra said. James was almost certain that he saw her breath come out in puffs of fog as she spoke. The tension in the air seemed to spike, and James felt a sudden, inexplicable fear that something terrible was about to happen. Images flickered behind his eyes, a black castle, huge and dead, perched on the edge of a cliff. Watching eyes hidden in shadow, a white hand holding a singularly ugly dagger, with blood dripping from the blade. These were visions from Petra's dreams. They came to him now, flashing like lightning, cold as icicles. Somehow she was broadcasting them to him, apparently unintentionally, on that invisible silver cord that still connected him to her. It was as if she was cycling up, like some kind of magical generator. He felt it, and it was awful, terrifying. What was she? How could she be so mysteriously powerful? James looked across the room towards Albert Keynes, and suddenly he wanted to yell at the man to shut up, to stop antagonizing Petra, not only because James loved her, but because he was afraid of her. But then, surprisingly, James's father spoke. I completely understand your predicament, Mr. Keynes, he said, and his tone of voice seemed to sap the tension from the room. After all, I am a man of the law myself. I am responsible for Miss Morganston's presence here. How would it be if I took responsibility for her and her sister Isabella during the course of your investigation? James turned to look at his dad, wide-eyed, as did Petra. It's a kind offer, Mr. Potter, Keene said stiffly, sitting up straight in his seat, but one I am duty-bound to refuse. The law, as I have mentioned, is quite clear. And as I have said, Mr. Keynes, Harry said a bit more loudly, I am also a man of the law and I'd like to remind you that international magical law provides allowance for foreign detainees to be given over to the custody of a representative of their own nation during the course of any necessary legal proceedings. Keynes looked hard at Harry, his eyes narrowed. The sweat on his upper lip glistened. James noticed that his father's expression, however, was perfectly neutral, as calm as a river stone. 
Are you quite certain, Mr. Potter? Keen said softly, that this is the course of action you truly wish to take. I see no other option, Harry replied. For a man of the law? Keen smiled again, slowly. So be it, then. As a representative of the American Wizarding Court, I release Petra and Isabella Morganston to your custody. Do know, however, that this means that both the Wizarding Legal Authority and the Magical Integration Bureau will be watching you very closely. There will be sentinels posted near your home around the clock. Then they can join the ones that are already there, Harry replied with a sigh. My wife has been known to invite them in for tea, although they have not yet taken her up on the offer. Mr. Potter, Petra whispered, leaning close to him. You don't have to. Is there any other business to attend to, then? Harry interrupted, looking briskly from face to face. No? Then I suggest that I escort Miss Morganston and her sister to their flat, where they can gather whatever things they need. The meeting broke up, and there was a scuffling of feet and a creak as the door was swung open. Professor Cloverhoof stood near the entry, allowing the others to leave before him. His face was inscrutable as he looked down at James and winked. James followed his father out into the main hallway that ran straight through the centre of Administration Hall. Petra rejoined her sister, who was waiting near the lobby stairs with Zane and Ralph. When James and his father reached the main entry, Albert Keynes sidled close to Harry, his demeanour friendly, if a bit condescending. "'I am aware, Mr. Potter,' he said in a low voice, "'that you provided sanctuary to Miss Morganston and her sister once before. It was, in fact, immediately after the unfortunate events of their last day on the Morganston farm. Could it be that you know a bit more about those events than you are letting on?' "'I assure you, Mr. Keynes,' Harry replied. You know as much as I do about these things, and perhaps more. Your information seems to know no bounds whatsoever. Keynes laughed, as if Harry and he were old friends. Alas, if only that were the case. I only ask, though, because I will find out. If there are any secrets you might wish to divulge now, it could save us both some trouble later on. I fear that things could get a bit less... civil. Harry paused for a long moment and James looked up at him, watching. For a moment, James thought that his father would tell Keynes what he knew, that Petra had, in fact, been seen coming from the Hall of Archives on the night it was attacked, and maybe even that Merlinus Ambrosius harbored worries about Petra's mental state, and even her overall goodness. Finally, however, Harry merely shook his head. "'Feel free to interview me and my family, Mr. Keynes,' Harry said, glancing down at James. "'We are in the habit of telling the truth. Sometimes, however, you have to ask the right questions. Keynes nodded, as if this was exactly the sort of answer he had expected. Very good. I will begin my investigation this very night, and if it becomes necessary, I will indeed take you up on your offer. For now, I bid you good night, and, uh, good luck. I suspect you will need it. With that, Keynes pushed open one of the heavy front doors and vanished into the darkness beyond, humming happily to himself. "'Odious man!' Franklin said with a sigh. "'But such individuals are, arguably, the grease that oils the axle of civilization.' Professor Cloverhoof nodded. "'And in much the same way, one feels the need to scrub one's hands after coming into contact with them.' Murmuring agreement, the group made their way out into the chilly darkness. Walking between James and his father, Petra asked, "'Are you sure you really want to do this, Mr. Potter? It'll only make things harder for you and your family. I can handle myself if I need to.' "'It's nothing,' Harry replied briskly, but then glanced down at her as they moved across the windy campus. In a lower voice he said, "'But pardon me for asking this, Petra, and know that I will only do so once. Did you do what Mr. Henrydon alleges?' Were you involved, for some reason, in the attack on the vault? Because Mr. Keynes, disagreeable as he is, is quite correct. The truth will be known. It is better to speak now than to be found out later. Are you guilty? Petra looked at Harry and then at James. I'm not. I swear it. I know a lot of weird stuff has happened around me, but I'm as baffled by it as everyone else. I want to know the truth just as much as Mr. Keynes does. Please believe me. James spoke up. I believe you, Petra, he said, meeting her eyes. She smiled aside at him a little sadly. Harry Potter, however, 
didn't say anything at all. Chapter 14 The Magnuson Riddles I thought you told me, Zane said the next day, that if there was any connection between this old Professor Magnuson story and the attack on the vault, your dad and Merlin and everyone else were already all over it. James shook his head. Come on, he urged. It's already ten till two. Franklin's office hours are nearly over. Yeah, Ralph said, warming to the subject. Whatever happened to all that stuff about us just being a bunch of school students with too much to do to get all wrapped up in any big adventures? James grabbed Ralph's sleeve and pulled the bigger boy around the corner into the high corridor lined with partially opened doors. That was then. This is now, all right? Dad's got his hands full with his own problems, especially now that he's got Petra and Izzy staying with them while that Keynes idiot does his investigating. We're not taking over for him. We're just helping. If there is anything to this whole thing about Professor Magnuson and the Nexus Curtain, we'll send it his way. I see how it is, Zane said with a smile. Now that Petra Morganston's fate is in the balance, you're willing to break the old Prime Directive, eh? I don't even know what that means, James sighed impatiently. Hurry! Franklin's office door is still open. All three boys piled to a stop just outside of the tall wooden door and peered inside. The office was surprisingly small, dominated by a very large oak desk, a set of visitor's chairs, and a bookcase crammed with enormous books and the occasional clockwork gizmo. Franklin sat at the desk facing the door, a large volume in his hands. He glanced up as the three students clambered to a halt. "'Boys,' he said welcomingly, "'what can I do for you?' "'Hi, Chancellor,' James said, entering the small room and looking around. "'Uh, this is your office?' One of them, at least, Franklin smiled. This is the one that serves me for meeting with students and faculty. Why do you ask? James shrugged as he moved to stand behind one of the visitor's chairs. No reason. I just expected something a bit bigger. We thought we'd get to see your daylight savings device again, Ralph added. Ah, yes, that, Franklin answered, closing his book with a thump. I keep that in my personal study. It is far too large and complex to leave in the faculty offices. After all, we are still victim to the occasional school prank, although such things are somewhat rarer nowadays thanks to Madame Lauser. You mean Crone Lauser? Zane asked, his eyes widening. So she's really for real? Some of the zombies were saying that she was just made up to scare us all out of exploring the basements. How may I help you, boys? Franklin asked, smiling a little crookedly, obviously avoiding Zane's question. Uh, James began, clutching the back of the chair in front of him. We just have a quick question. It's about the history of the school. We thought you'd be the best person to ask. Franklin nodded approvingly. Always a pleasure to see students taking an interest in the university. I do suppose I am uniquely qualified to discuss its history, since I have been alive throughout much of it. What is your question? James glanced back at Ralph and Zane, suddenly reluctant. It's, uh, about one of the professors. From a long time ago, Ralph added. Franklin's chair creaked as he leaned back in it. We've had a rather impressive list of teachers throughout the years, continuing even to the present. Mr. Bunyan, the giant, is one of our most recent additions. And believe me, it was no small task to convince him to take the post. Prefers the wide open spaces he does, along with his great blue ox, babe. It's about Professor Magnuson, Zane blurted, stepping forwards. Franklin's expression froze on his face. He paused, staring at all three boys. Do you remember him? James prodded tentatively. We looked him up in the library, but there was almost nothing. His full name was Ignatius Karloff Magnuson and he was head of Igor House like a hundred and fifty years ago or something. Franklin continued to study the boys, his eyes suddenly cautious. He leaned forward slowly again, producing another long creak from his chair. Ralph said, There are legends about this Magnuson bloke. They say that he opened up something called the Nexus. Boys! Franklin interrupted. I'm afraid that Professor Magnuson is a name from a period of time that this school would prefer to forget. It would behoove you to not inquire about him any further. Well, Zane replied slowly, glancing aside at his friends, 
as much as I'd like to agree to that, I suspect that we're just about ten times more curious now. Franklin sighed hugely. <sighs> I suppose you learned of this in Professor Jackson's technomancy class, yes? He nodded to himself, not awaiting the answer. The professor and I have had words on the subject. We have rather differing views regarding the merits of security versus disclosure. Perhaps I simply wish to make my job as Chancellor a bit easier. Surely the good professor would agree. James risked pressing the matter a bit further. What can you tell us, Chancellor? Is it true that Magnuson opened the Nexus Curtain and made his way into the world between the worlds? Franklin stood up and straightened his waistcoat. He turned towards the window and leaned to peer out over the campus. He used to live in the most prominent faculty home of Alma Alaron, the one that originally belonged to John Roberts, one of the school's founders. He was a brilliant man, Magnuson, and yes, I knew him. He was, in fact, that most rare of men. He was a scientist, and he was a lover of stories. His calculating mind was equal to the best technomancers who've ever lived, but his love of the tale allowed him to think in creative, ingenious ways that none of his colleagues could ever dream. The characteristics that made him great, however, also led him to obsessions. It was these, unfortunately, that drove him to commit acts that were both heinous and ultimately senseless. Franklin paused, apparently determining how much he should say. Finally, he went on, still peering out the window. It was a time of great interest in magical exploration and experimentation. Schools such as Alma Alaron allowed a virtually unlimited amount of autonomy and resources to their teachers, all in the name of progress. Too late did we learn that sometimes progress means decay. Professor Ignatius Magnuson was allowed to conduct his experiments and pursue his goals, even though the costs were far higher than we knew at the time, and the dangers were, well, incalculable. By the time he was found out, it was too late to stop him. In the end, he fell victim to his own designs, and that, unfortunately, is the end of his story. What did he do, sir? James persisted. Franklin was thoughtful. After a moment he glanced back at the boys, his eyes narrowed. Why, pray tell, are you three so interested in this? Er, uh, James began, but Zane overrode him. We're just curious, sir. It's in our natures. You know how we young people are. Franklin studied Zane for a long moment. Indeed I do. Curiosity is a good thing, my young friends. It is the fuel for the engine of invention. But like any fuel, it can be dangerous. It can burn you if you are not careful with it. James asked, Is that what happened to Professor Magnuson? Franklin's face remained calm as he shifted his gaze to James. After a long moment, he said, Magnuson lived in the home that once belonged to one of this school's three founders, as I said. It is the home that now stands in ruins at the opposite end of the mall. He nodded towards the window. Professor Magnuson is the reason that that building was reduced to rubble. His laboratory was there, and it was the scene of terrible things. When these things became known, a riot erupted on the campus. Hundreds rushed to the mansion, intent on dragging Magnuson out and bringing him to justice. Of course, an arbiter had already been assigned to Magnuson. Justice had already been set into motion. But because of Magnuson's status, he was granted the privilege of maintaining his post and his home during the investigation. This infuriated the population of the school, including, I regret to say, much of the faculty. During the fracas that followed, Magnuson escaped from the mansion. In the aftermath, the mansion was burned nearly to the ground. To this day, no one knows if the fire was an accident or deliberate. Some say that Magnuson himself said it, meaning to distract everyone from his escape. Either way, it not only destroyed the mansion, it wiped out all the evidence of what Magnuson had done, and frankly, perhaps that was for the best. Zane was impressed. So what happened to him after that? 
Did he live out the rest of his days on some South American island somewhere? Ignatius Magnuson was never seen or heard from again, Franklin answered brusquely, seating himself once more at his desk. The most likely explanation is that he escaped via the rift that he created into some reality that none of us can even imagine. So he did succeed in opening the Nexus Curtain, Ralph exclaimed. Franklin pinned Ralph with a steely gaze. He succeeded in opening something, Mr. Deedle. Unfortunately, we had virtually no time to question him before his escape, and the fire ruined what clues we might have gained in his absence. Therefore, no one knows for sure what he did or where he might have gone. All we know is that his success came at great cost and ruined many lives. I suggest you leave it at that. James wanted to ask more, but Franklin's expression made it clear that he was done discussing the topic. The three boys thanked the Chancellor and excused themselves as quickly as possible. Well, Ralph said, once they had exited Administration Hall, that was pretty much a bust. James pulled his cloak around him as the wind picked up. At least we found out that Magnuson really did open up the Nexus Curtain, he replied. That means that there might be something to Zane's theory. Maybe whoever really did steal the Crimson Thread used it to open the curtain again, and is still hiding out there, in the world between the worlds. If we can figure out how Magnuson got through, then maybe we can do it as well. Zane feigned surprise as he said, I thought we were just going to turn all this over to the great Harry Potter and his squad of Aura superdudes. Shut up already, why don't you? James grumbled crossly. Dad's got enough on his hands. There's no harm in us following a few leads, is there? It'll save him some time. Besides, we're already right here on campus. We can do all the footwork more easily than he can. I just wish Franklin hadn't been so tight-lipped about everything. He gave us almost nothing to go on. Zane sighed expansively and stopped walking. A moment later, Ralph and James stopped as well and turned to look back at him. Maybe, the blonde boy said with a crooked smile. We can try it my way now? James was quite curious as to what Zane's way actually was, but as it turned out, the next few days were too busy for the boys to attempt anything at all. On Friday evening, James joined Zane, Albus, Lucy and Ralph at Pepperpock Down for the Vampires vs. Werewolves clutch cudgel match. Albus rooted ardently for his own team, while Lucy led spirited cheers and waved a red and black banner in her gloved hands. James, Ralph and Zane, however, liking neither team, cheered only when there were penalties or injuries, earning quite a few disapproving looks from those in the grandstands around them. In the end, Werewolf House defeated the vampires by a score of 88 to 65, leaving Lucy in a grumpy mood that lasted well into her second licorice soda at the Kite and Key. James spent most of Saturday afternoon in the attic of Hermes' house, accompanied by Zane, in search of a costume for that evening's Halloween ball. Together, they settled on a mummy costume, comprised mostly of shreds of old sheets, which had, for some forgotten reason, been tie-dyed into rainbow colours. We'll call you the Saturday Night Fever, Zane proclaimed happily, examining James in his costume. The disco mummy! You'll be a total hit! Frankly, I'm a little jealous. Having failed disastrously in his attempt to make Petra his date to the ball, James sought out and asked Lucy to go with him, figuring that they could have more fun together than apart. She agreed instantly, and with rather more enthusiasm than James had expected. When he arrived at Erebus Mansion that evening to escort her to the ball, she came down the main staircase dressed as a vampire princess, resplendent in a rather striking black dress, boots, and a vial of blood worn on a black ribbon around her neck. It's not real blood, she smiled sheepishly, showing her canine teeth, which had been hexed into long points for the evening. It's just poisonberry juice, so I can really drink it if I want to. I borrowed the boots from Professor Remora. Can you believe her feet are nearly as small as mine? James told her that he couldn't, that he frankly preferred to think of Professor Remora's feet as absolutely little as possible. Along the way to Administration Hall, they met Ralph, who was dressed as a ghost, with a rather sadly moth-eaten sheet over his head. Together, the three made their way down to the cafeteria for drinks, and then up to the main ballroom, where the band, Rig Mortis and the Stiff Tones, was already well into their first set. It turned out to be a delightfully raucous evening. The music was very loud, and after a few failed attempts, Lucy finally coaxed James into joining her on the dance floor. Zane was already there, gyrating and bouncing wildly, dressed, of course, as a zombie. 
He painted his face green, added some stitches with black magic marker, and donned a mouldy, ill-fitting, powder-blue tuxedo. Across from him, Cheshire Chatterley looked rather fetching as his zombie prom date, complete with a blood-stained pink taffeta dress, and every inch of exposed skin charmed a deathly, blotchy blue. Some party, eh? Zane called as he shimmied past. It is, James called back, grinning. In front of him, Lucy danced happily, looking surprisingly beautiful with her hair done up in a complicated beehive. He told her as much as the lights flashed and twirled all around. Even in the flickering dimness, he saw the blush rise to her pale cheeks, and she smiled at him, obviously pleased. It wasn't until the following Wednesday afternoon that Zane finally gathered James and Ralph and told them to get ready for a little fact-finding mission once classes were over for the day. By five o'clock, all three boys met at Apollo Mansion for a quick dinner. The meal was prepared by the house steward, a bald, hunched, painfully thin wizard, whose demeanour usually hovered somewhere between veiled crankiness and outright hostility. Known only as Yates, the steward had apparently been a fixture in Apollo Mansion for nearly seventy years, and didn't seem to have any intention of retiring, ever. He was so old that he appeared to be in need of a good dusting, but he moved with a sort of grim economy that implied that if ever the need arose, he could probably tackle any single member of Bigfoot House with one of his large knuckly hands while flipping crepes with the other. "'I hope this is to the young sir's liking,' he said through gritted teeth as he pushed their plates in front of them. "'Cheeseburgers and homemade potato chips, the cornerstone of any nutritious dinner.' "'Thanks, Yates,' Ralph said, digging in. "'What is it about that guy?' Zane asked quietly as Yates retreated slowly to the stove. "'Every time we ask him for something, I get the impression that he's barely restraining himself from hexing us into salt and pepper shakers.' James shrugged and munched a potato chip. They were still hot and sprinkled with some kind of crumbly blue cheese. Yates is all right, he said. Reminds me of home. He's like a grown-up human version of creature. He is, Ralph nodded, his mouth full. I knew he seemed familiar. You're right. He does remind me of good old number 12 Grimmauld Place. Twenty minutes later, the three boys made their way out into the darkening evening, Zane in the lead. James noticed that they were heading towards the Hall of Archives. Just doing a little research, fellas. Zane said to the werewolf students, who were still serving as guards around the archive steps. Or do we need a permission slip signed in triplicate from the Chancellor himself? Just make it quick, Walker, one of the werewolf boys sneered. The hall gets locked up at eight on the dot, whether you're out of there or not. Hey, Zane grinned as he trotted up the steps towards the huge doors. That rhymed! You've been practicing that one, haven't you? You werewolves are so stinking clever! Smile while you can, Walker. Another of the boys called. We'll see if you're still grinning this Friday night after your team meets ours on the clutch course. Well, that didn't rhyme at all, Zane admonished. Back to the doghouse with you. The werewolf boys bristled, but they were apparently too committed to their guard duties to abandon their posts. James and Ralph sidled up the steps behind Zane, avoiding eye contact with the older boys on either side. So what are we going to do here? James asked as they entered the round, darkened room of the disc recorder. Even if there are any relics from Magnuson's time, they'd be in the restricted section of the archive. We can't get in there, no matter how many werewolves you insult. Au contraire, Zane announced, producing a slim golden key from his pocket. James recognized it. That's an archive skeleton key, he said impressed, just like the one Franklin used when we went down to the Vault of Destinies. How'd you get that? Zane shrugged. I've been planning things out for some time now. I figured that you'd eventually warm up to having a little extracurricular adventure. What do you think I agreed to go out with Cheshire Chatterley to the costume ball for? Ralph suggested, because she looks excellent in a pink taffeta dress. Well, yeah, there is that, Zane answered thoughtfully. But that's not all there is to it. She's on the maintenance crew that works here in the archive, and she's always been on Head Reading's good side. I can see why, Ralph nodded. James shook his head wonderingly. You nicked the key from her? No, Zane exclaimed, offended. I just asked her for it. What kind of cad do you think I am? Sorry, James replied, blinking. I told her I needed to look up some famous old dancer so I could practice my steps for the ball. She about split in two, gave me the key that very second. Ralph whistled, impressed. 
You danced with a girl just to get your hands on that key. Anything for the cause, Zane sighed. Come on. Using the key, the boys opened the door to the inner archive. After some nervous slinking around, they finally found a gated section locked off with a large chain and padlock. A quick wave of the skeleton key and a tap of Zane's wand opened the padlock, however, and the three crept slowly into the dark chamber beyond. It's so dark and dusty, Ralph commented, keeping his voice unconsciously hushed. How are we going to find what we're looking for in all this? Cheshire told me how they catalogued things in here, Zane answered, holding his lit wand overhead. Day first, and then the name of the event or person. Look at the top of the aisles. Magda's and taught between 1830 and 1859. Over here, James called, peering up at the shelves. The other two joined him and began skulking along the shelves, examining the myriad odd objects and blowing dust off their yellowed note cards. A shuffling sound surprised the boys. They froze in place, eyes wide, staring at each other. Was that one of you? James whispered. Ralph gulped. It wasn't me. It came from the aisle behind us. It was probably nothing, Zane whispered, glancing around. Almost immediately, a faint thump sounded nearby. All three boys jumped. Slowly, James turned towards the sound, lifting his wand. He was barely breathing. As one, the three boys leaned around the end of the aisle, peering into the darkness beyond. Something pushed out of the shelf immediately next to James's face, mashing up against his cheek and making a noise like a tiny motorboat. He cried out and leapt into the air, dropping his wand and scrabbling at his cheek. Patches! Zane rasped, his eyes bulging. James spun around, heart pounding, and looked. Patches the cat stood on the shelf, purring noisily, his bullet head bobbing. There were cobwebs caught in his whiskers. Patches, you rascal! Zane declared, reaching to scratch the cat between the ears. What are you doing down here? You about gave James a heart attack! He laughed nervously. Seems to me you were pretty wigged out too, James grumped, reaching to pick up his dropped wand. You try getting some great furry head and wet nose pushed into your face out of the dark and see how you feel about it. What's he doing down here? Ralph asked, stepping forwards to pet the cat himself. I thought he always hung around administration hall. Zane nodded. He does. I've never seen him anywhere else. Is it just me? Ralph said glancing sheepishly between Zane and James. Or does this feel like kind of a bad jinx? Maybe we should call the old thing off, eh? James expected Zane to scoff at the suggestion, but when he turned to the blonde boy, he saw him studying the cat critically. What's up, Patches? he asked the cat, where it still stood purring on the shelf. You here to grant us your blessing, or are you going to rat us out to the bigwigs back at Administration Hall? The cat stopped purring almost immediately. He hunkered low and peered over the ledge of the shelf. A moment later, he thumped lightly to the floor and began to stalk off along the aisle, his tail sticking up. Well, Zane blinked, pardon me for living. Ralph said, maybe he was offended by the word rat. Come on, James suggested, turning back to the shelves. Forget him, he's just a cat. If you remember, he thought we were supposed to be in Igor House. Zane glanced at James. Have you wondered if maybe he was right? James met his friend's gaze and frowned. What do you mean? Bigfoot House fits us just fine. What's some old cat know that we don't? I'm just saying, Zane replied. There is a reason he's here. Maybe it's worth thinking about. James felt impatient. He stopped and stared up at the dark ceiling for a moment. There, he said, glancing back at Zane and Ralph. I've thought about it. Can we get on with it now? This place creeps me out. Zane shrugged. Dismissing the cat, the three returned to their search of the shelves. A few minutes later, Zane called out. James and Ralph trotted down the aisle to join him. It's, Ralph began, and then swallowed thickly. It's a skull. James held his wand closer. Two objects were pushed into a small cubbyhole, and one of them was indeed a human skull, missing its jawbone. The other was a woman's boot, very old and scuffed, made of black leather. The card affixed to the front of the shelf read, 1859, October the 5th, I.K. Magnuson Interrogation 1. Maybe it's not real, James suggested, peering at the yellowed skull. 
It sure looks real, Ralph said, shuddering. It's just an old bone, Zane said, rolling his eyes and reaching for the skull. I'll carry it. Grab the boot and let's get this over with. As quickly as they could, the three boys carried their acquisitions back up to the room of the disc recorder. James breathed a sigh of relief as he walked beneath the thick, tiny windows embedded in the domed ceiling. It was dark outside now, but it was nice to see the faint blue glow of the night sky above. Who wants to do the honors? Zane asked, holding up the skull and peering at it. What do you think, Mr. Bones? He moved the skull like a puppet and answered in a higher voice, I think you should, Zane Brain, since you're so cool and dashing, and this was your idea after all. James sighed wearily. Quit it. You're freaking out, Ralph. I'm not freaked out, Ralph objected, his face pale. I mean, yeah, I am, but just a little. Let's get to it then, Zane squeaked, puppeting the skull again. Upsy daisy With a small clunk, Zane set the skull into the concave bowl of the disc recorder. Instantly, the room changed. It brightened and became much smaller. James, Ralph, and Zane turned on the spot and found themselves in a dim corner, peering into a sort of cramped study. Fire crackled in the brick fireplace, and darkness pressed against the tall windows. Three men were seated at a table, two on one side facing the third. James was not entirely surprised to see that Chancellor Franklin was one of the men seated at the table. He looked only slightly younger, with a rather less rotund middle. The man next to him wore the black robes and hat of an arbiter, although his skin was dark and he had a thin beard. In the center of the table, looking like a Halloween decoration, was the yellowed, jawless skull. The dark man had just finished tapping it with his wand. Douglas Treat, General Arbiter of the Wizarding Court of the United States of America, Philadelphia Station, he said blandly, overseeing the preliminary interrogation of one Ignatius Karloff Magnuson, detained for various charges, including theft and misuse of corpses, torture and suspicion of murder. I have chosen to use this skull as the relic for this interrogation, since it serves as Exhibit A for the case in question. I am accompanied by Benjamin Amadeus Franklin, head of the Alma Aleron Technomancy Department, and immediate superior of the defendant. Professor Magnuson, if you would state your full name for the record. James turned his attention to the man seated across from Franklin and the Arbiter. Magnuson was large, with a barrel chest and a square head, crowned with a fringe of short grey hair. His expression was grim, his dark brow lowered over a sharp, finely sculpted nose. "'I am Professor Ignatius Karloff Magnuson Third, he said, and James was surprised by the man's cultured, pleasant voice. Unlike most Americans, Magnuson spoke with a distinct British accent. Zane leaned towards James and Ralph and whispered, I heard that he never approved of America's break from England. In protest, he always spoke in what he called the King's English. James frowned and listened as Treat the Arbiter spoke again. You are aware of the allegations against you, Professor Magnuson. Magnuson didn't respond. He simply stared across the table, his eyes like steel marbles. Treat cleared his throat. Ahem. For the record, Professor... You were accused, at the very least, of dabbling in forbidden practices that threaten the stability of the dimensional hierarchy. Is it true that you have sought to control the future by exploitation of the wizarding grand unification theory? Magnuson remained utterly impassive. James could tell that the man was listening, for he stared at the men across from him as if he intended to pin them to a corkboard like butterflies. He simply did not seem to feel the need to respond to their questions. Franklin, for his own part, appeared completely miserable. His face was pale behind his square spectacles. So be it, then, Treat said, adjusting his own glasses and peering down at a parchment in front of him. You are further accused of opening a rift between dimensions, something legendarily referred to as the Nexus Curtain, with no regard to the consequences. How do you respond to this allegation? Magnuson did not stir. He might as well have been an extremely lifelike statue. Treat had apparently resigned himself to Magnuson's silence. Additionally, sir, you were accused of stealing bodies from the campus graveyard and conducting unlawful dissections of them. 
This skull, as I have mentioned, is Exhibit A in regard to that allegation. It was found in the basement of this very house, along with the sorts of tools one might expect to use for such purposes. Furthermore, you were suspected in the abduction and torture of as many as eight muggle citizens of the city of Philadelphia. Evidence of hasty obliviation has only succeeded in destroying these victims' ability to identify their tormentor, but has left traces of memories of this school and the magical world at large. Treat took off his glasses and stared hard at Magnuson. Such acts, if they are proven to be true, break any number of very serious laws, Professor, not to mention the law of common human decency to which we all profess to ascribe. None of these, however, are as serious as the final accusation. As you are certainly aware, the corpse of a young muggle woman, an impoverished local seamstress by the name of Frederica Staples, was recently found in an alley near the entrance to this school. Her body was mutilated, nearly beyond recognition, and she was missing a single boot. That missing boot, sir, was discovered two nights past in the basement of this home. I must ask you again, how do you respond to these allegations? Magnuson stirred for the first time, but when he spoke, he addressed Franklin. Was it you who summoned the authorities? he asked, his voice merely conversational. You gave me little choice, Franklin replied quietly. Research is one thing, Ignatius. This— He shook his head. Magnuson smiled tightly. You always were too weak to appreciate the risks associated with any great endeavor. You, Benjamin, are an academician. You are not like me. You are not an explorer. Yours is not a dream of exploration, Franklin replied, his face darkening. It is an obsession with power. This is not one of your fanciful stories of the heroic outcast struggling against ignorant foes. Your actions have affected real people. I should have intervened months ago when I discovered that you were experimenting with the Wizarding Grand Unification Theory. The Octosphere was bad enough, but at least it turned out to be harmless. Attempting to observe and measure all things at once in the name of domination is a madman's fantasy. I was mistaken, I agree, Magnuson replied, as if he and Franklin were merely discussing the matter as friends. I was preoccupied with the microscopic. I fell into the conviction that observing all things meant breaking the world down into smaller and smaller bits, recording the actions of even the most infinitesimal details. The motion of blood corpuscles through the pathways of arteries, the firing of neurons in individual human brains. I studied these things in great detail, learning what I could from the dead, gaining even more knowledge from my systematic studies of the living. You choose to call it torture, of course, and yes, even murder, because you fail to grasp the monumental nature of the end goal. What is mere infliction of pain in the face of perfect understanding? What is one paltry life in the name of the total unification of the cosmos? Ignatius, Franklin interrupted. Stop! You are only making matters worse for yourself. Eventually, Magnus went on, now leaning slightly over the table, his eyes bright. I determined that I was thinking too much like my fellows, failing where all those before me had failed. With that realization, I remembered my heraldium. He who fails to see the mountain stumbles headlong over the pebbles. Don't you see? The secret was not in the microscopic after all, Benjamin. The secret, of course, was in the macroscopic. Not the tiny, but the monumental. Totality of measurement could only be accomplished when one could view the totality of realities. I knew then what I had to do. I had to break out of the confines of this dimension and find a place where I could observe all dimensions at once. What you call a mere legend, I have walked upon with my own two feet. I have been through the Nexus Curtain, I have trod the world between the worlds, and witnessed the pathways into every other dimension. Treat shook his head, his eyes narrowed. Am I to understand, then, Professor, that you are admitting to all of the allegations leveled against you? Please, Ignatius, Franklin said, nearly pleading with the big man across from him. Your obsessions have driven you to madness. 
Whatever you have done, whatever you have seen, it has obviously affected you in some dreadful way. There is help for you here if you choose to seek it. Beware what you say, lest you forfeit that option. Magnuson chuckled dryly. <laughs> you think that I should care what this little man can do to me? Let him attempt to stop me. I am beyond the rim now, Benjamin. I am past the event horizon of destiny, incapable of returning even if I wished to. And I do not wish to. I embrace my mission. I will go to it with great relish. Treat pushed back his chair and stood up. I am afraid that I have no choice then, sirs. Out of respect for your position, Professor Magnuson, and at your personal request, Professor Franklin, I leave you now to formulate my verdict. You can expect my return within the week, along with a cadre of wizarding police, to escort the defendant to the Crystal Mountain for processing. Professor Franklin, for the interim, will you state your willing assumption of full responsibility for the guarding of the defendant? Franklin's eyes remained locked on Magnuson. I assume full responsibility for the defendant. So be it, Treat said briskly. He retrieved his wand from his sleeve, reached out, and tapped the yellow skull that sat on the table before him. Instantly the room vanished, leaving James, Zane, and Ralph blinking in the darkness of the hall of the disc recorder. Whoa! Zane breathed, looking down at the yellowed skull. Ralph shook his head slowly. Franklin wasn't kidding around when he said that that bloke was someone the school would like to forget. Well, we know why Magnuson went through the Nexus Curtain at least, James sighed. He was convinced that he had to measure everything in every dimension in order to know the future and control it. Is that how it sounded to you? Zane nodded. Magnuson was one crazy whack job. I see why he was head of Igor House. But where most of those guys just talk a big game about wanting to take over the world, he actually went out and did something about it. But we still don't know how he got through the Nexus Curtain, Ralph commented. And that's the bit we really need to know, right? How else are we going to get through to the world between the worlds and see if the real bad guys are hiding out there? Zane took the skull gingerly from the bowl of the disc recorder. According to Professor Jackson, the Nexus Curtain can only be opened with a key from some other dimension. Whoever attacked the Vault of Destinies has the Crimson Thread from the Loom, which would do the trick since it came from some neighboring reality. What could Magnuson have used as a key? James shrugged and nodded towards Ralph, who was holding the second relic, the old boot. Let's try that one. Maybe it'll tell us what we need to know. Ralph looked down at the boot in his hands. You think this is the boot that they talked about in the vision? The one that belonged to that muggle woman that Magnuson, uh... Just put it on the thing, Ralph, Zane said, shaking his head slowly. Ralph stepped forwards and placed the small boot onto the stone pedestal before him. In response... The hall of the disc recorder dimmed, but remained relatively unchanged. For a moment, James thought that there was something wrong with the relic, but then he heard a voice, echoing quietly. He followed the sound of it, turning to look about the hall, and saw a single flame burning in a small table lamp. Next to it was Benjamin Franklin, seated in a wooden chair with a desk attachment, writing. Unlike the previous vision, which had been bright and solid, the image of Franklin looked almost like a projection on smoke. Franklin's ghostly quill scratched on the parchment as he spoke the words aloud, dictating to himself. His voice seemed to come from very far away. These are the notes of Professor Benjamin Amadeus Franklin, he said slowly, bent over the parchment, detailing the final records of the events of this night, October the 8th, 1859. The last night of Professor Ignatius Magnuson, formerly a valued teacher at this institution, and a friend. Franklin stopped and looked up, almost as if he'd heard the boy's scuffling footsteps. James froze in place, but then he realized that the vision of Franklin was merely pausing to think. His eyes were bright behind his square spectacles. After a long moment, he drew a breath and leaned over the parchment again. The flames still burn in the foundation of the house Ignatius Magnuson once called home. How the fire began, no one knows for sure. I myself suspect a deliberate causation, perhaps even set by the professor himself. The mob that preceded the fire 
was maddened beyond reason and did nothing to extinguish the flames once they appeared. I am dismayed to announce that there were many in tonight's assembly who wished to see Magnuson's corpse pulled from the dying flames, killed as surely as the fire destroyed his home. Preliminary observation of the ruins, however, has revealed no trace of the professor's body. I have no doubt that further searches over the coming days will prove equally unsuccessful. Magnuson is not here. He has escaped. Probably during the very height of the fire, while the vengeance-seeking riot was in full fever. Franklin stopped writing again. He put down the quill and pushed his hand up under his spectacles, rubbing his eyes wearily. He didn't seem to want to go on, but after a moment he retrieved the quill and began again, speaking the words aloud as he wrote them. Where Ignatius Magnuson has gone, I cannot begin to guess. Surely he has by now accomplished what he swore was his destiny. He has retraced his steps through the Nexus Curtain, into whatever unknowable realm lies beyond. I believe it is likely that from that realm he will never return. Thus I wish to record what I now know of his most recent endeavors. Unfortunately, my interviews with the professor over the previous two days revealed very little useful information. There are only two details worth remembering. The first was his riddle regarding how he learned to open the Nexus Curtain. He told me, and I quote, Franklin paused again and retrieved another parchment from the table next to him. He studied it closely, adjusting his spectacles. James noticed that the woman's boot was sitting in the darkness beneath the table, leaning against one of the chair's thin, spindly legs. And I quote, Franklin went on, putting his quill to the parchment before him. The truth walked the halls of Erebus Castle. It was there all along for anyone to see. I myself have walked those halls for well over a century, and have not met anyone or anything that spoke of the paths of the Nexus Curtain. If there is any truth in Magnuson's claim, then it is carefully hidden and will require further study. James turned to Zane, his eyes widening. Erebus Castle is the home of Vampire House, right? he whispered. Zane nodded. We can get in and explore around a bit if Lucy lets us. Shh, Ralph hissed, leaning closer to the ghostly vision of Benjamin Franklin. The second detail is, I fear, an even more obscure riddle. When asked where the Nexus Curtain was, Magnuson only smiled and said nothing. This, of course, is the detail which concerns me most, since if what the professor claims is true, then he has succeeded in breaching the divide into the world between the worlds. I fear less the dimensional instabilities that might be created by such a rift. More, I fear, what may come through into our own dimension from those beyond. My entreaties to Magnuson that the boundaries between the worlds are there for good reason, to establish barriers between incompatible realities, fell entirely upon deaf ears. Finally, however, late last night, Professor Magnuson gave me an answer to my question, although I suspect that it is as useless as anything that might be provided by his damned octosphere. When pressed about the location of the Nexus Curtain, he finally smiled and told me. Here Franklin made a weary but possible imitation of Magnuson's accent. It lies within the eyes of robots. He paused once more, re-reading what he had written. With a sigh, he began to write again. The riddle is intentionally misleading and probably hopelessly obscure, and yet I know the professor well enough to know that he would not merely lie. He is too arrogant not to have offered up a valid clue, even if it would be impossible to solve. In time, I will study both of these quotes in the hopes of finding the Nexus Curtain and closing it forever. For now, however, I find that my duties must revolve around the more immediate concerns of calming the school and explaining myself to Arbiter Douglas Treat. I have failed in my duties in more ways than one. Franklin sighed deeply, put down his quill, 
and carefully folded the parchment he had written upon. When he was done, he retrieved the small boot from the floor next to him, slipped the folded parchment into it, and then tapped the boot with his wand. The vision evaporated in a puff of dry smoke, returning the hall of the disc recorder to its normal dimness. Immediately, Zane tucked the skull under his arm, turned around, and reached for the old boot that sat atop the stone pedestal. He peered inside it. It's still there, he said, smiling. Franklin's old note. Parchment feels like it'll crumble to bits if I pull it out, though. Cheshire and the catalogue crew probably would have preserved it somehow if they'd known it was there. The Nexus curtain lies within the eyes of Robits, Ralph said thoughtfully. Any idea who Robits is? Zane scrunched his face up with concentration. It rings a bell, actually. I'll see what I can find out. And we can ask Lucy about letting us look around the halls of Erebus Castle, James added. We have two clues to go on. Not bad. Wait a minute, Ralph said, shaking his head. If these clues were solvable, don't you think that Chancellor Franklin would have figured them out by now? Zane glanced at Ralph, thinking. How do we know he didn't? What do you mean? James asked. Well, it wouldn't be the first time somebody had discovered some terrible secret and then just sat on it. You heard him in the vision. Even if he did find out the secrets of the Nexus Curtain, it wasn't like he wanted to go out and share it with the world. He just wanted to shut it down or guard it so nothing could get through from either side. Including us, maybe, Ralph said, raising his eyebrows. James shook his head. Maybe, but I doubt it. If Franklin had figured out the truth of the Nexus Curtain, I think he'd have told us when we asked him about it. I mean, he obviously doesn't want anyone snooping around about it, right? If he'd found it and shut it down, he'd just say so. Ralph frowned. Why? Because, Zane answered, we're just a bunch of curious kids, right? If he could have killed the mystery for us by telling us that he'd already found the Nexus Curtain and closed it for good, then there'd be nothing left for us to be curious about. Set and spike. Good one, James. Ralph picked up the boot again. Let's take the relics back down to the restricted section and get out of here. I've had enough creepy mystery for now. Zane nodded. Come on, then. We still have time to look up this robots dude tonight. I'll just wait up here if you don't mind, James announced, shuffling his feet a little. Zane glanced back, one eyebrow raised. Sure, all right. What's the matter? You still hinky about patches hiding out of the shelves? James shook his head. No, I just... There's only the two relics. You guys don't really need me. Hurry back, all right? Ralph nodded. The sooner the better. Come on. A moment later, the door to the archive's lower levels eased shut, leaving James alone in the hall of the disc recorder. He waited for a moment, listening intently, and then, when he was sure that Ralph and Zane had begun their descent to the restricted area, he reached into the back pocket of his jeans. He had been carrying Petra's dream story around in his pocket for days, folded into its seamless packet and encased in a plastic bag that he'd found in the kitchen of Apollo Mansion. He didn't know for sure why he had started keeping it with him, except that it seemed safer somehow. He held the plastic bag gingerly between his thumb and forefinger and turned towards the disc recorder. The idea had come to him while they'd been watching the vision of Franklin. The disc recorder was only supposed to work on objects that had been especially enchanted, of course, but James couldn't help wondering. Ever since he had saved Petra's life back on the Gwyndamere, the dream story had become too magical for him to touch directly. Perhaps, however, it was just magical enough to trigger something in the disc recorder, something James could make sense of. James couldn't guess why Petra and her dream story seemed to possess such strange magical intensity, but he meant to find out even if it meant that he was, essentially, spying on her dreams. Gingerly, he tipped the plastic bag upside down over the stone bowl. The parchment packet tumbled out and fell into the bowl with a tiny thump. A gust of dry wind pushed past James suddenly, whipping his hair and forcing him to squint. He turned around on the spot, and dull brightness filled his vision. He was in daylight, standing atop a grassy plateau. The hall of the archive had completely vanished. Even the stone pedestal of the disc recorder itself was gone. This, James realized, was no hazy vision. It felt utterly solid, 
and yet surreal, as if every blade of dead grass was watching him, and every cloud in the low, heaving sky was glowering down at him, coldly angry. The featureless grass of the plateau stretched away in all directions, and James realized that the plateau was actually an island surrounded by craggy cliffs. Slate-gray waves slammed against the cliffs, sending spray up into the windy air. And of course, there was the castle, jutting up in the near distance. It was made of black stone, small but so tall, so encrusted with towers and turrets that it seemed to claw at the cloudy sky. The structure loomed over the edge of the cliff, as if the rocks had eroded away beneath it, and yet the castle still stood, held up by sheer bloody-minded determination. Someone was watching from the darkness of the castle. James sensed the weight of their gaze like hot stones on his skin. He peered up at the castle, shading his eyes against the grey light. A figure was standing on a high balcony, obscured in shadow. I have come a voice said. The words echoed over the grassy plateau like thunder. I watch and I wait. My time is very near. I am the Sorceress Queen. I am the Princess of Chaos. James strained his eyes, trying to see past the shadowy dimness of the balcony. He could barely make out the figure, except that it appeared to be a woman. Her hair streamed darkly in the wind. When she spoke again, a slow chill came over James, freezing him to the spot. His eyes widened, and the vision began to intensify, to bleed and pulse, to shred apart. But the words rang on, echoing louder and louder, pounding James's ears to the point of pain. I watch and I wait, the voice repeated. My name will be known throughout all of the destinies. My name is Morgan, she who strides between the worlds. The vision shattered and flew apart. Darkness swirled, compressed, and vanished into a single dark point which hovered over the pedestal of the disrecorder like a hole in space. A moment later, even that winked from view. James stood, rooted to the floor of the hall, his hair sticking up and his heart pounding. It's just a dream, he told himself, repeating the words over and over. It's just that part of Petra's mind, the Morgan part, wanting to get out. Petra has it locked away, imprisoned, under control. That's all it is. That must be all it is. James shuddered violently, remembering the hopeless toll of that dreaming voice. Footsteps approached, accompanied by echoing voices. Zane and Ralph were returning. Quickly, James stepped forwards to retrieve the dream story, but then he stopped, his eyes widening. The bowl of the disc recorder was empty. Petra's dream story had completely vanished. Chapter 15 The Star of Convergence Now that the Alma Alaron Halloween Ball had officially come and gone, the campus got down to the serious business of unwinding towards the winter holidays. No sooner had the floating pumpkins in the cafeteria been taken down then a collection of papier-mâché turkeys and strange buckled hats had gone up in their place. Thanksgiving, the holiday that, according to Professor Sunouye, celebrated the successful harvest of the first American pilgrims with the help and cooperation of the Native Americans whom they'd met there, seemed to be a surprisingly big deal among the Alma Alaron students and faculty. Most of them were making plans to go home over the long weekend, where they would apparently eat lots of roasted turkey, mashed potatoes, and pumpkin pie, and listen to, or attend, a lot of commemorative sporting events, including a blockbuster professional clutch cudgel match known as the Super Brawl. Curious about the details of such a quintessentially American holiday, James and Ralph shamelessly invited themselves to Zane's family home near St. Louis, Missouri, for the Walkers' Thanksgiving dinner. Zane's father, communicating via James's owl, Nobby, happily agreed to host the boys. Thus, on the last weekend of November, the three boys travelled by train to a small old station in the quaint little city of Kirkwood, which Zane proudly proclaimed as the first official suburb of St. Louis. This fact was woefully lost on James and Ralph, however, who were both preoccupied with the narrow, snow-dusted streets and brightly lit Christmas decorations that adorned the city's lampposts. 
As the three boys waited in the purple dusk for Zane's parents to pick them up, they peered across the street to where a gaggle of gaily dressed muggles milled around an artificial forest of neatly cut and arranged pine trees. Occasionally, a minivan or car would motor out onto the street with one of the trees tied to the roof by a length of twine. People around here get started early with their Christmases, don't they? Ralph said with a happy smile. I could get used to that, I bet. That's nothing, Zane replied. There's a family in the block next to my house that leaves their Christmas tree up all year long. True story. James frowned. Are they magical folk? Nah, Zane answered easily. They're just weird. Here comes my mom. The boys waved and collected their duffel bags as a white car pulled into the circle drive that fronted the train station. It still gave James an odd sensation whenever he saw someone driving from the left side of the car, but Zane, of course, thought nothing of it. He climbed into the front seat with his mother, an attractive blonde woman wearing tortoiseshell glasses. She smiled back at Ralph and James as they clambered into the back. Hi, boys, she announced, offering each one a cookie from a paper bag. Welcome to Kirkwood. Hope you're hungry. I am, Ralph agreed eagerly. Mmm, chocolate chip cookies. Are those chunks of cherry? Still hot, too, Zane nodded, his mouth full. Just came out of the oven ten minutes ago, Zane's mother concurred, steering the car back out onto the street. Greer stayed at home with her father, watching the last batch, but she's just as excited as we are to have you all over for the holiday. James watched the small town unroll past the windows of the car until they reached a neighborhood of little houses and neat yards, not unlike the area surrounding the Alma Alaron gate. Zane's mother slowed and angled up a short drive towards a simple stone house perched on a hill. Home, sweet home, Zane announced eagerly, already opening his door. Dad's got the fire going, I bet. That's not very hard, his mother commented. It's a gas fireplace, but I'm sure you're right. As the four climbed out of the car, the back door of the house swept open, and a head of curly blonde hair poked out, lit brightly by the overhead light. Dad's carving the turkey, the girl called, but I can't get him to stop eating it as he goes. You better get in here right away. Zane's mother sighed with weary affection. Hi, Greer, Zane called to his younger sister, waving, and then turned to James and Ralph, shaking his head happily. Some things never change. Come on inside. I'll show you my room. Thanksgiving at the Walker family home turned out to be not unlike any family gathering that James had known back at Marble Arch. The dining room was rather small, and by the time Zane's aunt and uncle had arrived with their two younger children, the house rang with a cacophony of overlapping sounds, laughter and conversation, the clank of dishes, the burble of Christmas carols from the kitchen radio, the staccato of clambering footsteps as Zane's cousins and sister ran about the small house. Zane and Ralph spent a goodly amount of time playing video games on the family television, although James could never quite get the hang of them. The food was excellent, and apparently never-ending, so that by Thanksgiving evening James felt utterly stuffed. The family gathered around the table to play board games, and James joined in, even though he had never heard of any of the games, and had no idea how to play them. "'Sorry, James,' Zane announced happily as James marched his marker around the board. "'You owe me two hundred bucks. Enjoy your commute, and thank you for patronizing Reading Railroad.' He's ruthless about these railroads, Ralph commented, as James counted out the last of his brightly coloured play money. If I'd known how much money these could make, I wouldn't have wasted all mine on these stupid utilities. James had no idea what any of it meant, but he didn't mind. It was an excellent time, no matter what. He grinned as he handed the play money to Zane and reached for one of the last cookies on a nearby plate. One more bite couldn't hurt. He decided he'd take chocolate cherry cookies over fake money any day. Over the course of the holiday weekend, James and Ralph shared the walker's guest bedroom, sleeping on a pair of narrow old beds. On Sunday afternoon, while Ralph, Zane and Greer played video games, James explored the small house alone. In the small corner office, he found Mr. Walker hunched over his desk, tapping furiously away at a laptop computer. His face was tense and scowling as if he was wrestling with the tiny keys. "'What are you working on?' James asked, leaning in the doorway. Walker looked up, his eyes wide and surprised, and James realised that the man hadn't noticed his approach. "'Ah!' 
he said and smiled. Sorry, I get pretty wrapped up in this sometimes. Hi, James. I didn't mean to interrupt you or anything, James said quickly. I was just curious. Walker sighed and leaned back in his chair, stretching. It's fine. I need people to remind me to take a break sometimes. Zane's mother says that when I'm riding, it's like I'm a hundred feet underwater. It takes a long time to get down there, and a long time to swim back to the surface. So when I am there, it's easy to forget everything else. I thought you made movies, James asked, frowning. Walker shrugged and bobbed his head. I make stuff, he said. Sometimes I make things for movies, sometimes I draw pictures, sometimes I write stories. James was curious. Do people read what you write? Like, are your stories in bookstores and stuff? Walker laughed and shook his head. <laughs> no, my books don't end up on any store shelves. Fortunately, though, I do get paid for the other things I make. Well enough, in fact, that I have the freedom to do some things just for the fun of it. That's what the writing is for. James frowned quizzically. You write for fun? No better reason, Walker sighed, flexing his fingers. So what are you writing now? Walker pursed his lips and shook his head. Just a little story. James narrowed his eyes at the man. For some reason, he suspected that Mr. Walker was purposely avoiding any further explanation. James peered towards the screen of the laptop. Without his glasses, the image was merely a blur of lines, but he thought he could make out a group of words in boldface. The title, perhaps? For a moment, he thought he saw his own name there. He shook his head and blinked. That was ridiculous, of course. Mr. Walker turned the computer slightly and clicked a button. The text on the screen disappeared. James noticed a small volume perched on the end of the desk. He gestured towards it. Is that one of your books? Walker scooped the book up. This? No, this is a classic. I was using it for research. It's called Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Ever hear of it? James shook his head. It's an old story, Walker said, letting the book fall open on his palm. A horror story, but a psychological one. That's what makes it so scary, really. What do you mean? James asked, peering at the book. Walker flipped the pages until he came to an illustration. In it, a man in coattails and a top hat was standing before a floor-length mirror. He was staring with wide-eyed terror at his own reflection, and it was no wonder. The reflection in the mirror was a different man entirely. The figure in the mirror was leering, grinning, with hands hooked into claws and boggling mad eyes. Because, Walker replied thoughtfully, this isn't just a story about a madman wreaking havoc on the innocent. This is a story where the villain and the hero cannot physically fight one another, where there is no clear-cut moment of confrontation between them, where one can win out over the other. James stared at the image on the page and felt a pall of uneasiness settle over him. Why not? he asked in a low voice. Well, it's very simple, Walker said, glancing up at James seriously. It's because the villain and the hero are the same person. James nodded slowly, unable to take his eyes away from the illustration on the page. In it, two different personalities stared at each other from within the same body, divided only by the mirror glass. In the warmth of the small office room, James shivered. A moment later, he dismissed himself and went to find Zane and Ralph. All of a sudden, he wanted nothing more than to be around his friends, to hear their raucous laughter, and to forget that strange, old illustration. The return trip to Alma Alaron, like all post-holiday journeys, was melancholy and quiet. Zane spent the train ride with his nose buried in a thick book called The Varney Guide to Who's Who in the Wizarding World. James tried to read over his shoulder at one point, but almost immediately found the book unforgivably boring. Instead, he challenged Ralph to a game of wizard chess, using a miniature box set of chess pieces that Ralph had taken to carrying with him wherever he went. James hated playing chess with Ralph, since he nearly always lost to the bigger boy, but even losing was better than simply staring out the windows at the passing dreary cities and rainy sky. 
The next day, Zane cornered Ralph and James in the hall outside of Majography. I know who Robots is, he said, his eyes bulging in his face. What? Ralph frowned. I thought you said he wasn't anywhere in that book. He wasn't, Zane agreed. It was a complete waste of time. Now my head's all stuffed full of useless names and trivia, and all for nothing. Like, did you know that the wizard who invented the scrim was some crazy dude named Vimrich who was just looking for a way to nap while he was riding his broom? He never got it to work. The flattened broom just kept flipping over and dropping him on the floor. But after he died, some of his nephews found the homemade brooms in his workshop and tried standing up on them. The rest is history. Fascinating, James said impatiently. Get to the robot's part. Hey, if I had to learn it, you have to put up with hearing about it, Zane proclaimed, poking James in the chest. But anyway, when I took the book back to the library this morning, I noticed something hanging on the wall. You know how the vampire girls are always making those charcoal etchings of the gravestones in the school cemetery? Well, a bunch of them are hanging up by the librarian's desk. Must have been some kind of class art project or something. The point is, guess whose name showed up on the one right by the return cart? Ralph looked surprised. Zane nodded eagerly. Right there, plain as day. It was spelled a little different than I expected. R-O-E bits, but close enough to play clutch, as we zombies say. He was just some old guy from way back in the day. Lived and worked here on campus, apparently. Probably he was like Magnuson's servant or gardener or something. The Nexus curtain lies within the eyes of Robits, James quoted, nodding. Maybe the key to the curtain is buried with the guy. Oh, no, Ralph raised his hands, palms out. I'm not going and digging up any old graves. Zane put an arm around Ralph's shoulders, standing on tiptoes to reach. Don't worry, Ralph, he said soothingly. We won't need to dig anybody up, all right? We won't, the bigger boy replied skeptically. Zane shook his head. Nah, I could tell by the etching that it was from a mausoleum. We don't need to dig at all. We just need to pry the door open with a crowbar. Oh, Ralph sighed sarcastically. Well, that's loads better. Over the following days, James, Ralph, and Zane explored the campus cemetery, which was surprisingly large, huddled in the northwest corner of the campus and surrounded by a tall, wrought-iron fence. Fortunately, the main gate was almost always left open, even at night, which meant that they wouldn't have to climb the fence if they had to sneak in by moonlight. After a few attempts, the three finally found the mausoleum belonging to a wizard named Leopold Cromwell Robitz, which sat embedded in a hill in the shadow of an ancient oak tree. The mausoleum door was made of copper, weathered to a pale green patina. Zane gripped the handle and gave it a tentative tug, but the door didn't budge. Well, so much for plan A, he said, nodding. Door's locked. Anyone want to try an unlocking spell? What about you, Ralphinator? You're the spellmeister of the group. Ralph grimaced but produced his wand. He leveled its lime-green tip at the door. Allow Mora, he said tentatively. There was a golden flash, but the door remained firmly closed. Zane yanked the handle once more to no avail. I guess that means plan C, eh? James said. Ralph asked hopefully, can't we just try it now? And risk getting hauled into the office as vandals? Zane replied, batting Ralph on the shoulder. Trust me, it's one thing to get caught hexing your name onto a statue. Messing around with the dead means a whole different kind of trouble. You saw how serious they took it when Magnuson was stealing bodies to dissect them. Ralph sighed. Oh, fine, but if we have to do this at night, I'm not going inside. I'll be waiting right here next to this old tree while you two go bumping around with the skeletons. Got it? James agreed. Wouldn't have it any other way, Ralph. It was the following weekend before the three boys could summon the courage to make the nighttime trek to the cemetery. Even Zane, whose audacity normally seemed to be limitless, appeared jumpy about the endeavor. On Saturday night, James and Ralph stayed up late in the game room of Apollo Mansion, playing ping-pong and enduring the constant critiques of Heckle and Jekyll. Finally, when the grandfather clock in the corner struck midnight, the boys crept up the stairs and eased open the front door. They looked at each other, standing between the coldness of the night and the warmth of the hall behind them. You up for this, Ralph? James asked in a whisper. No, Ralph admitted, but we're going to do it anyway, right? 
James nodded and gulped. Remember why we're doing it. It's for a good cause. We can't let Petra take the blade for something she didn't do. We have to find the people who really broke into the Hall of Archives and attacked the Vault of Destinies. Ralph shook his head. But we saw her, James. What makes you so sure that it wasn't really her? In the past, James would have felt angry about such a question, but he knew Ralph better now. He knew that Ralph was a pragmatist. Besides, Ralph didn't feel the same way about Petra that James did. He didn't know what James knew. Because she told me, James said simply, meeting his friend's gaze. After a moment, he added, When we were on the ship, Dad told me that the best thing I could do for Petra was to be her friend. Friends trust one another, and that's what I'm doing for her. Do you trust me? Ralph shrugged. Sometimes, he answered seriously, but mostly I just back your plays. That's the best way I know how to be a friend. That's what tonight's about. I hope that's good enough. James smiled, despite the cold and stillness of the night. Slowly, he pulled the door of Apollo Mansion closed behind them. That's more than good enough, Ralph. Come on. As James and Ralph stole into the darkness, they found the campus eerily quiet, covered in low, creeping tendrils of fog. The air was so cold that James immediately began to shiver. Overhead, the half-moon shone brightly, covering the lawns and footpaths with its bony light. Over there, Ralph whispered, his breath making puffs of mist in the air. Is that Zane anchored down by the octosphere? In answer, a poor imitation of an owl echoed across the dark lawn. James rolled his eyes. You didn't do the countersign, Zane rasped as James and Ralph ran to join him. I hoot, you bray like wolves. We practiced it this afternoon. And I told you then, James whispered, looking about at the empty campus. We're in a time bubble in the middle of a major American city. There aren't any wolves for miles and centuries in every direction. There would have been if you'd have done the countersign, Zane groused. Did you bring the grint? James asked, glancing at the blonde boy. Zane hugged himself, shivering. You mean the standard zombie tool for magically picking locks that any self-respecting zombie carries with him every time he goes out on an evening sneak? That, Grant? No, I left it in your grandma's sock drawer. Silly me. James nodded. All right, then. Looks like the coast is clear. Let's go. Together, the three boys ran along a line of leafless elms, hunkering low and keeping as much in shadow as possible. They skirted the front of the theatre, crossed the mall in front of Administration Hall, and ducked into the warren of footpaths that ran through a block of college student apartments. Finally, his lungs raw from the cold night air, James looked up and saw the gates of the campus cemetery gaping open before him. Tentacles of mist crept like lazy ghosts between the nearest gravestones, beyond which was impenetrable darkness. Why does there have to be so many big willow trees and shrubberies and stuff? Ralph whispered as they tiptoed through the gates. I mean, it's a cemetery, not an edge maze. Blame it on the old groundskeeper, Balpine Bludgeony, James replied, his teeth chattering. He's what you call a traditionalist. Make sure all the gates creak, all the trees are covered with Spanish moss, and the headstones lean just so. Gotta love a guy who takes that kind of pride in his work. The three boys huddled unconsciously together as they followed the winding path through the hills of the cemetery. Shortly, they rounded a curve and found themselves out of sight of the main entrance. Moss-covered statues and obelisks loomed in silhouette out of the misty shadows. Not so much as a breath of wind moved the trees or the ever-present ground mist. I think it's over there, Ralph whispered, pointing up a nearby hill. Can't we light our wands? Zane shook his head. Somebody will see us. Your eyes will get used to the dark soon enough. James led the way up the hill, skirting the leaning headstones. Suddenly, unbidden, he remembered his father's infrequent stories about the last days before the Battle of Hogwarts, when he and Headmaster Dumbledore had broken into a cave where Voldemort had hidden one of his many horcruxes. Specifically, James found himself thinking of the cursed dead that occupied that cave's deep lake, flailing to the surface like beastly gaping fish. In fury, James shuddered and tried not to envision dead white hands scrabbling up out of the ground, clutching at his ankles. He actually found himself hoping for a good old-fashioned ghost just to break the tension. Unfortunately, for whatever reason, 
Alma Aleron apparently didn't have any ghosts. He drew a deep breath and shuddered as he let it out. There it is, Zane nodded, angling towards the crest of the hill. Robits! I can just read it by the light of the moon. Come on! James watched as Zane retrieved a small, complicated tool from a pocket in the recesses of his cloak. The blond boy examined the keyhole beneath the mausoleum's door handle and then peered down to fiddle with the grint. How does it work? Ralph asked, leaning close. It's got a little imp locksmith in it, Zane replied. He sniffs out what sort of lock he's dealing with and pops out whatever tool is best to get it open. Ralph frowned and glanced at James. Is he making that up? You never can tell, can you? James answered, shaking his head. Zane leaned close to the door, squinted into the keyhole, and then pressed an ear to the cold metal, listening. Nobody moving around inside, he said, peering back at James and Ralph. Always a good sign. James was impatient. Can you get it open? No problem, Zane nodded. Nothing special here. Looks like a standard morning rose double-tongue turnbolt. I looked them up this afternoon at the library. It's a basic mortuary homunculus lock. The key is tears. Like one of us has to cry? James asked, blinking. Ralph frowned. How do you cry on command? Maybe you should try it, James. You're the actor, aren't you? I've only ever been in one play, James protested, and it didn't require any waterworks. I don't know how to make myself cry. Ralph's eyes widened with inspiration. You just think about the saddest thing that's ever happened to you, like when your first pet died or something. It's easy. I've never had any pets die yet, James replied. If it's so easy, you do it then. You guys coming in or what? Zane asked, pushing the copper door open. It creaked ponderously, revealing darkness beyond. James boggled. How'd you do that? I just picked it, Zane shrugged, pocketing the grint. I figured that'd be faster than waiting for you to get all misty-eyed. I think I broke the lock a little, but we can fix it on the way out, eh? Let's go. I'll, uh, keep watch, Ralph whispered nervously, backing away. James nodded, sighed, and then followed Zane into the musty darkness of the mausoleum. It was very cold inside, with a low ceiling and a gritty floor that scraped loudly under the boy's feet. Zane raised his wand slowly. Lumas, he whispered harshly. The wand sprang alight, filling the tiny space with its harsh glow. The interior of the mausoleum was completely unmarked. Cobwebs filled the corners, wafting with the boy's movements. The only objects in the cramped space were an old floor brazier with one remaining candle and a low stone shelf, upon which sat the unmistakable shape of a wooden casket. I opened the front door, Zane said in a low voice, eyes wide. Now that we're inside, you can do the honors. James gulped and stepped forwards. The casket was cold to the touch. Slowly, he curled his fingers around the metal handle of the casket's lid and began to lift it. It creaked loudly as it opened, and James wondered for a moment if Balpine Bludgeony had been in here as well, hexing the hinges of the casket so that they made the proper deep groan when opened in the dead of night. James leaned aside and peered into the narrow opening he'd created. A wash of relief flooded over him. It's empty, he breathed. Just darkness. It must be a dummy grave, set up as a hiding place for the— James interrupted himself with a little shriek as Zane stepped forwards, bringing his lit wand with him. The casket wasn't empty after all. The interior had merely been obscured by shadow. A mouldering skeleton lay inside, dressed in an old-fashioned suit with a string tie and a desiccated carnation lying flat in the buttonhole. The skeletal hands were crossed neatly over the thin chest. A gold tooth glimmered in the skull's leering grin. Ugh, James said, nearly dropping the casket's lid. Ugh. Zane shook his head impatiently. It's just a dead body, James. Sheesh, I thought you saw one of these come to life once in the cave of Merlin's cache. James gulped again. That was different somehow. He was just out there in the open, like, you don't think this one's going to, you know, get lively on us? Zane asked, grinning. Nah, not unless you make him really mad, anyway. Let's get on with it.
Like Magnuson said, the Nexus curtain lies within the eyes of robots. Let's take a look already. James pushed the casket lid the rest of the way open, and Zane leaned over the top of it, bringing his wand low. The skull grinned up at the light. A shock of grey hair was still matted onto the skull, combed neatly back from the temples. Nothing in the eye sockets, Zane said, leaning close. Just dust and a few cobwebs. Maybe somebody did beat us to it. The riddle said that the Nexus curtain was within the eyes of Robits, James mused. Maybe it means that it's somewhere where the skeleton could see it. Zane shrugged. Skeletons can't see anything, technically. James ignored Zane and peered at the padded silk of the inside of the casket's lid. He touched it tentatively, feeling around for any hidden shapes. Hey! Zane announced suddenly, leaning low over the casket again. James gasped and bent over the skeleton, following his friend's intense gaze. Zane pointed at the skeleton's left hand. He graduated in 1810. Look! It's right there on his class ring. He was in Aphrodite Heights. Wow! I wouldn't have guessed him for a pixie. James sighed and straightened again. Great. Well, this looks like another dead end. Ha <laughs> ha! Zane grinned, nudging James with his elbow. Let's go. I'm freezing, James said, lowering the casket's lid with another long creak. Maybe there isn't anything to all of this after all. Maybe Magnuson was just playing with Franklin, giving him meaningless hints. Zane shrugged and extinguished his wand. Both boys turned and crept back out into the night. Ralph! Zane rasped loudly, glancing around. Where is he? James asked, peering around as well. I thought he was going to be sitting here under this... He stopped, noticing a dark shape lying flattened on the frosty ground beneath the elm tree. It was Ralph's cloak. Zane saw it too and glanced up at James, his eyes widening. Ralph! James whispered, peering around at the shadowy gravestones. Suddenly, the graveyard seemed to be packed full of hiding places and dark recesses where any number of awful things might be watching, preparing to pounce. Nervously, James rasped. This isn't funny, Ralph! A noise came from behind the nearby elm tree, a heavy thump. Both boys jumped and grabbed at one another. Ralph? Zane asked, his voice quavering. Another thump sounded, closer this time. James and Zane began to back away, peering around for the source of the strange noises. The graveyard sat perfectly still, as if watching them. An owl hooted suddenly, sounding very loud and horribly mournful. James looked about wildly, his hair prickling. Ralph! Zane whispered once more, still gripping James's elbow. Is that you? Suddenly both boys backed into a large, solid object. They stopped, eyes bulging. Slowly, terrified, they turned around and looked up. A very tall... Vaguely human shape loomed over them. The skin of its face was papery, partly rotted away, revealing the mottled skull beneath. Two large bony hands raised slowly into the air, hooked into claws, and a deep, rattling voice emanated from the thing's throat. Get out of my yard, it said menacingly. James and Zane nearly collapsed in terror, scrambling away from the awful figure. Just then, however, another voice spoke up some distance away. That's what he told me at first, too, the voice said, speaking as if through a mouthful of biscuit. James tore his gaze from the figure that loomed over him, seeking the source of the second voice. Ralph stood in the open doorway of another mausoleum, happily munching a large pink sugar cookie. He shrugged. He's really just a big softy named Straithwaite. Says he used to be president of your house, eh? Charles Straithwaite, the zombie introduced himself once the three boys were seated inside his mausoleum. Despite his morbid appearance, the figure's speech had a disarming southern lilt that Zane later claimed was a Charleston, South Carolina accent. Former president of Hermes House, arithmetics professor, retired at your service. You'll have to excuse me for all that creeping and thumping and grumpiness. Comes with the territory, I'm afraid. 
He's the one I told you guys about, Zane enthused happily, accepting a cup of hot coffee from the shambling figure. He's the zombie house president that traveled to the darkest jungles and got himself turned into a real thing. A word of advice, Straithwaite nodded, easing himself into a chair. Never accept any smoking peach potions from a witch doctor whose hunt you've accidentally burned to the ground. Long story. Suffice it to say, here I am, dead, and loving it. I've seen your mausoleum loads of times, Zane said, grinning, but the door was always closed and everything was quiet. We all just assumed that you spent all your time sort of sleeping or something. Like being a real-life zombie was just a big, long, Rip Van Winkle nap, like. If only that were so, the undead teacher lamented. I've had trouble sleeping for the last decade or so. I don't have any trouble getting to sleep, mind, but I wake up early, usually after only three or four months. Age takes its toll. Uh, I do apologize, Straithwaite said, leaning forward and plucking something from the edge of Zane's saucer. Pinky finger, he said, apologetically, holding the digit up. Keeps coming off lately. Maybe you boys would be kind enough to bring me some plumber's putty and tape if you decided to come by again. Ralph nodded. Nice place you have here. I gotta say, I'm surprised. No reason you should be. Straithwaite replied, looking around at the cramped space. It was, indeed, rather nicely laid out, with four upholstered, if slightly mouldy, chairs, a small ornate coffee table, and two kerosene lamps, all arranged upon a threadbare oriental rug. Straithwaite's coffin lay open on its shelf, neatly made like a bed. In the corner nearest the door sat a tiny pot-belly stove, supporting a kettle and a small tin percolator. It was almost unbearably hot inside the stone mausoleum, but none of the boys minded. I dictated exactly how I wished to be interred, Straithwaite went on proudly, including an after-lifetime supply of ice cookies, coffee, tea, and condensed milk. Stuff goes straight through me these days, but I don't mind. Hard to experience indigestion if one no longer sports a stomach. Good riddance, I say. So, who may I ask of the three of you? And what brings you out to my neck of the woods at such an hour? Over the next few minutes, the boys introduced themselves and explained their mission to the patiently decrepit corpse of Professor Straithwaite, describing the attack on the Hall of Archives, Petra's alleged involvement, and their attempts to find the real culprits. Once James had finished relating the disrecorded visions of Professor Magnuson and his two riddles, Straithwaite nodded to himself meaningfully. I remember it well, actually, he said, peering up at the ceiling with his one remaining eye. I was still a student when the Magnuson ruckus occurred. My friends and I, as well as most of the school, were completely maddened by it. It was one thing to break the code of secrecy and torture people, but to kill a defenseless muggle woman, and one as young as Frederica Staples. Straithwaite shook his head slowly. Abominable! Unforgivable! James asked. Did you know her? No, no, Straithwaite admitted. Not until after it was over, when her name appeared in all of the newspapers in both the magical and muggle varieties. After Magnuson's escape, there was a lengthy investigation by the Magical Integration Bureau. Months and months of very ticklish interactions between the muggle and wizarding powers that be. By the end of it, none of us would ever forget that poor woman's name. Or well, that of her murderer, that horrible psychopath, Ignatius Magnuson. Zane sat forward in his chair. So what about this whole robots riddle business? Do you think there's anything to it? Straithwaite let out a rattly sigh and tapped his coffee cup with one bony index finger. I barely knew Professor Magnuson as anything more than a rather feared professor, and then as a famous escaped murderer. But I don't think he'd leave meaningless clues. He was too arrogant for that. Still, I'd have a difficult time believing that poor old Leo Robitz had anything to do with it. He hadn't even died yet when Magnuson disappeared. No, I'm afraid you boys are chasing the proverbial feral waterfowl. James released a disappointed sigh. Now we'll never find out where the Nexus Curtain is, he muttered. Straithwaite perked up a little at that. 
Did you actually think, he said, peering at James, that the Nexus curtain would be found inside the casket of a dead wizard literature teacher? James bristled a little. Well, it's magic, isn't it? It could be anywhere. We were just following the clues. Yes, Straithwaite chuckled dryly. I suppose that is one way to go about it, following clues. Of course, if it were me, I'd follow Magnuson himself instead. How are we going to do that? Zane asked, tilting his head. He's only been vanished for a hundred and fifty years or so. Yeah, Ralph added, and nobody saw where he went anyway. They were all too busy watching his house burn down. It wasn't his house, Straithwaite replied pedantically, raising a skeletal finger. It was the house of John Danforth Roberts, one of the three founders of the school. God rest his soul. And I wouldn't be quite so hasty about who saw what on that particular night. James narrowed his eyes at the moldering professor. What do you mean? I'd imagine it was quite obvious at this point, Straithwaite said, making a rather ghastly smile. I witnessed Magnuson's escape. But, Ralph began, squinting thoughtfully, but Franklin said in the disrecorder vision that nobody saw Magnuson escape. He said they were all too distracted by the fire. Alas, I have my own reasons for keeping my observations a secret, Straithwaite admitted, leaning back in his chair. Not that they'd have done anyone any good, I suspect. Zane asked, Is there a story that goes with that? Not much of one, I'm afraid, Straithwaite sighed. You see, I had recently become enamored with a fetching young lady by the name of Charlotte. She lived in Erebus Mansion and had a delightfully wicked mind. She occupied me for many hours during that autumn, hours that would have been far more responsibly spent on my studies. As a result, I was failing my geography quite disastrously. My teacher, Professor Howard Sternweather, had confronted me about my failing grades, demanding that I not throw my future away for some made-up strumpet, as he called her. He was right, of course, but I was livid. In fury, I abandoned the majography essay I had barely begun, and instead wrote an entirely new essay, consisting of precisely five words, which glowed green on the parchment and read as follows. Dearest Professor Sternweather, get stuffed. Zane hooted with laughter. <laughs> That's excellent. I see why you were present at a zombie house. Straithwaite nodded, smiling despite himself. Yes, well, I might never have achieved such a position if it had not been for the events that followed. You see, I handed the essay in after a night of affronted anger, emboldened by Charlotte herself and not a few dragon meads in the chitin key. Almost instantly, however, I regretted the act. If Sternweather failed me in my geography, the chances were that I would never get accepted to the graduate school, and if I didn't get accepted to the graduate school, I'd never receive my doctorate in advanced arithmetics, which meant I could never become a teacher and grow to be the distinguished and revered undead professor that you see before you now. Thus, I pined for a means to retrieve the essay before it was too late. Unfortunately, Professor Sternweather had already begun great in the essays, I hovered near his office door, peeking in, looking for any opportunities to sneak in and steal back the insulting essay. Sternweather, unfortunately, did not pause for so much as a bathroom break, and I began to fear the worst. Shortly, however, I overheard the brouhaha stewing in the lawn outside. I looked out of the nearby window and saw the crowd gathering saw the flames beginning to lick from the lower windows of Magnuson's residence. I heard about the travesty of Magnuson's crimes, of course, and knew that tensions had been mounting ever since the decision had been made to allow him to maintain his post during the investigation. I immediately ran out to join the mob, as much out of curiosity as malice, although I admit there was some malice in my own thoughts as well. As the night drew in, and the flames grew brighter and hotter, enveloping the unfortunate home of the former John Roberts, I spied, in the milling crowd, the humorless features of Professor Sternweather. He was watching from a distance, his arms folded disapprovingly. 
Perhaps it is a testament to my own sense of self-preservation, but I found myself immediately inspired. At once, I darted away from the flames into the nearby faculty offices. The halls were completely deserted, of course, and I breathed a great sigh of relief as I retrieved my essay, ungraded from the stack on Professor Sternweather's desk. I immediately produced my wand and obliterated the damning parchment. Finding a new parchment in the professor's desk, I quickly scribbled an apology for the fact that my essay would be a day late and promised to accept with good grace whatever penalty he deemed such tardiness deserved. I slipped this back into the stack of essays, and feeling a hundred pounds lighter, I made my way back out into the darkening evening. It was then, as I was skirting the buildings some distance from the conflagration, that I saw him. Professor Magnuson was an unmistakable figure, tall and solid, with stony features and a crown of very short gray hair. I feared for a moment that he had seen me and ducked into the bushes next to the guest house. The professor strode on, however, his gait full of purpose, and I breathed a sigh of relief. I feared him, you see, on that night more than any other. I considered bravery, but only for a moment. I was only a student, of course, and Magnuson was a much-feared wizard, even before he was known to be a torturer and a murderer. Thus, I watched. James was spellbound. Where did he go? Did you see him open the Nexus curtain? Straithwaite shook his head. I did not. The truth is, if indeed Magnuson did escape through the Nexus curtain, then he did not do so immediately. He left the campus first. I watched him. Even heard him, for my hiding place was quite near the warping willow. That is where he went. When he was under its branches, he spoke only one word. A moment later, he vanished. As far as I know, no witch or wizard ever saw him again. There was a moment of tense silence as the boys thought about this. Finally, James said, What was the one word? The word was abitus. Straithwaite answered somberly. It is a symbol spell which conjures an exit to the currently relevant date and time, the now. Magnuson left the campus that night and escaped into Muggle Philadelphia. I know not where he was going, but if all the suspicions about him are true, I have my ideas. You think he was going to the Nexus Curtain? James asked, wide-eyed. You think maybe it wasn't on campus at all? Perhaps, Straithwaite shrugged slowly and then leaned forward. In a rasping whisper, he added, Or perhaps he was going to get the key. The key, Ralph repeated slowly. Like, maybe whatever it was, it was too dangerous for him to keep on campus. Because whatever it was, Zane went on, realization dawning on him, it would be way too magical to leave in his offices. People would sense something that powerful, especially if it came from another dimension. Straithwaite leaned back again, using his index finger to tap the side of where his nose used to be. My thoughts precisely, he concurred, because there is one thing that is for certain. Whatever this alleged pan-dimensional key may have been, Magnuson was not carrying it on his person that night. If so, he'd never have been able to escape unnoticed. He may well have been on his way to the Nexus Curtain, if such a thing truly exists. But if he was, then he was going to retrieve the key first. So, Ralph announced after a meaningful pause, if we can somehow find a way to follow Magnuson, we can find the key. Find the key, Straithwaite mused, and I expect the Nexus Curtain will reveal itself. Zane shook his head. But how do we follow somebody who's been gone for a century and a half? Mercy, young man. You say you remember a zombie house? Straithwaite said, nodding at Zane. I'm surprised you haven't already divined the answer to that question. Give me a second already, Zane replied, piqued. I've only had a minute to think about it. And therein lies the solution, my friend. How's that? James asked, somewhat frustrated. Time is exactly our problem, like a hundred and fifty years' worth of it. Straithwaite sighed wearily. No, boy, 
Tom is your solution. Have you forgotten, he said, leaning slightly forward, his remaining eye twinkling, that this school is, in essence, one gigantic time machine. Shocked, the three boys looked at one another, their eyes widening slowly. In the dark heat of the mausoleum, Straithwaite chuckled hollowly. In the wake of the interview with Charles Straithwaite, James had gotten a vague idea of what they needed to do next. Unfortunately, with the Christmas holiday approaching, bringing with it a wave of midterm examinations, there was very little freedom to plan any time-travelling adventures in pursuit of the long-lost Ignatius Magnuson. Tell me again why exactly you were planning to do this? Rose asked, disapprovingly from the Shard, as James and Ralph practised shield charms for the next day's cursology exam. Pardon me for saying that it all seems a tad complicated and ridiculous. It's simple, Ralph said, his tone of voice implying that he didn't quite understand the plan himself. Whoever broke into the Vault of Destinies stole a crimson thread from some other dimension's version of the loom. Normally, something that massively magical would be easy to track down since it would be sending out waves of power like some kind of siren. For some reason, though, nobody's picked up the slightest trace of it, not even James's dad and the local police. Dane thinks that's because the people that stole the thread used it as a key to open the Nexus curtain and hide it in the world between the worlds, which is sort of like an hub that connects all the dimensions. Right, James agreed. That's the only way the thieves could escape without being traced. We need to follow Magnuson into the past to nick his key to the Nexus curtain. If we can figure out how to get through to the world between the worlds, then we can try to see who really did steal the thread and prove that Petra isn't really involved. And what will you do if this is all bilge and Morganston really is the culprit? Scorpius scowled from his side of the shard. James had prepared himself for such a question. She's not, but even if she is, this is what friends do. She said she's innocent, and we're doing what we can to prove her case. Scorpius narrowed his eyes and smirked slightly. So? You're doing this for friendship, are you? You can't just rush into something like that anyway, Rose interrupted. Time travelling is extremely dangerous business. You could do far more harm than good. James sighed and rolled his eyes. He hadn't wanted to tell Rose and Scorpius about it at all, but Ralph, being his typical self, had been unable to resist telling them all about the midnight conversation with the undead Professor Straithwaite. We know, Rose, James proclaimed, trying to head her off. It's Technomancy 101, all right? Accidentally step on a bug in the past and you change the whole present. Blah, blah, blah. But really, how bad can it be? Ralph commented, sitting down on his bed. I mean, James zapped himself a thousand years into the past and butted heads with Salazar Slytherin. He changed loads of things, but everything still seems just fine here in the present day. Rose shook her head in annoyance. One? she said, stabbing a finger into the air. We don't know that James didn't change the present, since everything we know is based on the history he affected. It may be that there were changes, but they weren't terribly important. Two, she stuck a second finger into the air. Just because James got lucky once doesn't mean the three of you won't mess things up royally this time out. We'll be careful, Rose, James insisted, lowering his wand and turning towards the shard. I know you're jealous because you can't come along with us and all, but that doesn't mean you have to try and scare us out of doing it. That's not it at all, Rose fumed, crossing her arms and flopping back against the sofa in the Gryffindor common room. Next to her, Scorpius grinned a little crookedly, apparently seeing the truth in James's words. I'm smarter than you, Rose went on sulkily. I know how much damage you lot can do, tinkering about with history, and I know that you'll barely think any of this out before you do it. James shook his head. We're plenty smart. We've thought about it loads. Oh, Rose replied, her eyebrow shooting up. Is that so? Well, then I assume you've already realized that there is no point in your attempting anything at all without first knowing what precisely the pan-dimensional key thing actually is. James rolled his eyes dramatically and spread his hands as if to say, Well, duh, of course, we've already figured that much out. But the effect was ruined by Ralph's querulous response. Uh, no, he said, frowning, and James slumped. We just thought we'd travel back to the day when Magnus escaped and try to follow him into Muggle Philadelphia. He'd just lead us to the key, wouldn't he? Nice to know you've given this some serious thought, Rose said wearily. Have you asked yourselves how you'll even recognize the key? 
James looked at Ralph for a moment and then glanced back at the shard. Well, I mean, it's a key. It'll be obvious, uh, won't it? Scorpius spoke up now. It could be anything, Potter. For instance, if your theory is accurate, and I'm not entirely sure that it is, then the real thieves, as you call them, have accessed this nexus curtain using a piece of red thread. Not exactly the most obvious pan-dimensional artifact in the world. Magnuson's key could come in any shape or form. Were you perhaps planning on just walking up to him and saying, Oi, Mr. Murderer, sir, would you be so kind as to give us this dimensional key thing? And never mind that we won't know the difference if you just hand us a chunk of lint that you might happen to have in your pocket. Scorpius smiled smugly at his wit. Well, James began, but couldn't immediately think of anything else to say. He glanced back at Ralph for help. We have another clue, Ralph said, perking up. Something about Erebus Castle. Magnuson said that the secret of the key walked around in the halls of Erebus Castle, or something like that. We just need to ask Lucy to take us on a tour. If we can figure out the riddle, then maybe we'll know what the key is. How hard can it be? James nodded, grinning sheepishly. Scorpius looked meaningfully at Rose as he asked James, Why do you need Lucy's permission to get into Erebus Castle? That's the house of the vampires, Ralph replied. They're totally wiggy about who they let inside to bump about. You have to get a member of Vampire House to chaperone you around the old time. Or you have to be a real-life vampire, James added, rolling his eyes. The president of their house, Professor Remora, says that Erebus Castle is a sanctuary for any fellow wandering children of the night, as if there are any of those in America. Rose looked vaguely disgusted. Did she actually say that? Children of the night? She says loads of stuff like that, James nodded. She's completely batty. Ha ha, Ralph added, nudging James with his elbow. James groaned. As the final days of the autumn semester unwound, James spent most of his time cramming, as Zane called it, for his semi-finals. His fellow Bigfoots were a great help in that endeavour, forming spontaneous study groups in the game room of Apollo Mansion. There, Jasmine Jade, Gobbins, Wentworth, Norrick, Muck Thatch, and anyone else who happened to be in the same classes would produce all of their notes and quiz one another for hours on end all while consuming vast quantities of licorice soda and snacks from the Apollo kitchen. Occasionally, Yates would drift through the room with a trash bag, collecting empty cans, cups, and candy wrappers, all the while muttering insincere apologies through his gritted teeth for interrupting the students' studies. Heckle and Jekyll hung near the cellar refrigerator and called out wrong answers to any quiz questions they overheard. James learned that Heckle, the deer head, answered wrongly on purpose, in the hopes of starting arguments with passers-by. Jekyll, the moose head, however, got the answers wrong because he was, essentially, a moose head. It was thanks to these study sessions, which often lasted well into the night, that James finished his last week of school before the Christmas break with a somewhat giddy sense of confidence. His final test, a three-page practical in precognitive engineering, was possibly the hardest of all. For the two-hour examination period, James and the rest of the students were given three separate divining tools, a small crystal ball, a cup of tea leaves, and a random selection of octocards, and instructed to recount on parchment their predictions, being careful to assure that they were a. accurate, b. measurable, and c. essentially in agreement. This meant, James knew, that the second half of the test, which would occur sometime during the spring semester, would be a rigorous detailing of how the predictions did or did not come true. If this had been Professor Trelawney's class, James would have been less concerned about that second part. Predictions for her class were always expected to be purposely vague and rather comically disastrous. The American precog teacher, however, Professor Ham Thackeray, was a fussy little man with a much different approach to the science of divination, as he called it. He frowned upon disastrous major prophecies, preferring instead smaller, more measurable predictions regarding things like what colour bird might next fly past a specific window, or the number of candies in a box of every flavour beans, or what dishes the cafeteria might choose to serve for dinner on any given evening. As a result, students had taken to spending inordinate amounts of energy attempting to steal advanced copies of the menu from the head cook's desk in Administration Hall. 
James had joined Jasmine Gobbins and Wentworth on one such escapade, and had succeeded in nicking a full menu plan for the entire month of December, right down to dessert options. Unfortunately, they had neglected to realize how far ahead the cook planned. It wasn't until after they made their remarkably detailed class-time predictions that Wentworth had noticed that the menu plan was for December of the following year. Easy enough, Gobbins had proclaimed, flush with inspiration. We just tell Thackeray that our predictions are super advanced and won't come true until next year at this time. Against all probability, the plan had actually worked. Thackeray had placed the students' predictions into a wall safe that he had had installed for just such a purpose, explaining that he would grade the assignments in precisely one year when the predictions could be measured. For now, however, James still had twenty minutes of examination time left. Feeling sleepy and vaguely hungry for lunch, he set the crystal ball aside and reached for the handful of octocards. It was very still in the preco classroom, which was high and dusty, lit by a bank of tall windows that ranged along the left side of the room. The windows were nearly opaque with curls of frost, reducing them to bright blindness. The only noises in the room were the busy scritch of quills on parchment and the occasional frustrated sigh and clunk as students shuffled their divining objects about on their desks. James glanced around. Two desks to his right, Zane leaned over his parchment, writing furiously. The feather end of his quill shook wildly over his shoulder, as if he was systematically choking it by the nib. James sighed quietly and turned over the first octocard on his desk. He looked down at it. The Lady of Mystery. James blinked at the card. For a moment, the face of the dancing, smiling woman on the card had looked familiar. It had looked, in fact, like Petra Morganston. James frowned and leaned over the card. It no longer looked like Petra, and yet it still looked familiar. Now it looked like the strange woman that he had seen in the midnight halls of the Aquapolis and later aboard the Zephyr, shooting hexes out of the windows without any visible wand. Who was she? James's hair suddenly prickled. It was her, he thought. She was the woman that came out of the Hall of Archives right after it was attacked. How could I have forgotten? But who is she? He peered down at the card, concentrating furiously. The woman on the card didn't move, and yet she almost seemed to be smirking up at him. For the first time, James felt a deep sense of dismay about what he'd seen that night. Was it possible that this woman and Petra had really done it? Was the woman somehow controlling Petra? Where had she come from, and what was the source of her power? Was it the same as the mysterious power that Petra herself seemed to demonstrate? In the warmth of the classroom, James shuddered. Slowly, he turned over another card. The Man of Mixed Destinies. James's eyes widened as he stared down at this card. He had never seen it before. Would have sworn, in fact, that there was no such card in a deck of octocards. Worse, however, he thought he recognized the face on this card as well. It was his own. The figure on the card was skinny, dressed in a quaint black suit with tails and an orange tie. Rather unsettlingly, however, the head had two faces, one looking right and smiling, the other looking left and frowning uncertainly. As James watched, the faces seemed to change places, to shift without moving. It made his eyes water, and he blinked. With a shiver, he turned over another card, covering the first two. The Star of Convergence. James had seen this one before, of course, the four-point golden star. He had drawn it once last year in Professor Trelawney's class. Back then it hadn't seemed particularly meaningful. Now the sight of it atop the other two cards made his stomach drop slowly, as if he were standing on a high ledge, swaying perilously. The points of the star were like paths merging together, forming something new and unknowable. He had a strange premonition that he was one of the four points. The strange lady with her enigmatic smile and sourceless magic was another. But who were the other two? Petra, he thought. Of course she's one of them. But that didn't feel exactly right. James leaned low over the star, squinting at it, concentrating. The star almost seemed to pulse, and a dull ringing came with it, blocking out the other faint noises in the room. Petra isn't one of the other two points, 
he now realised, and the sinking sensation in his stomach grew worse, chilling him. Petra isn't one of them. She's both of them. Petra and Morgan. He frowned to himself. That didn't make any sense at all, did it? Petra and Morgan were the same person, like two parts of the same mind, like the Jekyll and Hyde character in Mr. Walker's book. The Morgan side was the part that was influenced by the cursed shred of soul that once belonged to Lord Voldemort. The other part was the Petra that they had always known, smart, honest, inquisitive, and quirky. The good Petra had subdued the Morgan part of her personality once in the Chamber of Secrets and again at Morganston Farm when she had almost, but not quite, sacrificed her own sister to the lake. But what about Petra's mysterious dreams? What did it mean that Petra had been plagued by visions of her sister dying in that very lake? Was the Morgan side of Petra's mind growing more powerful? Was the balance of power tipping? I watch and I wait, the voice of Morgan had said, echoing from the dark tower in Petra's new dream of the strange, ocean-locked plateau. My time is very near. I am the Sorceress Queen. I am the Princess of Chaos. James looked at the last octocard again, the star, four points merging towards the centre like paths meeting, forging a new destiny. The four of us are converging somehow, he thought, and even though it seemed vaguely mad, he knew that it was true. Petra and Morgan, the mysterious lady and me, all leading to something. But is it something good or bad? Is it something that should be stopped? Is it a destiny or a choice? James didn't know the answer to the first part of that question, but the second part was all too clear. Destiny, as Professor Jackson had once said, is merely the name we give to the sum total of all of our life's choices. Was James making the right choices? Were the octocards offering him confirmation of his recent decisions, or a warning? James, a voice said, startling him. He glanced up and saw Professor Thackeray standing in front of him, his hand out. The examination period is over, James. Your test, please. James was shocked. How had the last twenty minutes gone by so quickly? He looked around and saw that the rest of the classroom was empty. Everyone else had finished and headed off to lunch. Uh, sure, Professor, James stammered, glancing guiltily down at his parchment. To his continued surprise, he saw that the last page was covered with his own handwriting. He had no recollection of writing anything at all. With no chance to read his own prediction, he handed the parchment to the professor. Very good, Thackeray said, peering through his glasses at the parchment. Very, uh, thorough. James nodded uncertainly. Thanks, Professor. Feeling shaky and a little spooked, he virtually fled the classroom, following his friends to lunch. Chapter 16 Christmas in Philadelphia on the Friday before Christmas, James, Ralph, Albus, and Lucy made their way to the warping willow, duffel bags slung over their shoulders, and breaths of mist puffing into the frigid air. The first snow of the season had fallen that morning, covering the campus with a blanket of sparkling white, and effectively hiding all of the flagstone paths, so that the four left winding, crisscrossing trails of footprints across the mall. Once they congregated under the tree, Lucy spoke the incantation that James had first heard from the undead Professor Straithwaite's account of the night Ignatius Magnuson had escaped. Abitus, she said, tapping the snow-crusted trunk with her wand. She turned to James as the tree began to move subtly all around them. Professor Remora taught me that. James nodded, not explaining that he had heard it himself from a different professor. Lucy sidled next to him, shoulder to shoulder, and her gloved hands laced fingers with his. James's face reddened a little, and he looked away, watching as the campus became hidden behind the shifting, whip-like branches of the warping willow. The transition to the outside was swifter than that which occurred whenever Professor Baruti took his potion-making class to visit Madame Ayasha in the old Indian city of Shakamaxon. Within a few seconds, a push of wintry air shivered the tree's branches, and James saw the tiny walled courtyard beyond. Snow still frosted the ground, turning the trash-strewn yard into something nearly as magical as the university they had just left. Merry Christmas, friends, 
a deep grating voice said as the four stepped into the dull daylight. Flintlock stood near the gate, his rocky face sculpted into a crooked smile. His diamond eyes sparkled happily. Hey, Flintlock! Albus cried, stepping to pat the rock troll on his huge, rough elbow, which was as high as the boy could reach. Aren't you cold? It feels like about fifty below out here. Cold? the troll repeated slowly. I suppose the temperature's dropped a tiny bit, hasn't it? I'd barely noticed. Barely noticed, Albus scoffed. Last time we saw you, it was the end of summer. I could have fried a flubber worm on your forehead at noon. The troll shrugged, making a sound like boulders rolling on gravel. I have found that you humans are far more affected by tiny shifts in the weather than am I. You may not be aware that I was born in the crucible of the Earth's furnace where lakes of lava wash on beaches of pumice. I remember it only vaguely, but fondly. When the temperature reaches five thousand degrees, then I will comment on the weather, as do you. Albus shook his head. You won't be commenting on it to me, that's for sure. The troll nodded and chuckled. With one languid movement, he reached for the gate. It squeaked noisily as he wrenched it open. A long brown car was waiting next to the curb beyond, a plume of exhaust dancing behind it. The passenger's window powered partly down, and James spied his Uncle Percy in the driver's seat. Come on, you lot, he called. Boots open. Throw your bags back there and pile in. Hello, Lucy dear. Happy Christmas, all of you. Happy Christmas, Dad. Lucy called, finally unlacing her fingers from James's hand as she angled towards the boot of the car. James breathed a sigh of entirely mixed emotions. It was very warm in the car as Uncle Percy navigated the narrow, slushy streets, muttering to himself in irritation at the slowness of the muggle traffic and occasionally tapping the horn, making fussy little bleeps. James took off his stocking cap and stared out the windows, watching the city go by. The drive took rather longer than James had expected, and James recognized vaguely that they were passing through the historical section of the city. He wished that Zane had come along with them for Christmas, if only so he could tell them about the buildings they were passing, his infectious enthusiasm brightening what was otherwise a fairly boring trek. As it was, the blond boy had left school the day before, taking the train back to his parents' house in Kirkwood, Missouri. Before Zane had departed, however, James had finally decided to share with both he and Ralph some of the things that he had thus far kept a secret. He had begun by telling them about the strange prediction that had occurred during his precognitive engineering midterm, when he had envisioned the strange, impending convergence between the mysterious lady, himself, and the twin entities of Petra and Morgan, somehow separate, even though they were both merely parts of the same person. Then, because the two seemed vaguely connected, he described his last encounter with Professor Trelawney in the dawn corridors of Hogwarts, the day when they had begun their journey. Zane and Ralph had listened with wide eyes, obviously understanding the significance of such a haunting prophecy coming from the lips of the otherwise comical old professor. Finally, James had reminded them of what had happened on the stern of the Gwyndemere when he had miraculously conjured the shining silver thread that had saved Petra's life. He explained that the thread was still there, still somehow connecting him to her, and that that was how he knew she could be trusted. I can see her dreams and feel her thoughts sometimes, it said, although he hadn't told them about the written dream, the one that had conjured the frightening vision of the Nightmare Island and the Black Castle before vanishing entirely. He had vowed to Petra not to tell anyone about the dream story, and he meant to keep that promise. I know that she's telling the truth about not being involved with the attack on the Vault of Destinies. No matter what we saw on the night, it couldn't have been her, because when she says she wasn't there, I can sense that she's telling the truth. I don't think she could lie to me even if she wanted to. James didn't really know if this was true or not, but he did know that she sincerely believed that she was innocent. This was what he had most wanted to impress upon Zane and Ralph, since their belief in that fact was going to be essential to the success of their attempts to clear her name. 
We'll work it all out after the Christmas break, Zane had said eagerly. You spend some time working on your cousin Lucy. After all, Rose is right. If we don't know what the dimensional key is, we won't recognize it when we follow Magnuson into the past. Lucy's all googly-eyed for you, so it should be no problem to convince her to let us scour Erebus Castle for clues. James's cheeks had heated a bit at that. She's not googly-eyed for me. She's my cousin, if you remember. Have you taken a good look at her lately? Zane had asked, cocking his head and pointing at his face. Not much of a family resemblance. I guess the only blood you share is the blood pudding you all put away last Weasley family picnic. Shut up, James had protested. You're daft. Ralph had shrugged with one shoulder. I think he's right, James. Even Rose and Scorpius say so. Rose says Lucy's been sweet on you ever since last year. James hadn't been able to argue it any further. He knew that it was true, as uncomfortable as it made him. He was, however, a little rankled about the fact that he had been, apparently, the last person to find out about it. He couldn't quite bring himself to manipulate Lucy's feelings for him, whatever they were, to get a tour of Erebus Castle. But maybe, if he just asked nicely, that would be enough. After all, she was his cousin. They'd always got on very well, which was more than he could say for some of his other cousins, particularly Louis. Why would Lucy say no? Silently, James cursed himself for having asked Lucy to go to the Halloween ball with him. Why hadn't Zane and Ralph warned him, since they had all apparently known and how Lucy felt about him? We're almost there, Lucy said from the front seat of the car, turning to smile back at James. We'll all be staying over at your parents' flat for Christmas Eve. Wouldn't that be fun? James nodded and forced a smile. Sure, Lou. Next to him, Albus began making obnoxious kissing noises. James shoved him hard enough to knock his hat off. Uncle Percy parked the car in an underground parking structure and led the troop to the silvery doors of a large elevator. Muggle condominiums, he said disdainfully, pressing the up button. Refitted for magical occupancy, thankfully, at least on the thirteenth floor. The doors swooped open and the group clambered inside. There was no thirteen on the bank of lit buttons, but Percy didn't seem to mind. Producing his wand, he tapped the buttons for floor number one and floor number three. Immediately, the doors shuttled closed again, and the elevator lurched, rocketing upwards much faster than any elevator James had ever ridden before. His feet left the floor for a split second as the lift shuddered to a sudden stop. Here we are, Percy said briskly, watching as the doors socked open once more. James had expected a hallway, but the lift apparently opened directly onto his parents' flat. It was quite large and open, with high ceilings, heavy decorative woodwork, and a rather baroque chandelier hanging over the entryway. From the perspective of the open elevator, the living spaces all seemed to run together, forming an airy blend of kitchen, dining room, and parlour. James's sister Lily was seated at the dining room table across from Izzy, a collection of half-decorated sugar cookies and coloured icing spread between them. They're here, Lily called, looking up and grinning. Behind James, Percy sighed. Being head aura, he muttered, stepping into the high foyer, certainly has its perks. Shortly after their arrival, Uncle Percy left again, meaning to pick up Molly at the nearby magical elementary school and then collect Audrey at their flat. Ralph joined Lily and Izzy in icing duties, using his wand to recolor the icings with stripes, sparkles, and the occasional flashing Rudolph red. Izzy laughed out loud, which was not the sort of thing girls often did around Ralph. He appeared quite pleased with himself, and James was glad. Lucy and Albus went upstairs to explore the bedrooms and stake out the best beds for themselves, while James climbed onto a stool near the kitchen and pulled a plate of tiny mincemeat pies towards himself. Your father's still at work, Ginny, James's mum said, with a hint of worry in her voice. She was in the kitchen, cooking madly, as she was wont to do whenever she was fretting. Back at Marble Arch, Albus had had a pet name for their mum whenever she got like this. Look out, he'd say, usually slamming the bedroom door behind him. Hurricane Ginny's on the rampage. Tie everything down before she blows in here and gives it a good cleaning. That's an awful lot of puddings, James commented, peering over the countertop. Expecting the Harriers for dinner, are we? Ginny sighed and dusted her hands on her apron. She took a moment to look around at the crowded countertops. You know, she replied, 
Whenever Christmas comes around, I seem to forget that I'm not still a kid living at the burrow, with Mum and me downstairs baking everything under the sun, and my brothers eating it all up nearly as fast as we pull it out of the oven. Some habits are hard to break. James wished that they were having Christmas at the burrow like they normally did. He asked, Will we see Grandma and Uncle Ron and Aunt Hermione and everybody? We'll probably talk to them by flu, Ginny answered, using her wand to stop a huge wooden spoon from stirring a bowl of dough. But not until tomorrow after breakfast. It's always so difficult to remember the time change and all. We're lucky we're connected to the International Flu Network at all. If it wasn't necessary for your father's work... Her voice trailed away, distracted. She pulled the refrigerator door open so quickly that the milk bottles rattled, and then stood staring into it as if she'd forgotten what she was looking for. Where is Dad, anyway? James asked, frowning. And Petra, too. Ginny let the refrigerator door swing closed again and looked at James, her face tense. He's working, she said, and then drew a brisk sigh. I haven't told your brother or sister this, James, so if you breathe a word about it to them, I swear I'll blend cockroaches into your eggnog. If I don't tell someone, though, I think I'll burst. The fact is, your father's on a raid. Ah. James said, nodding, and you're worried about him. Nonsense, she lied unconvincingly. Your father can take care of himself. With any luck, he'll be home within the hour. It's a big night for him, if all goes well. Who's he raiding? James asked in a low, eager voice. Did he track down those WULF nutters? Shh! Ginny rasped sharply, and then visibly calmed herself. Sorry, yes. She came over to meet James at the little breakfast bar. I'm so nervous lately. Those magical integration bureau men were bad enough, lurking in their black cars on the corner, watching our windows, following your father around when he so much as goes to the store for milk and bread. Now there are people from the American Legal Administration as well, hovering around like bats in their black cloaks and hats. They're worse, since you never know where they are. If tonight goes well for your father, though... What did he find? James prodded, eyes wide. Did he track down the people who attacked us on the train? Ginny shook her head, more in wonderment than negation. It's huge, she whispered. This Wizards United Liberation Movement. It wasn't just the attack on the Zephyr. They were the ones who hired those pirates to waylay us during our voyage. They've been dead set against us being here at all, and for good reason. Titus Hardcastle and your father have been tracking them for months, even calling in some favours with Draco Malfoy at Gringotts. I'm amazed that Draco helped at all, considering how much trouble he could get into if his goblin bosses found out. There's financial support going into the WULF from all over the world. But the base is right here in the United States. Titus and your father followed the money and finally found the organization's underground headquarters. A group of American wizarding police are helping your father right now. With any luck, they've already descended on the place and rounded up the ringleaders. Wow! James breathed, impressed. I wish I could see it. Ginny shuddered. Ugh, not me. I can barely stand to think of it. All those awful people, and your father right in the middle of them. Dad can take care of himself, James grinned, mimicking his mother's words. Remember? Nobody out auras him. Those WULF gits will be spending Christmas in Azkaban. Ginny nodded. I'm sure you're right, but I doubt they'd send them back home for that. They'll do their time here in the States. I can only hope that they find that poor muggle senator and rescue him. Who knows what they've filled his head with by now, assuming he's... uh still alive, James suggested. Don't talk that way. His mum shuddered again. Go and say hello to Petra, why don't you? She's up in her room, first door on the right. James nodded and dropped lightly from his stool. Tramping up the stairs, he heard Albus and Lucy talking nearby, their voices echoing in the hall. The second door on the right was cracked open, but the room beyond was dark. James knocked lightly on the door. Hey, Petra, he called softly not wishing to wake her if she was napping. Happy Christmas. Come downstairs and help me eat some of these desserts, eh? The door creaked open a little at James's knock. He peered inside with one eye. In the dimness, he could see two narrow beds and a dresser. One of the beds was rumpled, the pillows humped together haphazardly. Petra? James called again, pushing the door further open. The room was empty, although the bed certainly appeared to have been recently occupied. He frowned into the room, and then turned and retreated back into the hall. 
He followed Albus and Lucy's voices until he found them in a bedroom near the end, kneeling on the floor next to a pile of wrapped presents. Oh, Albus said, glancing up at James and lowering his brow. It's just you. We thought Mum was on to us. James frowned, watching as his brother trained his wand on one of the larger presents. What are you doing? What's it look like? Albus replied. Getting a pixie. Hang back if you don't want to know whether you're getting a new scrim or a box of underpants. James shook his head. Have either of you seen Petri yet? Lucy glanced up. No, she said, tilting her head. Why? Just wondering. I thought I'd say hello, that's all. Lucy shrugged and shook her head, her eyes still on James. All right, he replied. Whatever. Carry on, then. Don't tell Mum, Albus warned as James turned away. I'll hex you good if you do. On the way down the hall, James peered into Petra and Izzy's bedroom again. It was still dark and empty, although the rumpled bed gave the strangest impression that someone had been lying on it only moments before. James shook his head again and tromped back down the stairs. Dinner came and went, and James's dad still had not arrived home. The rest of the adults tried to maintain a festive atmosphere, but James sensed that there was a lot of tension in the air. Audrey and Percy sat near the fireplace and roasted chestnuts, while Ginny and Deniston Dolohoff cleaned up the kitchen, talking idly in low voices. Petra had not shown up for dinner at all, which James thought was a little odd. She's begun keeping rather strange hours ever since the debacle with that Mr. Henryden, Ginny had admitted to James. I think she's worried and afraid, poor thing. I can't blame her. A new country, and all of a sudden she's in legal trouble, all over a case of mistaken identity. I mean, I feel bad for the poor man who was attacked, but to accuse a teenaged girl of such a thing. But, James said, furrowing his brow, she wasn't upstairs when I went to say hi to her. Her room was empty. Ginny shrugged. She was probably in the loo, silly. James frowned. He was almost certain that the bathroom had been empty as well when he passed it, but he didn't press the issue. Shortly thereafter, Petra had, in fact, come down the stairs, smiling sleepily and greeting everyone. Hi, James, she said, coming to join him on the couch. Sorry, I was napping. I've been doing that a lot lately. I think it's for lack of anything better to do. James blinked at her, perplexed. You— he began, but stopped himself. He shook his head slightly. Never mind. How have you been? All right, she replied, looking towards the fire. Reading, mostly. Professor Baruti comes by in the evening sometimes, and helps me with my French. He's very kind, and understanding about all of this. James thought for a moment. Finally, in a quiet voice, he said, I think we've come up with a way to clear your name, Petra. She turned back to him, frowning slightly. How? James wobbled his head back and forth, unsure how much to say. It's complicated, but Zane and Ralph are helping. I think we might be onto something. If it works out, we'll find the people who really did attack the Vault of Destinies and steal the Crimson Thread. Then you'll be in the clear. To James's surprise, Petra was looking at him doubtfully. Are you sure that's a good idea, James? I mean, it sounds... She paused, as if choosing her words very carefully. Er, uh, dangerous. Maybe, James admitted, but it's worth it, isn't it? I mean, Petra, you're in really serious trouble here. If that arbiter Keen says you're guilty of attacking the vault and freezing Mr. Henryden, you could go to prison for a long, long time. If there's something I can do to stop that from happening... Petra smiled at James as if he was rather silly. I won't go to prison, James. Izzy and I will be fine. We've been through worse scrapes. You have? James frowned incredulously. Petra. That Keynes idiot was serious. Mum says there are more of his kind floating around the streets outside, keeping an eye on the flat, making sure you don't make a break for it or something. You can't just blow this off. Izzy needs you, and so do, uh, other people. If you get sent to wizarding prison... Petra sighed deeply. I'm not blowing it off, James. I just... I can't worry about that. Not now. There are other things. More important things. Petra, James exclaimed, exasperated, what's more important than being accused of attempted murder and the theft of some crazy dimensional artifact? In answer, Petra looked at James and smiled a little crookedly. You tell me, James. We're still connected, aren't we? That silver cord you conjured? It's still there even now. Don't you feel it? James glanced down at his right hand. He opened it, palm up on his lap. He could 
feel the cord now that she had mentioned it. He could even, although it might have been his imagination, see it very faintly. No, he lied. I think it's faded away now. I can't see your dreams any more. Petra held up her own hand. James looked at it in the light of the fireplace. You can't lie to me, James, even if you want to, Petra said, her voice low, amused. Slowly she lowered her own hand onto his. When they touched, James felt a small burst of mingled heat and cold. It spread up his arm, making him shiver, and yet he didn't pull his hand away. Underneath the thrumming energy of the magical cord, he could feel the prosaic thrill of Petra's hand resting upon his, her fingers cool and slender, curling around the heel of his palm. He looked up at her, speechless. The cord is still there, she said very quietly. It connects us, probably forever, because you were willing to die for me. I know that now, James, but instead of making a trade, your life for mine, like the laws of deep magic demand, you tapped into something even deeper, something beyond normal magic. Do you know what that is? James hadn't really considered it, not since that night on the stern of the Gwyndamere, but now, looking into Petra's eyes, he thought he did know the answer after all. He nodded. It came from you somehow, he said, not a little awe in his voice. I tapped into your power, the same power you used to reconnect the anchor chain to the ship without even using your wand, the power you almost used on Keynes when he was trying to separate you and Izzy that day in Administration Hall. Petra nodded, her face solemn. You tapped into my power, yes. I don't know how. Maybe because of how you feel for me, and because of what we've been through together, and maybe even just because of the intensity of the moment. You were willing to trade your life for mine, but the magic was bigger than that. The magic saved both of us. But, James, things like that don't happen without a price. I fear that some day— She shook her head and looked away again, towards the flickering flames of the fireplace. Some day you might regret it. James was shocked. No way, he whispered harshly, noticing the look his Aunt Audrey was giving them from across the room. He lowered his voice again and went on. Petra, that's crazy. I'd do it again right now. And I'd do whatever I can to find the people who really did curse Miss Endreden, so you can be free again. But Petra... He stopped and knitted his brow. Barely whispering, he went on. How can all of this be? What makes you so powerful all of a sudden? Petra drew a long, deep breath, thinking. Finally, she met his eyes again. I've always had that power, she admitted. I didn't understand it, and neither did anyone else, especially my grandparents. They were afraid of me because my magic was so much greater than theirs. They didn't believe I would know how to use it, that I would grow up to be something terrible and cruel, but their fear shamed me. As a result, I trained myself not to use my powers. I taught myself to use a wand instead of just my hands. My wand was like a funnel, making the magic smaller, weaker, more like everyone else's. Eventually, by the time you first met me, I'd become so used to the wand that I'd forgotten what it was like to work magic without it. James's brow was still furrowed as he listened to her, but she was looking past him now, her eyes unfocused, her hand still on his. Now, though, both of my grandparents are dead, she said faintly. There's no reason to hide any more. I broke my wand on my last night at Papa Warren's farm. I didn't do it on purpose. I just let it feel the full weight of my powers. It broke right down the middle, split as if it had been struck by lightning, just like my very first wand when I was a little girl and hadn't yet learned how to rein it in. Now I don't need a wand. Now I'm learning to use the power the way I was meant to. That's what you tapped into, James, she said, focusing on him again. For better or worse, you locked us together. When you conjured this silver cord, you bound us, maybe forever, soul to soul. And that, James, you may well some day regret. Some day you may curse yourself for it, and me too. James's thoughts swam as he looked at the slight girl next to him. It all sounded perfectly daft to him, and yet he could sense the honesty of her words. She believed everything she said. If she hadn't been touching him, her hand on his, making the silver cord pulse like a dynamo, he might have been able to doubt her. Now, however, tiny shreds of memories came into his head, directly from Petra's own thoughts. 
He saw her as a young girl, closing a set of window drapes with a wave of her small hand. Another memory showed her in a sunlit wood, moving rocks through the air with a pointing finger, forming them into carefully constructed, mysteriously sad towers. Finally, he saw her as a ten-year-old girl, standing frightened in the darkness of a cellar, several rats lying dead at her feet. She had thought the rats to death, merely sending her mind into their little beating hearts and squeezing them, bursting the little organs like balloons. She had hated the rats and feared them, but lying there, dead at her feet, their feet curled and their black eyes staring like drops of oil, Petra felt terrible about what she had done. She tried to think them back to life, but that was where her powers, her prodigious, mysterious powers, ended. She could kill, but she could not return to life. Young Petra cried in the darkness of the cellar, cried for the rats that she had first feared, and then, when it was too late, pitied. She cried for her own lost innocence. She was, after all, a rat murderer. And then, buried beneath all of these secret visions, curling under and through them like a snake, was a memory of a woman's voice crying out with terror and a sort of mad, vindictive spite. I always knew you'd be the death of me, you horrible girl, the voice screeched, and I was right! I was right! James shook himself. Involuntarily, he pulled his hand away from Petra's. The visions and the mad screeching voice stopped at once. Petra blinked at him, and then sheepishly she pulled her own hand back. Petra, James whispered, how is this possible? What, what kind of witch are you? Petra sighed once more and shook her head. I'm not a witch, James. In the warmth of the room, James felt suddenly cold. He remembered the vision of the black castle and the strange dead island. Like the visions he had seen when Petra had touched him only moments before, that had also been a peek into Petra's dreams and thoughts, and in that vision the Morgan part of Petra's mind, somehow separate and imprisoned, had spoken aloud. I am the Princess of Chaos, she had said. I am the Sorceress Queen, the Sorceress Queen. James opened his mouth, not sure what he was about to say, when Lily, Molly, and Izzy suddenly ran past, their feet thumping wildly, their voices giggling like a flock of birds. Tag, Izzy said, tapping James on the shoulder. You're it! With a flurry of screams and laughter, the three girls scurried away. James watched them and then turned back to Petra. You're it, she smiled, shrugging one shoulder. We'd better go get them. Petra, James began, but she shook her head. No more for now, James, she said, and James could sense that she meant it. Besides, I think they just ran into your father's study. You'd best herd them back out before they disturb any of his things. James could barely bring himself to interrupt his hushed conversation with Petra, especially when he felt so close to such an important revelation, but he didn't seem to have any choice. Petra had already turned away, standing and moving towards the fire. With a great sigh, James stood as well. All right, you lot, he began as he entered the study door. You know you're not supposed to be in here, especially you, Lil. He was drowned out by a cacophony of giggles and shrieks as all three of the girls scrambled from behind chairs and under tables. They rushed past him, obviously hoping that he meant to chase them. James shook his head in weary annoyance, marvelling at how his sister seemed to play down to the level of the youngest child in her presence, and then looked around the study to ensure that nothing had been disturbed. The room was rather like a small library, crowded with chairs, end tables, and lamps. The far end was dominated by a large desk and a leather swivel chair with a very high back. The chair was about as un-Harry Potter as anything James had ever seen. Its high pointed shoulders were adorned with silver rivets, making it look, on the whole, like something that belonged in the basement of Erebus Mansion. Obviously the flat had already come furnished. James knew that his father would never pick out such a thing for himself. Moving towards the desk, James reached over it and gave the chair a tentative push. It turned silently, revolving somewhat malevolently on its oiled base. Behind the chair, propped on a low shelf below the window, was the small shard of the Amsera Serf that Merlin had given his dad. Its face was silvery with rushing smoke, unfocused. 
James knew that it connected, when magically empowered, to the aura offices back at the Ministry of Magic. Using the shard, his father kept in close contact with Titus Hardcastle and the other auras. Below the shard, in the shadow of the shelf, was a gleaming iron lockbox. James's eyes widened. This, he knew, was the lockbox that his father had taken to keeping his invisibility cloak and Marauder's map in ever since last year when they had been stolen out of his trunk by Scorpius Malfoy. James moved quickly around the desk, his curiosity getting the better of him. Stopping the huge leather chair from turning, he sat down on it facing the window. He tapped the lockbox with his wand. Aloha Mora, he whispered quickly. There was a flash of golden light, and for a moment James thought that his basic unlocking spell had worked. The flash didn't diminish, however. It spun around the lockbox as if repelled from the iron shape. Finally, with a crackle of magical energy, the bolt spat back at James, striking him in the chest and shoving both him and the chair backwards. The chair rammed against the desk, producing a rattling thud. James shook himself, alarmed, and quickly rammed his wand back in his pocket, scrambling to get up. He should have known that his father's counterspells would repel anything that he, James, might use to open the lockbox. There were footsteps just outside the study. A shadow moved on the partially open door. Without thinking, James dropped back onto the huge desk chair. The chair began to spin again, and he clubbed his feet to the floor, halting its movement. He stared furiously out the darkened window in front of him and held his breath. The door swept open behind him, and James realized, with some amusement, that he could see the entire room reflected in the high study window. The shape of the batwing chair blocked out a lot of the reflection, of course, but he could see the top of the door and indistinct shadows on the nearby bookshelves as someone entered the room, leaving the door wide open behind them. What would Dumbledore say? the figure mumbled quietly, and James realized with a mixture of relief and trepidation that it was his father. Harry Potter had finally returned from his raid. He sighed quietly to himself. Think, Potter, what would Dumbledore say? Or even Snape? And then in a louder voice, In here, gentlemen! Close the door behind you, if you would! Slowly James hunkered lower in the black chair, keeping his feet planted firmly on the floor to prevent it from swiveling around and revealing him. More footsteps approached, and in the window's reflection James saw two more men enter the room. They wore the black suits and ties of the Magical Integration Bureau. I thought it best, Harry said, moving towards his desk and leaning on it, facing the men, that we debrief immediately. Thank you for coming inside. We wouldn't have it any other way, one of the men said stiffly. The image in the window's reflection was somewhat distorted, but James recognized the man. He was the one they had first met outside the Zephyr after the crushing attack along the streets of Muggle New York. His name, James recalled, was Price. Well then, Harry began briskly, it seems that our information was accurate enough. This is one good thing we can take from this evening's exercise. The WULF is on the run. We can expect that they will be much clumsier now, having been routed from their headquarters. And this seems like a good thing to you? Price said evenly. I don't know about you, but I'd rather stamp out the whole nest of spiders at once than try to chase them one by one into the shadows, wouldn't you, Espinosa? I sure wouldn't call tonight a win for the good guys, Espinosa replied coolly. They know we're onto them now. They'll be watching for us. No more element of surprise. We have eyes all over the city, Harry said. Now that Tarantus's agents are on the run, we will surely sense their movements. If we have to track them down one by one, then that's how we will do it. It wouldn't be the first time the Department of Auras disassembled a network of dark wizards one brick at a time. Espinosa commented, Would have been a lot easier if we'd have been able to take Tyrandus alive. Sure would, Price nodded, and James could see that he was watching Harry closely. I don't suppose you magical types have the ability to extract information from the dead, do you? No? That's a shame. And here we muggles all thought you were so much more advanced than that. Necromancy is a forbidden art, Harry replied. Not that it was ever particularly accurate, even for those who excelled at it. Pretty convenient, Price countered. Tyrandus being found murdered in his recently abandoned headquarters, and us not being able to interview the deceased to find out where his people might have escaped to, or what their plans were. 
No sign of the missing senator, either, Espinosa added reasonably. Very convenient. Convenient for whom, exactly, Harry said, and James heard the barely restrained anger in his voice. Since I've been spearheading the international search for these villains, I can say that the lack of any prominent leads and the apparent murder of their leader is decidedly inconvenient. I had very high hopes that this whole mess would be concluded tonight, as you well know. So you keep saying, Price countered, and yet there is no question that somebody alerted the WULF to our raid only minutes before our arrival, giving them just enough time to escape, not to mention the very damning fact that your name, Mr. Potter, was scrawled on the wall with the victim's own blood. A warning, Harry said stonily. They want me gone, precisely because we are this close to capturing them. They've been attempting to thwart our attempts ever since they hired a fleet of pirates to sink us on the journey here. Tarantus himself led the attack on the train and personally delivered the warning, telling us to leave immediately or face the consequences. And now Tarantus is lying cold in a wizarding morgue in downtown New Amsterdam, Espinosa nodded. I mean, it could be that the name written in blood on the wall was a warning that you should give up and run home, Mr. Potter, but we cannot rule out that it might, in fact, have been the victim's way of identifying his killer. That's ridiculous, Mr. Espinosa, if you'll pardon me for being blunt, Harry said coldly. Even apart from the fact that I was with you at the time the man was killed, I've seen killing curses in action in my time. The curse that ended Tarantus's life was not only brutal, it was instantaneous. He wasn't just killed. He was destroyed. I promise you, there were no final moments during which the man could have scrawled the name of his murderer on the wall in his own blood. Tarantus was dead before he hit the floor, and somebody else wrote my name on the wall with his blood. Espinosa asked, And why would the WULF have murdered their own leader only moments before their escape from our raid? Perhaps for being sloppy, Harry suggested curtly. After all, it was his own paper trail that led us to him. Organizations like the WULF do not easily forgive such ineptitude. Could be, Price agreed reluctantly. Then again, it could be that Tyrannus was getting ready to talk. Maybe he was getting cold feet about the organization's tactics and was planning on telling us everything he knew. Maybe someone else decided he was a threat and planned to overthrow him as a leader. They'd have no choice but to kill him, of course. Whoever tipped him off about the impending raid seems likely to me that that's the same person who's probably in charge now. What do you think, Espinosa? Just makes sense, Espinosa agreed. Find the snitch, find the murderer, find the murderer, find the new head of the WULF. And you think that person is me, Harry said with a sigh. Price shook his head. We're paid to be suspicious, Mr. Potter. Don't take offense. If we had any actual evidence of your involvement, then we wouldn't be standing here in your study having this little chat. But I'll be honest with you. There's loads of circumstantial evidence piling up against you. The bloody name on the wall doesn't help. Harry's voice was no longer restrained. That's insane, he proclaimed darkly. Lot of things are insane, Mr. Potter, Price agreed. Wanting to maintain power over non-magical people by not sharing your world with them, that seems a little insane to some of us. Conjuring up shadowy villains like the WULF to scare your own people into living by outdated laws of secrecy, that also seems pretty insane. Of course, all of this is just conjecture at this point, I admit. But if it ever stops being conjecture, well... The WULF is not a creation of the Department of Auras, Harry said with cold emphasis. Has it even begun to occur to you that it might have been one of your men who tipped them off about the impending raid? Frankly, if the Wizards United Liberation Front believes what they claim, then your own people are much more sympathetic with them than is the Department of Auras. Really, Mr. Potter, Price chided, that's a little childish, isn't it? You perceive that we are accusing you, so you accuse us in response. I expect it better from you. Someone alerted them that we were coming, Harry insisted. On my side, the only people who knew about the raid were Titus Hardcastle and myself. And we have your word for that only, Price said, affecting an apologetic tone of voice. Be reasonable, Mr. Potter. You mean to say that you didn't tell anyone else at the Ministry of Magic, or even your wife and family? 
I mean to tell you that those on my side who knew about today's raid, Harry growled, are people who I trust completely. Members of our raiding party, including myself, might have got killed today had the WULF chosen to ambush us instead of run. Why would my own people have risked that? If your people and the WULF are one and the same, Espinosa suggested, then it wouldn't be a risk at all, would it? Harry drew a deep breath, composing himself. Gentlemen, if this is where we stand, then I fail to see how we can continue to work together. Either arrest me for conspiracy, or let me and my associates work alone. Now, let's not get huffy, Harry, Price said, softening his tone and raising his hands in a conciliatory gesture. Espinosa and I are just doing our jobs. The task of the Magical Integration Bureau is to protect the interactions between the magical and the non-magical world, and to see that the two coexist with as much harmony as possible. Your people have chosen to hide yourselves and live among us in secrecy, which has always struck the Bureau as suspicious on the very surface of it. You can't blame us for approaching our duties with a degree of healthy skepticism, can you? Look, if you're innocent, then you have nothing to fear from our involvement. If you're guilty, then of course we can't just allow you to operate without our supervision. Either way, Harry, you're stuck with us. Let's try to make that fact as pleasant as possible, eh? There was a long pause as Harry appeared to consider this. In the window reflection, James could see Price standing to the side, his face stony, waiting. Across from him, Espinosa looked vaguely bored. He stared up at the dark ceiling, eyebrows raised inscrutably. So be it, Harry finally said. But if I suspect that your notions of mistrust are undermining our investigations, or worse, placing us all in danger, then be assured that I will abandon this mission regardless of the consequences. Is that understood? Duly noted, Price said with a smile. I'm glad that we can all dispense with any pretenses. Everything all out in the open. That's the way I like it. Right, Espinosa? Right you are, Price, the other man agreed soberly. I assume you can find the door on your own. Harry replied. Merry Christmas, gentlemen, and good night. James heard shuffling footsteps and saw the door's reflection as it opened again. A few moments later, the elevator doors dinged from down the hall. Price and Espinosa, apparently, were on their way down to the parking garage. Without turning the chair around, James asked quietly, You know I'm here, don't you? Harry, still leaning against the front of the desk, chuckled dryly. I never leave my chair facing the window. I figured it was either you or Albus. Frankly, I was betting on the latter. Nice counterspell on the lockbox, James said, swiveling the chair to face his father. I wasn't trying to nick the cloak and map, you know. I was just checking on them. Harry nodded, looking back at his son over his shoulder. With a sigh, he turned around and plopped onto one of the visitor's chairs. So what do you think, James? he asked. Is this whole investigation a lost cause? Why would they think that you were involved with the same bad guys that you're trying to catch? James exclaimed incredulously. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. It makes sense from their viewpoint, Harry said sadly. You were at Neville's assembly, so you heard how a lot of people around here think. Many of them truly believe that the Ministry of Magic would indeed stoop to creating shadow villains, from Voldemort to the WULF, just to keep the magical world under their thumb. If that was true then it would make perfect sense that I'd be in on it, and might even be one of the masterminds of the scheme. That's what Ralph said too, James acknowledged reluctantly, but none of it's true. How can they believe such a bunch of drivel? Harry frowned thoughtfully. Once you abandon the concept of truth, James, everything becomes merely a matter of perspective. For the progressive element, there is no right or wrong. There are only sides. When one of those sides defeats another, they don't see it as a triumph of good over evil or evil over good. They view it merely as one side exerting unfair power over the other. Without truth, without belief in right and wrong, the best one can hope for in life is a sort of lukewarm concept of fairness, where both sides in any fight simply choose to live and let live. They think that what we call good should just learn to tolerate what we call evil since good and evil are really just equally valid philosophies of life. But, James began, screwing up his face in an effort to understand, but that's obviously crazy. This isn't like disagreeing over whether flying carpet should be legal or not, 
Voldemort was a bloodthirsty villain who killed people just for the sake of his own power. Stopping him was the only way to save countless other lives, wasn't it? Not according to the progressive element, Harry replied, shaking his head. They think that if only we'd stopped fighting him, laid down our weapons, and given him his right to live the way he wanted to, then we'd all have just lived in peace somehow. James considered this for a moment, his eyes narrowed, and then shrugged. But then he'd just have killed every last one of you. Harry nodded. Probably. Voldemort wasn't a live-and-let-live sort of wizard, especially considering the prophecy. One of us had to die for the other to survive. But really, prophecy or not, that's how it is in every corner of the world, in every struggle between evil and good, between power and love. The two can't compromise because they cancel each other out. There will always be a struggle between them until one prevails over the other. There is no alternative. So, all these progressive element types are complete nutters, then, James said, throwing up his hands. Not all of them. Harry replied with a sigh. They are right that a lot of awful things have been done throughout the ages in the name of good. Merlin himself tells of battles that occurred between the magical and non-magical peoples of his day, not over right and wrong as they pretended to be, but over mere prejudice and fear, intolerance and hatred. These are the things we must always be wary of at all costs, and yet to deny that some struggles are indeed worthy of the fight that evil and good are always alive and in enmity against one another, like fire and water, is to turn a pragmatic truth into a dangerous delusion. This, James, is what the progressive element is guilty of. Most of them are not bad, and most of them are very well-meaning, but that does not mean that their philosophy is not, in the end, thoroughly deadly. James thought on this for a long moment. Finally, he asked, So, who do you think ratted you all out? Harry shook his head again, his face growing dark. I don't know. Hardly anyone knew about the raid. But I suspect that Espinosa and Price are right. Whoever warned them about us also killed their leader, Tarantus, and left his body for us to find. The WULF has a new leader now, someone who may well know a lot more about us and how we plan to stop them than Tarantus ever did. I suspect that the first order of business is to find out who that person is. Then, perhaps, we will know how to proceed. But who could it have been, Dad? James asked earnestly, leaning forwards over the desk. I mean, Mum knew, and maybe Lil. Even if they did tell someone else, Harry replied, narrowing his eyes, nobody sent any messages out of the flat, either via flu or even through the shard. I've set up hexes to alert me any time there is any communication between the flat and the outside world, just to make sure that no one is spying on us. If any message had got out, I'd have known about it. Suddenly, Harry looked up at his son, his eyes sharp. James, did any of you come or go over the last few hours? Besides Percy, I mean? After the time you arrived, did anyone go out, even for a little stroll around the neighborhood? No, Dad, James said, but then he paused. Unbidden, he found himself thinking of Petra's empty bed upstairs when he had gone to look for her. He'd searched through all of the upstairs rooms, but hadn't seen any sign of her, and yet, some time later, she'd come downstairs, as if she'd been up in her bedroom all along. James was still shaking his head, but his thoughts spun onwards, turning cold and fearful. Petra would have known about the raid, but surely she wouldn't have warned the villains, even if she could have somehow disapparated from the flat without anyone noticing. Would she? Well, I don't know then, Harry said, leaning back in his chair again but I'll find out. Whoever it was that leaked the information about the raid and killed Tarantus, I'll find them, and when I do, they'll be sorry they ever took over for him. I'll make very sure of that. James nodded, but inside he felt numb and deeply frightened. I am the Princess of Chaos, he thought, remembering the dream vision of Morgan, the shadowy figure that had spoken with Petra's voice. I am the Sorceress Queen. Christmas at the flat seemed to go by in a rather hectic rush, juggled between the much shorter Alma Alaron holiday break, Harry and Percy's constant work demands, and James's spinning thoughts about Petra, the WULF, Professor Ignatius Magnuson, and the Magical Integration Bureau. Christmas Day was the only somewhat relaxing day of the break, 
during which time the family opened their presents and visited with Grandma Weasley, Uncle Ron, Aunt Hermione, and the rest via flu. From his mother, James did indeed get a box of new underpants, as well as a new winter cloak. His father, however, had purchased James a brand new pair of clutch cudgel gauntlets from a wizarding sporting goods store in New Amsterdam. The gloves were leather, coloured Bigfoot orange and blue, with a chamois-lined wand sleeve in the left wrist. Deniston Dollarhoff had got Ralph a new wizard chess set with enchanted pieces that could, if desired, play themselves. The pieces had been especially hexed by a famed wizard chess champion so that Ralph could practice the game alone whenever he couldn't find a suitable opponent. Petra, to James's surprise, had managed to procure Izzy a new dollhouse and china doll, which Izzy had immediately christened Victoria Penelope. But never, Vicky Penny, she warned peering sternly at James, to which James nodded solemnly in agreement. Petra, of course, having no surviving parents or grandparents, received no gift whatsoever. Ginny had confided in James that the girl had insisted they not buy her anything either. She says it's more than enough that we're letting her live with us during the investigation, she said, as they dried dishes near the kitchen sink. I respected her wishes— but it seems so depressing not to have any gifts to open at Christmas, especially since she lost that brooch of hers on the voyage. She downplays it, but I think that brooch had special significance to her. She says it was a gift from her father for her first Christmas. Did you know that? James had not, and admitted that he'd never seen her wear it until earlier that summer. He assumed that the brooch had come in the box of Petra's father's things, sent to her by the Ministry of Magic upon her coming of age. Having made no such Christmas deal with Petra himself, however, James slipped outside late Christmas evening and found a bunch of dry weeds rooted behind some dumpsters. These he transfigured into a very satisfactory display of roses and tulips, which he encased in a simple time-loop charm, preventing them from wilting. He carried the flowers back up to the flat and bound them with a length of leftover Christmas ribbon. Finally, while everyone else was gathered around the fire downstairs, he sneaked into Petra's room and left the bouquet on her dresser, along with a small note which read simply, Happy Christmas, Petra. Content with his handiwork, James went to bed that night and fell almost immediately to sleep. He dreamed of Clutch Cudgel with his new gauntlets and zombie Professor Straithwaite's hollow chuckle and the mysterious riddle of the halls of Erebus Castle, complete with a ghostly figure of Professor Magnuson stalking warningly in the dimness his eyes like chips of mica. Finally, in the deepest chasm of the night, James dreamed of the flat island surrounded by crashing surf and low iron clouds. He dreamed of the black castle, both ancient and steadfast, and the figure watching from the balcony, a gaze heavy and hot, watching, waiting. Was it she that had alerted the members of the WULF of the impending raid? Had Morgan somehow killed Tarantus, leaving Petra, her alter ego, to take the blame? In the pit of the night, wrapped in the guileless lucidity of dreams, James thought it was entirely possible. He wouldn't remember any of it the next morning, but his dreaming self tried to send out the message, tried to warn his subconscious of what was to come. My job isn't to save Petra from Keynes the Arbiter, he realized as he wafted through the dreaming vision of the island gazing up at the shadowy balcony. My job is to save Petra from Morgan. My job, he thought from the depths of sleep, is to save Petra from herself. Chapter 17 The Ballad of the Rider Where the holiday break seemed to come and go like a flash of lightning, the spring semester unrolled before James like an interminable carpet, with no end in sight. Albus, in particular, seemed to return to school with a rather bitter disposition. I thought we were going to be quit of this dump by now, he grumped as they stalked across the campus towards their morning classes. A frigid wind scoured them all beneath the low, hulking clouds, making the boys' cloaks flap like sails. Hey, Zane said, his own typically cheerful disposition dampened by the Arctic weather. That's the Alaran you're talking about. I get why you might hate all your wolfy pals back at Aerie's mansion, but that's just them. Hate the player, don't hate the game. I'll hate who I bloody well want, Albus muttered darkly. I'm surprised, Ralph commented. I thought you'd be fitting in just fine with the werewolves. They don't seem that far removed from our mates back in Slytherin. 
Alba scoffed humorously. Ha! I'll take Tabitha Corsica over Olivia Jones any day. Tabitha may have turned out to be a little off her broom in the end, but at least she hated people on principle. These gits just hate anyone whose great-great-great-grandparents didn't have the good fortune to have been on some stupid boat that landed at Plymouth Bloody Rock. James was surprised at his brother's sudden openness. He knew it would probably evaporate once he'd had a chance to settle into the routine of school again, but for now he took advantage of it. You mean, he said as evenly as possible, that they give you a hard time just because you aren't an American? Albus pressed his lips together tightly and shook his head. They're fine with the fact that I'm not an American, so long as I don't want to play clutch or take part in the morning calisthenics preparedness corps or join their precious Salem Durgus free militia. Not that I want to do any of those things, mind you, but still, it gets a little old being constantly reminded that I'm shut out whether I want in or not. What's all Stonewall say about it? Zane asked, hefting his backpack against the icy wind. Oh, he talks a big game about how Werewolf House, like America in general, is the great melting pot, welcoming all into the arms of liberty, vigilance and civil service. But the students are another cauldron of newts entirely. I suppose if I pressed the issue with Jackson, he'd make sure I got into whatever club or team I wanted. But then I'd just have to live with the werewolves who tried to freeze me out to begin with. It's easier just to lay low and wait to get back home to Slytherin. Blimey, Ralph commented. After your performance on the clock tower during a flag switch escapade, I'd have thought you'd be the werewolf's golden boy. Yeah, Albus agreed sourly. That impressed them all right. They said I showed a lot of promise for a Cornelius. Hmm, James nodded, reticent to say anything more. Some small, petty part of him was meanly glad that Albus was having difficulties with his house. Serves him right for always siding with whatever group seems the most dodgy and evil, he thought. First the Slytherins, and now these daft, nationalistic werewolf stumpheads. Still, seeing how unhappy Albus apparently was, James's spite was short-lived. Maybe you can come hang out with us at Apollo Mansion, he offered. We have a pretty decent games room, and Yates makes a mean pizza if you can talk him into it. Yeah, that's just what I want, Albus replied, rolling his eyes, to start hanging out with the Campus Losers Club. Thanks, but no thanks. Werewolf House may be a bunch of narrow-minded grunts, but they excel at house pride. At least there I can look forward to a clutch cudgel trophy this year. You guys will be lucky if you get a single win. He's glad you're there, James, Zane agreed unhelpfully. James was too cold to argue the issue, and the boys trudged the rest of the way to class in silence. Within the first week of school, James realized that he had entirely forgotten to ask Lucy about taking him, Ralph, and Zane on a tour of Erebus Castle so that they could try to solve the riddle of Magnuson's dimensional key. Zane rolled his eyes as the three boys huddled around a table in the library near the top of the Tower of Art. It's easy, he whispered. You just have to ask Lucy to be your date to the Valentine's dance. Then she'll have to say yes when you tack on that you wanted to show us around the vampire's castle. James shook his head. It's Lucy, he said. I don't need to trick her or anything. I'll just ask her. Of course she'll say yes. Zane shrugged and leaned back in his chair. Have it your own way. Me, I'd want a little insurance. I hear she was pretty put off by all the touchy-feely that went down between you and Petra over Christmas. James's face heated with mingled embarrassment and surprise. What? That's ridiculous. Nothing happened at all. Ralph grimaced uncomfortably. I saw the two of you holding hands in a parlour, he admitted. So did Lucy. She pretended not to be bothered by it, but she hid in her room for a while afterwards. It wasn't like that, James sighed. We were just talking. In fact, we were talking about how we're going to try and clear her name. Seems to me you should have been talking to Lucy about that, Zane chided. She's the one whose go-ahead we need to get into Erebus Castle. Look, Lucy isn't Cheshire Chatterley, and I'm not you, James said, throwing a look at Zane. I can't trick her like that. There weren't any tricks involved with me and Cheshire, Zane replied a bit defensively. I got us the key to the archive, and Cheshire got to dance with me at the Halloween ball. It was a win-win for everyone. James crossed his arms on the library table and rested his chin on them. It's different for you. Cheshire wasn't sweet on you to begin with. 
Zane frowned thoughtfully. She was afterwards, he replied with a shrug. Maybe Ralph can do it, James offered, sitting up again. How could anyone say no to that face? Ralph glanced from Zane to James, his brow knitted. Zane shook his head. It's your ball game, James. Unless you know any real-life vampires, Lucy's our only way in. Do it however you want, but you'd better do it quick, like. That Keynes guy won't take forever to make his judgment about Petra. James knew that Zane was right. He also knew that they were probably making a much bigger deal out of the task than it deserved. Lucy was his cousin, after all. Still, her apparent infatuation with him tended to complicate matters in ways he couldn't predict. To be safe, he determined he would ask her after the next clutch cudgel match. Team Bigfoot was scheduled to face off against Vampire House again, and the odds were that, despite James's best efforts, the vamps would win handily. This would put Lucy in a good mood, rendering her more receptive to James's request. Having decided this, James dismissed the matter for the time being. Friday evening rolled around, and James made his way to Pepperpock Down. There he suited up in his clutch-cudgel gear alongside Jasmine, Gobbins, Wentworth, and the rest of Team Bigfoot. Nice new gauntlets, Jasmine said appreciatively. Christmas present? James nodded proudly. Yeah, from my dad. All I got was a bunch of hair potions and a box set of Remora's awful novels, Jasmine said, frowning. My mother's just crazy about them. She was hoping that I'd end up in Vampire House, or even Pixie. She says Bigfoot isn't very Vela-like. James didn't know how to respond to that. One of my aunts is part Vela, he ventured. For what it's worth, I prefer you to her most days. Jasmine smiled at him as she strapped on her shin pads. Let's go, team, Wood called from partway up the gantry stairs. I hope you all wore your long underwear. It's right frigid up there tonight. James grabbed his scrim and followed the team as they tramped up the steps into the windy evening. The sky over the gantries was cloudless, darkening towards sunset with a dusting of stars, just beginning to twinkle high above. All around, the parapet grandstands were filled with cheering and jeering students, most waving the red and black banners of Vampire House. We're the goats for tonight's march, Wood called over the noise, hunkering in the centre of the huddled players. If the vampires win tonight, it knocks us clean out of the playoffs and seals their standings. Most of the people here tonight want to see a werewolf vampire championship match, so sentiment is stacked pretty heavily against us. You've played excellently this year, team, even though there's been a lot more offensive magic than I am frankly comfortable with. No matter what, we can walk away from tonight's match with our heads held high. As always, let's keep it clean out there and do our ruddy best. All right. The team rumbled their agreement and piled their hands atop Wood's outstretched fist for the traditional rallying cry. Go feet, they shouted in unison, and then broke apart, lining up along the edge of the platform. I don't know about you, Norick muttered to James, but I don't plan to let the vampires have this one without a fight. James nodded. Have you been practicing that solar flak bit that Wentworth came up with? Spend half my Christmas break on it, Norick replied with a grim smile. In this darkness, it'll blind anybody who tries to ambush me from the rear, and maybe force one or two of them to drop the clutch if they try to pass me. Nice, James agreed. At least we've already got one tie game under our belts this year, eh? If it hadn't been for that, I bet half of these people would have stayed home tonight. Now they know that we'll be making those vampires work for it. In the air between the gantries, Professor Sanouye drifted like a dandelion seed on his official's broomstick. He blew a sharp blast on his whistle, and James saw Jasmine kick off the platform, angling towards the centre ring. The rest of the team followed, falling into position. Here goes nothing, Norick grinned. Into the breach! A moment later, both boys launched from the platform, leaning into the cold wind and squatting low over their scrims. Sixty seconds later, after a single tense warm-up lap, Sanouye blew a long note on his whistle. James lunged forwards on his scrim, launching it into a rocket-like acceleration, and immediately passed two vampires. He darted through the center ring, and before he knew it, had captured one of the clutches. He tucked it under his left arm and produced his wand from its sheath. Potter! Norrick called from behind him. Two bullets! 
Billy's at twelve o'clock, dropping fast! James ducked on his scrim and pulled back, decelerating so quickly that the clutch tried to squirt from beneath his arm. Almost instantly, two vampire players dropped out of the darkness ahead of him, colliding with one another and bouncing out of the course. James leapt upwards, pulling his scrim with him, and somersaulted over the bullies, barely passing through the nearest ring. Artis de Certo, he thought to himself with a grin. Who'd have thought it had come in handy on the clutch course? I'll have to start teaching that to the team as well. Still accelerating, James dodged through the course, completing his requisite laps, before lobbing the clutch through the goal ring. As soon as he released the clutch, however, he jabbed his wand at it. Duplicitous, he cried, and there was a flash of purple. Out of the flash, three clutches seemed to spin towards the goal instead of one. The vampire keeper hesitated for only a moment, and then swatted her cudgel at the middle of the three balls. The cudgel passed right through the phantom clutch, however, allowing the real clutch to flash through the goal ring behind her. A roar erupted from the crowd as James flew on, his hair whipping in the cold wind, and he couldn't tell if the spectators were cheering or booing, nor did he care. By half-time, James was stunned to realise that the vampires were leading Team Bigfoot by only four points. The Bigfoots were greatly heartened by this fact, and entered the second half of the match with a steadfast determination to at least end the game in a tie. It would still result in a technical victory for Vampire House, but at least the Bigfoots could go home feeling that they had achieved a symbolic victory, if nothing else. It was very hard to keep track of the actual score while the match was in progress, since there were, at any given time, three clutches in play. James glanced up at the scoreboard occasionally and saw that by the fourth quarter, the Bigfoots had, in fact, matched the vampires almost exactly throughout the second half of the game. The score hovered at 46 to 45, with Team Vampire clinging to a very fragile lead. Jasmine has the clutch, Norrit called, swooping alongside James. You make sure she gets to the goal. The rest of us will drop on their clippers like a ton of bricks, all right? Got it, James called with a curt nod. He glanced aside and saw Jasmine ducking through the course behind him, her cape flashing orange in the stadium lights. James dropped to one knee on his scrim, grabbing the nose with both hands as the board ground to a halt beneath him. Jasmine circled around and saw him waiting. She nodded her understanding. Time to mow the lawn, James announced, launching to full speed again and moving directly in front of Jasmine. He produced his wand and trained it on the vampire bullies ahead. A quick gravity well sucked them both out of the rings, allowing James and Jasmine to soar past without so much as a dip in their course. The rings flashed by, and James aimed again, using a lanyard charm to twitch the end of another vampire's scrim, causing him to lose control and veer out of the rings. James glanced up in time to see that Norrick had succeeded in forcing one of the vampire clippers out of the course using his solar flak hex. Bursts of stunning light still sparkled in his wake as he pumped his fist triumphantly in the air. We're nearly there, Jasmine, James called back. Nail the shot and we might just not this match. James circled around the last length of the figure eight course and prepared to drop out of the way, giving Jasmine room to aim. As he dipped, however, a shadow flicked over the end of his scrim. Glancing up, he saw that the second vampire clipper had caught up to Jasmine. The clipper raised his own clutch overhead, preparing to shoot for the goal at exactly the same time as Jasmine. Without thinking, James raised his wand once more, calling out his spell at exactly the same moment that both clippers released their clutches. Whatever happened next happened nearly too fast to watch, and yet, in James's mind, it seemed to take hours. He saw Jasmine's clutch arc through the air, tracking alongside the vampire clipper's shot, but Jasmine's aim was too low. Her clutch was going to miss the goal entirely. James's lanyard charm, however, neatly caught the vampire's clutch. With a flick of his wand, James twitched the opponent's clutch downwards, forcing it to dip and then bob up again. The vampire's clutch collided in mid-air with Jasmine's, altering its course. A split second later, both clutches soared through the goal ring past the two keepers, who had moved aside in an effort not to accidentally block their own team's shot. James rocketed beneath the goal ring into sudden silence. He glanced back, saw Jasmine's look of stunned disbelief, and then startled as the grandstands exploded into wild, 
deafening cheers all around. We scored a nut point, Jasmine cried in amazement, catching up to James and smacking him on the shoulder. A nut point, James! I can't even remember the last time that happened! What's a nut point? James called over the noise of the crowd. The rest of the team was catching up to them now, forming a mid-air dogpile all around him. You knocked our clutch against theirs and put them both through the goal, Jasmine yelled, laughing. That makes both points ours. We get double the score, James. You mean, James said, buffeting as the team collapsed around him and Jasmine. We won? We won! Norick hollered, laughing. Holy hinky pongs! We won! The rest of the team joined in the shout, proclaiming their victory and pushing James and Jasmine upwards between them. As one wild, bobbing bunch, the team drifted towards their platform and broke apart on top of it, roaring with triumphant delight. And in a shocking, record-breaking upset, Cheshire Chatterley's voice cried, echoing from the announcer's booth, Team Bigfoot snatches their first victory in nearly twelve years with an amazing, game-winning knockout goal by the combined efforts of Team Captain Jasmine Jade and newcomer James Sirius Potter. With that... Team Vampire's playoff hopes are put on hold for at least one more match, while Team Bigfoot refuses to be bumped out for the season. What a match, folks! What a match! Out of the darkness of the platform, a figure nearly bowled James over, calling his name. James, you big genius, you! A knockout win? How'd you do that? Zane, James laughed, struggling to stay upright. I don't know. I didn't even know what a knockout point was until it happened. How'd you get up here? Me and Ralph came up ten minutes ago when we thought you were just going to tie the match, Zane replied excitedly. Wood said we could watch the rest of the game from up here, Ralph added, grinning. What a party, eh? First victory in over a decade! Norick announced, clapping James heartily on the shoulder pads. Thanks to our new magic coach, James Potter! Come on, everyone! Victory party at the Kite and Key in twenty minutes! Let's see if we still remember how to do it, eh? With raucous whoops of delight and a great trampling of feet, Team Bigfoot clambered down the steps to the locker cellar, singing the Bigfoot House Anthem and virtually carrying James and Jasmine on their shoulders. It wasn't until an hour and a half later that James remembered his intention of asking Lucy about getting a tour of Erebus Castle. He was just leaving the Kite and Key when he spotted her at a table populated by a gaggle of morose-looking vampire students. He didn't think anything of it. After all, vampire students made quite a show of being morose at nearly every moment until she got up and met him near the door. "'Congratulations, cousin,' she said, a little stiffly. "'You wanted to talk to me about something?' Yeah. James nodded, remembering that he had asked her to find him after the match. Uh, are you heading back to the castle now? We could walk together. Lucy studied him for a moment and then nodded somberly. James pushed open the back door of the kite and key, letting in a gust of wintry air and sand like snow crystals. Uh, he said as the two of them walked into the darkness of the campus. This is a little awkward. I hadn't exactly expected to win tonight, you know. You did very well. Lucy said coolly. A knock point. The vampires say that hasn't happened in forever. They say you just got lucky, but I stuck up for you. I told them you were very talented in a lot of ways. James was glad that they were walking in the darkness. He felt extremely awkward all of a sudden. Thanks, Lou, he said. I wanted to ask you a favor, like... Lucy stopped walking and peered up at him, her eyes narrowed suspiciously. What? I... James began, and then swallowed hard. Uh, I was just thinking, Ralph and Zane and me, we're really interested in checking out Erebus Castle. We've heard some stuff about it, and we thought it'd be neat to give it a once-over, you know. But according to the house rules, we can't get in unless we're accompanied by a vampire student, or a real-life vampire. So, you being in Vampire House and all... Why are you so interested in Erebus Castle all of a sudden? Lucy asked, her eyes still narrowed in the darkness, watching James critically. It's nothing, really. I mean... He stopped, gulped again, and then decided, on the spur of the moment, to change his tactic. I thought you'd like to go to the Valentine's dance with me. Lucy's face looked pained for a very brief moment, but she quickly hid it. This has something to do with Petra Morganston, doesn't it? James blinked, stunned. What? He stammered. I mean, how? 
No, of course not. Don't be silly. I saw you two talking over Christmas, James, Lucy said, looking away. I don't know what it is you're planning, or what it has to do with the castle, but you could at least have paid me the compliment of being honest. She shook her head slightly, and when she looked up at him again, there were tears standing in her eyes. Really, James? The Valentine's dance? Like I'd want to go with you to that anyway. She glanced away again, swiping a hand angrily across her face. Look, Lou, James said, taking a step closer. Sorry, it was Zane's idea. I'll tell you the truth if you really want to know. It isn't what you think it is, really. I don't think anything at all, you big git, Lucy said, her voice thick. And I don't want to know either way. Whatever it is you're looking for in Erebus Castle, you can find someone else to be your ticket in. She turned and stalked away before James could respond. After a dozen steps, she turned back again, barely a shadowy shape in the darkness. And just so you know, she called, there are loads of people who want to take me to the Valentine's dance. What, do you think I've just been waiting for you to come along and ask? You're my cousin, James. Don't be such a creep. Having delivered her final salvo, she spun on her heel again and nearly ran into the trees, making black scrapes on the snow-crusted footpath. James watched her go, feeling utterly foolish and miserably angry at himself. He considered chasing after her, but some deep, wise inner voice told him that that would only make matters worse. With a disconsolate sigh, James turned around himself. Much more slowly, he trudged into the darkness, heading for the distant, blocky shape of Apollo Mansion. Over the course of the following week, a sudden warm snap descended over the campus, melting the ice and snow from the footpaths and reducing the campus's freight of icicles to steady, dripping crystal nubs. James, Ralph, and Zane spent most of their free time trying to think of another way into Erebus Castle, but encountered no success whatsoever. Their final effort had been to sneak away after Thursday afternoon's cursology class, which was held in the castle's smoked-glass moon room. This had failed almost immediately, however, when a small portrait of a very stern wizard with a pointed goatee had cornered them on the landing of the main staircase. Hold right there, gentlemen, the portrait pronounced as they crept past. Where do you think you're going? Shh, Zane hissed, turning back. We're just looking around a bit. Don't get your widow's peak out of joint. The portrait smiled a little disconcertingly. Only residents of Erebus Castle are allowed upstairs, my friends, it said in a suddenly silky voice. But what can I do about it? Me, a mere painting. Do as you wish, but consider yourselves warned. That's more like it, Zane muttered, turning back towards the stairs. The boys made it halfway up to the second landing, when the risers suddenly shuddered beneath their feet. With a loud thunk, the step immediately above James's feet retracted sideways into the wall, leaving a gaping black hole in its place. The next step down followed, nearly pitching James forwards into the darkness beneath the steps. He scrambled backwards, bumping into Zane and Ralph, and the stairs began to retract more quickly, chasing them back the way they had come. The three boys clambered wildly back down the stairs, falling over each other until they reached the main landing once again, and crashed, panting to the wooden floor. What was that all about? Zane exclaimed angrily, struggling to his feet. You were warned, the portrait sniffed mildly. Warned nothing, James said. You might have told us that we were about to get tossed to our dooms. The portrait clucked its tongue indignantly. The fall wouldn't have killed you it said. The rats might have, though. They've become rather an advanced, vicious little tribe down there, after living for so many years in a magical castle. James peered into the darkness beneath the stairs. He fancied he could hear faint scratchings and even the clicking of little teeth. Wow, Ralph shuddered. That is so not right. With a loud ka-chunk, the stair steps suddenly socked back into place, covering the hole. Perhaps next time you three will consider abiding by the rules, the portrait commented sternly, and respecting your elders, painted or otherwise. Now be gone with you before I alert the house president. That got the boys moving, since the last thing they wanted was any entanglements with Professor Remora. I can't believe we don't know anyone else in Vampire House, Zane groaned as they made their way towards the cafeteria for lunch. I mean, let's face it, 
I'm a lovable guy. Everyone gets along with me. Maybe we should just try to follow Magnuson into the past without knowing what the dimensional key is, James offered consideringly. Perhaps if we just hang back and watch him, we'll be able to figure it out, right? Maybe, Ralph said, shrugging. But I'd sure hate to get that bit wrong. We only get one chance. Rose says that time travel is really tetchy that way. What do you mean? Zane asked as they pulled open the doors to Administration Hall, following a gaggle of older students towards the cafeteria. I don't think I was there for that conversation. Not that I don't love Rose's hectoring predictions about all the ways we might destroy the fabric of the universe and all. James sighed. She says it's the reason why time-turners have been outlawed. Technomancy guys like Jackson have discovered that it's super dangerous for one person to occupy the same time frame more than once. Something about identical matter accidentally coming together and causing catastrophic pluralities or something quantum like that. Bottom line is that if we don't capture Magnuson's dimensional key the first time out, we won't have another chance without potentially causing way more trouble than we hope to prevent. So, how sure are you that we really have to do this anyway? Ralph asked, getting in line and grabbing a tray. You still think that the real bad guys are riding out in the world between the worlds? No doubt in my mind, James replied, with a little more conviction than he actually felt. That missing crimson thread is far too powerful to just disappear without a trace. If it was in our world, somebody somewhere would have sensed its trail. The only place it could possibly be hidden is outside of our dimension. It just makes sense. Well then, I guess we're back to square one, Zane said, grabbing two bowls of green pudding and cramming them onto his already filled tray. To get into the world between the worlds, we need to get Magnuson's dimensional key, which means we need to somehow get into Erebus Castle so we can figure out the riddle of what the key actually is. He sighed briskly. <sighs> Maybe we should just hex Ralph's teeth into points and try to pass him off as Count Ralphula the Impaler. What do you say, Ralphinator? Worth a shot? Don't even start, Ralph said, shaking his head. The boys found a place at one of the long tables, cramming in across from Wentworth, who was distracted by a series of fuzzy sneezes. What's with you, Went? James asked, poking at his stew with a fork. Garlic, Wentworth replied, wiping his nose. It's my special diet. I'm not even eating the stuff, but I can still smell it in everyone else's lunch. Breaks me all out. Zane stirred his own bowl. Yeah, this stuff's pretty heavy with it. Too bad for you, Went. It's yum in the tum. Wentworth sniffled. Yeah, well, you could all show a little more sensitivity. I can't help being this way, you know. It's in my genes, all the way back to what my parents call the old country. He rolled his eyes and shook his head. James watched as the smaller boy reached for a large stoneware mug. Wentworth pinched his nose and drank from it carefully. Just out of curiosity, Zane suddenly said, frowning at Wentworth. Where exactly is the old country? Wentworth peered over his mug at Zane, a little warily. Somewhere in Europe, he answered. A little region in Romania, if you must know. Really? Zane said, still frowning. Does it start with a T, maybe? I'm not supposed to talk about it, Wentworth announced, lowering his mug but holding it near his chest. My mother says we're not like that anymore. She says the less we talk about it, the better. What are you drinking there, Went? James asked, peering over the table. It's nothing, Went said. It's for my special diet. It's not like I want to drink it, you know. Ten ounces a day is all. Is that tomato juice? Ralph said, using his height to peek into Wentworth's mug. Looks too dark somehow. It's juice, Wentworth proclaimed, covering the cup with his hand. Uh, kinda. That's all you need to know. What? Zane glanced from Ralph to James. Wentworth, do me a little favor, he said smoothly, realization dawning on his suddenly crafty face. Give us one of those big old world smiles, eh? Yeah, Wentworth. James added curiously. Let's see those teeth. Coming through, Zane called out, pushing Wentworth through the front door of Erebus Mansion like a boy-sized battering ram. Vampire here! You have to let us in! Stop! Wentworth insisted, flushing furiously. Nobody is supposed to know! It's all right, James soothed, 
following close behind. You're among your fellow creatures of the night here. What's going on? A tall boy demanded in an imperious voice, moving to block the four intruders in the foyer. You can't just barge in here. This is for Vampire House members and their guests only. And real-life vampires, Zane added, patting Wentworth on the top of his head. Says so in your house charter. Any roaming vampires seeking asylum or succor are welcome within these halls. I looked it up to be sure. I thought the word sucker was a nice play on words. That's got remora written all over it, doesn't it? This kid's no vampire, the boy sneered, looking down his nose at Wentworth. Get out of here before I call the professor. Go ahead and call her, James nodded. Went here has the teeth and the pedigree. He's the real deal, right down to his ten-ounce blood ration a day, and an unnatural allergy to garlic and garlic-related root veg. Tell him, Went. I'm really sorry, Wentworth said, his cheeks burning. I had nothing to do with this. No one's supposed to know, really. My parents made special arrangements with the school. Oh, let them in, Harding, a girl said from a nearby sofa. Who cares? Remora isn't even here. This kid's no vampire, no matter what these credits say, the boy Harding declared, narrowing his eyes, his nostrils flaring. No vampire, no entry. But look at his teeth, Ralph insisted, guiding Went under the nearest chandelier. They may not be the sort of fangs you read about in Professor Remora's books, but they're plenty pointy if you look at them in the right light. Show them, Went. See? Anyone can hex a pair of fangs, Harding replied, rolling his eyes. Let me take a look at the boy, another voice said, its tone polite but commanding. James glanced around. The portrait of the stern-faced man with the pointed beard was staring down at them from the lower landing. Harding looked from the portrait to Wentworth, considering. Finally, reluctantly, the taller boy nodded towards the landing. Make it quick, and then vanish, why don't you? he growled. James, Zane, and Ralph followed Wentworth closely, crowding up onto the landing. The portrait narrowed its eyes at the small boy. James glanced at the little brass plaque affixed to the bottom of the portrait's round frame. It read, Niles Covington Erebus III. Only moderately developed in the canines, the portrait said thoughtfully, but real enough, I suspect. Hmm, there's only one way to know for certain. Mr. Harding, if you would turn me around, please. Obediently, the sneering boy climbed onto the landing and sidled towards the painting. Eyes still narrowed at Wentworth, he lifted the painting of Niles Erebus from the wall. When he turned it around, James was surprised to see that the rear of the painting was a mirror. Look at yourself, young man, Erebus said, apparently speaking to Wentworth. Comically, everyone on the landing leaned towards the mirror. Holy hinky punks! Zane breathed in amazement. When? Where are you? Still peering into the mirror, James reached aside with his right hand. His fingers patted Wentworth on the face, knocking the boy's glasses askew. In the mirror, however, James's fingers moved over empty space. Hey! Wentworth said, annoyed, straightening his glasses. Quit it already! He's not there! Ralph exclaimed. He's invisible in the mirror! I don't see what the big deal is, Wentworth announced wearily. It's not like some kind of superpower or anything. You have any idea how hard it is to comb your hair if you can't see yourself in a mirror? Well, Mr. Harding, the portrait of Erebus said from the reverse side of the mirror, it would appear that this young man is indeed the real article. According to the house rules, he and his guests must be granted entrance. But... Harding said, disgusted. Look at him! That's not what a vampire is supposed to look like! And you are an expert on these things, of course, Erebus sighed. Fear not, I will accompany our guests during their visit, and assure that they do not wander where they are unwelcome. After all, being granted entrance does not amount to carte blanche access to anywhere they wish, does it? It sure doesn't, Harding nodded dually. He sneered at Zane again, and then, rather stiffly, handed him the small portrait. Enjoy your stay, gentlemen. Thanks, Harding, Zane grinned, taking the portrait. Your vigilance is inspiring. I'll put in a good word for you with all the other vampires I know. He winked at the older boy.
Well then, my friends, Erebus said briskly as Harding skulked back down to the parlor. Now that you have attained something approaching a legitimate entrance, I believe you were on your way to the upper corridor. Shall we proceed together this time with better luck? Over the course of the next hour, James, Ralph, Wentworth, and Zane wandered the myriad halls, landings, secret stairways, hidden chambers, dens, bathrooms, and various common spaces of the castle, all the while listening to an informative, if slightly pedantic, monologue from Erebus's portrait about the details of each space. Apart from being somewhat amazed at the sheer number of rooms crammed into the castle, the boys found nothing that illuminated the riddle of Ignatius Magnuson's dimensional key. I don't get it, Zane finally proclaimed, plopping onto a chair on the third floor landing. How'd the quo go? The truth walked the halls of Erebus Castle, right? Well, we've walked more halls than I can count, and I didn't encounter any truth, did you? James shook his head. I didn't realize it would be this hard. I thought once we got inside, it'd just make sense somehow. Might I inquire, the portrait of Niles Erebus said, with a somewhat impatient sniff. What you gentlemen are talking about? You've got me, Wentworth announced, shaking his head and rolling his eyes. I'm just the token vampire. I decided these three were totally nuts three flaws ago. Is this riddle we heard? Ralph admitted, leaning the portrait on a window sill so he could look at it. Some old professor from a long time ago said it. The truth walked the halls of Erebus Castle. You seem to know an awful lot about this place. Any ideas what it might mean? I build this castle, Erebus said, bristling. I should think I would know everything that could possibly be known about it. Your riddle, however, is rather hopelessly obtuse. Without any sort of context, it could mean anything at all. James sighed. What a complete waste of time. It was probably just something Magnuson made up, after all, just to throw everyone off his trail. Magnuson, you say? the portrait asked, raising one eyebrow. Ignatius Magnuson. Yeah, Ralph replied, perking up a little. You know anything about him? Virtually nothing, Erebus answered dismissively. He was rather after my time, as you've apparently failed to notice. In my current state, however, I do recall seeing him visit the castle from time to time. The man had a bit of a fascination, it seemed. How'd he get in? James asked. He wasn't a vampire too, was he? Erebus rolled his eyes impatiently. Obviously, the rules of entrance do not apply to faculty and administration, young man. Every house is regularly frequented by professors from different societies, both for social and academic reasons. So, where did Magnuson go when he was here? Zane asked impatiently. I did not have to chaperone him during his visits, Erebus answered disdainfully. But I do recall that he took copious notes about some of the tapestries. Zane looked hard at James, his eyebrows raised. Tapestries? he repeated. Can we maybe see these tapestries? Erebus sighed dramatically. Second floor, he drawled, north corridor. And do try not to carry my frame like that, young man. There might be less pleasant views in the world than your armpit but I am hard-pressed to think of any at the moment. Sorry, Ralph muttered, taking the frame from beneath his arm. When they finally arrived at the second-floor corridor, James was surprised to find that they had somehow missed this area during their earlier tour. The corridor was quite high, lined with windows on one side and very old floor-length tapestries on the other. The windows were covered with thick golden curtains pulled tightly close. It's so dark. Ralph said, creeping slowly into the hall. I can barely see in here. Luminous, the portrait of Erebus said in a low voice. In response, a series of crystal chandeliers began to glow, flames growing silently from their previously unlit candles. The tapestries are quite ancient, Erebus explained as the boys walked along the corridor, watching as the candlelight flickered over the woven images. Erebus family treasures, in fact, passed down through many generations. Sunlight has faded them over the centuries, thus they are now kept secluded in darkness, preserved as well as they can be. James took a step closer to the first of the huge tapestries. 
The threadwork was very fine, reminding him of the neat weaving of the loom of destinies. Unlike the loom, however, the images shown here were not abstract. Each illustration was skillfully rendered, even lifelike. James almost expected them to begin moving. It looks like they tell a story, Wentworth commented, his voice unconsciously hushed. An astute observation, my friend, Erebus replied. These are, in fact, a complete series telling an ancient tale known as the Ballad of the Rider. I've never heard of it, Zane commented. Erebus chuckled humorously. Nor am I surprised. It is not the sort of tale the wizarding world tends to repeat. It is a tragedy, in fact, and a very dark one. James peered up at the nearest tapestry again. On it, a tall, grave man with a black beard sat upon a horse. On closer inspection, James realized that the horse was, in fact, a unicorn, dappled grey, with powerful forelegs and a mane of shimmering gold. Every line and thread of the image implied that the rider and the unicorn were regal, solemn, almost glorious. Behind them, a wildly colourful and ornate starburst stretched from one edge of the tapestry to the other. Along the bottom were dozens of hands and faces, all leering up towards the rider, pointing, shouting, crying, carefully woven blue tears of delight or terror. What's happening in this one? James asked, a little breathlessly. That, Erebus intoned solemnly, is the arrival of the rider. According to the ballad, his coming was marked by a blinding curtain of light, as if one of the very stars had descended from the night sky and settled for one twinkling moment on a hilltop. The rider appeared from within the light, which vanished behind him. This was in the dark ages of Europe. As you might imagine, his arrival caused great fear among those who witnessed it. The rider explained himself, however, describing his home in a different reality, one similar to our own, but utterly peaceful and advanced in both the healing and magical arts. To prove his assertions, he described the process by which his world's foremost witches and wizards had discovered the existence of other realities and learned how they were all bound together by one central core, the Nexus. Using their arts, they created a portal into the Nexus with hopes of reaching out to other dimensions. His purpose, he claimed, was to venture into less fortunate realities and share the wealth of their learning. The Nexus, Zane whispered, nodding. This fits perfectly with everything we've heard about the Nexus curtain and the world between the worlds. Together, the four boys drifted towards the next tapestry. This one showed the bearded rider standing at the head of a table, surrounded by seated witches and wizards. The rider's posture implied that he was speaking, his arm raised in a gesture of conjuring. Over the table hovered a fanciful representation of a globe covered with jungles, mountains, waterfalls, and placid oceans. The globe's continents were dotted with magnificent cities, its oceans streaked by sailing vessels with bright blue sails. The vision was contrived to seem as if it was spreading beams of light all around the room, but the listeners at the table seemed not to notice. Their faces were caricatures of wickedness, porcine and bloated, grinning and narrow-eyed, some with their heads bowed together in obvious conspiracy. Oh, Ralph said, nodding with realization. He's describing his dimension to everybody. Doesn't much look like they're listening, though, James added. Erebus frowned inside his frame. Indeed not. The rider fell into the council of greedy witches and wizards, who were far less interested in the gifts of his enlightenment than they were the dark magic they believed could be gleaned from him and his unicorn. Until then, there had been no such beasts in our world, you see, and these crafty witches and wizards instinctively understood that this was a creature of fabulous power. Thus, they bided their time, pretending to listen, all the while plotting how to steal the man's magic and use it against him. In truth, their intention, horribly, was to learn the use of the rider's portal and invade his reality, 
taking whatever they wish by force and domination. Some welcoming committee, Wentworth said sourly. Zane asked, so were they able to do it? Fortunately for us, they were not, Erebus replied. Had their scheme succeeded, our own reality would surely have descended into horrors, taking many more with it, perhaps even to destruction. The balance of the destinies prevailed, however, halting their evil plans, but not without cost. The group stood before the third tapestry now. On it, men in dark robes crowded around the unicorn, which was reared on its hind hooves, pouring at the air, its teeth bared in desperation. Around its neck, and connected to the fists of its dark adversaries, was a collection of restraining ropes. Worse, a crooked dagger was raised in the hand of one of the dark wizards, pointing towards the unicorn's dappled flank. In the foreground, the rider seemed to be in a duel with several of the dark wizards, his face noble yet resigned, as he was hopelessly outnumbered by his foes. Erebus spoke, continuing his recitation of the ballad. Once the horrid plan was placed into action, the rider was imprisoned. His unicorn was experimented upon and forced to breed with common horses, all in an attempt to create more of its kind. This, of course, is the origin of the few unicorns that still roam the deepest woods of our day, less powerful than their noble ancestor, but still glorious. In the end, the rider succeeded in mastering his powers for an escape. Being peaceful, he attempted to spare his captors' lives, but they viewed his mercy as weakness. In the end, they chased him and his unicorn down, subduing them both by sheer numbers. Unable to wrest the secret of the Nexus from him, they eventually killed him and hopelessly wounded his unicorn at the same time. James shook his head. That's perfectly beastly, he said in a low voice. It gets worse, Erebus admitted stoically. The gathering moved to the last tapestry. It glowed in the candlelight, somehow both more vibrant and more ghastly than the others. The scene showed a moonlit forest dominated by a huddle of the dark-robed witches and wizards. They seemed to be bent over something, obscuring it. What are they doing? Ralph asked tentatively, frowning at the tall image. What's all that silvery stuff running all over the ground? Alas, Erebus replied darkly. According to the ballad, the evil witches and wizards realized that their plan had been foiled. They had murdered their only hope of conquering the other dimensions, and mortally wounded the creature that might have granted them powers beyond their dreams. In a final, ghastly attempt to harness the magic of that hidden realm, they fell upon the wounded unicorn and consumed its blood, still warm from its failing heart. As they feasted upon it, piteously, the poor beast died. Unmoved by the extremity of their crimes, and grown cruelly powerful by their draught of the unicorn's blood, these witches and wizards turned into legends of horror for decades thereafter. They had become virtually unstoppable, you see, darkly magical and inhumanly strong. They were known to strike terror into the hearts of all they met, since both their eyes and mouths glowed with a pale silvery light forever tainted by the blood of their prey. To cover this, they fashioned masks of metal, even more terrible than their human faces, and wore them as signs of their fraternity. For nearly a century, these beasts in human form ruled with mayhem, torture, and murder, known universally by the name that they had chosen for themselves, a name that explained both the sources of their powers and the depths of their depravity. Death Eaters, they called themselves, a word that became synonymous with dark ambition, inhumanity, and power at any cost. They were the original Death Eaters? James asked faintly, staring up at the horrible image. But Voldemort— The devil cannot create, Erebus said evenly. He can only pervert. The villain your age knew as Voldemort adopted the policies of these, his spiritual brethren. He took their name and claimed it for himself, 
but he did not invent it. Shuddering, Wentworth asked, So whatever became of those guys? Over the decades, heroes of stout heart and courage hunted them down, Erebus answered, nodding gravely in his frame. Many knights died in the attempt, but one by one the Death Eaters were dispatched, their heads cut from their shoulders and buried while their bodies were burned to dust. In the end, only one remained, a woman named Proserpine. She was finally cornered in her secret citadel, deep in a trackless forest. There, rather than facing her pursuers, she took her own life, leaving her own severed head smiling on the doorstep, its eyes still glowing with dead malevolence. Her body, the legends claim, was never found. Ralph shivered. Hello, nightmares, he squeaked. What about the unicorn's body? Wentworth asked, shaking his head. Didn't they try to preserve that somehow? Erebus scoffed lightly. The Death Eaters cared not for preserving the corpse of their victim. According to legend, however, explorers did eventually find the poor creature's skeleton, complete with its magical horn. Rather than burying it or bringing it back, they decided to leave it as a memorial, hidden within a seamless blanket of unplotability, forever at rest. They did bring back one thing, though, as proof of their discovery. A single silver horseshoe, which they claimed was still attached to the beast's right front hoof, gleaming and uncorrupted. For centuries, that very horseshoe was a symbol of humility and regret, kept safe by a council of knights whose sole job was to watch for the appearance of any more delegates from the dimension beyond. If such a delegate were ever to appear, the horseshoe was to be returned to them in homage, a humble, insufficient apology for the crime that had been committed against their people. Wow, Zane said softly, somber for once. So, are those knights still out there somewhere? Guarding the horseshoe and watching for anyone from that other dimension? Alas, no, Erebus sighed. My family was the last of those knights, and I was the last of my family, come to this new country in the hopes of finding a permanent hiding place for the relic. As a result, the horseshoe was granted to this college, an heirloom and a sacred trust. Unfortunately, by then, its significance had been all but lost. For many years, it was preserved in the museum atop the Tower of Art, well guarded but forgotten. Now, I suspect, none even remember that it was ever there. Why? James asked, blinking suddenly. What happened to it? Where is it now? Erebus chuckled ruefully. That, as they used to say in my time, is the thousand drummel question. It seems that some time after my own death, the horseshoe was borrowed from the museum and never returned. Obviously, I myself am less than clear on the details. We portraits have rather a difficult time absorbing much of what happens beyond our own deaths. But I believe that the horseshoe went into the library of a trusted private collector. I suppose I should care more about it, seeing as I was the last of a long line of those whose duty was to protect the relic. But as I said, death offers its own unique perspective, one facet of which is that it becomes exceedingly easy not to give a damn. I can only hope that the horseshoe has been well cared for, or, at the very least, been tossed into a very, very deep well. James's eyes had grown wide as he listened. Silently, he turned to look at Ralph and then Zane. Both of them returned his look of speechless realization. What? Wentworth said, frowning. You three look like somebody just shot freezing charms into your underpants. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? James asked quietly. Zane nodded. I'm thinking I bet I know who the mysterious patron is that borrowed the old lucky horseshoe. But how would Magnuson have figured it all out? Ralph asked. We've got the portrait to explain everything, but Magnuson didn't get anything from him, apparently. 
Magnuson wouldn't have needed anyone to explain it, James whispered, flushed with excitement. Remember what Franklin told us. Magnuson was a guy who loved stories. He'd probably already read all about the legend of the rider. Zane nodded. Then, later, when he's out prowling the halls here in the castle, he spies these tapestries and starts putting everything together. He connects the tapestries with the silver horseshoe up in the Tower of Art, and bam he's got the dimensional key he's been dreaming of all along. Wow! Ralph laughed a little nervously. So the riddle was right after all. The truth walked the halls of Erebus Castle. Right here, the truth was Magnuson and the tapestry put together. There was a long, meaningful pause as the three boys stared at one another, absorbing the gravity of what they had just discovered. Finally, Wentworth spoke up, breaking the silence. Well, this is all marvellous, he sighed, rolling his eyes and pulling James by the elbow. I don't know what any of it means or why I should care, but bully for all three of you. Now, can I maybe go back and finish my lunch? Chapter 18 The Dimensional Key The first hints of spring on the campus of Alma Alaron were marked by a series of very gusty days. The warm winds first melted the remaining patches of snow and then dried the winter yellow lawns so that by the week before Valentine's Day groups of students could be seen practicing scrim or tossing clutches over the mall's yards and empty flower beds. After nearly a week of grey days, the sun finally broke through a tatter of stubborn clouds, bathing Administration Hall with beams of shifting golden light. In the days after the revelation of the Erebus Castle tapestries, James, Ralph, and Zane had begun to plan the next step of their adventure, which was to somehow use the time-travelling nature of the school to go back to the date of Professor Magnuson's escape and follow him through the time-lock out into Muggle Philadelphia. There, they would attempt to nick the dimensional key, the unicorn's silver horseshoe, from the villain Professor, before he could use it to vanish forever through the Nexus Curtain. If we're lucky, Zane whispered one morning in clockwork mechanics as Professor Cloverhoof assisted another student with her magical cuckoo clock, we'll get the horseshoe and see where the Nexus Curtain is at the same time. James lurched suddenly backwards as his own wooden cuckoo bird sprang from the tiny doors of his half-finished clock. The bird extended on a complicated accordion of wooden struts, began to retract back, and then lurched to a squeaking halt, bobbing back and forth over James's shoulder. Not enough beeswax on the joints, the bird chirped in irritation. And your measurements are all over the place. Shut it, bird, James grumped, reaching to force it back into its compartment. To Zane, he whispered, You mean, if we just follow Magnuson without being seen, we can wait for him to lead us to the Nexus Curtain, and then try to nick the unicorn shoe before he actually uses it? Seems like it'd be cutting things a bit close, Ralph admitted. Yeah, his own cuckoo bird chirped from where it lay on the table next to him, surrounded by a variety of wooden cogs, tools, and brass gears. And finesse doesn't seem to be your old strong suit. Shut it, bird, all three boys said in unison. Just to be sure of their information, James had suggested that they take a quick trip up to the museum atop the Tower of Art to learn what they could about the unicorn's horseshoe. During their Wednesday afternoon free period, they climbed the hundreds of stairs to the top of the tower and spent some time wandering the museum's halls, searching for any information about the apparently missing horseshoe. The curator was not at her desk, unfortunately and a quick look around the museum's halls revealed no mysteriously vacant display cases or empty frames where the horseshoe might originally have been displayed. It's been gone too long, Zane insisted, bored. The portraits said they didn't even really know the significance of the thing anyway, remember? As far as the curator knew, it was just some silver horseshoe from the Erebus family collection. Totally old and stuff, but still, just a horseshoe. Once it went missing, they probably just closed the display and put in a new bowl of golden scarabs. Let's go back and see them again, now that I mention it. I still have some of those copper shavings in my pocket that they like to eat. We need to be sure, James said stubbornly. Erebus himself said he's pretty fuzzy on anything that happened since his death. I want to know for certain that the horseshoe really was here once, and that it went missing around Magnuson's time. Hold on. What? Ralph asked 
as James suddenly pulled him into a side corridor. You say something? These are just more portraits, Zane said, rolling his eyes. You gonna corroborate one half-baked heap of paint with another? If their stories agreed, then yes, James replied. Besides, I've heard that one of these guys was known for never telling a lie. A quote that has long outlived its context, one of the portraits said with a sniff. It was directed at Mrs. Washington, in fact, on the occasion of a missing slice of apple pie. And, I might add, it was meant to be rather sarcastic. George Washington, Ralph asked, peering at the large portrait on the corridor wall. What's he going to know about a magical unicorn or shoe? Nothing whatsoever with an attitude like that, young man, Washington answered huffily. I've been watching the three of you trapes around the museum. I can't imagine why you haven't already asked any of us portraits about whatever it is you are seeking, especially since the curator is absent. Not that said absence is at all unusual. That's for certain, another portrait added. James glanced up and saw the painted visage of a rather round-faced man with tufts of iron-gray hair poking from the sides of his head. John Adams, the nameplate read. Our Madam Curator spends about as much time at her post as a Virginia night watchman. I take offense at comments like that, another portrait commented from further down the hall. We know, Thomas, Washington said with a roll of his eyes. That's why Adams keeps making them. He has been trying to get your goat for centuries. I cannot understand why you keep making it so very easy for him. Like shooting fish in a barrel, Adams smirked. Some of us prefer more sporting contests, said the portrait from further down the hall. James leaned to the side and read the nameplate, Thomas Jefferson. Us Virginians aim for loftier challenges than mere colloquial insults. Do note, John, Washington added carefully, that I was a Virginian as well. Yes, but you can give as well as you get, George, Adams replied jovially. You have a sense of humor, after all. Wait a minute, Ralph interrupted. George Washington, you're the guy that invented peanut butter, right? Uh-huh. Another voice coughed lightly. You're thinking of George Washington Carver, young man. A common enough mistake, I suppose. Oh, Ralph said, his face reddening as he glanced aside at the portrait of a handsome man with dark skin and grey hair. Uh, sorry, Mr. Carver. Not necessary, the portrait smiled. Although, do spread the word, if you will pardon the pun. I invented over four hundred uses for the common peanut. Being chiefly remembered for the creation of a snack food tends to be a bit of a legacy killer. Ralph nodded. I'll, uh, try to remember that, sir. So then, Adams said, leaning back in his painted chair, what can we do for you fine gentlemen? Zane stepped forwards. All right, he said, glancing around at the portraits. We're looking for information about something that might have been here in the museum a long time ago. Any of you guys remember a silver horseshoe? Silver horseshoe, Washington mused thoughtfully. Rings a very faint bell, I dare say, although the idea seems a bit impractical on the surface of it. You may wish to ask Miss Sacagawea, Jefferson suggested. She has a better view of the rest of the museum, being on the end near the entryway. James walked along the line of portraits until he came to a large painting of a tall Native American woman in a fringed, buff-colored tunic. Her long black hair fell over one shoulder, glinting in the light of a forest sunset. Um, James began. Hi, miss. Mr. Jefferson said you might know something about an old horseshoe that used to be here in the museum. Do you remember anything like that? The woman in the portrait didn't move for several seconds. Finally, her eyelids fluttered slightly, as if she were rousing herself from a sort of sleep. She glanced at James solemnly, and then nodded past him towards the corridor's broad entrance. The talisman of the rider's mount, she said softly. I remember it. Its voice once sang from the hall beyond you, from its resting place near the window. Zane frowned. 
Uh, I don't think we're talking about the same thing, he said respectfully. This was a silver horseshoe, you know, not the sort of thing that sings, usually. It was no usual relic, the portrait said, and there was a tinge of sadness in her voice. Its home was not of this world, and the hoof from which it came belonged to no ordinary beast. Its voice was tiny, nearly faded to silence, but such was the enchantment of its origin that it still told its sad tale even after so many seasons had passed over it. I alone heard its song and marked its passing. In an awed voice, James asked, Do you remember what happened to it, miss? Sakajawea nodded slowly. The man with the iron cane took it, she said. He enchanted the woman who was curator in that time, making her believe that he had been given special privileges. She helped him unlock the talisman's case. When the man touched the talisman, its song, faint as it was, finally ceased. He took it with him, and it has been gone ever since. The man with the iron cane, Zane whispered, nudging James. Magnuson, you think? James nodded. Who else could it be? Ignatius Magnuson? Jefferson's voice echoed from the corridor. I remember him and his cane. James looked back. You saw him here, too. He was not the sort of man one is likely to forget, Jefferson answered soberly. Had a face like something carved from granite and a tongue like a two-edged sword. We observed him with his classes on occasion, Washington added. Thomas is quite right. Professor Magnuson had a way with cruelty that was very nearly an art form. I knew men like him in my day, men whose words could both build the strongest confidences and cut the deepest wounds. And his iron-tipped cane, I might add, said the portrait of George Washington Carver, was no normal cane. Its power was concealed, but no great secret. Where others seemed to rely on magical wands, Professor Magnuson wielded his horrid cane, and it was revered with much dread. I remember seeing that cane, James said thoughtfully. In the disrecorder vision, it was leaning against the table right next to him. Its handle looked sort of like a falcon or a gargoyle or something. Indeed, that was the man's constant companion, the portrait of Adams said, nodding. Be glad, gentlemen, that his day is past, and you do not have to sit beneath his cold eye. Yeah, Ralph said morosely, as they made their way back along the corridor, heading for the exit. Hooray for us. It was Valentine's evening before the three boys were finally able to attempt the trip through time in pursuit of the infamous Professor Magnuson. Tracking down the date of the professor's disappearance was the easiest part, since, by all accounts, it coincided with the fire that destroyed his erstwhile home. Figuring out how to get the Warping Willow to take them to that exact date, however, proved to be a bit more of a challenge. In the end, Zane had called upon his fellow zombies, including Warrington, to help write the appropriate rhyming verse that would, with any luck, send them back to the evening of October the 8th, 1859. The day leading up to the adventure went exceedingly slowly. James found it very difficult to pay attention in Georgia Burke's magizoology class, even though they were studying live velocipedes, which tended to require constant observation and very quick reflexes. Halfway through the class, James had got nearly bowled over by one of the huge hundred-legged insects. As a result, the creature had squirmed playfully around him in a vigorous hug and licked his face repeatedly with its long, prehensile tongue. "'You'll be all right,' Professor Burke called from outside the muddy pen. "'They're like big puppies, really. Just relax, and she'll get bored with you in a minute. There's no point in trying to disengage yourself, trust me.' James flopped back into the mud and squinted his eyes shut while the velocipede huffed excitedly into his face, its tongue like a miniature rubbery whip. The afternoon's classes had no sooner ended than James had to rush across campus towards Pepperpock Down, munching a sandwich en route and dragging his clutch gear along with him. The afternoon match was against Pixie House, 
and amazingly enough, Team Bigfoot was tied with the Pixies' scoring record. Frankly, James was too preoccupied with the evening's upcoming adventure to care much about the match, but the rest of Team Bigfoot had been wildly heartened by their recent victory over Team Vampire. As a result, they went into that afternoon's match with a grim determination that was, despite James's distraction, quite inspiring. It was no great surprise, therefore, when the Bigfoots prevailed narrowly throughout the match and ended the game with a very slim but breathlessly exciting win over the Pixies. The packed grandstands roared raucously when the final whistle blew, and James realized with some degree of amazement that Team Bigfoot had gone from forgettable losers to admirable underdogs. The entire school, with the obvious exception of whichever house they happened to be playing, suddenly seemed to be rooting for them if only as a novelty. Changing out of his clutch gear and heading for Administration Hall for dinner, James met up with Zane and Ralph. It wasn't until they made their way towards the cafeteria that James remembered that it was the night of the Valentine's dance. Construction paper hearts and cupids flitted through the upper reaches of the halls, occasionally swooping down onto unsuspecting students and chasing them around, producing sudden explosions of giggles and happy screams. What's all that about? James asked as a girl swept past, giggling and batting at the paper cupid that was circling her head. It's Valentine's Day, Zane shrugged. Don't you have Valentine's Day at Hoggies? Yeah, Ralph nodded. I guess, but it's a lot less, uh, screamy. Zane rolled his eyes as he ducked into the cafeteria. It's simple, really. If one of the cupids or hearts lands on you, you have to go and find a girl who's got one of the hearts or cupids stuck on her. You kiss, and then the cupids and hearts let you go. Ah, oh, Ralph said uncomfortably. Maybe we should have just had dinner back at Apollo Mansion. Buck up, Ralph, James smiled, nudging the bigger boy. If you play your cards right, you could wiggle a kiss out of Jasmine. Ralph boggled, and his face reddened. You think so? No, that's... He stopped as the idea firmly began to take root in his mind. His eyes began to dart around the room, watching the flitting paper symbols. It's all about timing, Zane nodded, throwing his arm around Ralph's shoulders. Keep your head down until one of them nabs Jasmine, then up you pop. Obvious, but not too obvious, you know. Those cupids can smell opportunists, so you have to play it cool. James stopped listening as he filled his tray. Half a minute later, the three boys found a seat at one of the long, crowded tables. The cafeteria thrummed with the noise of the post-clutch pre-dance crowd, creating an atmosphere of giddy excitement that very nearly vibrated in the walls. You all set for tonight? Zane asked James as he munched a grilled cheese sandwich. I guess, James shrugged. I've been going over it all day in my head. The sooner we get it over with, the better. I went out to see old Straithwaite in the cemetery again, Zane said quietly, just to make sure we had everything all buttoned up. He said he saw Magnuson leave around eight o'clock on the night of the fire. If we get this right, we'll arrive at the wall gate about half an hour before him. Then we can just hide out and follow him when he shows up. What about Flintlock? James asked suddenly. When do you recognize that we aren't students in that time? What if he thinks we're intruders or something? Funny thing about rock trolls, Zane smiled, tapping his nose. They don't occupy time the same way we do. Did you know that when they're born, they actually age backwards? They get younger as time passes. It's true. Rose looked it up for me at the Hogwarts library. She's like our own private research department, you know? What do you mean by they age backwards? James frowned. You mean Flintlock's younger now than he was when he first came to America hundreds of years ago? Zane shrugged and bobbed his head. Hard to say. A lot of trolls try to learn to age forward in time like we do, especially if they live and work with humans, when in Rome, you know? The point is, Flintlock's grasp on time is pretty slippery. Even in 1859, he'll sort of remember us from the present day. That's totally bizarre, Ralph said, around a mouthful of jello. Yeah, Zane agreed, but the upshot is that even if he does eventually realize we aren't supposed to be around in that time, we'll probably already be long gone, chasing after old Iggy Magnuson. James drew a breath to respond when something fluttered wildly in his ear, startling him. What is it? he cried, batting at the side of his head. Get it off! Calm down, Zane laughed. It's a red cupid! You've been marked, James! 
Better go find somebody to kiss. James stopped flailing. The paper cupid flung a red and pink paper chain around his neck and held on tight. What? James exclaimed, trying to peer down at the figure on his shoulder. No way! I don't have a girlfriend or anything. That's the point, Zane insisted, pushing him up from the table. This is how you get a girlfriend. James's face reddened. But I don't need any help in that area. Ralph shrugged and grinned. Cupid disagrees. What happens if I just rip it off me? Zane shook his head warningly. You can't break the spell that way, mate. They may be paper, but they're stubborn. In five minutes, he'll start pulling your hair out one strand at a time. After that, things will get ugly. James shook his head in irritation and embarrassment, allowing Zane to push him up from his seat. Glancing around the room, he saw several girls with pink hearts and cupids clinging variously to their hair, collars, and necks. He immediately looked away from them, refusing to make eye contact. Oh, Zane encouraged. Julie Margulis has a pink heart. She's a senior. She could teach you a thing or two about kissing. Go for it. No, James hissed. He angled out from between the tables, keeping his eyes lowered. He tugged at the cupid, but it only renewed its grip on the paper chain around his neck. We'll see how you like a little hot water splashed on your chain, you little imp, he warned, stalking towards the bathroom, head down. Just try to hang on to me when you're soggy as a... He stopped suddenly as he ran into someone else, nearly knocking them both to the ground. James, a girl's voice said, surprised, and James groaned inwardly. Uh, hi, Lou, he said, the blush on his face deepening from pink to brick red. Sorry, didn't see you. Me neither, she admitted, glancing away and tugging at her shoulder. A red heart was stuck there, apparently by some sort of magical magnetism. I was just on my way to, uh... James saw the look of miserable embarrassment on his cousin's face, saw her eyes as she refused to look at him. Hey, Lou, he said quietly, as she finally looked up at him. He took a quick breath and went on. Sorry about the other day. I was a total burk. I should have just asked you straight up for what I needed. Can you forgive me? She studied his eyes for a moment and then slumped slightly. I forgave you that very night, she admitted shyly. I can't stay mad at you, no matter how hard I want to, and I really did want to. James glanced around the room to make sure no one was watching, and then leaned close to the shorter girl. I wasn't trying to trick you when I asked you to go to the Halloween dance with me, Lou, he said earnestly. I asked you because I knew I'd have fun with you, and I did. You had fun too, right? I didn't mean for it to be, uh, confusing. Lucy shook her head and dropped her eyes. Don't say any more, James. I'm already mortified. Just let me sneak off to the girls' bathroom and see if I can soak this stupid heart off of me. James smiled sheepishly. I was going to do the same thing, he admitted. I mean, not in the girls' bathroom, though, of course. I was going to, um... He paused, looking down at her as a completely unexpected idea occurred to him. It was probably stupid, but suddenly that didn't seem to matter very much. Uh, he began, and she glanced up at him. Her eyes were huge and very dark, cautiously inquisitive. Uh, he said again, and swallowed. I mean, I know we're cousins and all, but we're not really blood or anything, like. We could maybe just... But suddenly Lucy was pulling away, caught up in a mass of students who pushed past, screaming and laughing. You lost your chance with this little vampire potter, Gobbins grinned, taking Lucy by the shoulder. You snooze, you lose. With a quick, messy smack, he kissed Lucy on the corner of her mouth. Immediately, the paper heart flitted up from her shoulder and darted out over the cafeteria. Lucy touched the corner of her mouth, simultaneously peeved and amused. Happy Valentine's Day, Lucy, Gobbins called with a grin as he backed away. Lucy blushed and smiled, a little flustered. James sighed deeply, his face heating. Yeah, he agreed somberly. Happy Valentine's Day. Before Lucy could reply, he ducked into the boy's bathroom, tugging at the cupid that still clung to his neck. I told you you couldn't just rip it off, Zane whispered some hours later as the three boys stole through the darkness towards the warping willow. Don't remind me, James rasped. Let's just forget the whole thing ever happened, all right? 
It was a good thing for you that Mother Newt saw you in the hall and knew how to summon a paper heart for herself, Zane said, shaking his head. Otherwise, you'd probably be spear ball by now. So, was she a good kisser, then? James fumed silently. I hear she was quite a looker back in the day, Ralph mused. Zane considered this. Way back in the day, maybe. Would you both shut up about it? James exclaimed in a loud hiss. We're nearly there. You got the note? Right here, Zane acknowledged, producing a folded scrap of parchment from his pocket. He's hoping it works. Silently, the boys crept underneath the low-hanging limbs of the warping willow. All around, the campus was dark and quiet, overhung by a huge moon and a sprinkle of glittering stars. I think you're supposed to read it first, Ralph said, nudging Zane, and then you drop it in the knot hole in the trunk. I know, I know, Zane mumbled. All right, here it goes. The blond boy unfolded the note and peered at it by the dim light of the moon. He took a deep breath and read aloud. Warping Willow, take we three, to a date that's nifty fine. In the nineteenth century, 8th October, fifty-nine. Rolling his eyes, Zane crumpled the note and dropped it into the hole in the willow's trunk. Nifty fine, Ralph repeated quizzically. Hey, you try to find a rhyme for fifty-nine. Zane replied tersely. See what you come up with. Do you think it'll work? James asked, looking around. As if in answer, the tree's limbs began to sway and whisper all around. Very slowly, the stars beyond the tree's canopy began to move like painted dots on a monstrous black dome. We're going somewhere, at least, Zane said. Let's hope we got everything right and don't end up in the Stone Age or something. You're joking, right? Ralph asked nervously. Neither Zane nor James replied. Accompanied by the shushing movement of the willow's limbs, time began to unravel all around. Night crept backwards into day, only to be followed swiftly by night once again. The sun and moon chased each other faster and faster through the sky, becoming streaks as the days grew into a flickering blur. Winter came and went again, and then the leaves sprang up onto the trees all around, changing from autumn orange to vibrant summer green. Seasons melted together as years sped into decades, spiraling steadily backwards. Finally, the whip-like branches of the warping willow began to relax. The wicker of the leaves settled to a whisper as the sun resolved into an individual orb again, dropping past the horizon, descending into a single chilly night. The moon crept up into the sky a thin sickle shape now, and stopped. Well, Zane said, his voice unconsciously hushed. We're here, I hope. How do we know what year it is? James asked as they skulked out from beneath the tree into the weedy-walled yard that formed the entrance to Muggle Philadelphia. Do we just wait and hope for the best? Ralph nodded. I don't think we have much of a choice. Are you sure about the incantation that takes us back to the school? That one's easy, Zane whispered. I've heard it about a thousand times, and it never really changes, so long as you know the time frame that the Aleron is occupying on any given day. Warrington worked it out with me, so that's no problem. Shh, James rasped suddenly, pushing Ralph and Zane backwards behind him. He nodded towards the gate and whispered, Look! Both boys looked and saw the hunkered shape of Flintlock. He was in his resting form, looking like nothing more than a pile of great mossy boulders near the closed gate. As they watched, a clatter of hooves on cobbles could be heard beyond the gate. A shadow passed by on the street outside, followed by a rattle of wheels. Well, Ralph whispered, horses and carriages. That's a good sign, I guess. James nodded. Together, the three boys hunkered down into the weeds near the yard's furthest corner. As they waited, the sounds of the Muggle city filled the small yard, echoing off the stone walls. James heard indistinct voices and laughter, as well as the more distant bellows of working men, probably down by the river. Clangs and whistles marked the passage of ships on the dark waterway. The crisp breeze carried the scent of smoke, horse manure, and rotting fish. After a few minutes, a bell began to toll the hour, ringing clearly in the darkness. Eight chimes pealed out, diminishing slowly into the silence. Any moment now? Zane whispered, watching the warping willow carefully. I hope he comes quick, like, Ralph replied quietly. My bum's going to sleep. 
Several more minutes crept by, each one seeming as long as an hour. James began to worry that they had missed their target date somehow. He opened his mouth to say so when the tree began to rustle faintly in front of them. This is it, Zane rasped, his eyes bulging with anticipation. Keep low so he doesn't see us. James hunkered down in the weeds, hoping the darkness and the overgrowth would be enough to hide them. Shortly, the motion of the tree increased, hiding the space beneath it. James held his breath, watching. With a shudder and a sort of sigh, the limbs relaxed and a figure stepped purposely out from beneath the willow. There was no question of who the figure was. Even in the darkness, the fringe of short grey hair and the chiselled features of Ignatius Magnuson were clearly visible. Further dispelling any doubt, the man thumped the ground with his cane, and James saw moonlight glinting off the hooked iron face of its handle. Awake, my friend, Magnuson announced in his unmistakable British accent, speaking to Flintlock. I have one final duty to perform this evening, and then you will know me no more. Slowly, Flintlock stirred, his movements like a miniature landslide in reverse. Professor, the troll said, spying the man before him. I'm afraid I cannot allow you to pass. I have orders directly from Chancellor Franklin himself. Magnuson lowered his head and stepped forward in a friendly fashion. I am quite certain that you do, my friend, he said. But look here. With that, Magnuson raised his cane, holding the iron head aloft nearly at the troll's eye level. A green flash lit the troll's face, sparkling in his diamond chip eyes, and Flintlock stopped moving. Open the gate, Magnuson ordered, and all the friendliness had dropped out of his voice. Or I will unmake you and return you to the guts of the earth. A million pebbles without memory of the shape they once comprised. Jerkily, almost as if he were being operated by a careless puppet master, Flintlock reached for the gate. He wrenched it open in one swift motion, ripping the vines that had grown up through the bars. Thank you, my friend, Magnuson said easily, lowering his cane. With a sweep of his cloak, he strode through the entrance and disappeared into the dark street beyond. That was an imperious curse, Zane breathed worriedly. He imperioed Flintlock! Come on, James whispered, scrambling to his feet. But what about Flintlock? Ralph asked. What if he tries to stop us? Zane approached the great stony troll carefully and then patted him on the knee. I don't think he's going to notice anything for a while, he said with a shudder. James looked up at the troll as he passed. Flintlock's eyes stared straight ahead, glinting dully in the moonlight. More than anything, he looked like a machine that had been temporarily switched off. Come on, Zane nodded soberly. Mags went to the right. We'll have to hurry up or we'll lose sight of him. With a renewed sense of urgency, the three boys darted through the open doorway out into the streets of 19th century Muggle Philadelphia. To James's eye, Muggle Philadelphia didn't look immediately very different, despite the change of nearly two centuries. The streets were narrower and cobbled rather than paved, and the footpaths were made of uneven slabs of stone, leaning somewhat drunkenly towards the brick-lined gutters. What street lamps there were flickered with gas flames instead of the bright incandescence of the modern lights. The houses that lined the streets, however, seemed nearly unchanged, apart from the lack of any televisions flashing behind the windows. Occasionally, a black carriage or handsome cab would trundle past in the toe of large horses, their eyes hidden behind black blinders, their harnesses creaking and jingling. This would be a lot easier if there were more people on the street, Ralph whispered as they trailed Magnuson. If he turns around, he'll see us straight away. Just walk casual, Zane muttered, and try to keep in the shadows. Magnuson strode briskly his cape billowing behind him like bat wings in the chilly breeze. The three boys had to occasionally trot to keep him in sight as he zigzagged through the narrow residential streets. Obviously, Magnuson knew exactly where he was going and was sparing no time in getting there. Shortly, the boys trailed the big man into a neighborhood of much larger houses, 
most surrounded by low stone walls and wrought iron gates. The gas lampposts were more prominent here, and the windows of the houses glowed brightly, making it harder for the three boys to stay hidden in the shadows. Magnuson never once looked back, however, even as he turned sharply and descended into a narrow alley. We're heading down towards the river, Zane whispered as they ducked into the alley. Wrong side of the track, city. What's that mean? Ralph asked. I didn't see any tracks. It means keep a sharp eye out, Ralph Inader, Zane said grimly. This area is seedy enough in our own day. I don't expect it's any better in this time frame. Watch your back. Fortunately, it was much easier for the boys to follow Magnuson here, since the streets were very narrow and crowded with carts, uneven stacks of crates and barrels, and parked carriages. Figures moved in the dim recesses of doorways, or skulked along the cobbled road, their feet splashing in the puddles that trickled downhill towards the river beyond. James realized that they had got close enough to Magnuson to hear his boot heels knocking hollowly on the cobbles. How far is he going to go? Zane whispered, darting behind a row of empty carts. We're nearly to the waterfront. Those are the wharves up ahead. After that, there's nothing but river. Suddenly, Magnuson stopped and turned around. James ducked behind the nearest cart, his heart leaping up into his throat. Both Ralph and Zane hunkered down next to him. After a long, tense moment, the three dared to peek out from beneath the cart, their chins virtually touching the wet street. Magnuson was fingering his cane as he peered around the cramped intersection, his eyes narrowed. Finally, apparently satisfied, he turned and stalked into an even narrower alley. That looks like a dead end, James whispered, doesn't it? Zane nodded. Come on, we can get closer if we hide behind that pile of broken crates. As quietly as possible, the three boys crept along the edge of the street into the shadow of the jagged pile. Bits of broken wood crunched underfoot as the three gathered against the corner of a brick warehouse. It is a dead end, Ralph whispered, peering cautiously around the corner. There's a little stairway at the end, though, and a door. Looks like a cheap little flat or something. Zane craned his head around the corner as well, squinting in the darkness. Any sign of old Mags? No, Ralph shook his head. He must have gone inside. You think maybe it's his flat, like... He rendered it special just to have a place outside of school. James nodded. He needed a place to hide the horseshoe where nobody magical would sense its power. While it was up in the museum, it was probably lost in the background noise of all the other magical relics up there. Once he took it out, though, he'd need to keep it hidden. This is probably the perfect place. So, Ralph whispered, turning back around and leaning against the grimy bricks, how are we going to get the horseshoe from him? Zane rubbed his hands together against the cold. Right, what's the plan, James? Me, James rasped. I thought you were in charge of that detail. I got the verse to get us through the warping willow, Zane frowned defensively. Ralph glanced worriedly from Zane to James. And, uh, I'm the one what found old zombie Professor Strafeway. Without him, we wouldn't have got anywhere at all. Hold on, James said, poking a finger into the air. We got this far, and none of us has any plan for how to actually get the unicorn's horseshoe from Magnuson? Well, Zane shrugged, we could just send Ralph out there with his Godzilla wand. I'd put your wand up against that evil cane of his any day, Ralph Ineda. No way I'm dueling a bloat like that, Ralph replied, shaking his head vigorously. Not after the way all those portraits talked about him. Let's not forget that the man's a bloody murderer. James nodded soberly. That's true. We have to be dead careful, or just plain dead. Zane gulped. Don't get spooked yet, James said reasonably. We still need to follow him to the Nexus Curtain. We can figure something out along the way. Yeah, Zane nodded. Figuring stuff out along the way. That's always worked out great for us in the past. Shh, Ralph hissed, peering back around the corner. Here he comes. A door thunked shut in the darkness. It was followed by the tromp of boots on squeaky stairs. James peeked around the corner, followed by Zane. Together, the three boys watched the shadowy form of Professor Magnuson as he stalked along the alley, his feet splashing in the puddles and his cane glinting in the darkness. Hey! a man's voice called out suddenly. James startled, as did Zane and Ralph. Magnuson stopped in his tracks, wary as a jackal. 
After a few tense seconds, the voice spoke again, timidly, but with stubborn resolution. She knew you'd come back, it said, and there was a hint of a disbelieving laugh in it. I told her she was crazy. You'd never come back here, not after what happened. But here you are, bold as brass, big as life. Magnuson hadn't moved. His voice came out of the darkness silkily. You have me at a disadvantage, friend, he said. Come into the light so I can see you. What, so you can do to me what you did to her? The voice scoffed nervously. In spite of its words, however, a figure moved into the mouth of the alley. He was a young man, barely twenty years old very thin and wearing a bowler hat. Braces were slung over his shoulders, holding up a pair of ill-fitting flannel trousers. He was less than fifteen feet away from James, Zane, and Ralph, where they hid in the shadow of the broken crates. Have we met, good sir? Magnuson asked calmly, taking a step forwards. Oh, yeah, we've met, the man spat, although I doubt you'd remember it. Frederica even talked to you about me. She was worried that you might get the wrong ideas about her. A big, fancy man like you from up in the heights, coming down here to engage the services of a common seamstress. I heard all about how you stared at her when she delivered your mended coats and capes, how you looked like you were measuring her up with your eyes, like she was just a piece of meat and you were a butcher. She told you she had a fiancé just so you knew where you stood with her. To me, she said, not to worry, that she could handle herself and she needed the money you were paying her. It turns out she was right about you, wasn't she? Poor little Frederica, who never would have heard a fly. You were a butcher, after all. You killed her, mangled her, and left her in the street for us to find. And now here you are, come right back to the very scene, just as bold as you please. This is a misunderstanding, my good man, Magnuson said soothingly, still stepping forward. To James, he looked like a cat slowly creeping up on its prey. Silently, James drew his wand from his pocket. Next to him, he sensed Ralph and Zane doing the same. Helen said you'd come back, the man said, and then he laughed a little hysterically. At his side, he held a length of iron, a crowbar. Helen is Frederica's little sister, you know. She has a sense about these things. I didn't believe her, at least not completely. But you know what? I believed her enough to keep a watch on this here alley. When I saw you come here tonight, saw you stand right here on this spot, looking around like you owned the place, I barely believed my own eyes. But Helen was right. You came back. The man began to stride forwards then, raising the crowbar. He looked like he barely knew what he meant to do with it. Magnuson didn't move. Now look here, my good man he said, with a smile in his voice. Suddenly, the thin man flew up from the pavement, flailing wildly in the air and dropping the crowbar. It clattered loudly to the cobbles, spinning away into a puddle. A moment later, the man himself crashed into a stack of barrels at the rear of the alley. The barrels toppled and tumbled over each other, burying the man. So much ugliness, Magnuson sighed to himself, turning towards the rear of the alley. When will these people ever learn? A barrel clattered sideways as the skinny man scrambled to his feet again, his face pale but determined in the dimness. I don't know who or what you are, you demon, he breathed, but you aren't leaving this alley for Frederica. You know, Magnuson said magnanimously, the young lady did speak of you now that you mention it. Your name is William, isn't it? Yes. She screamed your name, in fact, near the end of her life. I wouldn't have thought that she had been capable of something so strenuous at that point, but that just goes to show the difference between theory and reality. It was highly instructive, in fact. I'll tell you what. As thanks, I will grant you your greatest wish. I will send you to join your dear departed Frederica. Perhaps you will scream her name as well. The skinny man barely seemed to hear Magnuson. He lurched to his feet, limping pathetically, and began to lope towards the older man, his bare hands held before him, hooked into claws. In the darkness, Magnuson raised his cane, smiling malevolently. No! James cried out, leaping out into the alley and brandishing his wand. His voice, however, was drowned out by a loud, echoing crack 
nearly deafening in the confined space of the alley. Too late, James thought hectically, still aiming his wand wildly at Magnuson's back. He's killed him! The skinny man, William, did not fall, however. James blinked into the darkness of the alley, waiting for Magnuson's evil spell to take effect. Instead, Magnuson lowered his cane and then dropped it. It clattered to the cobbles. A moment later, Magnuson himself fell to his knees. How? he asked, looking up at William. Slowly, almost ponderously, Magnuson fell forwards, flat on his face in the centre of the alley, dead. For Frederica, a girl's voice said faintly. James looked to the side. A young woman, barely older than James himself, stood nearby. She stared at Magnuson's dead body, her face a mask of pale resignation. In her outstretched hand, smoking lazily, was a small pistol. For Frederica, she repeated faintly. From her fiancé, William, and from me, her sister Helen. The girl, Helen, had seen the three boys, but didn't seem particularly interested in them. Zane, being wise enough to opt for the truth when it was the most appropriate, simply told her that the dead man in the alley had stolen something from their school. Thus, he and his friends had followed him in the hopes of getting it back. William, still limping, had been surprised to see Helen and her pistol, but only a little. Kneeling over the body of Magnuson, he had retrieved the man's evil magical cane. With a swift, decisive movement, he broke the cane over his knee. The long end he tossed into the gutter, but the handle he peered at in his hand, studying the glint of moonlight on the leering metal face. He shuddered. Your stolen goods might not be the sort of thing that would fit in a velvet bag, would they? he asked dourly, looking down at the body. James nodded. Could be, he answered, stepping gingerly forward. As he approached Magnuson's prone figure, he saw a drawstring sack lying next to the corpse, still hooked over the left wrist. Feeling a wave of revulsion, James tugged the loop of the string from around the dead man's wrist. The hand thumped back to the street with a faint smack. You three, William said faintly, looking at the boys. You're like him, ain't you? James swallowed thickly and shook his head, but Ralph, surprisingly, was the one to speak up. We're sorry for what happened to Frederica, he said solemnly. This man may have been a part of our world, but we aren't like him. William stared at Ralph, his eyes wide and shining in the darkness. Slowly, he nodded. Helen moved next to him and put an arm around his shoulders, still staring down at Magnuson's body, as if mesmerized by it. Her face was very pale, and James had a suspicion that the girl had been sick only moments earlier, probably behind the same broken crates where he, Zane, and Ralph had hidden. I don't know what's in that velvet bag, William said, shuddering, and I'm sure I don't wanna. This is over. You go your way, and me and Helen, we'll try to go ours. Fair enough? James nodded. He could feel the cold weight of the horseshoe through the velvet of the sack. Slowly, he backed away from the body of Magnuson. Zane and Ralph followed, and a moment later, all three boys turned and ran out of the alley. They ran almost the entire way back to the Alma Alaron gate, where Flintlock was only just beginning to come out of the trance Magnuson had cast over him. The rock troll remembered them in that hazy reverse time way that Zane had predicted, and allowed them to approach the warping willow. Zane recited the incantation that would return them to the school, and the tree began to shiver all around them. The moon and stars started to roll forwards again, taking them back to the school and their own time. Throughout the journey home, James held the velvet bag, fingering the distinctive shape inside it. Neither he, Zane, nor Ralph said a word. They didn't have to. Chapter 19 Unhelpful Revelations They killed him? Rose asked the following day, speaking through the shard on the back of the dormitory room door. Shot him dead? Right there in the street? It was like something from a movie, Ralph nodded soberly. Only in real life, it doesn't feel so exciting. It was just sad and shocking and sort of final. It didn't fix anything that had been done. 
it just stopped more bad things from happening. The poor girl, Rose said sadly, shaking her head. Maybe Magnuson deserved what he got, but she'll have to live with what she did for the rest of her life. That's what courts of law are for. Boo hoo, Scorpius scoffed, sitting on the other end of the sofa in the Gryffindor common room. You think some muggle court would be able to capture and convict someone like Magnuson? Don't kid yourself. I'm more interested in the horseshoe, anyway. Let us see it, why don't you? James swallowed hard and turned towards his bunk. A moment later, he retrieved the black velvet bag from beneath his mattress. We haven't found a decent hiding place for it yet, he said, loosening the drawstring and sliding the cold metal shape into his right hand. If it was too magical for Magnuson to keep on campus, then the same is probably true for us. Someone's bound to sense its power and come sniffing around to see what it is. He crossed to the shard and held the horseshoe up before it, cradling the silvery weight gingerly in his palm. The metal was dulled and clouded with myriad scratches, but its shape was unmistakable. Purplish light glinted along its curved edges. It's bigger than I would have expected. Rose said, having approached the mirror on the Hogwarts side of the shard. It looks heavy, somehow. It is, James admitted, almost like it comes from a place where gravity is less important, and it glows a little, too. You can't see it unless all the lights are turned off and it's totally dark, but it's there, sort of faint purple, like the last bit of sunset. I can almost sense the magic from here, Rose said quietly. You're right. You definitely need to hide it somewhere safe. At least until we can find a way to use it to get into the world between the worlds, Ralph nodded. But that's our main problem now, James said, turning back around and carrying the horseshoe to his bed. On the other side of the shard, Scorpius sighed. Ah, yes. Up until now, everyone believed that your Professor Magnuson had escaped into the Nexus with the help of his dimensional key. Now that you know that the man was, in fact, killed by a muggle bullet, you have no way of knowing where the Nexus curtain actually is. That was supposed to be the easy part, Ralph acknowledged, flopping back onto his bed. We thought we'd just have to follow Magnuson to the curtain. Getting the horseshoe from him was supposed to be the difficult bit. James finished stuffing the horseshoe under his mattress again and stood up. We're not completely stumped, he said stubbornly. We still have Magnuson's other riddle, the one about the Nexus curtain lying in the eyes of Robitz. Zane's back working on that one again, although it's looking pretty bleak. There aren't a whole lot of Robitzes in the world. I'll look it up on my side, Rose said briskly. Maybe it isn't a person at all. You never know. James sighed. Thanks, Rose. We appreciate your help. Petra, too. I'm doing this to help you and Uncle Harry to find out the truth, James, Rose said meeting his gaze through the glass of shard. If it helps Petra, then that's all for the best. I'm not quite as confident about her as you are, though. Sorry. James sighed again and nodded. From behind Rose, Scorpius watched James, his own eyes sharp, narrowed. Scorpius was more than unconvinced of Petra's innocence, James knew. Scorpius was outright suspicious of her. Deep down, despite his own feelings to the contrary, James couldn't blame him. As spring settled firmly over the school, tulips, daffodils, and snapdragons began to crowd the flowerbeds that lined the mall. The snapdragons, being of a magical variety, occasionally leaned lazily and nipped at the fat bumblebees that patrolled the flowerbeds. The days grew longer and warmer, and James finally packed away his winter cloak, happy to relegate it to the top of his wardrobe, along with his dress robes and the backup pair of spectacles that his mother had insisted he pack, which were, in reality, hand-me-downs from his father. Clutch cudgel matches went from gruelling, dark and icy affairs to exhilarating romps through the mild evenings, lit by the rose-gold light of the later sunsets. Team Bigfoot continued its dogged refusal to be knocked out of the final tournament playoffs, winning a few matches, tying even more. Fortunately, since their standings had gradually improved over the course of the season, tie games often meant technical victories for the orange and blue team. No one expected the Foots to actually get into the final tournament, but at least no one expected them to get knocked out easily. James was quietly very proud of the team and his own unique involvement with it. 
Even if they still ended up dead last in the overall season standings, it would be a close thing. More importantly, the other teams respected Team Bigfoot now, or, at the very least, didn't openly mock them. Oliver Wood still showed a stubborn reluctance to encourage the use of anything other than the most basic magic during his team's matches. He did, however, allow the continuation of the team's game magic meetings, and James began showing his fellow players some of the artist Deserto tricks he'd learned during his last year's Defence Against the Dark Arts classes with Professor Kendrick de Bellows. It isn't just about beating the other guy's magic with your own magic, he attempted to explain. It's about beating his magic with your mind, by knowing what he's going to do even before he does it, and being ready for it. Mind reading? Gobbins frowned sceptically. I never understood that crazy voodoo stuff. It's not voodoo, Ralph said, shaking his head. It's just knowing how people usually act, and guessing what they're going to do before they do it. It's easier than you think. People are a lot less unpredictable than you'd ever guess. James nodded enthusiastically. Look at the Igors, he said, standing up. Say it's the third quarter and they're down by ten. You see three of their clippers lining up around the second turn. What are they up to? Jasmine laughed and shook her head. They're stacking a pile drive maneuver. Their elite clipper has the clutch, and if he loses it somehow, he'll just toss it back to the guy behind him. That way they've got two man insurance that they'll make it to the goal. That's what I'm talking about, James nodded, pointing at her. We don't have to wait to see what they're going to do in that situation. We already know that's their standard procedure. So we act first, sending some bullies back to get in between them even before they line up. That's Artis Deserto. But that's not all it is, Wentworth said, tilting his head. It's also those crazy acrobatics you do out there on the scrim. You look like one of those guys from Cirque de Blasé. My mom took me to that last year. Norrick interjected. Wentworth turned to him. Did you like it? Nah, Norrick shrugged. When I think circus, I think guys walking tightropes and taming tigers and making pyramids out of dozens of elephants and stuff. I don't usually think of a bunch of dudes in tights swinging around on velvet ropes and doing yoga on flying carpets. Sounds pretty interesting to me, Jasmine admitted. Norrick rolled his eyes. That's because you're a girl. Thanks for noticing, Jasmine replied sourly. At least when Ralph says it, it sounds like a good thing. She smiled at Ralph across the room and his cheeks reddened. He coughed lightly and looked helplessly at James. Yeah, James nodded, struggling to stay on topic. Artist Deserto is also about acrobatic kinds of stuff, too. It's just a matter of using your whole body, sort of like a tool or a weapon or a torpedo. Whatever best suits the situation. You put both ideas together, and not only will you know what the other guy is about to do, you'll already be getting yourself into position to defeat it. Like when you got between that zombie clipper and bully last match? Wentworth exclaimed, sitting forwards. And you pretended to have a clutch under your arm, so the bully would aim a gravity well at you, but then you spun around up over the other guy at just the right moment, and the bully shot his spell at his own clipper and knocked him right out of the course, and then ran into him because he was so surprised that he didn't even see the other guy behind you until you all went topsy-turvy, and they both crashed into the ring like a couple of blind rafe ringers. His eyes bulged excitedly at the memory. Then he sighed deeply, leaning back again. That was beautiful. Zane sure didn't think it was funny, Ralph muttered, although he did admit that it was a pretty good move. Yeah, James agreed, nodding at Wentworth. Like that. But how do we practice stuff like that? Another player, Luca Fiorello, asked from the corner near the window. James nodded resolutely. Good question, he admitted. And he won't like the answer, but, well, me, Ralph, Zane, and Professor Cloverhoof have set up something in the backyard. It's not anywhere near as good as the one back at Hogwarts, and Zane and Professor Cloverhoof only helped us build it because we agreed to let Team Zombie use it as well. But trust us, it's the best way to learn artist Deserto. Come on over and take a look. James led the team out onto the third-floor landing, where they all crowded around the window that overlooked the mansion's walled back garden. There was a moment of tense, puzzled silence. Finally, Jasmine spoke up. What is it? she asked, frowning. 
James sighed at the irony of it all. In the yard below was a haphazard clockwork monstrosity of wooden cogs, treadmills, pommels, swinging weights, and wand-studded barrels. It's called the Gauntlet, he admitted, and it's about to be your worst enemy. Classes at Alma Alaron, which had at first seemed exotic and strange, had by now grown routine and even boring. James's favorite classes were clockwork mechanics, advanced elemental transmutation, which was the American equivalent of transfiguration, theoretical gravity, which was still being taught by Oliver Wood, and magi American history with Professor Paul Bunyan. Having lived that long and amazing life of a giant in the country's frontier days, the professor taught a lot of his classes by way of first-hand stories. Some of the stories, admittedly, were embroidered with obvious tall tales, such as the details surrounding the origin of the Rocky Mountains, allegedly piles of cast-off rocks gleaned out of the giant's boot treads with a redwood trunk, and the creation of the Great Lakes, claimed to have been dug out by the giant's footprints when he was wrestling Babe, the giant blue ox, for the last pancake of a particularly delicious breakfast. A vampire boy had once deigned to challenge Professor Bunyan's tall tales, confronting him with the fact that while he was indeed quite large, he was nowhere near big enough to leave footprints the size of Lake Superior. Were you bigger back then, maybe? the boy asked, a smile curling the corner of his mouth. Professor Bunyan merely scoffed and waved a hand. I was always the same size, he said, his dark eyes twinkling. But the world was a lot smaller back in those days. It's a known fact. Just ask Professor Wimwrinkle. James had a suspicion that Bunyan knew that no one would actually do any such thing, being generally terrified of the majography professor. Thus, his allegations were nominally safe. Majography was, in fact, near the top of the list of James's least loved classes. Only marginally worse, however, was forbidden practices and cursology with the insufferable Persephone Remora. Remora had, it seemed, developed a bit of a fixation with James and his famous father. As a result, her attitude towards him seemed to swing between doting favoritism and spiteful jealousy. James never knew, on any given Thursday afternoon, whether the professor would gesture for him to sit close to her in the front row, where she would favour him with conspiratorial winks and infuriatingly condescending pats on the head, or glower at him darkly, annoyed and impatient at his apparent lack of awe for her accomplishments and her self-proclaimed dark wiles. James's last essay had been returned to him with the incomprehensible grade of insipid plus, scrawled across the top of it in red, followed by the handwritten comment, You show mild promise if you receive the proper tutelage. You know my office hours. See me. She either has a crush on you, or she wants to poison you, Zane whispered, peering at the handwriting atop James's essay. And you never know. With her it could be both. No way I'm seeking her out for proper tutelage, James hissed from behind his hand. I'll take insipid plus for the rest of the year if I have to. From the front of the classroom, Remora narrowed her eyes at him, her red lips pressed into a tight frown. The rest of the semester's classes dragged on with varying degrees of boredom, challenge, and occasional strangeness. Muggle occupation studies, for instance, seemed to be the Alma Alaron version of Muggle studies, but with a specific emphasis on learning about Muggle careers and working conditions. Most of the class times were spent on discussions of the difference between such concepts as water cooler breaks and coffee runs, cubicles versus corner offices, elevator etiquette, surreptitious use of magic in muggle surroundings, and how to converse about the sort of things most muggles seem to be interested in, such as muggle sports, television, and the weather. James didn't quite understand the point of the class, since he himself planned to become an aura like his father— but the teacher, a very fat woman by the name of Heather Wozniak, who for some reason nearly always wore a pink jogging outfit, insisted that muggle occupational familiarity was absolutely essential for all witches and wizards in the current social climate of magical muggle diversification. James accepted this with a sigh, secretly vowing to forget everything he was learning once the final exams were over. 
potion-making class continued to be an intriguing challenge, despite the noticeable lack of Petra as Professor Baruti's assistant. Besides teaching traditional Native American forms of potion-making via visits to the ancient city of Shakamaxon, Baruti spent much time demonstrating potion techniques from many of the world's magical cultures, including Oriental enchant teas, African steam creatures, and Russian cold soup tonics most of which were made with a very potent clear liquor known as Storch, known to melt cauldrons if they were not thoroughly pre-oiled with a thick coating of mucus eel slime. James had once approached Professor Baruti after class and asked how things were going with Petra. "'Miss Morganston is coming along very well,' Baruti replied easily, displaying one of his stunningly bright smiles. "'I see her once a week. Most of the time she misses her freedom.' but our French is a magnifique. James nodded. Any word about the investigation with that Keynes bloke? I haven't heard a word about it from my parents. I think they're trying to keep me from worrying about it, but I can handle it. Baruti clucked his tongue and shook his head dismissively. Don't you worry about that, young Master James. Miss Morganston is not worried. Why should you be? If tomorrow brings trouble, it will bring the solution as well. He patted James on the shoulder with his large, calloused hand, and James nodded disconsolately. The only class that James was performing particularly poorly in was arithmetics. Taught by a young professor named Plumvole, with far more enthusiasm for the subject than actual teaching ability, James simply couldn't wrap his mind around the long, dense formulas and symbols scrawled onto the magical blackboard. As a result, he was pressed to attend occasional tutoring sessions with Professor Plumvole in his office on the fifth floor of Administration Hall. The professor was thoroughly patient with James, explaining the concepts over and over on parchment, while James leaned on the desk, his forehead cradled helplessly in his hands. He still didn't understand the equations, but Plumvole was so infatuated with his own explanations that he didn't notice James's complete lack of involvement. As a result, Plumvole completed all of James's homework, while James himself merely watched. At the end of the last session, Plumvole clapped James heartily on the shoulder, promising that they were making excellent progress. Sheepishly, James nodded, shrugged, and bid the professor good night. It was growing dark outside the administration hall's tall windows as James meandered his way to the ground floor. Passing a set of propped-open auditorium doors, however, he heard a familiar voice. It was Professor Wood giving a lecture to an audience of college-level students. James remembered that Wood taught a subject called Ethics of Magic, which Zane had promised was dead boring. Still, James was curious. He stopped to listen, hovering just inside the open doorway. So, Wood was saying, turning to a huge blackboard and pointing his wand at it. The question of intervention revolves around these three primary questions, motive, benefit, and repercussion. Before considering any intervention in the affairs of our muggle fellows, we must honestly ask ourselves, one, why are we doing it? Is it truly for the muggle's good, or for another, more selfish reason? Two, what is the real benefit that might be gained by such an intervention? Is it worth the risks involved? We cannot judge this on feelings alone. We must answer this impartially and honestly. Finally, what are all the possible repercussions of such an action? As in the example, if a fellow wizard is being attacked by muggle robbers in an alley, and we stun the leader within sight of his cohorts, is the damage of that magical revelation worth the money that the attackers might have stolen? This is a safe example, for it involves only money, and it is therefore easier to consider. But the equation might well involve lives rather than coin. It is ethically incumbent on us to consider. If we save a life, but harm the integrity of the magical muggle worlds for thousands of others, is that a worthy intervention? There are no obvious conclusions, but as we have seen in the examples, any interaction between the muggle and magical worlds that fails in any one of these considerations threatens, at the very least, the integrity of those involved, and, potentially, the very stability of our twin cultures. Easy answers are tempting, as we all know, answers that rely on emotion and goodwill and basic concepts of immediate justice, but easy answers can lead to horrific consequences. 
This is the weight of responsibility that we, unlike our muggle brothers, bear. It is no easy burden, but that does not give us an excuse to shrug it off. We must consider the fact that, despite how we might feel, sometimes it is better and more deeply responsible to do nothing. Sometimes we cannot trust our feelings alone. Sometimes the heart is a liar. James didn't quite understand everything that Wood was saying, but the last part stuck with him. Sometimes the heart is a liar. Petra Morganston had, in fact, said something almost exactly like that, James remembered, months earlier when they'd talked, strangely enough, about the Bible story of Adam and Eve. Eve had borne the burden of the same sort of responsibility that Wood was talking about, the responsibility to consider that sometimes what felt right was, in fact, exactly the wrong thing to do. She wasn't evil, Petra had said that day as they'd walked towards the warping willow under Professor Baruti's shimmering rainbow umbrella. She was just misinformed. She was doing what she felt was best. Sometimes the heart is a liar. Petra had told him that day, her eyes solemn. In James's memory, though, Petra didn't sound quite like she meant it. She sounded more as if she was trying on the concept, the way someone might try on a shoe or a hat, just to see if it fit. For some reason, the thought made James shudder. Without waiting for Professor Wood to finish his lecture, he turned and followed the hall towards the stairs at the far end, shaking his head worriedly. It was fully dark outside by the time James crossed the campus, heading towards Apollo Mansion. The mall was virtually deserted, lit by the occasional lamppost and the glow of lights from the other houses. Light glinted off a dark orb as James passed a pool. Stopping, he saw that it was the octosphere. It turned slowly, shimmering in the moon glow and creating its soft, almost inaudible rumble. James frowned at it in the darkness, thinking— Professor Magnuson had created the octosphere, his first attempt at reading all things in the universe at once, and therefore predicting and controlling the future. Everyone believed that Magnuson had finally succeeded, in a way. They believed that he had escaped into the world between the worlds, leaving this dimension forever. James knew the truth, however. Magnuson had been struck down in vengeance for the acts he'd committed in pursuit of his horrible plan. He may once have trod the world between the worlds, as he had claimed in the Disrecorder vision, but he certainly had not ended up there. As Kendrick de Bellows had once said during last year's classes, the warrior who trusts only in the greatness of his magic will trip over the smallest stone. Magnuson had been extremely arrogant, and he had tripped over the smallest stone imaginable, one the size of a single muggle bullet. Suddenly, James remembered that he himself had very nearly interfered with that reality. He had jumped out from his hiding place in the alley, wand in hand, prepared to duel Magnuson rather than watch him kill the muggle man, William. If he had intervened only a second earlier, he probably would have interrupted Helen in the act of aiming her pistol. What would have happened? Would Magnuson have defeated them all? Might James, Ralph, and Zane have somehow prevailed over the professor and saved Helen from the act of shooting him? How would that have affected history and the lives of all those involved? James shook his head and shivered. Wood was right. It was scary to consider the repercussions of such things. James himself had very nearly changed history, and in a rather dramatic way. Somehow he knew that it was best that he had not— that his intervention had been a split second too late. Maybe it wasn't the best possible reality that Helen had shot and killed Magnuson, but James was secretly sure that if things had gone any other way, it could have been far worse in the end. But what about now? Was he, James, interfering again? His own mother and father had warned him not to get involved in any more grandiose adventures. Even Patches the Cat, seemed to have offered warnings, first suggesting they rush for Igor House, and then appearing in the archive, apparently cautioning them against viewing the disrecorder visions of Professor Magnuson. Should James have heeded those warnings? He had tried to in the beginning, and yet how could he allow Petra to go to prison for something she might not have done? 
Wasn't it his responsibility to help her, or, at the very least, to do what he could to reveal the truth of what had really happened that night when the Vault of Destinies had been attacked? There are no easy answers, Wood had said. James shook his head slowly, knowing that the professor was right. He drew a deep breath and plopped down onto the low wall that bordered the pool of the octosphere. The great black orb turned hypnotically, rumbling faintly. "'Tell me, octosphere,' James said in a low voice, staring at the huge stone shape. "'Am I doing the wrong thing? Should I just leave well enough alone?' The orb continued to turn, as if it didn't intend to argue such a vague question. Then, however, it began to slow. Cloudy letters swam up from the orb's murky depths. James leaned closer and squinted as the words formed, growing dimly in the moonlight. Better not tell you now. James frowned. He knew that the octosphere was rumoured never to give helpful answers, but it was always supposed to give a correct answer, no matter how indecipherable. He decided to try again, being more specific. All right, he said. Well, I made something awful happen by trying to help Petra. Immediately, the white words faded from the surface of the orb. It began to turn again, first slowly and then faster, so that water crept up the sides of the sphere, running back in trickling rivulets. Finally, after nearly a minute, the orb slowed again. Dim shapes swam deep within it, resolving slowly. James leaned close, watching the letters float to the surface, as if from a very deep, dark well. You will not. James read the words over several times, and then breathed a long sigh of relief. Perhaps the legends about the octosphere were wrong. After all, this was a clear answer both helpful and straightforward. As long as it was true, then there was nothing to worry about. And according to Zane, the Octosphere's answers were always true, even if they weren't obvious. James shuddered again, feeling a cool breeze ripple over the campus and shush in the nearby trees. He stood up again and continued on his way to Apollo Mansion, renewed in his mission, even if he didn't know exactly what he was supposed to do next. Neither he, Ralph, nor Zane knew the location of the Nexus Curtain, or the meaning of Magnuson's remaining riddle. Still, at least he could feel some confidence that they weren't going to ruin everything even if they did figure it all out. In the darkness behind him, the glowing words began to drift slowly into the depths of the octosphere, and it began to turn again, slowly, resuming its low rumble. No one was there to see it, but the word, you remained visible for nearly a minute after the others had faded out, almost as if it had some special, secret emphasis. After all, the octosphere always told the truth, but it was never helpful. On the third Saturday in April, James, Zane, and Ralph climbed their way to the library in the Tower of Art, ostensibly to do homework, but also in the hopes of researching a new lead in the Robits riddle. The library occupied the space immediately below the penthouse museum, and took up the equivalent of three full floors with its dizzyingly tall bookshelves and rolling ladders, long polished tables decked with green banker's lamps and overhanging balconies, stairways and landings. High in the very centre of the space, visible from nearly every angle, hung a monstrous crystal chandelier, its thousands of pendants winking rainbow prisms in the glinting candlelight. Around this, somewhat unsettlingly, books of all sizes flew like bats, flapping their covers, their ribbon bookmarkers trailing behind them like kite tails. James had been to the library several times before he realized that the flying books were actually part of the library's shelving system. Loose tomes would occasionally soar up from the carts next to the front desk and circle the chandelier, almost as if it were a sort of roundabout. One at a time, the books would eventually swoop back down towards the leaning monolithic bookshelves, furl their covers with a soft thunk, and slip into place with their fellows. James had a strange suspicion that part of the reason that the books spent so much time circling the chandelier was because they were, being magical books, very slightly alive, and liked the hustle and bustle of what the librarian referred to as the sorting cloud. The ripple of their pages 
and the gentle clap of their covers as the book circled the chandelier sounded vaguely like whispered speech, and James couldn't help wondering if the book spent their time in the cloud trading gossipy stories about the students and teachers below. Considering the way James sometimes treated his own library books, this was not a very comforting thought. This really seems like a long shot, Ralph whispered as they settled down to a table on the edge of one of the upper balconies. I mean, fish eggs. Row, Zane replied, annoyed. Fish eggs are called row, row bits. It's worth checking out, at least. Maybe Magnuson was really into aquariums or something. Maybe he hid the secret of the Nexus curtain in some fish food and fed it to his pet catfish, which then had baby fish and, uh... James pressed his lips together tentatively. It's a long shot, he said, agreeing with Ralph. I don't see you two coming up with any genius brainstorms, Zane groused, pulling a huge picture book towards him. On the front of it was a moving photograph of the Loch Ness Monster snapping its prodigious jaws. The title was embossed in gold. Magical Fish and Marine Life of the World. I'll be back in a few minutes, James said, slipping out of his seat. I need to find a book for my Kettles and Cauldrons home egg paper. Don't remind me, Ralph said, rolling his eyes. I have to write a paragraph on the difference between cupcakes and muffins. You ought to be an expert on that. Zane said, without looking up from his book. You ate three of each at breakfast just this morning. Ralph frowned. It was research, he said a little defensively. James worked his way back down the stairs to the main floor, and then meandered through several rows of tall, crooked bookshelves. The highest levels seemed to totter precariously over him, their books threatening to spill from their shelves at the slightest provocation. After several turns, James finally found the reference section. Huge, dusty volumes lined the shelves, bowing the wood under their accumulated weight. Finally, near the end of the aisle, James found what he was looking for. An entire section was devoted to an anthology of huge encyclopedias, all arranged by letter and subject. There appeared to be thousands of volumes in the collection, each cloth-bound in frayed beige, their spines nearly two feet tall. James craned his neck to see into the upper levels of the bookcase and then pulled one of the wheeled ladders towards him. The rungs squeaked as he began to climb. He stopped halfway up the ladder and reached carefully for a particular volume. A huge embossed letter S decorated the top portion of the spine. Beneath this were the words, Sinks Porium Through Sordisius. Clutching the heavy book against his chest, James inched back down the ladder. He sat down, cross-legged on the floor at the base of the ladder, and cradled the huge volume on his knees. After a brief pause, he opened it. The book smelled like mildew and dust, but its pages were thick and creamy smooth, yellowed only slightly along the edges. Full-page illustrations filled the book alongside dense fields of small print. Normally, of course, this was the sort of thing Rose would be assigned to do— as Zane had said, she really was like their very own personal research department. Some things, however, James had been reluctant to share even with his closest companions. The topic he was looking up now was one of those things. He began to riffle through the encyclopedia's pages as quietly as possible until he reached a particular heading, nearly halfway through. He stared down at the words, his lips pressed into a thin line. Sorceress. See Sorcerer. Female. Slowly, James turned back a page, leaning slightly lower over the book. He began to read. Sorcerer. Defined simplistically as a magical human male, a sorcerer should not be confused with a wizard. While both are primarily determined by their predisposition to spell work, potion making, and the use of magical objects, there is a marked difference in the fundamental source of those powers. While witches and wizards draw upon magical resources within their own bodies, see intrinsic magic, sorcerers collect their powers from external resources such as growing things, kinetic energy reserves, oceans, or even the passage of time, see elemental magic types and uses. For this reason, sorcerers, or in the old language, sorcerer, are potentially far more powerful than a typical witch or wizard, depending on the residual magic resources of their surroundings. Similarly, where a typical magical individual's power is a constant, a sorcerer's power may be diminished to the point of abject weakness if he is cut off from those magical resources. 
It is interesting to note, however, that in every recorded instance, a sorcerer only derives power from one type of extrinsic source. For instance, a sorcerer who draws his strength from growing things will find himself considerably weakened when placed within a desert environment. Theoretically, this is an example of the law of conservation of powers, which predicts that absolute power will always be prohibited within a balanced natural world. Origins and Explanations While there are many theories regarding the origins of sorcerers, none have been conclusively proven. All such theories, however, can be broken up into two predominant categories, the serendipitous and the causational. The serendipitous theory states that a sorcerer is always created when a certain series of variable requirements are met. The most well-known serendipitous theory is the seventh son of a seventh son premise, which merely states that any seventh male offspring of a wizard, who is himself a seventh male offspring, will, without exception, be a sorcerer. Other theories are far more complicated, suggesting deviations in times of the year, phases of the moon, ages and lineage of the parents, and even the number of windows in the room of the child's birth. Adherents to the causational theory, however, postulate a much different origin, owing itself not at all to randomly determined variables, but to the balance of the magical world in general. In short, the causational theory states that when the scales of the cosmos require a sorcerer, either to maintain balance or to destroy it, then a sorcerer will, out of sheer necessity, appear. Notably, one variation of the causational theory adds that there can never be only one sorcerer. In order for the polarities of destiny to remain in check, the theory claims there must always be a duality, either no sorcerers whatsoever, or two. This theory, however, like all the rest, has never been proven or disproven. Historical Examples while any number of legendary sorcerers have appeared in the annals of history, there are very few documented cases of the existence of such individuals. The most well-known and verified instance is Merlinus Ambrosius, whose power, mysterious origins, and legendary disappearance describe the very archetype of the classical sorcerer. During his lifetime, he was known to conjure feats of such devastating natural ferocity, including, but not limited to, earthquakes, floods, typhoons, walking forests, and tidal waves, that he was by turns revered and or vilified by all who knew him. Since his time, approximately 935 to 980 AD, there has been no uncontested evidence of another living sorcerer. Variations Elves, Goblins, Sorceresses while both elven-kind and goblin-kind also derive their powers from extrinsic magical sources, they are not technically considered sorcerers, despite long-standing arguments by goblin leaders and species rights advocates. Since both goblins and elves can only contain the equivalent of any average magical person's power, they do not meet the limitless magical expression requirement set forth by the Magical Defining Characteristics Census of 1177 for sorcerer status. Contrarywise, there has existed a long-standing theory that claims that the existence of sorcerers implies, by logical necessity, the possibility of sorceresses, that is, a female whose source of power is extrinsic and who is capable of summoning limitless expressions of that extrinsic resource based upon its availability. Despite this, no irrefutable example of such a person has ever been verified. James lowered the book and leaned slowly back letting his head bump the bookshelf behind him. For several seconds, he merely stared up past the canyon of leaning bookcases towards the books which flapped silently through the library's upper levels, winging towards their shelves. It made perfect sense. That was the most dreadful part. The passage in the encyclopedia was like the centerpiece of a puzzle, the one that brought all the separate bits together and formed the full picture. As incredible as it seemed, as completely gut-wrenchingly unbelievable as it would appear to any sane observer, Petra Morganston was a sorceress. James shook his head slowly, barely able to grasp the concept. He remembered the first time he had met Petra back on his first night at Hogwarts. Ted had introduced her to him, along with the rest of the gremlins. She had seemed merely pretty and smart then, the perfect foil for the brash insolence of the rest of the gremlins. 
James had had classes with her throughout that year. In all honesty, he had begun, even then, to feel the faintest stirrings of romantic magnetism towards her. Most assuredly, there was something unique about her, something rare and slightly dark, both inspiring and solemn. Even so, how could this slight, smart girl, the one with the tendency to suck thoughtfully on the ends of her raven-dark hair and doodle dancing elves in the margins of her textbooks, how could that girl possibly be something so powerful, so rare, and so potentially frightening as a sorceress? And yet, of course, James knew it was true. It had to be true. Everything pointed to it, from the mysteries surrounding her last day at Morganston Farm, to the amazing magic she seemed to perform without any wand, to the strange silver thread that had appeared when she'd fallen from the back of the Gwyndamere, conjured by James, but drawn, apparently, from her own power. Merlin, of course, was a sorcerer. Was that why he was so interested in Petra? Was that why he was worried about what she might do? Was she his equal? His opposite? James shuddered violently, and the encyclopedia nearly fell off his lap. Instinctively, he grabbed at it, then closed it with a soft thump. For the first time, seriously, he wondered if Petra really had been involved in the attack on the Vault of Destinies. Thus far, James had been able to convince himself that it couldn't really have been her that he'd seen on that night coming out of the archive alongside the creepy woman in the black robes. He'd convinced himself that it had to have been a trick, someone using Polyjuice Potion, for instance, or perhaps even a Vism Ineptio charm. But what if none of that was true? What if Petra really was in league with the mysterious dark woman, and had been lying all along about her innocence? Worse, what if the Morgan part of Petra's mind, the part influenced by the final shred of Lord Voldemort's soul, had broken free of the mental prison that Petra had erected for it, the black castle in her dreams, and had taken over somehow? What if James, Ralph, and Zane succeeded in breaking through to the world between the worlds, only to find irrefutable proof that it had been Petra, Morgan, who had broken into the Hall of Archives, cursed Mr. Henrydon, and then stolen the Crimson Thread from the Foreign Dimension's Vault of Destinies? What then? Would the courts send Petra to wizarding prison? Perhaps even worse, would they be unable to? For one bright, horrible moment, James envisioned the dark-haired girl, Petra Morgan, walking resolutely down the centre of a broad road, peppered with green killing curses, and yet unfazed, her brow lowered in cold fury, her eyes flashing back sparks and lightning crackling between her clawed fingertips. She's not evil, he told himself resolutely. It was almost a mantra, an incantation. In his deepest heart, he both believed it utterly and doubted it hopelessly. The friction between the two warring convictions was nearly overwhelming, almost like a breaking heart. Petra's not evil, he whispered, his eyes wide and bright in the darkness of the library aisle. She's just— He cut himself off with a gasp, realizing what he was about to say. Suddenly he felt very cold, chilled nearly to the bone. This time, when the encyclopedia tried to slide off his crossed legs, James let it. He barely even noticed. She's not evil, he thought helplessly. She's just misinformed. Like Eve. Just misinformed. What's wrong with you, James? Zane asked the following Thursday, as the three left cursology class and made their way into a bright, warm afternoon. James hefted his books and squinted into the sunlight. Nothing. Why? You've been all quiet lately, Zane pressed. Even Ralph's noticed. Ralph nodded. It's true. You didn't even show up for clutch magic practice the other day. I had to power the gauntlet myself. Didn't go so well either. Zane laughed and clapped Ralph on the shoulder. That's cause you still haven't learned to rein in that Godzilla wand of yours. I hear the gauntlet was running so fast that parts of it were a blur. Is that true? The team sure didn't think it was funny, Ralph admitted, raking his fingers through his hair. But it definitely sharpened their reflexes. I swear, at one point, it looked like Fiorello was in two places at once, trying to evade one of those clockwork battering arms. I'm fine, James sighed, 
approaching the sprawling ruins of Robert's burnt mansion. He plopped onto a broken wall and stared out along the sunlit mall. I'm just annoyed that we haven't figured this last bit out yet. I mean, we can't keep the horseshoe hidden forever. Someone's going to sniff it out, and then we'll be totally sunk. Zane shrugged and joined James on the broken end of the wall. Tall grass swished around the boy's feet where they dangled over the side. I don't know, he replied. Hiding the unicorn shoe in the roots of the warping willow was totally genius. That horseshoe may have some powerful mojo in it, but if it's stronger than the willow, I'll eat a clutch. That's a big score for the Ralphinator. It was nothing, Ralph said, trying not to grin with pride. I was just thinking back to our first year, when Delacroix hid the Merlin throne right on Hogwarts grounds, since it was the only place in the country that was magical enough and protected enough to overshadow that kind of power. If it worked for her, I thought it might work for us. Zane nodded. It's an excellent idea, no matter what. I bet if old Mags had thought of it, he might actually have made it to the world between the worlds, and not got shot down in an alley like a cowboy at high noon. James shook his head, not at all sharing in his friend's carefree attitudes. It's just that it's taking too long, he said, smacking his hand on the stone next to him. That idiot Keynes, the arbiter, is nearly finished with his inspection. Dad sent me a note saying that he ran into him at the Crystal Mountain. Keynes told him that he wouldn't need to interview any of us after all, said that he'd found all the information he needed elsewhere. That can only mean one thing, can't it? He's about ready to make his judgment, and he's found just what he needed to convict Petra and send her to prison. But who could he have talked to? Ralph asked, kicking at the weeds near a fallen chunk of stone wall. We were the only witnesses to what happened. Who else would tell him that someone that looked an awful lot like Petra came walking out afterwards? I mean, the only people we told were Rose and Scorpius through the shard. If Keynes had talked to them, they definitely would have told us. James frowned dourly. Ralph may be right about Rose, but James himself wasn't so sure about Scorpius. Either way, if we're going to figure out this stupid riddle, we'd better do it right quick. Otherwise, there won't be any point. They'll have passed judgment on Petra and carted her off, and Izzy will wind up in some muggle foster home, probably with all her memories of us completely obliviated. But we've checked out everything we can think of, Zane said, raising his eyebrows and hands at the same time. We've got Bupkiss. If the Nexus curtain lies within the eyes of Robits, then Robits sure ain't talking about it. I'm all out of ideas, and I know from experience that that means you two are completely tapped out as well. He sighed and shook his head. Hey, I'm the one what thought of hiding the horseshoe under the warping willow, Ralph reminded the blonde boy, scowling in annoyance. Zane shrugged again and rolled his eyes. I just hate feeling stuck like this, James groused darkly. We're so close, and yet we're completely stymied. I feel like that bloke Roberts who had to live on top of the sunken Aquapolis like a shipwreck survivor. So close to civilization, but cut off from it, all alone up on top with nothing but the waves and seagulls to keep him company. He leaned forward and crossed his forearms over his knees, exhaling dourly. A moment later, he realized that Zane was staring hard at him. What did you just say? the blonde boy asked in a low, emphatic voice. James shrugged it off. It was just this bloke that we met on the journey here. He lived on the very top of the Aquapolis, the part that poked up out of the ocean like an island whenever the city was sunk beneath the surface. No, no, Zane said, his eyes growing sharp. Before that, what did you say his name was? James glanced quizzically back at Zane, but it was Ralph who answered. Roberts, he said. What's the big deal about that? Zane's eyes bulged. He looked back and forth between James and Ralph in apparent amazement. What's the big deal? he exclaimed. You two just said it! Robits! You're seriously telling me that this island dude's name was Robits? James looked aside at Ralph. We didn't say Robits, he replied in a puzzled voice. We said Roberts. Can't you hear? Spell it, Zane demanded, nearly vibrating with excitement. Ralph sighed and spelled out the name. Zane's eyes bulged even further. It's your accent, he said as if to himself. The English accent. When you say Roberts, it sounds like Robots. We don't have any accent, Ralph scowled. You Americans do. Don't you see, Zane said, 
pushing James hard enough to nearly knock him off the stone wall. Magnuson spoke with the same accent you two do. He never approved of the country's break from England and insisted on speaking the same way you Brits do. He called it the King's English, remember? James's own eyes began to widen slowly. In the disrecorder vision, he said, when Franklin was explaining Magnuson's riddles, he imitated Magnuson's accent. We didn't recognize it, though, since Franklin's an American. We heard it wrong because we didn't recognize that he was mimicking the way Magnuson spoke. He didn't say robots at all. Ralph finished the thought for all of them. He said Roberts. The big boy breathed in a low voice, glancing at his friends. The Nexus curtain lies within the eyes of Roberts. All three boys stared at one another, dumbstruck. Slowly, they all turned towards the ruin behind them, looking up over the broken bits of garden wall and the weed-choked stairs towards the remains of the grand façade. The lintel over the door still bore the engraved name of the original owner, Roberts. In front of this, jutting crookedly up out of the tall grass, just as always, was the statue of the man himself. His stern face weathered with age, his wand held purposely at his side. The eyes of Roberts, James said quietly, suddenly flush with adrenaline. It can't be that easy, Ralph muttered, shaking his head. Can it? Only one way to find out, Zane said, jumping down from the stone wall and clapping his hands together. What do you say, Ralph? Feel like giving me a little boost? Three minutes later, James stood in the shadow of the statue of Roberts, peering up at Zane as he stood atop Ralph's shoulders, struggling to reach the back of the statue's head. It's a good thing this thing's pedestal is mostly buried in the dirt, Ralph grunted. Otherwise, we'd never be able to reach the top of it. There are holes in the back of his head, Zane called down. Two of them, side by side, see? Push me up a little higher, Ralph. I'm pushing as hard as I can, Ralph groaned, struggling to stand on tiptoes. What do you see? Nothing, Zane said, his voice muffled as he pressed his eyes to the back of the statue's head. The holes go all the way through the statue, right out the eyes, as far as I can tell. But there isn't anything inside here at all. James frowned, and then a burst of inspiration struck him. Can you see through the front? He called up. Like, what if the secret isn't literally in his eyes? What if it's what he's looking at? Zane was silent for a moment as he struggled to line up his own eyes with the holes in the back of the statue's head. Finally, he shook his head. No good, he replied. It's all blurry. I can't line up the holes somehow. It's like being totally nearsighted. Hurry up, Ralph grunted. Your eels are like anvils. How can a skinny little prat like you weigh so bloody much? Wait a minute. James said suddenly, I've got an idea. Swiftly, he dropped his knapsack and unzipped it. He dug for several seconds and finally retrieved something from the bag's recesses. Here, he said, jumping up and turning to Ralph. Hand these up to him. Your glasses, Ralph frowned, glancing at the object in his hands. You're serious? It could work, James insisted. Just hand them up to him. Let's see him, Ralph, Zane called down, reaching. You never know. James is due for a good idea one of these times. Ralph reached up and handed the glasses off to Zane. Carefully, Zane stretched up again, wrapping his arm around the statue's neck and pushing the glasses onto the stony face. Uh-oh, he said suddenly. What? James called. I heard a crack, the blonde boy called back. I think old Roberts has a bigger head than you, James. I think he broke the nose of your specs. Sorry. James sighed. I have a spare he said, rolling his eyes. Can you see any better? Zane pressed his eyes to the back of Robert's carved head again. There was a long, tense moment as he adjusted the glasses and struggled to pull himself into position. He was nearly riding piggyback on the statues leaning back now. It works, he finally announced. Sorta. What do you mean, sorta? Ralph asked. Zane adjusted the spectacles on the statue's face again. Well... He called down. I can see through Robert's eyes all right. The glasses work almost like a telescope. It's just that there isn't much to see. At least, not anything that's very helpful. What is it? James demanded, nearly hopping with impatience. Robert just seems to be staring down at the mall towards Administration Hall.
Zane replied, still peering through the back of the statue's head. He's looking right at the front doors, in fact. They're propped open, so I can see right through the main corridor. Hey, there's Albus and Lucy, probably going to get an early dinner. James shook his head. That can't be the secret entrance to the Nexus Curtain. We've been in there a hundred times. Well, that's what's in the eyes of Roberts, Zane called back. Maybe we should go snoop around in there a little more. Who knows what might be? He stopped suddenly and pressed himself harder against the back of the statue's head, frowning slightly. What? Ralph asked impatiently. What might be what? Hold on, Zane said. Someone's opening up the doors on the other end of the main corridor now. I can see straight through the whole building. Cool! James waited. He knew what was on the other side of the campus, behind Administration Hall. Victory Hill was the honorary home of every year's Clutch Cudgel tournament winner. According to tradition, the night of the final match was marked by the magical march of the houses when the winning team's residents would magically arise from its cellar and circle the campus, coming to rest on the permanent foundation atop the hill near Pepperpog Down. Unfortunately, Zane himself had not witnessed a march of the houses, nor had anyone else for the past ten years or so, since Team Werewolf had handily won the Clutch Cudgel tournament for over a decade, thus holding on to that position of honour. It's just Aerie's mansion, Zane called down. I can only see the base of it through the back of the administration hall up on Victory Hill. Man, I hate those guys. Is that it? Ralph asked, exasperated. That's it. Zane replied, just the foundation up on Victory Hill with that big mausoleum house of theirs sitting on top of it. The only part that's really visible is the cornerstone with that weird little U engraved on it. James frowned. Weird little U? <sighs> yeah, Zane sighed. On the cornerstone of the permanent foundation, there's just this odd symbol like a little letter U. Nobody knows what it stands for. University, maybe, or... You are here? James narrowed his eyes very thoughtfully. Are you certain, he asked slowly, that it's a you? He peered up at Zane. The blond boy looked down at him. Slowly, his eyebrows rose up onto his forehead as his eyes widened. Ralph's knees bucked slightly. In a strained voice, he said, This means you can get off me shoulders now, right? What do you three want? An older werewolf boy called from the high portico of Ares' mansion as James, Zane, and Ralph approached. James recognized the speaker as Clayton Altair, the captain of the werewolf clutch team. Oh, we're just here to bask in your glory for a minute, Zane replied from the footpath that circled Victory Hill. Don't pay any attention to us. Altair scowled at them suspiciously. What's that you got in the bag, then? Oh, this? James asked his face reddening. He looked down at the black velvet bag in his right hand. It's nothing, just a... Uh... It's his technomancy own work, Ralph volunteered. Totally dangerous stuff, strictly experimental magic. I wouldn't even look directly at it if I was you. Altair nodded skeptically towards Zane. I know you, Walker, if you're trying to prank us. Me? Zane asked his face a mask of wounded innocence. Never! Why, I'll have you know that this here is James Potter. His brother is Albus, one of your werewolf brethren. We'd never do anything to cause any trouble for little old Al, would we, fellas? He looked back and forth between James and Ralph, who nodded silently. Albus, Altair smirked. Yeah, our little Cornelius. I'll tell him you popped in for a chat. He turned and walked into the shadow of the doorway, chuckling to himself. Yeah, you do that, stumphead, Zane muttered, rolling his eyes. He turned to James. All right, come on, let's see if it fits. I don't like having that thing out in broad daylight, Ralph said, following closely as James and Zane angled towards the corner of Ares' mansion, passing a rather large bronze statue of a fiercely snarling werewolf with blank amber eyes embedded into its face. James knew that the statue had been a gift from an alumnus erected some ten years ago. Albus had told him that the members of the werewolf clutch cudgel team ritualistically rubbed the statue's snarling muzzle on every game day as they made their way to Pepperpock Down. James shuddered as he passed before the glinting bronze figure, not liking that frozen, toothy growl. 
As the three approached the cornerstone of the house's permanent foundation, James saw that it was quite a large block of solid granite. At the very top of it, engraved right up to the edge, was a squat U-shape. "'It'll only take a second, Ralph,' James said, feeling rather nervous himself. "'We just need to see if it's the same shape. If the horseshoe is the dimensional key, then this could be the keyhole. If it's not, then we'll just take it back and hide it under the warping willow again.' Ralph gulped. "'You mean, if it fits, we're going to go through into the world between the worlds right now?' "'Relax, Ralphinator,' Zane hissed impatiently. "'We're just going to see if it works. "'We'll come back later for our big entrance if it all goes as planned.' "'Glancing around to assure no one was watching, "'James slipped the silver horseshoe from its bag. "'The three boys crowded around the cornerstone "'as he held it up next to the engraved shape. "'Well,' Ralph said hesitantly, "'it fits a little.' "'The engraved shape's too short.' Zane said, shaking his head. The top part's cut off. James peered at the horseshoe as he held it up against the engraved U-shape. The bottom bit fits perfectly, he agreed. It's almost like the top half of the cornerstone is missing. That makes sense, Zane said. None of the buildings are on their original foundations. Every time there's a new clutch cudgel tournament winner, the house swaps around. I bet nobody even remembers which house was originally built on this foundation. So if we can figure out which house's cornerstone shows the top half of the horseshoe, Ralph ventured, then we'll know where the entrance to the Nexus Curtain is, right? Maybe, James said, slipping the horseshoe back into its velvet bag. But I have a feeling that the only way the dimensional key will work is if we get the right house onto the right foundation. Zane shrugged optimistically. That's easy. Like Ralph said, we just need to find out which house is the rest of the horseshoe on its cornerstone and then make sure that that house wins the clutch tourney. If we're lucky, it'll be Hermes Mansion. We zombies are up for a win this year. I can feel it. James slumped as a sinking certainty settled over him. He shook his head slowly. I don't think, he said morosely, that it's going to be Hermes Mansion. Wow, Ralph said a short time later, as the three boys stood in the bushes in front of Bigfoot House. How do you know? "'Couldn't say,' James answered with a sigh. "'It just makes a certain kind of backward sense, doesn't it?' Zane nodded firmly, his lips pressed into a tight line as he stared down at the cornerstone of Apollo Mansion. Sure enough, the bottom edge of the stone showed the twin markings of the top of the silver horseshoe. "'So,' he said heartily, still nodding, "'in order to open the Nexus Curtain and potentially prove the innocence of our good friend Petra Morganston, the worst clutch team in a decade has to win the tournament against the best clutch team in a decade. Is that about it? Do I have this straight?' "'I'm afraid so,' James answered dually. Zane nodded some more. "'Well, then,' he said, "'one thing above all else is absolutely certain.' "'What's that?' Ralph asked a little hesitantly. Zane looked gravely at both James and Ralph, and then answered, You're gonna need a bigger gauntlet. Over the following weeks, James approached Team Bigfoot's clutch magic practices with renewed vigor. They did indeed expand the gauntlet, adding a gyroscopic flight pad section where players could mount a scrim and fly in place with simulated wind, turns, and, most important of all, attacking clockwork opponents. Using this, Players practiced artist Deserto in flight, learning to perform mid-air flips, barrel rolls, horizontal leans, and an entirely new maneuver known as the drop, in which a player would fall flat onto the length of their scrim, their fingers curled over the front edge, reducing their target area and wind resistance, and effectively transforming themselves into missiles. In this posture, the player was able to use his or her scrim as a shield, deflecting spells by pulling the leading edge upwards, forcing the spells to bounce off the bottom. Wow! Gobbins cheered, as Jasmine performed an impressive dropping barrel roll through a group of clockwork bullies, complete with mechanical cudgels. Way to thread the needle, Jazz! I gotta admit, James, Norrick said, shaking his head. I wasn't buying into this whole artist deserto thing at first, but between the new magic we've been practicing and these crazy new moves, I think we might just have a chance to get into the tournament. Get into it nothing, 
Wentworth exclaimed, his eyes boggling behind his huge glasses. We've got a chance to win that baby, especially now that the Pixies and Igors have been knocked out of the playoffs. It's down to the werewolves, vampires, zombies, and us, and we haven't even started using any of these new moves yet. Let's not get too confident, James warned, despite his own cautious confidence. It's one thing to do these maneuvers in the gauntlet. It's another thing entirely to pull them off on the course. Besides, our next match is sudden death against the zombies, and they've been practicing in the gauntlet same as we have, thanks to the fact that we needed Zane and Professor Cloverhoof's help to build it. I watched them practice on it yesterday, Jasmine gasped, jumping off her scrim as Ralph halted the gauntlet around her. From the window on the upstairs landing, they aren't taking it all that seriously. They didn't use the flight pad at all. Grrrrf! Muck Thatch agreed, hopping onto his scrim and piloting it into a position for his own turn on the pad. <laughs> what did he say? James asked Norrick behind his hand. He says the zombies' weakness is the fact that they don't take anything seriously. They prefer tricks and surprise to discipline and practice. Wow, Ralph said, blinking. He said all that? Sasquatchian is a very economical language. Norrick replied, nodding wisely. I've been taking it since grade school. They have a hundred words for dirt, but no word for quit. Kind of tells you everything you need to know about them, doesn't it? James nodded. Later, on the night before the Bigfoot's last match against Team Zombie, James met Zane on the porch of Hermes' mansion. Did you try to talk to them about it? He asked the blonde boy, who shook his head grimly. It's a pride thing, Zane explained in a low voice glancing back at the house behind him. Team Zombie hasn't been beat by the foot since, like, forever. That tie game you handed him last match was bad enough. And this is a playoff death match. The winner goes on, the loser goes home. I just can't tell him. Hey, fellas, why don't you throw this thing to the Bigfoots, eh? I can't tell you why, but it'll keep some girl you don't know from being sent to Fort Bedlam and... Who knows, maybe even save the universe from collapsing in on itself because of some missing thread. What do you say? Sorry, James. You know I'm on board with you, but there's no way that bludger will fly. James shook his head in exasperation. Can you, like, slip a dose of Weasley's Silly Serum into their morning coffees or something? Or hex some invisible weights onto their scrims? Zane looked aghast. Sabotage the zombies? he hissed, mortified. Look, mate, I'm on your side and all, but rule number one of Zombie House is that you never, ever prank your own house. Zane stopped and glanced aside thoughtfully. Well, actually, rule number one is to always keep the cellar door locked from the outside so the ghoul doesn't sneak upstairs at night and have parties with all the other house ghouls. Boy, do they make a terrible mess. And do they eat? Sheesh! Last time there wasn't anything left but a box of dried leech chews and half a jar of El Salsa Granado. But not pranking your own house is definitely rule number two, without a doubt. But, James began, but Zane cut him off with a raised hand. Sorry, James, I just can't do it. We zombies may not have much of a code of ethics, but the few ethics we do have... We stick to like glue, capiche? You guys will just have to win it fair and square. James sighed deeply and nodded. As he turned to leave, however, Zane tapped him on the shoulder. I'll be rooting for you guys, he whispered with a crooked smile. You can do it. Keep between Warrington and Hurst, eh? I can't tell you why, but if you do that, stick between those two like beetle butter between two slices of white bread, then you'll do just fine. He winked conspiratorially, and then turned back to his house, whistling an innocent tune. The afternoon of the match turned out to be bright and warm, resulting in a very exuberant turnout of spectators. The grandstands were packed to overflowing, crowded with waving banners and handmade signs. To James's surprise, there seemed to be nearly as many Bigfoot colours and banners as there were zombie supporters. The two factions jostled amiably on the high rampart bleachers, competing against each other with small displays of firework spells in team colours. This is it, team, Wood hollered as the players huddled around him atop the platform. His voice was nearly lost in the roar of the excited crowd. I know this is a sudden death match, but don't let that spook you. 
We've played an amazing season, and I'm proud of each and every one of you. Do your best, keep it clean, and try to have fun. If we lose, we may be out of the playoffs, but we'll still have a better record than Team Bigfoot has racked up in over ten years. You're all winners in my book, eh? So let's keep our chins up. Ready? The team joined in, piling their hands atop Wood's outstretched fist. Go feet! As the team assembled along the platform edge, Wentworth moved alongside James, his scrim at his side. If I didn't know any better, he murmured under his breath, I almost think Wood expected us to lose. James glanced at the boy next to him. Wentworth looked up. I'm just saying, he shrugged. Well, I expect us to win, James replied. Remember, just keep an eye on Warrington and Hurst. If they line up... Yeah, yeah, Gobbins agreed grimly from James's other side. We squeeze in between them like Mother Newt chaperone in a Valentine's dance. A sharp whistle pierced the air over the figure of eight course. Professor Sinouye floated over the centre ring in his official's tunic, his whistle protruding from between his teeth. Number six hippogriff, Jasmine announced, launching from the platform for the warm-up lap. The rest of the team began to stream out behind her, assembling into hippogriff formation. This is it! Norrick called seriously, dropping his scrim and preparing to launch from the platform. Sudden death, everyone! Do or die! Do or die! The others echoed as if it were a battle cry. James joined them, feeling a drunken mixture of excitement, apprehension, and secret confidence. Do or die! Let's go! One minute later, Sanouye blew a long note on his whistle. The match began. Two hours later, Team Bigfoot was gathered in the Kite and Key, jostling raucously around two tables which they'd pushed together. Victory! Norrick cried, hoisting his butterbeer. The rest mimicked his toast, making sure to shout loud enough for the zombies gathered dually in booths on either side of the bar to hear. Victory! They cried jubilantly, clanking their mugs and tankards together, slopping their drinks all over the tables between them. It was a close one, Gobbins admitted to James as the cheers broke up into enthusiastic chatter. I was a little worried at halftime with them up by four points. James nodded and shrugged, but the truth was that he knew it had never really been a close match at all. One minute before the halftime whistle had blown, Team Zombie had succeeded in walloping home a string of quick goals, thanks to the combined efforts of Warrington and Hurst, who, despite the foot's best efforts, had managed to cluster into a pile-drive formation, carrying all three clutches between them and flanked by the remainder of their team. James had fumed about his team's failure to prevent the manoeuvre, but he also knew that pile-drive formation was a once-in-a-match tactic. Team Zombie had been nervous about losing the match even then, and had begun to resort to desperation manoeuvres. Five minutes into the second half... Team Bigfoot had already regained the lead. Wentworth had replaced Muckthatch on goal, leaving Muckthatch to shadow Warrington for the rest of the game, his ape-like reach and intimidating demeanour easily preventing any repeats of the fabled pile-drive manoeuvre. In the end, using a confident mixture of game magic and artist asserto aerobatics, Team Bigfoot had soundly defeated the zombies by a score of 82 to 60. We're going to the tournament! Norrick cried out exuberantly, and the rest joined in, hooting and hollering, but James was less confident. Even as his fellow teammate cheered, he looked around and saw a table near the fireplace surrounded by the slate-grey sweaters and scarves of Werewolf House. Clayton Altair sat at the head of the table, staring at James with a small, crooked smile. As James watched, the older boy raised a hand and pointed discreetly at James. He mimed shooting at him, and mouthed the words, POW. The rest of the werewolves saw the gesture. They turned and grinned wickedly back at James, their eyes glittering narrowly. James sighed, the celebration leaking out of his heart. You may make it to the tournament, you little squibs, the werewolves grin seemed to say, but then you'll have to face off against us, and we're a whole different cauldron of newts. We eat squibs like you for breakfast. James looked away, not liking those secretive, confident grins. Instead, he looked towards the zombies on the other side of the room, gathered truculently around their own tables. Zane sat among them, looking equally morose. 
and yet when he saw James, he winked and shrugged a little. Like the werewolf's grins, Zane's gesture seemed to speak volumes. Congratulations, pal, the little wink seemed to say. Now comes the fun part. James rolled his eyes, bemused. Even Zane's gestures managed to be sarcastic. During the following days, James, Ralph, and Zane struggled to formulate a plan. Barring any unforeseen disasters, it seemed that the Bigfoots would, amazingly enough, play in the final tournament match. For most of the team, this accomplishment was success enough. James, of course, had a different goal in mind. It was essential that the Bigfoots not only meet Team Werewolf in the tournament, but that they defeat them. Only then would Apollo Mansion relocate onto Victory Hill, replacing Ares Mansion and thus completing the dimensional keyhole. But how could it be done? It would have helped if the werewolf's record had been even slightly imperfect. Where Team Bigfoot, to no one's greater surprise than their own, had managed to scrape together a record of four wins and three losses, barely clinging to a second-place standing, Team Werewolf was as yet undefeated. Worse yet, all but one of the Bigfoot's victories had been breathtakingly close, including two technical wins by tie. The werewolves, however, had easily dominated every match, usually leading by double digits at half-time and proceeding to send in their second-string players for the last quarter, while the starters actually left the platform, descending to their locker cellar and changing out of their pads and jerseys. The sheer arrogance of it all added insult to injury, and formed the final sting of the werewolves' game of psychological warfare, a game they alone played with nearly eerie ease. Every team has a weakness, Zane insisted, pounding the arm of one of the sofas in the Bigfoot game room. Even the wolves! Probably, but nobody's found it yet, Ralph said with a sigh. They just seem to play a totally solid game. No chinks, no weak links. James shook his head, as he looked down at the floor between the sofas. The disarmadillo waddled idly past a nearby coffee table, sniffing the carpet. Two empty licorice soda bottles balanced amusingly on its plated back. Zane sat up and added his own empty bottle to the collection. That doesn't mean they don't have a weakness, he said darkly. It just means they're hiding it behind all that stupid arrogance. Their best offense is psyching everyone out so much that they win even before the match starts. Maybe, James admitted. But then again, maybe that's their weakness. Maybe they really aren't as good a team as everyone believes they are. Maybe Altair and his goons have just succeeded in convincing everyone that the werewolves are so good that the other teams just get nervous and throw the game. Has that ever occurred to you? Zane considered it. It's a theory, at least he acknowledged. So you're saying that if you can convince the Foots that Team Werewolf is more bark than bite, then maybe you'll take the wolves' best weapon right out of their paws? Couldn't hurt, Ralph nodded. Either way, right? I mean, psyching out can work both ways. If it's true that Team Werewolf can psych other teams into playing worse, then it's also true that we can psych ourselves into playing even better. Stands to reason. Zane pressed his lips together thoughtfully. But you'll need more than words to convince your guys that the werewolves are just a bunch of sheep in wolves' clothing. You'll need something concrete, something they can rally around, some secret weapon or something, even if it's just a symbol. Like that stupid bronze statue that Team Werewolf rubs on their way to every match, Ralph concurred, becoming excited. But different, something that will really make the team believe they have an ace up their sleeve. James was thoughtful. His eyes narrowed as the disarmadillo lumbered under his outstretched legs, knocking the bottles from its back. Zane and Ralph looked at him. What are you thinking? Zane asked, raising his eyebrows. James mused. I'm thinking that maybe the werewolves do have a weakness after all. I mean, besides their overconfidence. What's that? Ralph asked. James smiled slowly and a little wickedly. Do you think that there is anyone on campus apart from their own housemates, who want Team Werewolf to win the tournament? Zane blew a breath out through pursed lips. After a decade of being undefeated, and after all the humiliations they've handed out for the last few seasons? Not likely. In fact, I'd bet that everyone in every other house would pay good money to see the wolves get clobbered this year. Why? James was still smiling mischievously. Do you think, he asked quietly, that they'd be willing to help make it happen.
It was a simple enough plan, and James admitted, somewhat grudgingly, that he was just the person to pull it off. Two years earlier, during his first term at Hogwarts, James had learned something about himself. He was not like his father. This was not a bad thing, really, although for some time he had sorely believed it was. It did mean, however, that James had to find other methods to get things done. His father, as a young man, had succeeded by rushing pell-mell straight into the arms of danger, usually flanked only by his mates Ron and Hermione. This had worked for him because he was, simply put, the child of destiny. He was Harry Potter, the boy who lived. James, on the other hand, was just a kid. His attempts to manage adventures entirely on his own had failed rather miserably. Like Team Bigfoot, James had only succeeded narrowly, often by the slightest of margins, and always with the help of the people around him. This had finally convinced him of the reality of the kind of person he was. Rather than attempting to manage things entirely on his own, as his father had, James had learned, at least in a few instances, to ask for help. He had first done this by asking the gremlins to assist him, Ralph, and Zane in the great broomstick caper, when they had believed that Tabitha Corsica's broom had been the legendary Merlin staff in disguise. The caper had failed, in the fundamental sense that the broomstick had not, in fact, been the Merlin staff, but it had worked excellently in actual practice. James had succeeded in pilfering the broom, at least for a few minutes. Later, of course, James had asked Merlin himself to help them in ridding Hogwarts of the pesky but dangerous muggle reporter, Martin Prescott. That, incredibly, had worked exceptionally well. Grudgingly, over the next year, James had learned that this was his fate. He was not a hero so much as he was a manager. He asked for help, not always, of course, and probably not even as often as he should, but when he did, things seemed to work out much better. Now, he was only slightly more comfortable with it, and yet, as he visited the first house on his list, it was Aphrodite Heights, up on the hill near the theatre, he discovered that this task, unlike his previous experiences with asking for help, was going to be rather eerily easy. You bet! Ophelia Wright, captain of Team Pixie, nodded resolutely, making her blonde pigtails flop. Those werewolf stumpheads had the gall to play Winkles and Argus on their platform during our last match? By the fourth quarter, Professor Jackson wasn't even watching the game. He was watching his own players winkle an old clutch around the platform. We'll do more than share our best spells with you. We'll show you how to use them. That'll teach those tasteless old wolves to embarrass the pixies. Ten minutes later, James left Aphrodite Heights in a sort of stunned daze. Ralph walked next to him, his nose buried in a handwritten notebook, its pages crammed with hand-drawn illustrations and neat backslanting cursive, the eyes all dotted with smiley faces and hearts. Wow! Ralph breathed, not looking up from the pages. Those pixies are only cute on the outside. This stuff is ruthless! James nodded, but their work wasn't done yet. They still had three more houses to visit, and yet he approached the task with a renewed sense of purpose. Ophelia Wright had responded almost as if the two Bigfoot players were doing them a favour, rather than the other way around. Put them in their place, she'd said grimly as she walked them to the big gingerbready front door of Aphrodite Heights. Knock them off their infuriatingly colourless grey scrims and tell them it's from Team Pixie, at least in part. James had nodded, smiling crookedly. This was going far better than he'd expected. By the end of the day, he and Ralph had procured the enthusiastic assistance of the team captains from every other house. The Igors had agreed to give Team Bigfoot Scrims a secret pre-game boost, using a battery of technomancic enhancements that they had formulated over the previous few seasons, and which had, up until now, been a carefully guarded secret. These enhancements, the Igor captain promised with a slightly maniacal, if practiced, laugh, would make the Bigfoot scrims faster and more manoeuvrable than anything in the werewolves' arsenal. Warrington, the captain of Team Zombie, was still smarting from his team's loss to the Bigfoots, but with Zane's encouragement this was easily offset by the zombies' long-term hatred of the werewolves. He agreed to share his team's most effective offensive techniques with the Bigfoots, which was no small offering, considering that the zombies had succeeded in scoring the most points against the werewolves throughout the season. 
James had been prepared to fetch Wentworth in order to guarantee an interview with the captain of Team Vampire, but it turned out that the captain was Anton Harding, the boy who had initially tried to prevent their entrance into Erebus Castle, and he had already heard about James and Ralph's mission. He headed them off as they made their way across the afternoon warmth of the campus. I hear you're looking for help from the other societies in beating Al Tear and his werewolves in the tournament, he said with no preamble. James nodded and gulped. Uh, yes, he admitted. We checked the Bigfoot team charter and saw that there's no rule against it. We just thought the other teams might, uh, want to see the werewolves finally get beaten after all these years. Fair and square, of course. Nothing underhanded. Harding's eyes narrowed. Well, that's a shame, he scowled in disgust. But I should have known that Team Bigfoot wouldn't have the guts to do anything truly evil to put those infuriating dogs in their place. I was willing to share with you our most secret game curses. Would you be willing to accept a few mild plague hexes at least? Ralph gave a smile that shocked James a little, and then put an arm around Harding's shoulders. Did you know, he said conspiratorially, that I come from a little place known as Slivering House? Plague hexes are a bit of a specialty for us. Talk to me. Harding met Ralph's grin. For the next twenty minutes, the three talked in low voices, hovering near the glinting orb of the octosphere. At the end of it, both Ralph and Harding laughed. After a moment, James joined in, a bit nervously. All the houses were backing them now. With their assistance, Team Bigfoot would be more formidable than they had ever been before, and might never be again. James knew, however, that the real secret of their potential success was not in the technomancy-enhanced scrims, or the expanded game magic, or even the vampire's dreadful game curses. The real secret was in the psychological boost that these things would give Team Bigfoot. The whole school was behind them, rooting for them, and offering them their best support. Apart from the members of Werewolf House, the entire school believed that the Bigfoots could win the tournament. This, more than anything, was their secret weapon. Tentatively, James began to think that they might just pull it off. Chapter 20 Albus's Story Albus didn't hate Alma Alaron despite his outward jibes and complaints, nor did he necessarily dislike life in Ares' mansion with his fellow werewolves. In many ways, they were comfortingly similar to his mates back in Slytherin House. There was a familiar ruthlessness to them, a mingled sense of pride and ambition that Albus wholeheartedly shared. He had friends among the wolves, and even a few outside his own society. Like Zane, Albus was a likable fellow. People gravitated towards him and got caught in his orbit, drawn by his infectious, albeit pointed, wit and his cynical insightfulness. There were times when Albus felt perfectly at home with his new mates, and even this strange new school, which was so very unlike Hogwarts. Furthermore, there was a refreshing candor to the werewolves, a distinctly American straightforwardness that was somewhat shocking to his English sensibilities. Where the Slytherins, at least in his day and age, were rather political and subtle with their tactics, the werewolves were fully overt about their aims. They were militant, power-hungry, arrogant, and merciless, and they were utterly unabashed about it. Albus appreciated the sheer bloody-minded bluntness of Clay Altair, Olivia Jones, and the rest of the upper-classmen wolves, even if their flinty-eyed zeal sometimes left him a little cold. The one thing that ruined it all, of course, was the werewolf's sense of nearly absurd patriotism. Albus understood patriotism, had expressed it himself in his irritation about coming to the States to begin with, but the brand of nationalism practiced by many of the older werewolf students was off-putting at the very least. It had begun with the nickname Cornelius, apparently an American term for anyone with a British accent derived from some famous speeches given decades earlier by some minister of magic. Albus could live with that, he supposed. He himself had handed out more than a few derisive nicknames in his time, and knew that the best way to manage such a thing was to embrace the nickname rather than eschew it. Consequently, he answered to the nickname as if it was a source of pride. After all, he was British, and this Cornelius fellow had been Minister of Magic. These were hardly things to be ashamed of. 
The werewolves, however, seemed immune to the irony of Albus's willing acceptance of their sneering moniker. They viewed it as a weakness rather than a sort of backhanded boldness. The werewolves, Albus learned, did not appreciate cunning or subtlety, at least outside of the battlefield. What they wished to see from their fellow wolves was fierceness. They wanted Albus to bare his metaphorical teeth at them to prove his toughness and his adopted Americanness by snarling at their jibes and even slashing back at them a little. By the time he realized this, however, it was too late to do anything about it. Like any wolf pack, the alpha dogs maintained their positions by stepping on the throats of the lesser animals. By playing it cool and subtle, Albus had allowed them to decide, erroneously, that he was not an alpha dog. The fact that he clung to his Britishness, and perhaps even more, his Slytherinness, only cemented their opinion that he was an interloper. As a result, Albus's initial rabid enthusiasm for his house and his mates had cooled to a brittle, grudging tolerance. He missed Slytherin House, where he was appreciated, and, he had to admit it, at least to himself, revered a little. After all, he was the son of Harry Potter, and he had been sorted into the house of Harry Potter's mortal enemy. If that wasn't delicious irony, then nothing was. The Slytherins, politic as they might be, understood irony. They relished it. Thus, as each day passed, bringing Albus one step closer to going home to his mates, he became more and more discontent and restless. He talked to James about it a little, but James couldn't really understand. James had Ralph and that insufferable git, Zane Walker, to hang out with just like always. Besides, James was obviously obsessed with some project or other, as he always seemed to be. Albus didn't know anything about it, had merely noticed his brother and his small circle of mates buried in hushed conversations and lurking around the campus like a bunch of self-important little burks but he guessed that whatever it was, it had something to do with Petra Morganston. Albus supposed that he was slightly jealous of them. After all, Petra was his friend too, at least a little. She and her sister had lived in the Potter home for several weeks over the summer, and Petra and Albus had developed a sort of sharp-edged camaraderie. There was something decidedly un-Gryffindor about Petra, despite her house of origin. She could be surprisingly dark sometimes, both in her attitudes and her humour, and Albus had, to his own great surprise, truly liked her. He didn't feel the same way about the older girl that James did, of course. Everybody knew that James was completely sodden with puppy love for Petra. Albus, on the other hand, saw her as a younger, female version of his recently married Uncle George. To him, Petra was a sort of sister-in-arms, a cynical kindred spirit. Even if she did tend to hide it all under a somewhat sugary, nice girl exterior. Albus didn't know if Petra really was guilty of cursing old Mr. Henrydon or not. In his own way, he thought, he knew her even better than James did, since James's opinion of her was rather hopelessly skewed by the rose coloured glasses of infatuation. Albus understood that Petra may well have been the one to break into the Hall of Archives. He didn't know what all the ruckus was about, really. So what if she had cursed some old muggle curator and diddled about with some mysterious relic at the bottom of the archive? Even if she had done it, Albus figured she had a good reason for it. He also understood, instinctively if nothing else, that if the American wizarding authorities tried to put Petra in prison, they might have a harder time holding on to her than they'd expect. Albus had some experience dealing with singularly unique magical individuals, his father, after all, was the great Harry Potter. Albus knew that there was something unusual about Petra, something that was both quietly powerful and, perhaps even more importantly, deeply fierce. No matter what happened with her and that pipsqueak arbiter Keynes, Albus had a feeling that Petra would manage to stay in charge of her own destiny, and Izzy's as well. Hey, Cornelius! Altair called as Albus returned to Ares' mansion one evening, interrupting him just as he began to tromp up the wide staircase. Your brother and his slab of a buddy toddled by to see you. Albus stopped, surprised. He peered over the banister at Altair, who lounged in the main parlour with some older werewolf students, pretending to study, nipping fire whiskey from a bottle they kept hidden behind the couch. James came here. What did he say? Altair shrugged indulgently. Who knows? 
He and his little Bigfoot pal shook in their capes when I met them at the door and told them you weren't here. I suggested they beat it before I taught them a little respect. Sorry if I ruined tea time or something. He grinned maliciously and nudged the girl next to him. She smirked crookedly. Albus rolled his eyes and turned away, trudging up the rest of the stairs. He'd heard about James's errands around the campus that day. Lucy had corroborated the rumors at lunchtime. Apparently, James and Ralph Deedle were making the rounds to all the other societies, asking for a little help with the upcoming tournament match. He shook his head as he made his way to the second-floor landing and opened the door to the small sophomore dormitory room. It was just like James to traipse all over the campus with his hand out, begging for help, making his problem everyone else's problem. As irritating as the werewolves could be, at least they understood the concept of self-respect. They'd either win or lose on their own two feet, and they'd do it with pride, no matter what. Of course, in Albus's experience, the werewolves always won, so he couldn't be entirely sure how they'd react if they ever lost. He assumed that they'd accepted with the same stoic bitterness that they displayed in nearly every other case. Albus plopped his knapsack onto his bed and threw himself down next to it. He propped his chin in his hands and stared out the tall window. The fact was that it rankled him a little bit that James hadn't tried any harder to ask him for help. Truthfully, Albus knew that he hadn't given James any indication that he, Albus, would be willing to offer any help, but still, they were brothers, weren't they? Deep down, despite all of his bravado and his apparent society loyalty, Albus sort of wanted to see the Bigfoots win the tournament. Not just because James was part of the team, and not in the least because the Foots were the celebrated underdogs. Albus was not the sort of boy to be moved by the plight of the underdog. The fact was, Albus was uneasy about the apparently unstoppable nature of Team Werewolf. It had started a few months earlier, right before Christmas. Albus was bundling up to follow the team out to Pepperpock Down for a match against Igor House when Altair had stopped him. Whoa, whoa, whoa! Where do you think you're running off to? the bigger boy had demanded, placing a hand in the middle of Albus's chest and pushing him slightly back into the foyer. I'm going to the match, Albus replied, resisting with some difficulty the urge to produce his wand and give Altair a shove of his own. Altair shook his head impatiently. No, you aren't, he countered. You've got a job to do. Don't tell me you forgot already. Albus frowned wearily. You're kidding. I have to do it now. But the match... I expect we'll manage to play the first half just fine without you in the stands waving your little werewolf flag, Olivia Jones smirked, passing them as she strapped on her gauntlets. Everybody has to do their part, Altair added condescendingly. Our part is to go kick Team Igor's scrawny butts. Yours is to polish the silver so we have something nice to eat with when we get back. It may not seem very important to you, Cornelius, but we'll be hungry when we get back. We'll deserve some nice shiny silverware, right? What would happen if you toddle off to the match and shirk your duties? Why, we'd get back here and find nothing but tarnished, spotty old silver. How awful would that be? Answer him, cadet! The werewolf keeper, a brute of a senior named Dunkel, commanded as he passed, bumping Albus with his shoulder. That would be pretty awful, Albus muttered, trying not to sound too sarcastic. Altair nodded. It sure would. Now get to it. If you double-time it, you might still make it for the second half of the game. And if you get there any earlier than that, I'll know you cheated and used magic. No magic for house chores. You know the rules. Yeah, Albus said darkly, stripping off his scarf and throwing it over the hook by the door. I know the rules. Altair had already dismissed Albus, however. He smacked himself on his padded shoulders, first his right and then his left, let out a hoarse bark of animal-like enthusiasm, which was answered by the rest of the team as they made their way through the huge front door and trotted down the main steps into the cold afternoon. Unlike the rest of the houses, Team Werewolf lived close enough to Pepperpock Down that they got ready for their matches in their own house, ignoring the locker cellar beneath their platform until the end of the match. Albus watched grimly as the team ran single file down the steps, and along the path, barking and yawping at the early yellow moon. As they passed the bronze statue of the crouched werewolf, they patted it on the muzzle, as if for good luck. 
It was a tradition that was very nearly a compulsion. Albus shook his head. He was not superstitious enough to believe in luck. He believed in making his own luck. Or not. Still frowning to himself, he turned back to the main hall of Ares' mansion and made his way to the dining room and the silver hutch therein. He used magic to clean the silver, of course, despite the werewolf house rules. It took all of three minutes. The next few minutes he spent grubbing up some old rags with silver polish and leaving them on the table just for the look of it. There was a television in Ares' mansion. This had offended Albus a great deal at first. The idea of a telly at Hogwarts was utterly preposterous, of course, but Alma Aleron was not Hogwarts, and at times like this he was secretly rather glad for the diversion. He used his wand to click on the set and plopped full length onto the couch. There were dedicated wizarding television channels in the States, and Albus watched one of them disconsolately, biding his time until he felt he could head out to the match without raising any suspicions. The program was a sort of chat show. The host, a wizard in orange pinstripe robes, was interviewing some bloke from the Crystal Mountain about the persistently missing muggle senator. The working theory, apparently, was that the senator, whose name was Fillmore, was still alive and was being held by the Wizards' United Liberation Front at a secret location. The man from the Crystal Mountain was impressively slick and cool, wearing a slate-grey suit and a burgundy ascot. Former werewolf houseman, Albus thought with a mixture of pride and annoyance. According to some experts, the new head of the WULF is a woman, the man said, his tone grave. She replaces the former leader, Edgar Tyrannus, who preferred to be a rather public figure despite his group's clandestine nature. This new leader, however, has maintained a remarkably low profile, and we know almost nothing about her. She simply seems to have appeared out of thin air, wresting control of the group away from its founders, and taking it, some say, into dangerous new directions. And what does this bode for the muggle Senator Fillmore? The host asked meaningfully, leaning slightly forward on his chair. The man in the grey suit shrugged. If he is still alive, then we have to assume that the plan is to obliviate and imperio him. He may then be released back into the muggle power structure, probably with some fabricated story to explain his absence. Assuming that this succeeds, we must expect that he will then act upon the will of his former captors. And what might that be? the host asked, cocking his head. The aims of the WULF are quite well known, the grey-suited man replied easily. Complete equality between the wizarding and muggle worlds. The first step would probably be some disclosure of the magical world, at least in a relatively small way, just to prepare the muggle public for the changes to come. Of course, this is just conjecture at this point. The host nodded dually. Noble goals, indeed, even if their methods are a little questionable. Recent opinion polls show that nearly 52% of American witches and wizards are in favor of complete magical revelation to the muggle world. Any idea why the WULF and their mysterious new leader have waited so long to act? After all, the senator has been missing for several months now. It may be that they are on the run, the interviewee answered breezily. International authorities are working with the Magical Integration Bureau to track them down, and there are rumors that the international agencies involved have acted imprudently, allowing the WULF time to relocate. There are even suspicions that some of the international police are secretly involved with the WULF, either working with them, or more likely, attempting to take over the group for their own nefarious purposes. Scroat poop! Albus said disgustedly, sitting up on the couch and flicking his wand at the telly. It popped off with a short squawk. Bloody malcontents and ingrates! It'd serve you all right if Dad just gave up and went home. Leave you all in the lurch with your stupid WULF and your bleeding opinion polls. He got up, pocketed his wand, and stalked towards the door, not caring if he got to the match early or not. For the moment, Albus figured, Altair could stuff his silver where the nargles didn't bite. He grabbed his scarf and slammed the front door on his way out. It was virtually dark by now, and Albus could hear the whoop and roar of nearby Pepperpock down, even as he made his way along the front path. He passed the glinting bronze statue of the crouched werewolf. 
The plaque embedded into the statue's base was just readable by the light of the full moon. Victory to the werewolves! Gift of Mr. Stafford N. Havershift, Wolfpack Booster Troop Chairman, Class of 1992. Sod off, Havershift, Albus grumped. You and your stupid statue. A moment later, he stopped in his tracks as a thrill of surprise scuttled up his back. Slowly, wide-eyed, he turned back to the snarling bronze shape. It hadn't moved, and yet Albus was quite sure that it had just growled at him. He frowned at the crouched shape. Its bared teeth glinted in the moonlight. Its amber eyes caught the dusky light and seemed to glow faintly. Albus was about to continue on his way when the sound came again, a sort of tiny, barking growl. It was almost too quiet to notice, but it was definitely coming from the statue. With some trepidation, Albus crept closer to the statue. The noise of nearby Pepperpock Down echoed across Victory Hill. A cheer erupted suddenly from the grandstands. Albus concentrated on the bronze statue, resisting an irrational fear that the frozen shape would suddenly spring to life and pounce upon him, snapping its jaws, its amber eyes flashing. It was making noises. They were so quiet, so faint, that Albus had to place his ear directly in front of the bared muzzle, straining to listen. But there was no question about it. More of the faint barking growls sounded, and Albus suddenly recognized them. He'd heard the same sounds less than half an hour earlier as Team Werewolf was making their way to the match. It was his own team, barking in triumph at a scored goal. He heard them through the mouth of the bronze statue, as if on some secret magical wireless frequency. And then, tiny but recognizable, he heard their voices. Nice shot, Lance! Knocked her clean off her scrim! All right, team, pincer formation! Let's take it to him again! Steal that clutch from him! That's more like it! Albus recognized the voices. Altair, Jones, and all the rest. As he listened, he heard the roar of the crowd as well, coming both from the statue's snarling mouth and the air high overhead. There was no question about it. He was hearing the match as it happened, hearing everything his teammates said to each other, like a magical play-by-play. -play. He stepped back and stared at the statue. The amber eyes glowed faintly, and Albus wondered if it wasn't the collected light of the full moon that he saw glinting in those yellow orbs. Perhaps they were glowing on their own, powered by the same secret magic that connected the statue to the match, even as it played on less than a hundred yards away. And if it was connected to the match, was the match somehow connected to it? Albus knew very well that while game magic was allowed in Clutch Cudgel, outside magic was strictly forbidden. Nothing outside the boundaries of the figure of eight course was permitted to influence the match in any way. And yet... Albus shook his head slowly, still frowning at the bronze statue. Victory to the werewolves, the plaque on its base read. Albus couldn't help wondering. Was that merely a slogan? Or, perhaps, just perhaps... Was it an incantation? He didn't know, but he meant to find out. For now, he turned and ran the rest of the way to the nearby grandstands, his breath pluming behind him in the cold, dark air. It took less than a week for Albus to work out the secret of the werewolf statue. No doubt James would have been amazed by this, and later was when Albus told him about it, but his cousin Rose would not have been surprised at all. While Albus was mainly known among his family as a rather sharp-tongued rogue and a bit of a malcontent, he was also, deep down, a very sharp boy with excellent instincts. Rose recognized these qualities because she had them herself. In fact, the main difference between the two of them was that Rose, like her mother, loved to read and had therefore supplemented her innate brightness with a wealth of knowledge. Albus, unfortunately, hated to read. Thus, his natural intelligence had been rather starved of the fuel it needed to thrive. For this reason, it was easy for those who knew him, including Albus himself, to conclude he was a bit thicker than his brother and sister, despite his verbal wit. The truth, however, was rather the reverse. The first thing Albus did was research a certain Mr. Stafford Havershift, whose generosity was apparently responsible for the statue that stood in front of Ares' mansion. This proved to be rather easier than Albus could have hoped. 
The hall outside of the Aries Mansion dining room was dominated by a large glass trophy case packed with plaques, photos, newspaper clippings, and assorted memorabilia. One entire section of the case had been dedicated to Mr. Havershift, whose face smirked crookedly from a large framed photo in the centre. He was an almost absurdly good-looking man, with a prominent cleft chin, thick salt-and-pepper hair, a chiselled nose, and bright green eyes. A cursory glance around the nearby shelves told Albus quite a lot. The man had played clipper for Team Werewolf throughout his school career some twenty years earlier, and had led the team to a series of championships. According to the newspaper clippings, Havershift had been both an excellent athlete and a dedicated student, excelling at potion-making and precognitive engineering. Albus wondered for a moment if the man had gone on to play professional clutch cudgel, but then his eyes fell upon another newspaper clipping near the top right of the case. Accident Sideline Star Werewolf The moving black-and-white photo that accompanied the article showed two clutch players colliding hard in mid-air, spinning out of the centre ring with their pads and goggles flying. Albus scanned the first few lines of the article, gleaning just enough to learn that Havershift's right wrist had been shattered in the collision, struck by the other player's scrim. Apparently, there had been conjecture that the other player, a boy named Benoit from Vampire House, had deliberately struck Havershift in an attempt to remove him from the match. Deliberate or not, the result was the same. Havershift's wrist had been healed as well as possible, but he had sustained permanent damage to the tendons of his hand, dramatically reducing his ability to use a wand. In one fell swoop, his career as a clutch-cudgel athlete had been ruined. Regardless, the team had apparently gone on to victory, and had granted Havershift a most valuable player award, despite the bandages that still wrapped his wrist. As Albus scanned the rest of the case for more clues, a shadow fell over him. Glancing up, he saw Professor Jackson, president of Werewolf House, standing over him, his dark brow steely as always. "'It's good to see you taking an interest in house history, Mr. Potter,' the tall man said stoically. Albus nodded. "'Yeah, uh, I've been walking right past this case for almost a whole year, and I've never really stopped to look at it.' He glanced back at the glass shelves and pointed at the large framed photo. "'You know anything about this bloke?' Stafford Havershift? Jackson said, smiling a little incredulously. He chuckled and shook his head. Of course, being from England, you might not be quite as familiar with him as the rest of us are. Mr. Havershift is the founder of Pandora Potions, the country's largest elixir and potion fabricating facility. His products are shipped the world over, everything from hair coloring tonics to magical acids used by the military. I dare say you've probably got some of his products in your own toilet. Albus shrugged. Perhaps. So he's kind of a big deal here at Werewolf House, eh? Him being a former werewolf and all? Indeed he is, Jackson nodded, turning serious. His perseverance in the face of adversity is an example to us all. As a clipper for Team Werewolf, he led us to our first string of tournament victories in many years. I was president of Werewolf House in that time as well, and I remember it quite vividly. After his unfortunate accident, he swore that he would devote himself to the support of the team for his entire life, regardless of his inability to play. He graduated, founded Pandora Potions with the help of his father, and became a global success. And yet, despite his wealth and his international business obligations, he still finds time to stay involved here at Alma Alaron. He was chairman of the Werewolf Booster Troop for many years. Just over a decade ago, he donated the bronze Werewolf statue you've seen standing before this very house. Is that so? Albus replied evenly. He came for the dedication of it, Jackson added, straightening his back and nodding proudly. It was a glorious day attended by alumni from decades past. There had to have been three hundred people on the slope of Victory Hill, which we had just regained after a very impressive tournament victory over Team Pixie. Mr. Havershift asked the current Clutch Cudgel team to come forward so that he could have his picture taken with them and the statue. Stroke its muzzle, he told them as they gathered around the statue, and I can still remember the pride in his smile, the twinkle in his eyes. Stroke it and see if it brings you victory, he told them. 
That was the beginning of the tradition you yourself have surely witnessed. Am I correct, Mr. Potter? Albus nodded slowly, turning back to the smiling man in the photograph. It was a moving photograph, of course. In it, Havershift's grin was smug, confident, even a little mean. Albus's instincts were clicking neatly into place. He didn't know as much stuff as Rose, but he was quick. Here was a man, Stafford Havershift, whose chance at a senior year tournament victory had been stolen away from him, along with much of the use of his right hand, his wand hand. This did not stop him, however. It barely even slowed him down. In classic werewolf house fashion, the man apparently forewent wand magic and immersed himself into his second love, potion making. Driven and probably ruthless, he succeeded wildly, all the while simmering in anger about what had been taken from him, about that last tournament victory that he had been unable to taste. In response, he had vowed to support Team Werewolf until his dying day, to help them achieve as many more of those victories as possible. And, as a token of that support, he had donated a large bronze statue with mysterious amber eyes. Was it possible that no one else had figured it out? Or did they know, at least a little, and just pretend not to? To Albus, it seemed very obvious. A wealthy team supporter, who just happens to be an international potion-making expert, gives the team a talisman for them to rub before every game, and from that day on, they never lose. Coincidence? You've got to be kidding me, Albus mumbled under his breath, peering out the front window at the statue on the lawn, glinting in the moonlight. I mean, seriously? Nobody is that good. A few days later, as he was coming home from classes, Albus angled over towards the statue. He glanced furtively around, and then peered closely at the amber eyes set into the statue's head, just over the snarling muzzle. He saw his own reflection in them, hazy but bright, tinted golden. Tentatively, he reached out and touched the cold metal of the wolf's nose. It was skillfully cast, both soft and hard under his fingertips, worn bright by the hands that had rubbed it over the years. Feeling a slight shudder, Albus stroked his palm along the wolf's carved muzzle. A moment later, he retreated into the house, virtually running up the steps to his dormitory. Once inside, he slammed the door and hurried to his bed. He placed his knapsack onto the bed, unzipped it, and rummaged inside until he found a sheet of light pink parchment, nearly as thin as tissue. He had just come from potion-making class with Professor Baruti, and had secretly nicked the flimsy bit of parchment from the stash in the potion's closet. Among the potion students, the pink parchment sheets were known as teach sheets because of the way Professor Baruti used them to measure the ingredients of the class projects. He'd merely dip one corner into their cauldrons, examine it critically, and then suggest more eye of newt or a pinch less powdered spider bile. Carefully, Albus lay the thin parchment onto his right hand, which was still cool from the metal of the bronze statue. With his left hand, he pressed the teach sheet hard against his palm. He waited ten seconds, counting slowly under his breath, and then drew his hands apart again. He carried the sheet of pink parchment to the window so he could examine it in the sunlight. Slowly, faintly, cursive handwriting began to curl out on the paper, as if written by an invisible hand. Albus read the words as soon as each one became clear. Peppermint oil, trace. Powdered slag belly toenail, 133 particles. Essence of eel, minuscule. Reek ramble root, degraded, zero potency. Albus leaned over the parchment, frowning at the words. He could trace the origins of all of those ingredients. Most of them were remnants from his recent potions class and his lunch prior to that. The reek ramble route was from last week, when Professor Baruti had taken the class to Shakamaxon for a special lesson with the native woman, Madame Ayasha. Albus reminded himself that he should probably wash his hands a little more often. He sighed. The teach cheat didn't seem to have picked up anything from the bronze statue outside. But then, very faintly and slowly, another line began to write out on the tissue-like parchment. Albus leaned over it again, straining to make out the blurry words. Composite. Felix Felicis. Derivative hybrid memory. Albus very nearly gasped. 
His eyes widened as he stared down at the parchment and its faint words. He knew what memory meant in potion's terms. It meant that there wasn't any detectable remnant of the listed ingredient, but a sort of halo or aura of it remained, imprinted onto the parchment like an echo. Felix Felicis, he whispered to himself, awed. A moment later a crooked smile crept onto his face, and he shook his head slowly. He was familiar with the substance, although he had never actually encountered any of it in real life. It's probably in those amber eyes, he mused aloud. After all, it's a liquid, isn't it? It might be infused in the metal as well, but there'd have to be a store of it somewhere inside, otherwise the potion memory would be useless. Albus narrowed his eyes. He collected the used teach cheat, folded it up, and stuffed it into the inside pocket of his slate-gray blazer. He wasn't entirely sure what he'd do with what he'd learned, but he was glad of it nonetheless. Maybe he'd tell James about it. Not that it would do any good, of course, but it would feel good to be able to reveal such a juicy bit of house gossip. Felix Felicis, he thought, smiling ruefully, better known as Liquid Luck. Albus might have told James that very night if it hadn't been for the arrest of Petra Morganston. In retrospect, both James and Albus understood that that had been the event that set everything fully into motion, like a lever being pulled and starting up a sort of magical merry-go-round, one that starts slowly but gradually spins faster and faster, becoming an unstoppable blur. They were walking to the library after dinner in the cafeteria, Albus, James, Ralph, Zane, and Lucy the Tuesday before the final clutch cudgel tournament match, when the word came down. A rabble of voices wafted into the early summer air, distracting Albus from the quaffle he and Ralph had been tossing around. Ralph's toss struck Albus in the chest and bounced to the ground, unseen, as the gathering turned towards the increasing noise. "'It's that girl!' someone shouted out in a sort of hushed shout. "'The one that cursed Mr. Henrydon! They finally convicted her!' "'But why are they bringing her here?' a vampire boy asked, trotting past Albus, heading to join the gathering crowd. "'Petra?' Ralph asked, turning to look at James and Zane. "'Did you hear anything about this?' James shook his head, his face growing alarmed. "'No, not a thing. Come on!' As one, the group broke into a run, Albus and Lucy following in the rear. By the time they reached the throng of students, a commanding voice rang out from the centre, overruling the babble. Everyone, please stand back, the voice said, its tone one of unquestioned authority. Albus saw a very severe man in a dark grey tunic and short vest, his hands raised. The left hand was held palm out, the right clutched his wand. For your own safety and for the security of the campus, return immediately to your houses and classrooms. Anyone caught interfering with wizarding court affairs, even by accident, will be prosecuted. Am I clear? The last was not really a question, and the set of the man's face made the fact very obvious. Students began to fall back, although none seemed in any hurry to return to their houses and classrooms. As the mob broke apart, Albus saw a tight assembly of men and women dressed in more of the grey tunics and vests, their faces all nearly expressionless. The arbiter, Albert Keynes, was among them, smiling faintly, his hat pulled tightly down over his bald head. The troop began to walk slowly towards a large building, the campus medical school levitating something carefully between them. Albus realized what it was at the same moment that James and the rest did. Petra, James said, nearly groaning. He began to move forwards again, reaching for his own wand, but Ralph and Zane both grabbed a shoulder and held him back, their faces pale and grave. Petra Morganston floated upright in the centre of the gathered witches and wizards, her head down, her hair hanging like a dark curtain over her face. Albus guessed by the dangle of her arms and the loose curls of her fingers that she was unconscious, and felt his own pang of mingled pity and fear. Her bare feet dangled six inches over her shadow as she floated along the footpath, suspended in the centre of no less than eight pointing wands. Petra! James called again, as if he meant to wake her. Albus knew it was a futile effort. She wasn't merely asleep. She had been stunned into unconsciousness. Probably it had been the only way the court officials could apprehend her. Still, it hurt his heart a little to see it. It was a bit like seeing a noble dragon declawed and defanged, 
or a captured warrior princess with all of her hair cut off. There was something shameful about it, and something rather deeply frightening. Not just because Petra was so silent in her unconsciousness, but because Albus knew that they wouldn't be able to keep her unconscious forever. Eventually, she would wake up. Slowly, carefully, the gathered court policemen and women maneuvered Petra's body into the wide front doors of the medical college. Keynes held one of the doors open for them, smiling that infuriating smug smile. Inside, Albus knew, were potions that could place someone into a deep sleep, virtually dreamless. But they won't be able to keep her unconscious forever, Albus thought again, and shuddered faintly. Eventually, Petra would wake up. Perhaps Izzy would be gone by then, spirited off to her new home in the Muggle world, her memory of Alma Alaron, the magical world, and Petra herself completely erased. Perhaps they would have succeeded in imprisoning Petra by then, for all the good it might or might not do. Unlike James, Albus didn't know that Petra was a sorceress, but he sensed nonetheless that she was no typical witch. Eventually, sometime, Petra would surely wake up. It was inevitable. And when she did, Albus was quite sure of one thing. When she woke up, she would be very, very angry. Chapter 21 Unlikely Alliances Petra! James called, not even feeling Ralph and Zane's hands on his shoulders, holding him back. Distantly, he was aware that he had produced his wand from his robes, was raising it as if he meant to attack Albert Keynes and his troop of court officials. It was preposterous, of course, but for the moment he was beyond such practicalities. They had taken her, had stunned her unconscious like some sort of wild animal, and were dragging her away for imprisonment. The doors of the medical college swung slowly shut, cutting off the view of the pathetically hovering young woman and her cadre of guards. Keynes watched James through the gently closing doors, his expression sadly patronizing. Did you really think I wouldn't learn the truth? His gaze seemed to say, and then, with a soft click, the doors closed. No! James groaned. It's not supposed to happen this way! They weren't supposed to convict her yet! We're so close! It's not over yet, Zane said quietly, seriously, finally releasing James's shoulder. We can still set things to rights! Ralph nodded. Yeah, it isn't over yet. James barely heard them, however. He could feel the invisible silver thread that connected him to Petra. It was cold, flowing down the center of his arm like a vein of ice, filling his head with murky visions and shreds of dreams broadcast directly from Petra's sleeping mind. She was dreaming of her capture, replaying it over and over. James caught phantom glimpses of his own parents on the street outside their flat, helpless and angry. Lily was there, standing on the footpath next to Izzy. They were holding hands. Both of them looked shocked, disbelieving. In the center of the street, Keynes and his crew called Petra out, surrounding her, raising their wands towards her. He heard Petra's own voice in her memory, confused and dismayed, claiming that she would come quietly, that it was all a mistake. It isn't a mistake, Keynes had said blandly, his own wand trained unflinchingly on her. And you certainly will come quietly. There were flashes then, coming from many directions at once. Petra had tried to fight their force, but she hadn't been prepared. It was too sudden, and there'd been too many of them. Blackness had overtaken her then, and in her unconscious mind, the scene began to play over again, like a needle skipping on an old record. Anger swelled in James's chest, overwhelming him. Before he knew it, he was running, darting towards the medical centre, his wand still in his hand, gripped hard enough to emit red sparks from his tip. He heard Zane and Ralph call out to him again, followed by the alarmed cries of both Albus and Lucy, but those things didn't matter. He followed the invisible silvery thread, chasing it like a beacon. He burst through the doors of the medical college and bolted through the lobby, his footsteps echoing loudly on the marble floor. He made it only a few paces before a burst of light startled him. His wand sprang from his hand and clattered to the floor, spinning off into the hall. Leave it, 
a voice commanded quickly, even as James scrambled after it. James stopped and spun around, panting. Albert Keynes was standing in a corner just inside the main doors, his own wand raised comfortably, as if he had merely been waiting for James. Good choice, Keynes said, unsmiling. I don't blame you for being upset, young man, but I would hate to see you do anything rash. You really must learn to control your emotions. She's not guilty, James said, almost shouting in rage and frustration. You must know that! Keynes cocked his head pityingly. I'd advise you to leave now, Mr. Potter. I will turn your wand over to the Chancellor, from whom you may collect it at a later time, once you have calmed yourself. She didn't do it! James repeated, advancing on Keynes, his hands opening and closing at his sides, helplessly empty. Miss Morganston is guilty, Mr. Potter, Keynes said calmly, his voice almost infuriatingly bland and quiet. I have exhausted every possibility of her innocence. It is my job. Justice must be served. Who'd you talk to? James demanded, shaking his head in fury. Whoever they are, they lied! Keynes raised his chin slightly, his pale face growing stony. Beware what questions you ask, my young friend, he said coolly. You may get answers you do not wish to hear. You don't know anything, James spat, stopping in the center of the foyer. Tears of frustration pricked the corners of his eyes, but he willed them back. You can't know anything. Whatever you've heard, it's all lies. I fear, Keynes said his voice so low and quiet that James had to strain to hear him, that it is you who've been lied to, Mr. Potter, lied to by Miss Morganston herself. James's face heated in an angry blush, almost as if he knew that Keynes was right. I don't know what you're talking about, he said, dropping his own voice. I know what happened at the Morganston farm, Keynes said slowly, his eyes boring into James. Do you? I know enough, James said, his cheeks still burning. I know that she escaped from an awful life with her stepmother, her sister too. Keynes was shaking his head gravely. You know what Miss Morganston wishes you to know, but she has kept the worst of it from you. And what's the worst of it? James demanded. But Keynes was answering already, interrupting him, his words calculated to cut like a razor. Miss Morganston killed her stepmother. Keynes said carefully, making certain that James heard every word. James stared at him dumbly, and Keynes went on, drawing a sad little sigh. She was a muggle woman, powerless and helpless to fight back against such ferocity. Miss Morganston killed the woman using magic that was both stunning and inexplicable. She used a tree to do it. It sounds rather incredible, doesn't it? Apparently, Miss Morganston brought the tree to life, forced it to collect her stepmother, and then commanded it to drown her in a nearby lake. Worse, she did it within sight of the woman's own daughter, Isabella Morganston. I scarcely believed it myself, but the evidence of the scene of the crime corroborates the story quite convincingly. The crater where the tree once stood is still there, and of course, the witness is very persuasive. When James tried to speak, his voice came out in a dry croak. What witness? Keynes pressed his lips together thoughtfully, and James assumed he wouldn't answer. But then Keynes met his gaze again. A witch, he replied very quietly. You couldn't possibly know her. She lived in the area at the time, and was given to morning walks around the lake in question. She is a lover of nature, you see, and water in particular. She strove to remain hidden during her morning strolls, out of fear for being arrested for trespassing, since the lake was a part of the Morganston farm. Still, her conscience bade her to tell me what she witnessed. She sought me out, in fact. Had it not been for her and for the veracity of her story, Miss Morganston might well have gotten away with the murder she committed that morning. And as you can imagine, this charge only further convinced me of the truth of Mr. Henrydon's allegations about what happened in the Hall of Archives. 
Why, without this woman's noble testimony, Miss Morganston might have gone scot-free. James felt rooted to the floor, cold and solid as a statue. Who was she? he asked, again not expecting an answer, and yet fearing that he knew the answer nonetheless. Of course he did. He could picture her even now in his memory, long red hair mostly hidden beneath a dark hood, glittering green eyes, unnaturally perfect, pale skin. People tend not to notice me, she had said on the night James first met her in the halls of the Aquapolis, unless they want to, or unless I make them. You do not know her, Keene said, smiling condescendingly at James. She is rather a secretive woman, perhaps even reclusive, although quite fetching in her own way. She didn't even give you her name, did she? James whispered, shaking his head. She was that secretive, wasn't she? She was lying to you. She had to be. She was not lying, Keene stated coldly, his eyes narrowing. And she most certainly did give me her name, Mr. Potter. Not that it should matter to you. Her name. He stopped, apparently considering whether he should go on. Finally, he lowered his voice to a near mutter and went on. Her first name is Judith. That's all you need to know. Now be gone, quickly, before I grow impatient. James stood on the spot, however, his eyes wide, his brow knitted in consternation. Judith. He'd heard that name before. But where? His thoughts raced as he tried to place it. Go! Keynes commanded, flicking his wand again. James stumbled backwards as a mild force shoved him, buffeting him like a hot wind. He turned, ignoring Keynes's earlier instructions, and scooped up his wand from the floor. A moment later, he burst out into the warm air of the summer evening. Zane, Ralph, and Lucy were waiting for him, wide-eyed and worried. James shook his head at them and headed across the campus, making his way to Apollo Mansion. What happened? Zane demanded, trotting to catch up. Did you see her? No, James answered, walking fast, his mind spinning. You lot go on up to the library. I uh, uh, need to grab a few more books. I'll meet you there in a few minutes. We can talk about it then. Ralph, Zane, and Lucy agreed, albeit reluctantly. James didn't really need any of his books, however. What he really needed was a few minutes to think. It was awfully difficult. Keynes's words clanged like lead weights in James's memory, blotting out his own thoughts. Was any of it true? Did it change anything? Was it too late to help Petra now? Did Petra truly deserve his help? There were so many questions and so few answers. James stalked along in a sort of numb fugue, barely seeing the campus as it unrolled around him. He was on the footpath that led up to Apollo Mansion when he finally, unexpectedly, remembered where he'd heard the name Judith before. He stopped, his brow furrowed, perplexed. Judith had been the name of Merlin's betrothed love back in the distant past, a thousand years earlier. James remembered Rose telling him all about it last year. Merlin had never married Judith, of course, due to a series of tragic events that had ended finally with her death at Merlin's own unknowing hand. Could there be some sort of connection? James thought of the woman he had met in the corridors of the Aquapolis, and then later seen on the Zephyr, and then, later still, witnessed coming out of the Hall of Archives on the night of the attack, apparently in the company of Petra. Could she really be the same woman that had sought out Keynes and told him the terrible tale of what had happened at Morganston Farm? Why would she do such a thing? How could she have known? Worse, was her testimony true? Had Petra truly killed her stepmother? And finally, somehow most nagging of all, was there some strange connection between this mysterious woman and the Judith of Merlin's tragic past? It was impossible, of course, and yet James couldn't shake the suspicion. It buzzed around his head like a cloud of gnats, persistent and teasing. After all, it wasn't a particularly common name, Judith. And then, out of nowhere, James remembered one more thing that Rosa told him. Like the Morganstons, Merlin's Judith had had a lake on her farm. In fact, 
it had formed the source of her nickname amongst the local villagers. Judith, James whispered to himself, musing. The Lady of the Lake. At the sound of his own words, a shiver coursed down James's back. Despite the early evening summer warmth, it shook him all the way to his toes. The final days of the school year began to run past quickly, draining away like grains of sand in a giant hourglass. Older students were most often seen buried in their books or studying in tense knots all over the campus. Final exams filled the last week's schedule, looming like vultures. James was amazed that the year had gone by so quickly. As he walked to classes, he occasionally glanced back at the warping willow, positioned near the southwest corner of the mall in the shadow of the guesthouse, and reminded himself that he would soon be using it to go back home for good. He was glad of this, and yet it all seemed so far away and remote. The Potter family home in Marble Arch, Creature, even Hogwarts, although he had seen the Gryffindor common room many times throughout the school year via the Shard. Sometimes it seemed to James that it had only been a few days since his arrival at Alma Alaron. He remembered his first nights on campus, sleeping in the common dorm with its creepy clockwork monkey bellhop. He recalled, with a pang of embarrassment, the debacle of the great flag-switch escapade which had destroyed his and Ralph's chances of joining Zombie House. Patches the cat had warned them about pledging at Zombie House, and he had apparently been right. The cat had suggested that they rush for Igor House. In retrospect, maybe he'd been on to something. James was fairly good at technomancy, despite his hesitance to admit it. Kneasel or not, Patches apparently knew his stuff. As the final week's exams wore on, a hard summer heatwave descended over the school, raising heat shimmers from the footpaths and making the new leaves hang limp from their branches, as if exhausted. Students loosened their ties and carried their blazers disconsolately under their arms or over their shoulders. Old-fashioned magical fans were placed in many of the building's entryways, their fat blades humming loudly, pushing the hot air around the halls and rustling the papers tacked to the bulletin boards. Students clustered in front of these fans, holding lackluster conversations or studying sheets of last-minute notes, furiously cramming for their impending exams. Despite James's distractions, he felt confident that he was doing fairly well with his end-of-term exams. Through the shard, Rose had offered, albeit tiredly, to help him, Ralph, and Zane to study since the Hogwarts school term lasted a bit longer than Alma Alaron's. I would ask you to return the favour in the next few weeks, she said, rolling her eyes. But I expect that'd be a bit like asking for blood from a rock. Is that likely to be on the exam? Ralph had asked suddenly, looking up from his bed, where he'd been poring over his advanced elemental transmutation textbook. We did butterflies from stones already. I don't remember blood from a rock. He flipped some pages while Rose sighed helplessly. After studying late Thursday afternoon, James explained everything to Rose. Scorpius was not present, thankfully, otherwise he might not have. So what are you going to do? Rose asked seriously, now standing next to the mantle in the Gryffindor common room, so they could all keep their voices low. I mean, if she's guilty, she's guilty. You can't stand in the way of justice. James sighed deeply. He asked his cousin, Do you really believe she's guilty? Rose shrugged, as if the question was too big to answer. I don't know, she replied somberly. Scorpius thinks she did it. So do Damien and Sabrina. I mean, we all like Petra and all, but it doesn't look very good, does it? That Arbiter bloke spoke to them, you know, and Ted, too, via flu. He found out that they were all there when everything, uh, came down at Petra's grandparents' farm. They told him to go hex himself, in so many words, but he already seemed to know everything. I hid behind the couch during the interview. He was one smug beast, I'll tell you. You got that one right, Zane commented from James's bed, where he lounged amid a pile of books and notes. Nobody should enjoy justice as much as he does. He's just a bully with a badge, if you ask me. So... What do they plan to do with Petra? Rose asked in a hushed voice. Zane shrugged briskly. She's still in the medical college detention wing, only a few doors down from old Madame Delacroix here. Lucy volunteers there sometimes, so she's been keeping us in the loop. Hardly anybody is allowed within fifty feet of Petra's door. 
They have guards posted all over the place, even though Petra's been unconscious the whole time. They gave her the poison apple treatment. Poison apple? Rose blinked, frowning. Is that a joke? Nope, Zane said seriously. Mother Newt makes them. One bite and you're out for good, or at least until someone says the magic word to wake you up. They had to give it to Petra by hand since she's already out cold when they brought her in. Until they know how to move her and lock her up, that's where she'll stay, sleeping under its spell. She may be powerful, but nobody wakes up from the poison apple on their own. What about Izzy? Rose pressed. Can't Uncle Harry and Aunt Ginny just adopt her? Why does the court say she has to be obliviated? It's the law, James said darkly. Izzy's a muggle, remember? As long as she had a free and living magical relative, she'd have been allowed to live in the wizarding world. But now Petra's been convicted of a crime, so Izzy is on her own. If she was of age, it would be a different story. But since she's not, the law says she has to be sent back to the muggle world. That's horrible, Rose said, hugging herself. Then, in a different voice, she asked, Do you still plan to go through with your plans regarding the world between the worlds? James nodded. Yes he said stubbornly, if we can win the tournament next Monday, and if we really can open the Nexus Curtain once Apollo Mansion moves to Victory Hill and the cornerstones come together. Rose shook her head slowly, watching her cousin's face through the glass of the shard. Are you really sure that's such a good idea? What if you do find your way into this place, this world between the worlds, only to find out that Petra really did do it? James's face hardened slightly. If it really was Petra, then she was being tricked or used somehow. We'll prove it. Rose was persistent. But how can you know that? She asked earnestly, almost whispering. Because of the silver thread, he answered, meeting her eyes. After a moment, he glanced around at Zane and Ralph. You remember what I told you lot about that, from when Petra went over the back of the Gwindamere and nearly fell in the ocean? Ralph nodded, remembering. Yeah, you said that this magical silver thread appeared and connected the two of you. It's what saved her. Yeah, James concurred gravely. Well, my dad talked to me about it afterwards. I don't remember everything he said, but I do remember this. He said that what happened between me and Petra was sort of like what happened between him and his mum when she was willing to die for him. It created some really deep kind of magic protecting him, but also connecting him to Voldemort. When Petra fell off the ship, he paused, searching for the words. After a moment, he drew a deep breath. I was willing to do whatever I had to do to save her. I was even willing to go over in her place, although I was barely thinking about it at the time. It all happened too fast to think. Dad says that because I was willing to trade fates with Petra, it made that deep magic happen, just like it did between his mum and him, only different. Because you didn't die, Rose said, nodding slightly. And yet you saved her anyway, somehow. That changes the deal, though, doesn't it? Ralph suggested. I mean, it's a little like cheating, uh, isn't it? James looked at his friend. Maybe it is, I don't know. The magic was so strong, so unreal. But the thing is, where the deep magic connected my dad to Voldemort back when he was a baby and his mum died for him... For me and Petra, it happened differently. It connected us somehow. That silver thread, the one that appeared and saved her, connecting us so that I could pull her up, it's still there. When I'm close to her, and sometimes even when I'm not, I can sense her on the other end of it. I can sort of feel echoes of her thoughts and dreams. It isn't like I can read her mind or anything, but I can feel the shape of her thoughts, and probably vice versa too. One thing I know for sure is that regardless of what Keynes and the rest all say, Petra believes she is innocent. She is really and truly convinced that she didn't break into the Hall of Archives or curse Mr. Henrydon. In her mind, she's totally innocent. He paused and frowned thoughtfully. At least, she believes she's innocent of that. Rose looked very serious on the other side of the shard. Her brow was low, knitted on her forehead. James, she said softly, I'm afraid to say this, but that's a little crazy. James blinked at her. Well, he countered defensively, maybe, but it's true. Silver thread or not, 
Zane announced, climbing to his feet. I just want to see how this whole dealio works out. We've put too much into this to stop now. That's hardly a good reason, Rose said, but Zane approached the shard and patted it as if he meant to pat her on the head. Rose, love, you're a girl. You wouldn't understand. There's a sort of inertia to these things. We've got the magic horseshoe. We figured out the riddle of where the Nexus Curtain is. There's no way we can stop now. The weight of our own curiosity would crush us. Is that what you want? For us to be crushed by our own curiosity? This is dangerous, Rose insisted, her eyes hardening. At least tell your father, James. James shook his head. Dad's completely swamped, he replied. Ever since Petra's arrest, he's been buried in some major secret plan. Titus Hardcastle came over for it, and even Victor Crumb and the Harriers. Dad doesn't trust the locals much, and they don't trust him, so he thought it'd be best to bring his own blokes along for this last raid, whatever it is. There's no way I'm going to throw this on him as well. Is this the WULF? Rose asked, interested in spite of herself. Has Uncle Harry found them? And that missing muggle politician? James shook his head and shrugged. All I know for sure is that it's all going to go down in the next few days. Dad can't even come to my clutch cudgel tournament. He and Titus Hardcastle are going to be in New Amsterdam, doing some last-minute reconnaissance, is what he told me. There's going to be a big muggle parade that night. It's some American holiday or other. Memorial Day, Zane piped up, nodding. Yeah, that, James agreed. Dad says it'll be the perfect time to make last-minute arrangements, since everybody will be distracted with the parade and all the festivities. Last time he tried to raid them, the bad guys caught wind of it somehow, and got away only hours before. Dad doesn't want that to happen this time. Rose sighed. Well, she admitted, I do feel a bit better knowing that this could all be over soon. You'll be coming home after this is all said and done, assuming Uncle Harry's raid goes well. Oh, it'll be a smash, Zane nodded confidently. I mean, he's Harry Potter, right? The boy who lived. And he's got his A-team with him. Hardcastle, Crumb, everybody. Those WULF loons and their crazy new lady leader will be breaking rocks in Fort Bedlam by this time next week. You wait and see. Rose accepted this stolidly. Well then, sorry your dad won't be there to see you play in your tournament, James, she said a little stiffly. And I do wish you well no matter what. James shrugged, as if he didn't really mind that his dad wouldn't be there, which he did. It's all right he said. Mum says that Victor Crumb might come along with her, since Dad doesn't really need him for his little looky-loo around New Amsterdam that day. Besides, Lily will be there too, along with Izzy, Uncle Percy, and everybody else. That'll be pretty cool. I mean, how many players get to have a former professional Quidditch player and Triwizard Tournament contestant supporting them from the stands? Not many, I'd guess, Rose admitted. Strange that your dad doesn't want Victor to come along for his reconnaissance mission, since he came all that way to help out. But anyway, no matter how it all turns out, promise me, all three of you, that you'll be careful. We'll be careful, Zane said soothingly. We'll watch out for each other, Rosie. I won't let anything happen to your cousin. Rose sighed harshly and shook her head. I'm less worried about the three of you, she said grimly, than I am the universe in general. When the day of the Clutch Cudgel tournament match finally came around, the school was universally abuzz with excitement and anticipation. The irony of the decade's worst team facing off against the long-time champions was not in the least lost on the student body at large. Banners had appeared on the balconies of several of the mansions and row houses, proclaiming their support for Team Bigfoot in the face of their daunting adversary. Stomp the wolves, the poster on Hermes' mansion declared in bright green letters, accompanied by a messily painted and animated drawing of a gigantic foot mashing a werewolf's whimpering head. All over the campus, the members of Team Bigfoot were greeted with encouraging cheers and backslaps, reducing the players to sheepish, happy grins. James made his way through the day's last exam, clockwork mechanics with Professor Cloverhoof, in a state of nervous euphoria. On the one hand, he harboured a secret confidence that Team Bigfoot might actually succeed in winning the tournament with the help of the other four houses, whose grudges against Team Werewolf had made them exceedingly eager to assist in whatever way they could. On the other hand, James was painfully aware that if they lost, there was much more at stake than mere house pride and a place on Victory Hill. "'Good luck tonight, Mr. Potter,' 
Professor Cloverhoof commented as he exited James's clockwork test assignment, a magic-powered owl feeder. Thoroughly prepared, are you? James nodded. As prepared as we'll ever be, I think. I am given to understand that my own students have taught your team a few of our better tactics, Cloverhoof said, tipping a handful of birdseed into the tiny clockwork hopper. The machine's brass gears began to turn and click industriously. I trust that you will keep such things to yourselves, hmm? James nodded again more quickly. Absolutely, sir. Excellent, the professor grinned. But for tonight, young man... Here, Cloverhoof leaned over the desk slightly, his grin turning predatory. Use them well, and send those wolves to the doghouse with our blessing. Will do, sir, James agreed, taking a step back from the professor's mirthless grin. Tiny chugs and ratchetings sounded from the clockwork owl feeder. After a moment, it deposited a small supply of seed into a copper dish and let out a happy little ding. Excellent work, Mr. Potter, Cloverhoof said, breezily leaning back at his desk. On all counts! As James made his way out into the heat of the campus, heading for a late lunch at Apollo Mansion, he thought on what Cloverhoof had said. The truth of it was that he was just a bit nervous about some of what the other houses had offered by way of assistance. Much of it, like the zombies' clutch spells, struck James as rather experimental and risky, the sort of things that the teams might have considered throughout the season but never quite had the guts or the audacity to try themselves. The Igors, for instance, had installed tiny clockwork gizmos on the back of some of Team Bigfoot's scrims. James knew what they did. They had even partly been his idea, although he hadn't been entirely serious about it. And yet he was worried that they weren't technically legal. Perhaps even worse, Team Vampire had offered the Foots the use of some rather dastardly curses and airborne potions. "'Entirely sporting!' the vampire magic coach, a boy named Ellis Alexander, had insisted seriously. His narrowed eyes and tight smile had seemed to say just the opposite, however. "'I've packaged them in convenient little pouches. Your team can wear one each around their neck. When the time comes, simply pull the ripcord attached to the top here. The wind will do the rest.' Norick had been especially pleased by the vampire's game cursology tactics. Lesson twelve in the werewolf's own handbook, he declared, holding up the tiny pouch. All's fair in love and war. Right back at you, fellas. Still, despite James's worries about the dubious nature of some of the other team's suggested tactics, his overall plan seemed to have worked even better than he could have hoped. The members of Team Bigfoot, from Jasmine Jade to Muck Thatch, seemed thoroughly convinced that they could win the tournament and unseat the reigning werewolf champions. They'd even begun talking about what life would be like on Victory Hill. I hear that Apollo Mansion hasn't been on the hill for over a hundred years, a senior Bigfoot boy named Troy Covington said when James met the team in the kitchen for lunch. Yates told me he was here back then making grilled cheese sandwiches with pickles just like today. We'll have to move all the game room stuff ourselves after the mansion swap places, Wentworth commented through a mouthful of sandwich. The cellars don't move, of course, and we sure don't want to let those werewolf goons have our ping-pong table. Or the disarmadillo, Jasmine added, or Heckle and Jekyll. <laughs> Muckthatch concurred, nodding. Norick frowned. That's right. The fridge is dead heavy. We'll have to levitate it. Let's not get ahead of ourselves, James interrupted, raising his hands. Let's just concentrate on winning tonight, eh? The rest will take care of itself. As James finished his lunch and prepared to head off to his last class, he met Professor Wood in the hallway. James, Wood said, and James could tell by his tone of voice that the professor had been looking for him. Come with me down to my office for a moment, would ye? I want to talk to you about something. James gulped. Um, uh, sure, Professor, he replied, and followed Wood towards the stairs. Wood didn't speak until he was seated at his desk in the corner of the midday empty game room. James settled into one of the old reclining easy chairs across from the Professor's crooked desk. He sank deep into its sprung seat, but didn't lean back. Heckle and Jekyll hung on either side of the nearby refrigerator, apparently asleep. The disarmadillo had managed to climb onto the corner of Wood's desk, 
where it lay curled in a sort of armoured ball, its narrow nose on its forepaws. James waited for Wood to begin. After a thoughtful pause, the professor drew a breath and peered up at the low ceiling. The Bigfoot Clutch Cudgel team has done remarkably well this season, hasn't it? he asked with forced casualness. James nodded. Yes, sir. Unusually well, many would say. Wood went on, still looking up at the ceiling, his hands folded on his chest. He shook his head slowly, musingly, and then lowered his gaze to the boy across from him. With a small smile, he said, You know, James, I've been president of Apollo Mansion for several years. I took it over from the previous Bigfoot president, Maxwell Greenfield, when I became a full professor and he decided to retire. I remember it like it was yesterday. Chancellor Franklin called me into his office, and Greenfield was there when I arrived. Together, they told me about the history of Bigfoot House, about how, despite what many believed, it was the real backbone of the entire school. Bigfoot House, they said, is Alma Aleron's true melting pot. Back then, you see, Apollo Mansion was home to two Arctic Sasquatches, a she-werewolf, a half-goblin, two American Indian shamans from Shakamaxon, and an Atlantean merman who had to sleep in a giant tub and wear a water helmet to classes. As you know now, Bigfoot House enjoys the same diversity today as it did then, not as a slogan or a gimmick, but as a basic fact of life. Just as Franklin told me on that day, years ago, we, the Bigfoots, represented the true American ideal. James nodded again, not quite sure what any of this had to do with the Bigfoot clutch team. Sure. Professor. I mean, we've got Jasmine, who's part Vila, although she hardly ever acts like it, and Muck Thatch, and Went, who's a, uh, it's all right, Wood said, smiling a bit more easily. I know about Mr. Paddington. Wentworth's parents made arrangements with the school administration to keep his, uh, heritage a secret. They themselves are part of the Crimson Teetotalers League. That means they've trained themselves not to require blood at all. Extremely dedicated to their new lives they are, which is why they felt it was important for Wentworth to receive a normal magical education. One would think that he would have ended up in Vampire House, of course, but as you might imagine, Apollo Mansion is a much better fit for him. James nodded meaningfully. Yeah, we spent some time in Vampire House. They think real vampires have to be like the ones in Remora's stupid books, all unbelievably good-looking and tragically romantic and rubbish like that. In all fairness, Wood said, as if he felt it was his duty. Some vampires are like that. Here he paused and bobbed his head thoughtfully, although not very many, admittedly. You understand, then, why so many real vampires, werewolves, and even the occasional pixie actually come to live with the foots, don't you? Because here they can be who they are, and not just what they are. James stopped and frowned. Uh, right? Wood nodded heartily. Well said, James. That's exactly it. But there is one more thing that the former Bigfoot president and Chancellor Franklin impressed upon me when I took this post. He leaned forward and crossed his arms on his desk, cupping his elbows. He studied James seriously. They told me that Bigfoot House really is the moral core of all the campus societies, and as such it is held to a rather higher standard of conduct. Fairness, honesty, respect, courage, these are the things that are exemplified by the Bigfoot banner, and they must be applied to all areas of life. Most specifically, at least as far as you and I are concerned, these qualities are meant to be demonstrated on the sporting field. Chancellor Franklin was very clear about this when he asked me to take the post of House President. He knew I had played professional Quidditch, you see, and worried that I might allow my love of victory to cloud my judgment in this regard. Winning, he told me, must always be secondary to self-respect and the courage of one's convictions. I vowed to them that I completely concurred with that philosophy. In the years since, I have tried very hard, James, to maintain that record. Not a record of wins and losses, you see, but a record of honourable matches, well played and strenuous, with an eye, ultimately, to fairness and respect. Wood stopped, and James realised that the professor's eyes had grown rather unfocused. He wasn't quite looking at James, but rather into the darkness of the game room. James waited, fearing the worst. 
that Wood was going to forbid Team Bigfoot from using their recently acquired game magic in the night's tournament match. We've lost every year, Wood finally said, blinking and returning his gaze to James. Not just the tournament, but nearly every single match. We've always had a good team, a solid team, but we've never won. We were building character, though. At least that's what I told myself. And building character is important, no question. Wood paused again, as if struggling with himself. Character is important, James began, but Wood waved him into silence. I've allowed you to teach Team Bigfoot game magic, James, he said seriously. It was against my better judgment, but I allowed it. Because I saw that while you were teaching the team to play in a way that was decidedly unlike previous Bigfoot teams, going back over a century, you were still managing to play each match with respect, honour and fairness, uh, mostly. And then you introduced the concepts of the magical martial arts, Artis de Certo. You built that clockwork contraption in the back garden with the help of Professor Cloverhoof and some of the zombie house students. This, again, was contrary to my better judgment, and yet I allowed it. Perhaps it was a mistake, and yet I saw that there might be some good in it. Artis de Certo is a respected discipline after all, if used wisely and with self-control. Wood was nodding slightly, thoughtfully. James was afraid to speak now, afraid of the boom he felt certain was about to fall. He held his breath. Wood met his gaze once more, gravely this time. I received a visit from the Chancellor this morning, James, he said carefully. He is concerned. He has been watching the progress of Team Bigfoot very closely, and while he is not claiming that we have done anything wrong precisely, he did acknowledge some growing trepidation about our very non-traditional methods. It has reached his attention that you have been making the rounds to the other houses, all but Werewolf House, of course seeking assistance in defeating Team Werewolf in tonight's match. James, is this correct? James felt pinned to the chair. He pressed his lips together so tightly that they became a thin white line on his face. He nodded once. Wood sighed and leaned back in his chair again. <sighs> Chancellor Franklin made his wishes quite clear, James. He is no longer only worried about the integrity of Bigfoot House, but of the entire school in general. He feels that you have broken the unspoken code of Apollo Mansion and reversed the moral standard that we are meant to uphold for the sake of the rest of the campus. But, James began, only to be waved into silence again by Professor Wood. He did not tell me what to do, James, the professor went on. He left the decision to me, and I've been thinking about it all day. Wood stopped once more. He seemed to be studying James, his face very stern and solemn. Nearly thirty seconds went by. The disarmadillo snorted, stirred, and got up. It waddled over to Wood, who petted it on its plated head, not taking his eyes from James. I've made my decision, the professor finally said, quietly, emphatically. You see, I am aware of the things people say about me around the campus. I am aware that they believe I don't have the heart to win any more, that I left my passion for victory on the Quidditch pitch back in England. Maybe they are even partly right. After the battle, it was hard to think about using magic that way again, even in a sporting match. And yet, I believe in the deeper mission of Bigfoot House. I am committed to it, no matter what. And thus, James, after my conversation with Chancellor Franklin this morning, I have made my decision. I have decided to do nothing. James blinked. He shook his head slightly, as if to clear it, and then craned his head towards the man behind the big crooked desk. Excuse me, sir? I'm not going to do anything, Wood said simply, raising his eyebrows and turning his hands palm up over the desk. I've been watching you lot myself, James. I've seen the exact same things that the Chancellor has, and yet I have interpreted them entirely differently. You have learned to play the game very well, all of you, and to strive for excellence, all without sacrificing your integrity or the dignity of your opponents. You've trained yourselves to become superior based solely on your skills and discipline. You have sought to be creative and intelligent on the clutch course while still playing with honour. Now you have succeeded in rallying nearly the whole school to your side, 
going so far even as to earn their entirely fair and legal assistance. Where Chancellor Franklin sees potential debauchery, I happen to see a team that has played so well and yet so fairly that even those whom they have defeated wish to assist them on to further victory. If this in itself does not perfectly exemplify the sort of moral standard that Bigfoot House has always strove to maintain, then I dare say nothing does. As Wood spoke, a grin of dawning realisation grew onto James's face. Wood wasn't going to forbid them from using the new game magic. Wood almost seemed, in fact, to be encouraging them to go on exactly as planned. Really, Professor? James asked, barely able to contain himself. He gripped the fat arms of his reclining chair, pulling himself upright. Really, James, Wood agreed, meeting James's smile. Under one condition. What's that, sir? James asked, somewhat warily. Chancellor Franklin did not tell me what to do, Wood said seriously. He merely shared his concerns, assuming I would comply. I am not. However, I am sharing those same concerns with you, and granting you the same responsibility. Whatever the other houses have offered Team Bigfoot by the way of help, James, use it well. Use it with honour and integrity, or do not use it at all. I could enforce this rule myself, as you know, but if I have learned anything myself over the course of this year, it is that a lesson learned on one's own is far more deeply rooted than a lesson forced by rules. Will you be wise with what you know, you and the team in general? James nodded. I will, Professor, he said. But Jasmine's the team captain. Shouldn't you be having this conversation with her as well? Wood smiled crookedly. I already have, he agreed. And she said the same thing that you did. I'm content. Thank you, James. I'm sure you have preparations to make for tonight's big event. You're dismissed. James grinned and nodded. Jumping up, he ran back towards the stairs, threading his way through the assembled couches, tables, and mismatched floor lamps. Just as he began to tromp up the stairs, Wood called his name one more time. Yes, sir, James replied, stopping and peering back across the game room. Wood was still smiling, but it was unlike any other smile James had ever seen on the man's face. It was wide, tight, and very slightly frightening. I haven't forgotten what it means to win, James he said, his voice calm but emphatic in the empty room. But I had forgotten how really excellent it feels. If Team Bigfoot is going to win the tournament tonight, then we have to give it absolutely everything we've got, and do it with as much heart, guts, and pride as we can. Yes, sir, James agreed, grinning eagerly. For the first time, he thought, he was seeing Oliver Wood the way his father had seen him, back when he'd been the student captain of the Gryffindor Quidditch team, driven to excellence and hungry for victory. Wood nodded and narrowed his eyes. Go on, then, he said with restrained fervour, and let's put those wolves in their place. James ran the rest of the way up the stairs, his heart nearly bursting with excitement and delight. It wasn't until later that afternoon, as he was gathering his clutch gear from under the bed in his dormitory room, that it occurred to him that Chancellor Franklin might have had ulterior reasons for talking to Wood about Team Bigfoot's playing style. Perhaps, just perhaps, Franklin had learned the secret of Magnuson's riddle about the eyes of Roberts. Franklin was, after all, incredibly smart. Perhaps he knew that if Apollo Mansion ever again sat upon Victory Hill, it would complete the cornerstone, potentially activating the Nexus Curtain. If so, he had probably done everything he could to assure that this would never happen, even going so far as to invent a ruse that would discourage any Bigfoot House president from leading his clutch team to victory. If that had been Franklin's goal, then James had to give the man credit. It had very nearly worked. If the president of Bigfoot House had been anyone other than Oliver Wood, it might still have. Thinking this, James grabbed his wrist gauntlets, jersey, and shoulder pads. A minute later, he met the rest of Team Bigfoot, along with Ralph and Zane, on the steps outside Apollo Mansion. Noisily, excitedly, accompanied by encouraging cheers from many along the way, the troop began to make their way across the campus, heading towards Pepperpock Down and into Clutch Cudgel history. Chapter 22 Woven Destinies 
As the gathering neared Pepperpock Down, it accumulated a following of students from other houses, forming something like an escort. By the time they passed by Administration Hall, there were over a hundred people walking along with the Bigfoot Clutch Team, shouting happily, cheering, waving banners, and tossing old clutches overhead. James was nearly bursting with mingled excitement and apprehension. The encouragement of the other houses, all but Werewolf House, of course, was both exhilarating and a bit frightening, since James knew that it would probably taper off quickly if Team Bigfoot did not immediately hold their own against the werewolf juggernaut. As they passed by the medical college, James was surprised to see Uncle Percy standing near the doors, his face tense and distracted. Lucy stood by his side, as well as a small knot of nurses, doctors, and, James noticed with some dismay, wizarding court officials. He recognized the latter by their slate-gray tunics and severe expressions. "'What's going on over there?' he asked, nudging Ralph and pointing. Ralph looked and shook his head. "'I don't know. Maybe they're here for the match.' "'Uncle Percy, perhaps,' James said doubtfully, raising his voice over the accompanying crowd. "'But not those blokes from the American Wizarding Court?' Zane peered over the crowd towards the doors of the medical college. "'I don't see Keynes, at least.' James nodded, frowning. No, but still. He paused, craning to look as the crowd pushed him onwards past the medical complex. A blonde-haired girl moved next to Lucy in the centre of the gaggle of court agents. It was Izzy, her face pale and worried, looking up at the severe expressions of those all around her. James felt a sudden sinking sensation in the pit of his stomach. Izzy's with him, Ralph said, noticing the same thing. You don't think? They wouldn't, Zane said, not very convincingly. Not while the match is going on. Keynes and his goons may have plans to obliviate Iz and send her off to be adopted into the muggle world, but they wouldn't do it already. Uh, I think. James wasn't so sure. As the crowd forced the team onwards towards Pepperpock Down, he lost sight of the gathering on the medical college steps. Just because Keynes wasn't visible, that didn't mean he wasn't there. He could very well be inside, making arrangements. The Arbiter didn't strike James as the sort of man who would allow a sporting event to interrupt his plans. Still, there was nothing James could do about it at the moment. He felt a deep sense of misgiving nonetheless. At least Uncle Percy was there, and Lucy. They wouldn't let anything bad happen to Izzy. If they could help it, at least. James shook his head, clearing his thoughts. He had other difficulties at the moment. Pepperpock Down hove into view as the team angled around Administration Hall. It was already nearly full, thrumming with the roar of the crowd, alive with waving flags and popping bursts of firework spells. James's heart skipped a beat and then galloped to catch up. He grinned as the crowd escorted the team into the shadow of the rampart grandstands. A cheer went up in support of the approaching Bigfoots. It throbbed in the air, blotting out every other noise, and James couldn't help turning to look back at his fellow players, exultant with nervous excitement. "'Go, Foots!' Jasmine Jade cried suddenly, raising her voice barely over the roar of the cheers. "'Go, Foots!' the rest of the team echoed back, pumping their fists in the air. Muckthatch let out a surprisingly loud roar, and then grinned a little sheepishly as everyone boggled at him. A moment later, the team crossed the field and disappeared into the cellar locker room, where their scrims and Professor Wood awaited them. "'This is it, team!' he called out, clapping his hands together eagerly. "'Get geared up, and let's meet on the platform for practice laps in ten minutes!' Wood met James's eye as he turned to climb the steps. He winked and smiled crookedly, almost mischievously. James grinned at the professor, and then began to strap on his new wrist gauntlets. By the time the last of the team clumped up onto the platform, the sun had lowered to a huge bronze ball on the horizon, casting its last beams onto the waving flags and banners of the grandstands. The crowd was in extremely high spirits, producing a nearly constant roar of happy exhilaration. James blinked in the late afternoon glare and fingered his scrim. Only minutes earlier, 
While the team had still been congregated in the locker cellar, James had called them together in a quick huddle. There he had announced one change to the evening's clutch magic game. No curses, he'd said firmly, producing a chorus of objections from the gathered team members. Why not? Norrick had asked stridently. We'll need to use everything we've got against those wolves. Not curses, James had repeated. Leave the potion pouches down here in your lockers. They may be legal, and they may not be, but that's not really the point, is it? The Foots play a clean game, nothing dirty, right? We'll win this match, but we'll do it with our heads held high, just like always. Understood? James is right, Jasmine had added resolutely, removing the potion pouch from around her neck. We'll win this match straight up. We don't need to resort to vampire curses. That sort of thing is for the teams that don't play as well as the Bigfoots. Am I right? To James's surprise and delight, the team had responded with a hearty cheer. All around, the Bigfoot players had removed their potion pouches from around their necks and piled them onto the shelf next to their scrims. Now, standing in the sunset light and looking across the rings towards the werewolf's platform, James felt a pang of doubt. The powdered curses might have been sneaky and a bit devilish, but all of a sudden James agreed with Norrick. They were going to need everything in their arsenal to beat the wolves. With their backs to the sunset, Team Werewolf appeared to be fringed with molten gold. Clayton Altair stood in the front, grinning malevolently, his scrim standing next to him, decorated with a snarling wolf's visage. Flanking him were Olivia Jones and Jeremiah Dunkel. All of them stared across the lofty open space of the field, smirking with seamless confidence. "'Don't let them spook you!' Wood called, summoning the team into a huddle. "'Team Werewolf is a good team, an excellent team, but you lot are every bit as skilled as they are, and then some. Their overconfidence will be their downfall. They expect to win this match easily with hardly any effort. They think that Victory Hill is their birthright. Are they right?' "'No!' Team Bigfoot cried out in rowdy unison. "'Will you lie down and let them win just because they're werewolves?' "'No!' the team barked again louder. Wood shouted over the crowd, "'Will you take the match to them and show them that their arrogance is their greatest weakness?' This time the team exploded in a shout so loud that the crowd all around could hear them. "'Yes! Who are we?' Wood demanded. "'The Bigfoots!' Wood asked again. "'Who are we?' THE BIGFOOTS! This time the shout dissolved into a deafening cheer as the gathered crowd took up the cry, turning it into a chant. Big foots! Big foots! Big foots! Fireworks popped from the grandstands all around, and banners waved frantically against the purple sky. Line up! Wood shouted, smiling grimly. Practice laps! Team Captain! Viper formation! Jasmine barked, dropping her scrim and jumping onto it. Go, Fritz! The rest of the team returned the cry and followed Jasmine out into the rings, slipping easily into formation. James was among the last to take off. For one instant, he felt a pang of mortal worry. This isn't going to work, he thought, panic washing over him like a tidal wave. We can't do this! They'll slaughter us! For a split second he was convinced that he had forgotten everything, all the game magic they had practiced, all the formations and manoeuvres, everything the other house teams had taught them, even how to fly a scrim. He stared down at the odd broom as it floated next to him, one of his feet planted on its middle, holding it steady. He felt frozen in place. A hand clapped him gently on the shoulder. When James looked up, it was Professor Wood. Don't worry about it, James, Wood suggested, nodding encouragingly. Just have fun, eh? This is what you were made for. James looked at the professor, hoping he was right. He nodded, gulped, and then swung his other foot onto the beam of his scrim. A moment later, the platform was gone, replaced by open space. James remembered everything. Less than a minute later, Professor Sanouye blew his official's whistle. From that point on, there was no looking back.
The match was a blur of wild motion, punctuated only by the whoosh of the rings, the buffet of passing players, and the occasional thump and cry as bullies collided with clippers. Spells sizzled through the air all around, and James thought he had never experienced such intense, instantaneous ferocity. It was as if the wolves were pulling out all the stops from the very moment the whistle blew, meaning to crush Team Bigfoot's spirit even before it had a chance to take root. As James passed through the centre ring in pursuit of a werewolf clipper, he was walloped from overhead by what felt like a passing freight train. He spun off his scrim, grabbed onto it as he fell away, and then swung back up on the other side, a manoeuvre he had practised so many times in the gauntlet that it was nearly second nature. As he reoriented himself, he glanced aside. Pence, the boy who had tried to knock him off his scrim the very first time he, James, had attempted to fly one, was rocketing away, grinning back over his shoulder. James shook his head, fuming, and darted back into the rings, rejoining the flow of the match. It was difficult to keep track of the match as it was underway. James tried to be aware of what the rest of his team was doing, but the viciousness and speed of the werewolf's tactics made it a challenge simply to stay on his scrim. James was sure that he had never flown so fast for so long, and yet he was barely keeping up. At one point during the first quarter, he saw Jasmine and Gobbins performing one of the two-man offensive spells that the Pixies had taught them with some apparent success. Later, he followed Wentworth in clipper formation and saw the smaller boy activate one of the Igor's ingenious gizmos from the rear of his scrim. A small box popped open and a boggart deployed from it, immediately taking the shape of a ghastly flying clown. Clayton Altair, who had been gaining on Wentworth in bully position, nearly fell off his scrim as the clown loomed over him. James flashed past and used the ridiculous spell his father had taught him to turn the clown into a cloud of ping-pong balls, which fell away into the darkness below. In general, the team seemed to be putting everything they knew to good use, and yet, as the match neared half-time, James noticed with dismay the Team Werewolf was leading by a score of 52 to 44. And then, 15 seconds before the end of the second quarter, James heard a sickening thud and a shout of pain. The crowd roared deafeningly, either in anger or encouragement, and James glanced around, seeking the source of the cry. His heart rammed up into his throat as he saw Norrick falling into the darkness of the field, his arms and legs thrashing at the empty air. Far over him, his scrim spun lazily, weaving a looping trail out over one of the grandstands. Professor Sanuye's wand was out in a flash. "'Wingardium Leviosa!' he shouted, his voice thin with distance. Norrick bobbed upwards, missing the grassy field below by less than ten feet. He hovered over his shadow, his right arm hanging limply. The crowd, which had fallen silent for a few seconds, erupted with mingled cheers and jeers. From the announcer's booth, Cheshire Chatterley's voice rang out. Bigfoot number six, Willem Narek, appears to be injured after a devastating sideswipe by werewolf number nine, Parker Pence, she cried, obviously angry. Match official Sanuye is escorting Narek to the Bigfoot platform. Unless we hear otherwise, it would appear that Mr. Norrick will be out for the rest of this match, leaving Team Bigfoot one player short. James shouted to Norrick as Sanuye levitated him to the platform. Norrick, how bad is it? Bad enough, Norrick called back through gritted teeth. But I'll keep playing. That punk can't get rid of me that easily. James glanced back at the punk in question. Pence flew in a lazy arc around the werewolf platform, grinning crookedly. "'Do we have any reserve players?' Gobbins asked, floating up to join James near the centre ring. Row! Muck Thatch answered dolefully from his place by the goal ring. "'We only had Kleinschmidt,' James said, "'and he came down with the yip splits from eating too many of Yates' dragon fingers.' "'He'd have been no help anyway,' Gobbins observed mournfully. "'Kid flies a scrim like a fish flies a kite. "'So what do we do?' James asked. Gobbins shrugged. "'We'll play one man short unless we can find a replacement. "'Can you think of anyone else who can suit up in Narek's place?' "'James shook his head dourly. "'From the Bigfoot platform, Professor Sinouye turned away from Narek and blew his whistle. 
Penalty Team Werewolf, he called out, using his wand to amplify his voice. Malicious sideswiping. Three minutes in the dark. James glanced back to the werewolf platform in time to see Pence dropping easily onto it. The werewolf coach, a college-level student with a blocky head and a crew cut, collected Pence's scrim and grinned tightly. They planned it, Gobbins commented wonderingly. Pence did it on purpose. See how easy they're taking the penalty? James sighed angrily. Well, at least our numbers will be even for the next three minutes. Three minutes nothing, Gobbin said, glancing back at him. It's only thirteen seconds till half time. All penalties are cancelled at that point. Why do you think they waited to do this now? Come next half, they'll have a full crew, and we'll be down by one, unless Narek can keep playing. As if on cue, Cheshire Chatterley spoke again, her voice echoing from the announcer's box. And Willem Narek is escorted down the field by the medical crew, apparently suffering a dislocated shoulder at the hands of Team Werewolf. Thus, with no reserves, Team Bigfoot finds themselves one player short of a full squad. Daunting odds indeed for the perennial underdogs. James's face was hot with anger and frustration. When Sanuye blew his whistle again, announcing the resumption of play, he felt clumsy on his scrim. Werewolf players thundered past, quickly collecting all three clutches. By the time the half-time horn sounded, two of those clutches had been turned into scores. Team Werewolf circled like wasps, barking gleefully and collapsing onto their platform in triumph. "'How's Narek?' Jasmine asked dispiritedly as she landed on the Bigfoot platform. "'He'll be all right.' Wood replied, sighing, by tomorrow afternoon. For now, I'm afraid he's out of the march. Do we have to forfeit? Wentworth asked, his eyes huge and angry behind his glasses. Not legally, no, Wood answered immediately. But we are at a distinct disadvantage. Let's give it a vote. Do you lot want to go on with the march? Or shall we pack it in and head down to the Kite and Key to celebrate a season well spent? No way! Gobbins announced loudly. I'll take them all on myself, even if the rest of you go home. Lousy cheats! I'll teach them to play dirty like that! I'm in too, Jasmine said, firming her jaw. <laughs> Muckthatch agreed, nodding vigorously. We can still take them, James added, sounding much more confident than he felt. This is our match to win. Here, here, Wood concurred as the rest of the team cheered in agreement. Then we stay and play on. You're doing incredibly well, all of you. I have nothing else to tell you than to just keep it up. Now that we're down one player, though, we'll all have to be even more alert. Concentrate on offense. Sink as many scores as you can. You'll have to get used to playing Clipper and Bully at the same time whenever necessary. We can do that, because you all know all the parts, right? Right! Team Bigfoot responded with slightly less than their original fervour. Right, Wood agreed. Now, get something to drink and limber up. We're back in the air in three minutes. It was nearly fully dark by now, with only a pink rim spreading along the western horizon. James took a moment to look around the grandstands, hoping to see some sign of his family. Sure enough, he spotted his mum in the grandstand, directly behind the Bigfoot platform. She saw him looking and waved at him, her face pale and strained, as if she were desperately wishing the match were over rather than merely at half-time. Next to her was Lily, Aunt Audrey, Cousin Molly, and Victor Crumb, who sat ramrod straight, his face etched with restrained anger. Join the club, James thought sourly, and then, where's everyone else? He scanned the seats all around his mum. There was no sign of Albus, Neither in sight were Uncle Percy, Lucy, or Izzy. James was again visited by that sense of sinking dread. I can't think about that now, he reminded himself. Win the clutch match first, then deal with everything else. Wood called the team over to the edge of the platform. Half-time was nearly over. James turned away from his family and Victor Crumb, returning to the matter at hand. But where are they? he thought naggingly, worriedly. What in the world could be so important that Lucy, Izzy, and Albus wouldn't be here to watch the match? Shortly enough, though, the teams launched from their platforms and merged into the figure-of-eight course. 
Professor Sanuye blew his whistle once more, and the match launched again into motion, wild and ferocious. In the midst of it, James forgot about his brother, friend, and cousin completely. Lucy was watching the match, in fact, in a manner of speaking. What's the score? Izzy asked, her voice small. I don't know, Lucy replied quietly. The scoreboard's too little to make out from here. The two girls sat in a small waiting area on the fourth floor of the medical college. Nearby, a round desk was dominated by a ghostly miniature representation of the ongoing clutch cudgel tournament match. The tiny spectral players swooped and zoomed silently through the rings, no larger than dinner plates. The witch working the desk was plump and pale, her red hair cut so short and curly that it looked like a helmet. She was watching the match whenever she wasn't glancing furtively at the wizarding court officials gathered near the hall. Which one is James? Izzy asked for the third time. She leaned her head against Lucy's shoulder. One of the ones wearing blue and orange, Lucy answered patiently. With dark hair, it's hard to keep track of him with things moving so fast. Izzy nodded against Lucy's shoulder. From the hallway nearby, voices approached. Lucy looked up, feeling a gulf of nervousness in her stomach. She'd volunteered at the medical college for the past two months, mostly for extra credit, but also because she liked being around the recuperating patients, liked helping people who were so grateful for even the slightest thing. Tonight, however, she wasn't working. She wouldn't have been allowed to be here at all if her father hadn't been who he was. As a senior vice-director in the Ministry of Magic, he was the closest thing to an official representative of Izzy's home government as was likely to be found. There wasn't much he could do other than observe, but he was committed to doing that, if nothing else, and Lucy loved him for it. She herself was only there to keep Izzy company, until the moment came when the men would call the blonde girl back into the room beyond the hall's double doors. When Izzy came out of those doors again, she wouldn't know who Lucy was, or anyone else for that matter. At that point, Izzy would be as alone as anyone on earth could be. Until that happened, Lucy meant to stay by her side. What are they going to do to me? Izzy asked without raising her head. Lucy pressed her lips together tightly and then said, They're going to make you forget. Izzy nodded again. There are some things it'd be nice to forget. Lucy considered this as she stared at the large round desk and the tiny ghostly clutch players that swirled over it. Will I forget my mother? Izzy asked. Lucy began to answer, and then paused. Actually, she answered quietly, you may not. She wasn't a witch. There was another pause. The voices in the hallway were still talking, quietly and intensely. Lucy heard her father among them. She couldn't tell what they were saying, but she could see their shadows on the hallway wall, gesturing animatedly. "'Will I forget the lake?' Izzy asked softly. She lifted her head and looked directly at Lucy, her eyes intent. "'Will I forget the gazebo and the wishing tree?' Lucy didn't know what that meant. "'Probably,' she ventured. "'I expect so.' Izzy nodded. "'Good. That's good. I don't want to remember that.' Lucy sighed deeply. The men in the hall had stopped walking as they talked, but now they approached again. Lizzie sensed that they were finally coming for Izzy. For her own part, Izzy wasn't paying them any attention. When it's all over, she asked, leaning her head on Lucy's shoulder again, will Petra and I be able to go home again, back to our little terraced house here at the school? Lucy held her breath, her eyes widening slowly. She supposed she could lie to Izzy. After all, in a few minutes, none of it would matter. Izzy wouldn't remember that she had ever had a big stepsister, much less the details of this conversation. And yet, Lucy couldn't bring herself to tell Izzy anything other than the truth. No, Iz, she said very softly. I'm sorry. No. Where will we go, then? Izzy asked. And as she raised her head once more, Lucy saw the first cloud of doubt pass over the girl's face. You'll go somewhere else, Lucy answered, not taking her gaze from Izzy's eyes. Izzy whispered, But what about Petra? Lucy shook her head and tried to smile encouragingly. It was very difficult. 
It'll be all right, Iz, she said. You won't remember her. Izzy's face began to darken. Her lips pulled down in a slow frown, and her brow clouded. Her eyes thickened with sudden tears. I'll remember Petra, she said, certainty and doubt mingling in her words. I could never forget Petra. I'm sorry, Iz, Lucy said, cursing herself for ruining the poor girl's last moments of awareness. I won't forget Petra, Izzy said again stubbornly. A tear spilled over onto her right cheek, and she glanced towards the door. The men came into sight even as she looked. The one in the lead was the arbiter, Albert Keynes. Behind him, looking perfectly miserable, his face pinched into a helpless frown, was Lucy's father. Isabella, Keynes said, cocking his head slightly and smiling. Come on over here now, darling. We're all ready for you. No! Izzy replied immediately, pressing back into her chair, her lower lip stuck out in defiance. Keene stopped in front of Izzy, still smiling. He hunkered down on one knee before her. I'm afraid I can't take no for an answer, darling, the man said, tilting his head towards her as if he meant to play. Come along with me, and when it's all over, I'll give you a lollipop. I won't remember lollipops when it's all over, Izzy replied immediately. And I won't remember you, or Lucy, or any of the rest of you. And I won't remember Petra. Lucy realized that Izzy was crying. Tears ran down her pink cheeks in shining rivulets. They weren't tears of sadness, however, at least not entirely. Mostly, Lucy realized, they were tears of anger. You won't forget lollipops, though. Keen smiled, reaching to take Izzy's hand. Those you'll remember just fine. Suddenly, unexpectedly, Izzy turned her head and let out a yell. It wasn't a scream. It was a name. Petra! Izzy called so loudly that her voice cracked. Now listen here, Keen said and grabbed for Izzy's hand. Izzy wrung it away from him and hugged her knees to her chest. Give the girl a moment! Percy snapped angrily, stepping to get between Izzy and Keynes. Keynes was too close to her, however. He reached for her again, his already pale face growing even paler with annoyance. Petra! Izzy called again. A voice rang in the waiting area. The nurse behind the round desk was standing now, one hand covering her mouth and the other flat against her throat. Come along now, Keynes demanded, grabbing at Izzy. Lucy could bear it no longer. She jumped up, not even aware of what she was doing. She was holding Izzy's hand in her own, and Izzy began to clamber after her. Oh, no, you don't, Keynes cried, but was cut off as Izzy extended both of her feet at once, connecting with the man's thin chest. He sprawled backwards, knocking Percy aside. Both men fell to the floor. Stop her, Keynes called, his knees poking up into the air as the court guards scrambled to help him up. Forget about me! Get the girl! Lucy, no! Percy called out. Lucy heard his voice, but didn't so much as glance back as she ran, Izzy at her side. Hands grabbed at them as they sped through the archway into the main corridor, but the girls were young and quick. They ducked between the two guards flanking the entry and darted into the door-lined corridor, making for the stairs beyond. It was completely hopeless, of course. They'd never make it out of the building, and even if they did, where would they go? And yet, Lucy couldn't stop herself. She ran on, Izzy at her side, even as a red bolt struck the marble floor at her feet, sending up a burst of sparks. Petra, Izzy said, almost to herself, still running. We have to find Petra. Not very far away, Albus followed along with the clutch cudgel tournament, somewhat indirectly. He'd stayed back at Ares' mansion as Team Werewolf geared up for the match and left pausing only for their ceremonial rubbing of the bronze werewolf statue in the front garden. No one asked him why he was still there, not even his mates, Grunway and Shrum, since they had left an hour earlier to get good seats up in the grandstands. Albus watched through the tiny window in the centre of the third-floor hall until the team was completely out of sight, their barking grunts lost in the increasing roar of the crowd. Then, as patiently as he could, Albus had waited. He'd overheard Altair and Jones talking in the parlour earlier that afternoon. Altair had heard all about James's overtures to the other houses, seeking help in the Bigfoot's attempt to defeat the werewolves. 
both of them had laughed maliciously at this. Isn't it just like the foots to ask the losers for help in beating the winners? Olivia Jones had observed, shaking her head. They should have come to us. We'd have given them the best advice of all. Go home and hide under your beds, little foots. Altair had chuckled. We should teach them a lesson, he'd said, his voice hardening, just for having the gall to try and rally the whole school against us. We should beat them into the ground like tent pegs for even trying. Make an example out of them. I have an idea, Jones had agreed, and then lowered her voice. Half a minute later, Altair had yodeled a laugh of pure spite. Albus hadn't liked the sound of that laugh, although he hadn't heard the details of Jones's plan. It didn't matter, really. Team Werewolf's tactics were never particularly subtle. Probably they meant to sacrifice a few penalties in favor of taking out a Bigfoot player or two. Albus only hoped that one of the players they eliminated wouldn't be James. Albus hadn't known for sure what he intended to do, but at that moment he had decided on a plan. It might not work, but then again, it just might. Besides, it wasn't as if he would be sabotaging his own team. He would merely be evening the odds. From his dormitory room, he listened to the ebb and roar of the crowd at nearby Pepperpock Down. He'd watched the clock impatiently. Finally, when it had got dark enough outside to hide his movements, he had crept out the front door of Ares' mansion and approached the statue of the snarling werewolf. As before, he could hear the shouts and commands of Team Werewolf echoing from the statue's muzzle, as if on a distant wireless frequency. Albus hunkered in the darkness, waiting for his moment to act. People were still moving along the nearby footpaths, latecomers to the match hurrying towards Pepperpock Down. None of them noticed the boy hiding in the shadow of the werewolf statue, but Albus didn't mean to take any chances. He waited and listened watching for the moment when no one would observe his actions. Faintly, via the mysterious statue, he heard Altair's instructions, shouted to his teammates as the match approached half-time. He could even hear the dull thumps and exclamations as the players collided in air, or the buzzing whooshes of the game magic spells. Albus could tell that Team Bigfoot was holding their own against the wolves, although not well enough to take the lead. Of course not! Albus thought sourly. They don't have liquid luck on their side. He glanced up at the werewolf statue as he listened. Its eyes glowed faintly, coppery in the last light of the sunset. Finally, just as Albus was preparing to act, he heard Altair call out a command, directed at that block-headed prat, Parker Pence. Number nine! Do it now! Phase one! Operation Achilles! A moment later, a heavy thump and yelp of pain emanated from the statue's mouth. Albus heard Altair's wicked laugh as the unfortunate Bigfoot player screamed, falling away from his assailant. Nearby, drowning out the thin broadcast of the statue, the crowd roared in Pepperpock Down's grandstands. Albus didn't know what happened next, but he assumed that the Bigfoot player was all right, more or less, since the match continued shortly thereafter. It was nearly half-time. Albus thought that that was probably the best time to act. He waited for the half-time horn to sound, and then climbed carefully to his feet, producing his wand from the sheath in his sleeve. He stood in front of the statue's glowing eyes, hearing the distant whoops and barks of his team as they congregated for half-time, and then raised his wand. He opened his mouth to speak the incantation. Convulsis was the spell he had chosen after some consideration, but the words stopped in his throat as the werewolf statue blinked. It moved, shaking its shaggy bronze neck and turning very slightly, as if to face Albus directly. The amber eyes narrowed, and a low growl, almost like the purr of a very large cat, emanated from deep within the thing's metal throat. Albus froze. This he had not at all expected. His mouth moved, framing the words of the spell, but he couldn't speak. Fear had closed off his breath. The statue's eyes flared brighter, and Albus sensed it preparing to pounce on him, to crush him under its weight. He had time to think. It have a shift in chance it to recognize when it was being threatened, and to defend itself? Is that even possible? Obviously, it was. The truth wrinkled its bronze lips back from its bronze teeth, 
and the growl grew louder, announcing its intention to strike. And then, suddenly, a hand closed on Albus's wrist, pushing his arm upright. Hold it right there, Cornelius, a voice commanded stridently. Drop the wand, now! Albus didn't obey. He barely heard the words. He continued to stare wildly at the crouching werewolf shape before him, but most of the light suddenly seemed to have gone from its eyes. It was no longer moving or growling. I said drop it, the voice commanded again. The hand dropping Albus's wrist tightened painfully, and Albus's hand spasmed, releasing his wand. It fell silently into the grass in front of the statue. Albus finally looked aside and found himself staring into the face of Dayton Englewood, a senior werewolf student and member in good standing of Professor Jackson's Salem Durgus Free Militia. Englewood's crew cut bristled, and his wide, pockmarked face was set with a sweaty gleam of triumph. Looks like I caught me a spy, he said with grim glee. A spy and a saboteur! Despite his fear and frustration, Albus rolled his eyes. Great, he said wearily. Just what you've always wanted. Gobbins! James shouted hoarsely. Overhead! Brick wall! Now! Gobbins acted immediately, stopping his scrim in mid-air as if he had struck a solid wall and dropping flat onto the surface, with the clutch held beneath him, protected. The werewolf bullies swooped over him, barely missing his head as he hunkered down. Instantly, Gobbins sprang up again, rocketing forwards, now following the bullies, drafting behind them. They boggled back at him, and then jerked upwards out of the course under the influence of Wentworth's gravity well. There was no time to celebrate even as Gobbins swept on towards the goal. The other two clutches were in the werewolf's possession. James leaned over his scrim, driving it forward so quickly that the rings flashed past like fence posts. He caught up to one of the werewolf clippers, Olivia Jones, and fired a zombie hexeter. Somehow, uncannily, Jones jigged to the left just at the right moment, causing the spell to deflect from the center ring as she passed through it. James cursed loudly to himself and ducked through the melee of the center ring, still chasing Jones. They were only five minutes into the second half when James swooped past Clayton Altair, who let out a guttural bark of triumph. Number four! he shouted, apparently to one of his teammates. Phase two, now! James didn't know what the call meant. A few seconds later, however, a piercing howl rang out over the course. James was so surprised that he nearly fell off his scrim. He swooped out of the course and spun around in a tight corkscrew. There was only one person in the rings who could make a sound like that. Sure enough, Muckthatch had fallen onto his scrim, holding his right knee in pain. His keeper's cudgel was spinning lazily as it fell towards the field far below. Oh no! Jasmine cried helplessly, dismay and rage evident in her voice. Not Mark! What did they do? They buzzed him! Troy Covington called from the opposite end of the course. On purpose! James flew over to the platform and jumped off his scrim, landing next to Professor Wood, whose face was set in a hard frown. They shot Mark! James declared angrily, pointing, and that was no accident. What spell was it? Inertia charm, Wood answered tersely. Great for thrown clutches, terrible for human bones, or Sasquatch bones for that matter. Professor Sinouye was towing Muckthatch towards the platform using a lanyard charm. His whistle poked from between his teeth. On his scrim, Muckthatch groaned, still clutching his right knee. Medical college immediately! Sanuye announced as Wood helped Muckthatch off his scrim. They did that deliberately, Wood said to the match official. You know that, right? Miss Brazil says it was an accident, Sanuye replied evenly. Linton Brazil is a cheat and a liar, James exclaimed. But Wood raised a hand, silencing him. Your word against hers, Sanuye said, shaking his head slowly. Either way, you're down by two players, Professor. You don't intend to finish the match, do you? Absolutely, Gobbins cried, landing on the other side of the platform. Jasmine and the rest of the diminished team were close behind. As they landed, two medical students in green tunics appeared on the platform to examine Muckthatch's knee. They shook their heads gravely and began to splint the knee in preparation for the trip back to the medical college. I'd strongly advise you to forfeit, Sanuye said, still speaking to Wood. You may choose to contest the results at a later time. 
Frankly, I testify to the board that you deserve a tie. Team Werewolf would still receive a technical victory, but you'd save your team the embarrassment of losing rather miserably. A squad two players short is a lost cause, I'm afraid. Wood considered this stoically. He looked out over the remainder of the team. No way, James declared, shaking his head. We can't give up. They're trying to force us out, one by one, because they know they can't beat us in a clean match. Right you may be, James, Wood nodded. But Professor Sanuye is right. We're two players down. I don't see that we have much of a choice. But we can't give up, James insisted, looking around at the team. That's what they want us to do. Maybe we should, though, Jasmine suggested sadly. I mean, if we can at least get a technical tie game, like Professor Sanuye says. Troy Covington nodded. It's better than getting completely destroyed in the rings, at least. I sure don't want to risk any more accidents at the hands of those maniacs. He shot a dark look across the platform across the way. Face it, Wentworth added, stripping off his gauntlets and throwing them down onto the platform floor. Playing a clean game is just no match for all's fair in love and war. The rest of the team muttered agreement. Shall we take a vote? Wood asked, raising his voice. What's the point? Gobbins declared angrily, glancing around at his teammates. Let's just get out of here! He made his way towards the stairs that descended through the center of the platform, and the rest of the team followed, discouraged into silence. Gobbins stopped on the second step, however, as the sound of clumping footsteps rang up from below. James watched as Gobbins backed up off the stairs again, making way for the newcomer. A head with very short, dark hair appeared from below followed by a stocky body with arms like tree trunks. The figure was carrying Muck Thatch's scrim and wearing an ill-fitting Bigfoot jersey. You need a reserve player, the figure asked seriously, glancing around at the wide-eyed members of Team Bigfoot. You're Victor Crumb, Wentworth exclaimed suddenly, pointing a finger at the big man. I've got your chocolate frog card back in my room. Crumb smiled gravely. Victor, Wood said, stepping forwards and shaking the man's hand. Good to see you, especially under these circumstances. Is it legal? James asked impatiently, glancing around at Professor Sanuye. Can he actually play for us? Sanuye nodded consideringly. Every house has their own rules for who can play on their team, he said. The official Alma Alaron rule book only states that a simple majority of any team must be students from that team's house of origin. Mr. Crumb may indeed play if he wishes, and if you'll have him. But can he play? Covington asked. I mean no offense, Mr. Crumb, but do you even know how to fly a scrim? Are you screwed, Poop? Wentworth exclaimed, nearly beside himself. He's Victor Zarkin Crumb! He can do anything! Without a word, Victor tossed Muck Thatch's scrim into the air. As it came down next to him, the big man hopped easily onto it. It bobbed with him on it, and he directed it in a quick corkscrew swoop, ending in a ready crouch, his hands held out flat on either side. I once played for Bulgarian Clutch Cudgel Minor League, he admitted with a grin. It's not Quidditch, but sport is sport, yes? Sport is definitely sport, Wood agreed, matching the big man's grin. Professor Sanuyi! It would appear that the Bigfoots are not quite prepared to give up just yet. All around him, Team Bigfoot cheered fervently. Sanuye nodded. A moment later, he turned his broom away from the platform and swept out over the center ring. He blew his whistle, and the babbling crowd fell quiet. Penalty, Team Werewolf! Careless use of magic! Five minutes in the dark! The crowd roared approval as the members of Team Werewolf cried out angrily, denouncing the call. James grinned as he jumped back onto his scrim. Careless use of magic contained a much harsher penalty than mere accidental buzzing, which enforced only two minutes in the dock. Linton Brazil would be out of the match for the rest of the third quarter, making the teams even once again, at least for the moment. And in a shocking turn of events! Cheshire Chatterley called from the announcer's booth. Team Bigfoot gains a surprise reserve player in the form of Mr. Victor Crumb, world-renowned Harrier, athlete, and participant in the famed Triwizard Tournament. T-1000 
Team Werewolf faces a stiff but fair penalty at the hands of match official Sanuye, and the match resumes with the Wolves leading by a score of 76 to 65. James heard the whistle as the match ploughed once again into motion. He watched as Victor Crumb immediately snagged one of the loose clutches and tucked it under his huge arm. The match isn't over yet, he thought, and plunged eagerly into the fracas. Lucy and Izzy clambered down into the dark stairwell. Voices rang out behind them, but they echoed so that Lucy couldn't tell how close their pursuers were. We just can't keep running, Iz, Lucy panted, but Izzy paid no attention. The two girls darted around a corner and pushed through a heavy door. There were no windows here, and a sign overhead was lit with red light. Experimental medicine and elixirs. No admittance. Izzy ran on, her blonde curls flying. Lucy followed, glancing back the way they'd come. Petra! Izzy moaned again, looking around wildly. She's here! I feel her! She's dreaming! Izzy, Petra's in an enchanted sleep, Lucy insisted. They gave her the poison apple. Nothing will wake her up until they want her to wake. Izzy didn't seem to hear Lucy. She turned and pushed through a set of swinging double doors. There! A voice echoed behind Lucy. She glanced back and saw two of the court agents bursting through the stairwell doors. Their faces glowed crimson in the light of the overhead sign. One of the men pointed his wand and shouted. A stunning spell burst against the pale green brick wall next to Lucy, showering her with red sparks. Lubricus! Lucy cried, flinging her own wand out. Both men suddenly flailed wildly as if the marble floor beneath them was coated with ice. They slid into the walls, one on each side, overcorrected, and then bounced off of each other, collapsing messily to the corridor floor. Lucy spun and ran again, following Izzy through the swinging double doors. The walls here were black tile, shiny in the overhead lights. The room itself was low and wide, packed with aisles of shelves. Lucy had been to the Ministry of Magic many times and was reminded of the Department of Mysteries. Here, however, the shelves were crammed with stoppered jars of coloured liquid, each labelled in glowing green ink. Izzy was looking around at the shelves helplessly. She's nearby, she moaned. She looked up at Lucy, her eyes pleading. I can feel her. She's close. She's dreaming. She's dreaming of us. Stop, Izzy, please, Lucy pleaded. It's useless. You can't wake her even if you do find her. Do you understand? Maybe we can talk to the people. Try once more to convince them not to take away your memory. My father can help. A burst of red shattered on one of the vials of a nearby shelf, startling both girls. They ducked and clambered away as more spells lit the air. Izzy spun at the end of one of the aisles and grabbed a large jar. Her face was etched with fear and rage as she flung it. The jar arced over Lucy's head and shattered loudly on the marble floor, directly in front of the approaching court agents. Fire leapt up from the jar's liquid contents and engulfed the men. They shrieked in unison as they scrambled forwards, beating at their clothes to extinguish the red flames. Lucy had only a moment to realize that the flames weren't fire, however. They were leaves. Red vines and bright red flowers grew with lightning speed from the released liquid, entwining the men's arms and legs, attaching to their grey tunics. Stop! one of the men shouted, tugging at the vines. Stop in the name of the Wizarding Lord of the United States! Sod off! Lucy shouted back. A moment later, she and Izzy doubled back to the main doors, banging through them even as the court agents fired repelling spells at the red vines releasing themselves. If you see her, Lucy asked as they ran on. If you see Petra is, will you stop running? Yes, Izzy cried out eagerly. Lucy nodded. I know where she is, she said. Follow me. Izzy had been right after all. Petra had been very close. She had been exactly one floor below them, in the lowest basement of the medical college. Glancing back only once, the two girls found the rear stairwell and began to clamber down into the darkness below. "'What were you planning to do?' Dayton Englewood demanded, pushing his face so close to Albus's that he completely blocked the view of the tiny Ares Mansion dungeon. "'I told you,' Albus replied in irritation. "'I was giving old Wolfie a little haircut, that's all. Shaggy Fur is so last year.' "'Laugh all you want, Cornelius!' 
Englewood growled, narrowing his eyes. You won't be laughing when Professor Jackson gets here. He'll nail you to the wall. I've seen it happen, you know. He doesn't take kindly to saboteurs. I'm sure he doesn't, Albus agreed. What did he do with my wand? Englewood smiled thinly. I confiscated it. You'll probably never see it again. They don't allow wands where you're going. Really? Albus said, shifting on the hard bench in the corner of the dungeon. So, you Americans are in the habit of sending blokes to Fort Bedlam just for pointing wands at statues? Sounds pretty touchy if you ask me. Maybe you should consider growing a bit thicker hide. Shut up, Cornelius, Englewood suggested, lowering his own wand a little, but not completely. It's just a good thing I was coming back late for my last exam. Who knows what you might have done? That's pretty late for an exam, isn't it? Albus replied, unable to stop himself. The pointy end of the quill goes down, you know. The fluffy end points up. Tough one to remember that. Shut up, I said. Englewood commanded, raising his wand again. You think I want to be here guarding your sorry English butt? I'm missing the tournament match. Albus rolled his eyes and slumped on the wooden bench. Ah, uh, you're not missing anything, he muttered. Same old song and dance. At that point, a dull thump and a series of heavy footsteps sounded overhead. Englewood glanced up and then showed Albus a toothy grin. That's Professor Jackson, he said smugly. I sent for him by pigeon, interrupted him right in the middle of the match. Boy, will he be mad at you. Yeah, Albus nodded. Dangerous prisoner like me definitely couldn't have waited until after the tournament was over. I bet he'll give you a medal even. Englewood's grin faltered for a moment. Footsteps knocked loudly on the stone stairs of the dungeon as Professor Jackson descended, his black waistcoat buttoned all the way to his chin. Englewood spun around to face him. He saluted with fierce efficiency. I've captured a spy, General, he shouted, snapping to attention. He was engaged in the act of sabotage when I discovered him and apprehended him. I've been guarding him ever since, awaiting instructions. Jackson glanced at Englewood and then shifted his gaze to Albus, his expression unchanging. Slowly, he looked back at Englewood again. This is Albus Potter, Englewood, Jackson said, apparently struggling to keep his voice even. He is a member of this house. Sir, he is a spy, sir, Englewood barked, saluting again. I caught him attempting to sabotage the werewolf statue out front. Jackson closed his eyes and pressed his lips together. When he opened them again, he was looking at Albus. Is this true, Mr. Potter? he asked tiredly. Yes, sir, Albus answered honestly. There didn't seem to be any point in lying about it. I was planning to blast it a hard one right between the eyes. It was on the edge of attacking me. Attacking you? Jackson repeated. The statue you say was attacking you. Sir, yes, sir, Albus nodded easily. Jackson drew a long, deep breath. When he let it out, he returned his attention to Englewood. Could this not, perhaps, have waited for the end of the match, Private? The spy presented a clear and present danger, sir, Englewood declared, his face going red. He glanced back over his shoulder at Albus. He, uh, was engaged in covert activities. He was pulling a prank, Private, Jackson sighed. At best, I cannot imagine why he was doing it, but I admit that I have never quite understood the thought processes of the Potter family. Frustrating as they may be, they are relatively harmless, I assure you. Englewood snapped his heels together and stood so straight that he looked like he meant to rock it up through the low dungeon ceiling. Sir, what are your orders, sir? Jackson closed his eyes again and rubbed them with the thumb and forefinger of his left hand. I order you both, he said patiently, to accompany me back to Pepperpock Down for the remainder of the tournament match. It was, you may be interested to know, just getting good. Sir, yes, sir! Englewood barked again, snapping off yet another salute. At ease, Private, Jackson growled. A moment later, he beckoned for Albus to follow him. In single file, Albus in the middle, the three made their way back up the dungeon stairs and through the mansion's main hall. I hesitate to ask this, Mr. Potter, Jackson said as the front door slammed behind them. But why, pray tell, were you pointing your wand at the werewolf statue? Like I said, Albus answered, still seeing no need to lie. I planned to destroy it, at least a little. Jackson shook his head slowly. I doubt you'd have succeeded in any case, he said wryly. But why, 
young man. Albus paused and stopped. Englewood nearly ran into him from behind. His wand was still out, pointing at his prisoner, and Albus felt it poke him harmlessly in the back. Englewood dropped it and cursed urgently to himself, scrambling to pick it up again. Three paces away, Jackson stopped as well. He turned and looked back, his eyes impatient but curious. Albus tilted his head towards the bronze statue. It stood unmoving next to him, its muzzle frozen in its characteristic snarl. Do you really? he said, turning back to the professor. Want to know? By the end of the third quarter of the tournament match, Team Werewolf had succeeded in taking out yet one more Bigfoot player. This time, Troy Covington had received a blindside hit with a scrim right in the middle of the back. Covington had fallen from his scrim, completely unconscious, while the werewolf bully, Pence, had collected the dropped clutch and flown on without a backward glance. Sanuye had succeeded in levitating Covington just as he had Norrick. The penalty had been called, ten more minutes in the dock for dangerous manoeuvring, and Pence had landed on the werewolf's platform, no longer grinning, but grimacing smugly. Professor Jackson's not even in the stands, Gobbins panted, swooping in next to James and pointing. The wolves always play dirty, but even he wouldn't have allowed a brazen hit like that. They're taking advantage of the fact that he's not here. James swore loudly and glanced back at his own platform. What he saw there gladdened his heart, even if the match seemed increasingly hopeless. Several members of the other house clutch team stood on the platform, surrounding Professor Wood. Every one of them wore a Bigfoot jersey and held their scrims at their sides. Warrington was first in line. As Covington was lowered gently onto a waiting stretcher, Warrington hopped onto his scrim and swooped out into the rings. It's his grand poo barness, James announced gamely. Welcome to the jungle, Warrington, Jasmine Jade called. Thanks for coming. Wouldn't miss it for the world, Warrington said. Zane says howdy, by the way. And if you ever remind me that I once wore a Bigfoot jersey, I'll paint your house with blimpy puke. See if I don't. James nodded. Point taken. Is it break time? Victor Crumb called as he swept past. Or is a match going on? Warrington frowned. Into the breach, he called, and leaned over his scrim, following Crumb. A moment later, James and Gobbins followed. The Bigfoots were still behind. No matter how many goals they scored, the werewolves always, infuriatingly, managed to keep a slim but stubborn lead. James refused to think about it. As he had thought several minutes earlier, the match wasn't over yet. The Foots still had a chance, no matter how slim. James flashed through the center ring and snatched a floating clutch. He pointed his wand, called out one of the Pixies' proprietary speed charms, and rocketed forwards in a blur. Lucy and Izzy made it to the bottom of the narrow stairwell and pushed through the heavy door. It was very dark in the corridor, and a pair of guards stood at the end, flanking the last doorway. They looked up as the two girls approached. This is a restricted area, sweetheart, one of the guards called to Lucy. He was young, with a southern accent. Don't call me sweetheart, Lucy instructed, raising her wand. Her stunning spell struck the young guard in the shoulder, and he collapsed like a bag of cauldrons. The other guard watched this in disbelief, not even thinking to reach for his own wand. Oh, no, you didn't, he said, looking up at Lucy and frowning. He was finally reaching for his wand, but it was too late. Oh, yes, I did, Lucy replied. Sorry. She winced as her stunning spell struck the second guard. He crumpled on top of his mate, dropping his wand. Sometimes, Lucy thought, it helped to be a young girl. They're coming, Izzy said urgently. I sense them. Petra's dreaming of them. She's just beyond that door, Lucy shrugged, pointing. Go ahead, Iz. Go see her. Do what you have to do. Izzy trotted forwards, clambering easily over the fallen guards. Lucy thought the heavy metal door would be locked, but when Izzy turned the handle, it opened easily, swinging silently on its hinges. Izzy disappeared quickly inside. Lucy stepped gingerly over the guards and stood just outside the open door. It was dark inside the cell. The walls were blank stone with no windows. A narrow metal bed stood in the exact center of the room beneath a dim lamp. Petra lay on the bed, uncovered, clothed in the same drab dress she had been wearing on the day that they had arrested her. 
Izzy stood beside the bed and clasped one of Petra's hands. Petra, she said fervently, wake up! They're coming to get me. They're going to make me forget you and everybody else. They're going to send us away from each other. You have to wake up and help me. Lucy watched, frustrated anger and fear settling over her like a wet blanket. Petra lay on the bed, still as stone, her eyes closed peacefully. Lucy could make out the shape of Petra's eyes beneath her lids. They didn't so much as flinch. Petra! Izzy insisted in an urgent whisper. Wake up! Please! Don't let them take me! They're coming! You're dreaming of them! I can see it in your thoughts even now! Izzy, Lucy whispered, shaking her head. She can't. She would if she could, but she can't. You do understand? It isn't Petra's fault. No! Izzy wailed, raising her voice, not taking her eyes from the sleeping shape of her sister. She will wake up! She has to! A door banged open at the end of the dark corridor. Lucy looked back the way they had come and saw figures emerging into the dim light. Keynes was in the lead, his face hard. Lucy's father was close behind him. Lucy! he called, his voice echoing in the low corridor. Put your one down, love! Please stop! Then to the others he said, If any of you raise a wand to my daughter, I will have your badges before the International Wizarding Court, I swear it! Come out, Isabella, Keynes demanded. All the sweetness had gone out of his voice. You're only making this horror on yourself. Lucy turned back to the small room. Izzy had not looked up from her sister. Petra, of course, had not moved in the slightest. Petra! Izzy cried, still clinging to the young woman's hand with both of her own. Don't leave me alone with them! Don't let them make me forget you! Stand back, young lady, Keynes demanded, pushing Lucy aside. Her father stopped next to her and put his hand on her shoulder. He shook his head down at her, both sadly and warningly. Isabella Morganston, Keynes said, striding into the room. Come this moment. I don't wish to stun you. He grabbed her, one hand on each shoulder. Izzy screamed and wriggled beneath his grip. But Keynes was no longer wasting any effort. His grip on her was like a vice. He turned her around even as Izzy still clung to her sister's hand. Petra! Izzy gasped, tears running down her face again. Don't let them, Petra, please! Lucy watched helplessly as Keynes pushed her towards the door. He stopped only to grasp Izzy's small fingers and pry them away from Petra's hand. The hand fell away limply and hung next to the narrow bed. The fingers curled loosely in sleep. Izzy screamed, loudly this time, making no words. Keynes's face was hard as stone as he maneuvered Izzy through the door, which she clung to uselessly. Lucy reached to comfort the girl, but Keynes pushed her hand away, giving her a black look. A moment later, he dragged Izzy down the corridor towards the basement stairwell. The court agents followed along, cutting off Lucy's view of the blonde girl. One of them remained by the door, his wand in his hand, standing over the stunned guards. I'm so sorry, Lou, her father said, his hand still on her shoulder. There's nothing I can do. Petra! Izzy screamed once more through her tears. The sound of it rang in the hall like a gong, and Lucy realized that she herself was crying. She turned to look back through the open doorway of Petra's cell. The girl lay on the bed like a corpse, her eyes closed peacefully, her hand hanging limply to the side, pale in the lamplight. Petra! Izzy's voice shrieked, cracking, and then, frantically, echoing as the girl was pushed into the stairwell. Morgan! Help me! Help me! And on the bed, Petra's eyes flickered. They fluttered, opened and then turned aside as Petra rolled her head towards the door, meeting Lucy's astonished gaze. Coldness rushed out of the room like a gust of wind, streaming through Lucy's hair and clothes. Lucy gasped at the frigid blast and raised an arm to shield her eyes from its force. When she looked again, the narrow bed in the dark room was empty. "'Are you quite certain of this?' Professor Jackson asked flatly studying Albus's face. "'Teeth cheat, don't lie,' Albus said, nodding towards the pink paper in Professor Jackson's hands. 
Albus had realized that he'd been carrying the tiny paper in his blazer pocket ever since the day he'd used it to test the statue. It looked very small in Jackson's big, knuckly fingers. Indeed it does not, Jackson stated gravely. He could have gotten that from anywhere, Englewood cried. There's no way of knowing if that stuff came from the statue. It's a trick. Gotta be. Jackson narrowed his eyes at Albus. Slowly, he lowered the teach cheat and pushed it into the pocket of his waistcoat. When the professor's hand reappeared, it was holding his wand. You may be right, Mr. Englewood, Jackson replied in a low, smooth voice. This is, after all, an extremely serious allegation. Damn straight, Englewood agreed, giving Albus a beady-eyed glare. Jackson raised his wand. Albus felt a moment of raw panic as the wand seemed to level at him. He glanced around, remembering that his own wand had been confiscated by Englewood. He was defenceless. And then, with a monumental sense of relief, he saw what the professor was really pointing at. There is only one way to find out, Jackson said, obviously reluctant to do what he was about to do. He stared down the length of his wand and trained it on the werewolf's bronze head, just past Albus's shoulder. The wolf growled, loudly this time. Albus spun around, his eyes going wide and ducked aside. If the statue meant to tackle its opponent, Albus did not wish to be between them. Professor Jackson called his spell at exactly the same moment that the bronze werewolf pounced. Expulso! Jackson thundered, raising his arm instinctively to match the metal beast's motion. The spell struck the statue in mid-air, producing a blinding purple flash, which was, strangely, perfectly silent. Albus dropped to the ground and covered his head with his hands. Bits of statue rained down like hail, peppering him, none larger than his pinky finger. When the rain of bronze bits was over, Albus raised his head, his eyes wild. The rear half of the statue was mostly intact. It lay sideways on the grass, six feet from its base. The rest of the statue was spread around the lawn like a corona, thousands of tiny bits glinting in the yellow moonlight. Well then, Jackson said, his own eyes wide as he pocketed his wand. Let us proceed to the tournament match, then. We shall see what effect, if any, this turn of events has on the outcome. Uh, what about him? Albus asked, climbing to his feet and glancing back towards Englewood. Jackson peered over his shoulder at the boy. He lay on his back in the grass, his arms and legs splayed in a dead faint. <sighs> Leave him, Jackson sighed. If he'd have saluted once more, I'd have stunned him myself. James sensed the change immediately. He couldn't put his finger on what it was, but it was evident nonetheless. For one thing, Pence dropped the clutch. James had been chasing him, trying to aim a lanyard charm, when the leather ball had simply popped out from beneath the boy's arm. James could scarcely believe it, and almost forgot to grab for the clutch as he sped past. An instant later, he hugged it against his chest and leaned over his scrim, hardly believing his luck. He rocketed past Pence, who was glancing around confusedly, comically. "'What happened?' Warrington demanded, swooping in next to James to escort him through his laps. "'He fumbled!' James called, swooping through the centre ring and ducking beneath a werewolf bully. "'Straight up dropped it! It nearly hit me in the face!' "'Well, don't waste it!' Warrington advised, aiming a bone-fuse hex at a werewolf clipper. "'We're only down by four! We can still take this match!' James nodded as he completed his second lap. He expected to be fallen upon by werewolf bullies, but as he glanced around, he was amazed to see that his course was almost completely clear. In fact, most of the werewolves seemed to have fallen into a sort of confused fugue. They had slowed in their path through the rings. One of them, Olivia Jones, had completely missed one of the far rings and had been forced to relinquish her clutch. She stared dumbly down at her own hands and then back at the ring she had flown past. There were no Bigfoot bullies around her at all. She had simply missed the ring. What's happened to them? Warrington called, wonderingly glancing around. They act like somebody pulled the plug on them. It won't last, whatever it is, James replied, raising his voice into the rushing wind of the course. Stay on top of it. If they take out one more Bigfoot, we'll have to forfeit the match. Warrington nodded grimly as James spun around on his scrim, lobbing the clutch towards the goal ring. 
Dunkel, the werewolf keeper, wasn't even watching. The clutch sailed through the goal, and James glanced towards the scoreboard as he flew on, watching the numbers change. Well, with only 90 seconds left in tonight's incredible matchup, Cheshire Chatterley cried exuberantly. Team Bigfoot closes within three points of the reigning champions. What a match, folks! James sped on. He sensed the werewolves recovering from the mysterious confusion that had overtaken them. Altair swooped in next to him as they passed through the center ring. They both grabbed for the single remaining clutch, but Altair body-checked James, knocking him violently out of the course. The werewolf captain glanced back angrily as he sped on, holding the clutch under his arm. Even as he looked back, however, Jasmine Jade fell in next to him. James hurled himself forwards, attempting to catch up. Hey, Altair! Jasmine called out, giving her voice a very uncharacteristic lilt. James was shocked to see the big girl place one hand behind her head and the other on her waist. She cocked her hip towards the werewolf captain and smiled at him, all while rocketing along next to him, scrim for scrim. You're such a big bad wolf, she trilled, fluttering her eyes at Altair. How would you like to huff and puff and blow my house down? Altair did a complete double-take at Jasmine, apparently forgetting for the moment where he was. A split second later, he spanged headlong into one of the passing rings, dropping the clutch as his scrim squirted away into the night. Jasmine caught the clutch easily, tucked it beneath her arm, and hunkered over her scrim. Wow! James called to her, his eyes wide with disbelief. That Vila thing is pretty amazing when you turn it on. He glanced back and saw Altair dangling gamely from the ring he'd crashed into. If you've got it, Jasmine called, grinning sheepishly. Flaunt it! As Jasmine scored, James saw that the werewolves were only ahead by two points. Ten seconds later, Victor Crumb socked home another goal, hurling the clutch so hard that it knocked the cudgel clean out of Dunkel's hand. The crowd exploded into deafening cheers, stomping their feet and waving banners wildly against the night. Two more and we win! Gobbin shouted, grinning with disbelief. We're gonna do it! James nodded. The werewolves had been merciless in their attack on Team Bigfoot and had apparently been infuriated by the line of players from the other houses gathering to play reserve for the underdog team. Only minutes earlier, Wentworth had got forced into a collision with a werewolf bully, jamming most of the fingers on his right hand. He had sworn loudly and even bared his teeth at the werewolf bully before being pulled away by Jasmine and Gobbins. By the time Pixie Captain Ophelia Wright subbed in for Wentworth, Nearly half of the team had become comprised of players from other houses. If only one more native player got removed from the match, Team Bigfoot would have to forfeit. James tried not to worry about it. The last thing the team could afford right now was to be careful. Thinking this, James rammed through the centre ring, collecting the clutch that Crumb had just scored with. He tossed it aside to Gobbins and fell in behind him, meaning to escort him through his laps. Two werewolf bullies dropped instantly alongside, moving to flank Gobbins. Now's as good a time as ever, James thought, pressing his lips together tightly. He leaned severely into the wind, driving his scrim wildly forwards, and reached towards the button the Igors had installed on the end of his scrim. He pounded it with the flat of his hand. Beneath his scrim, a small box popped open. James knew what was in the box— a tiny photograph of a babel thrush spore and a curled length of bamboozle vine that James had asked Professor Longbottom to send to him. As the box opened, the bamboozle transformed into a cloud of fat pink babel thrush spores. The werewolf bullies flew through the spores, which peppered their goggles and chests. Immediately the bullies corkscrewed off course, swiping at their goggles and dissolving into fits of sneezes. That's the last of our tricks, James thought, as Gobbins lobbed the clutch through the goal ring, tying the match. From here on out, it's just us. The crowd roared constantly now, as the final seconds of the match ticked away. James heard Cheshire Chatterley's voice echoing wildly from the announcer's booth, but he couldn't make out any of her actual words. He leaned completely sideways on his scrim as he powered through the figure-of-eight course, passing werewolves and Bigfoots on both sides. As he ripped through the centre ring, he managed to grab two clutches, one in each hand. Amazingly, there were no werewolves challenging him for them. He tucked one under each arm, leaned over his scrim, and grimaced into the oncoming wind. He completed the first lap easily, almost effortlessly, and was halfway through his second when a voice cried out, 
"'James!' Crum called distantly. James barely stopped to look. When he did, he saw Crum waving wildly at him, pointing, "'Behind you!' James peered back over his shoulder. The entirety of Team Werewolf was stacked up behind him, gaining on him, their faces set into grim lines of resolve. Most of them had their wands out, aiming at him. They're going to take me out, James thought, and panic ripped through him. They don't care if their whole team gets penalised. If they knock me out of the match, there won't be enough native Bigfoots left on the team, and we'll have to forfeit. Team Werewolf will get a technical victory. Even as this realisation formed in James's mind, a blast of red sparks sizzled over his shoulder, barely missing him. It hadn't been a lanyard charm or a gravity well. The werewolves were using duelling spells. James, look out! Jasmine cried from somewhere far behind, but it was no use. James ducked and swooped back and forth, struggling to stay inside the rings while simultaneously avoiding being struck. More magical bolts lit the air all around. Sanuye was blowing his whistle repeatedly, but the wolves weren't stopping. They were desperate, and in their desperation they were willing to do anything. James felt a sudden wriggle of real fright. It spread through him like ice, freezing him. He scrambled for his wand, fumbling one of the clutches. He stripped the thin wooden shaft out of his gauntlet, and then dropped it as well. It spun away into the darkness, and he stared after it, petrified. Something thumped against his chest as he leaned over. He scrambled at it, worried that it was a lanyard charm, or worse. With some amazement, he realized that it was a small cloth pouch, both soft and dense to the touch. It hung around his neck on a length of rawhide string, the vampire's game curse. He had been so intent on getting the rest of the team to take the vampire's potion powders off before the match that he had completely forgotten to remove his own. Without thinking, he grabbed at the short, fluttering ripcord. He pulled it and felt the pouch pop open. Black powder exploded from it, streaming backwards instantly into his wake. It engulfed the trailing werewolves, covering them in writhing black tendrils. James glanced back, struggling to stay on his own scrim while holding on to the last clutch. The tendrils of black powder solidified around the werewolves, forming a sort of loose net. Then, violently, it contracted. The black net pulled tight, sucking the entirety of Team Werewolf into a monstrous collision. If the game curse had been deployed on a single player, it would surely have forced them to momentarily lose control of their scrim, sending them off course. Deployed on the entire team, however, the effect was both sickly amusing and utterly devastating. The team crashed instantly in mid-air, pulled together by the force of the magical black net. A second later, the net vanished into smoke, and the werewolves fell out of it, scrambling to stay on their scrims, grabbing at one another, spiralling away in every direction. Breathlessly, James turned back to the course. Somehow, he had managed not to miss a single ring. He raised the final clutch, held it over his shoulder, and tossed it easily through the goal ring. No one was guarding it. The clutch sailed through so cleanly that James caught it himself, coming through on the other side. The crowd erupted into a single riotous cheer. The scoreboard flickered, reflecting the change in the score. Ninety-seven to ninety-eight. Team Bigfoot, including the several reserve players, collapsed around James, laughing wildly and hoisting him up over them. The horn sounded, echoing deafeningly over the grandstands. The match was over. Team Bigfoot had won. Chapter 23 The Beginning of the End For the Bigfoots, most winning matches had ended in a victorious evening celebration at the Kitan Key, crowded around a few tables in their usual corner, quaffing butterbeers and licorice sodas. The end of the tournament match, however, launched a major event that nearly the entire campus turned out to watch. Thanks to the werewolves' recent string of championship victories, due in no small part to the now-destroyed werewolf statue, the March of the Houses had not been witnessed at Alma Alaron for over a decade. Apart from the teachers, hardly anyone had ever seen it. Ares' mansion had become a fixture on Victory Hill, 
and many had begun to think that it would never move again. They might have been right if Albus had not discovered the secret of Stafford Havershift's bewitched werewolf statue. Even now, already, rumours about the broken bronze statue were circulating among the student populace. James heard snippets of them, although he wouldn't hear Albus's complete story until later during the journey home. Some students were whispering that the statue had been magical and had come alive, forcing Professor Jackson to destroy it. Others claimed that it had been a good luck charm that had been overwhelmed by the werewolf's tournament loss, resulting in its spontaneous destruction. Regardless of the reason, as Team Bigfoot gathered at the base of Victory Hill, James saw that the imposing statue was, indeed, destroyed. Its rear half lay several feet away from its base, and while James couldn't be certain, it looked to him as if the pose of the remaining half was rather different than it had been when he'd seen it last. "'People are saying that the statue just exploded as soon as the werewolves lost,' Ralph said, crowding between James and Jasmine Jade, like it committed statuicide in shame or something. I don't blame it, Zane commented from James's other side. Beside him, Warrington scoffed. Who cares what happened to it? If it was me, I'd leave it there like a trophy, even after Aerie's mansion scampered off with its tail between its legs. James noticed that Warrington was still wearing the Bigfoot jersey he had donned earlier in order to play reserve. Behind the team... The crowd from Pepperpock down was still milling around, congregating noisily in the quad between Administration Hall and Victory Hill, packing the lawns in excited anticipation. Team Werewolf was nowhere in sight, and James assumed that they were simply waiting it out in their locker cellar, refusing to watch the moving of the houses. Victor Crum, unfortunately, had left immediately after the match, along with James's mum and sister. Word had leaked back to James that they had received an urgent message via the shard, which Ginny had been carrying in her purse in the hope of news from her husband. James's dad, of course, was out on his reconnaissance mission to New Amsterdam, accompanied by Titus Hardcastle, in preparation for tomorrow's raid. Victor himself had wanted to go along, but Harry had been adamant in his refusal. Taking more than two spies on the night's mission would have been conspicuous, he'd said, and he had no intention of alerting the new WULF leader to the impending raid. James was quite glad that his father had insisted that Victor stay behind for the night. If he hadn't, the game would have ended in forfeit before it was barely half over. Now, in the wake of the Bigfoot victory, cheers still rang out from the gathering throng, and pops of fireworks sounded in the hot evening air, flashing their colours up onto the hill and the stern façade of Ares' mansion. So, how's this going to happen? Ralph asked, glancing around at the throng. Does Franklin or somebody need to come out and, like, levitate the houses or something? Gobbin shook his head. I don't think so. I think the march of the houses is old magic, set up by Perpapak and Roberts and, and the rest back when they first built the Aleron. I think it happens all by itself. We just wait and watch. Even as Gobbin spoke, a low, ominous groan arose. James felt the rumble of it in his chest and the soles of his feet. It throbbed in the air, blotting out the other noises rather like a bass note on a gigantic magical amplifier. Immediately, the crowd hushed into bright-eyed silence. James looked towards Ares' mansion, but it simply sat there, unmoving, its windows unlit and blank like stubborn, staring eyes. Is this it? James called, raising his voice over the thrumming rumble. Zane shook his head, glancing around. Must be. Look! He pointed, not at Ares' mansion, but backwards, over the heads of the throng behind them. James and the rest of Team Bigfoot turned around and gasped. Hovering over the crowd, casting its humongous blocky shadow onto the upturned faces, was Apollo Mansion. It looked exactly the same as always, except that you could see inside the dark footprint of its foundation, a square of heavy bricks surrounding what was, unmistakably, the ceiling of the erstwhile basement game room. Clods of dirt and mortar pattered down over the crowd as the structure drifted overhead, moving like a giant parade balloon. A round white shape peered from one of the upper windows, 
and James saw that it was Jeffrey Kleinschmidt, the Bigfoot reserve player, who'd been too sick to make it to the match. He waved gamely, grinning, his hair poking up in an unruly strew. We won? He hollered down, both as a question and a statement, and the crowd roared back, laughing and cheering. Slowly, ponderously, Apollo Mansion approached Victory Hill, passing over the crowd and emitting that deep, throbbing rumble. As it swept over James's head, he almost thought he could reach up and touch the rafters of the basement ceiling. He laughed out loud as he saw the disarmadillo hunkered on top of one of those rafters, crouched in a sort of alert ball, eyes blinking down at the crowd below. As the house passed over the lawn of Victory Hill, casting its shadow over the broken werewolf statue, James was surprised to see that Ares Mansion was still there, sitting stubbornly on the hill's foundation. Go on, Zane called, grinning. Beat it, house! Yeah! The members of Team Bigfoot joined in, raising their fists. Soon the entire crowd rallied the cry, cheering and jeering raucously. Ares Mansion did not budge, however, even as the shadow of Apollo Mansion crept up its front, casting its reflection onto the tall, staring windows. Finally, gently, Apollo Mansion nudged the front corner of its counterpart. The sound of it was a soft, rattling crunch. In response, Ares Mansion shuddered slightly and seemed almost to let out a resigned sigh. A moment later, it arose from the foundation of Victory Hill, producing a long, crumbling, ripping noise. The crowd erupted into cheers again as the houses traded places, moving like elephantine dancers. Slowly, almost sheepishly, Ares Mansion began its long march down Victory Hill and towards the empty foundation on the opposite end of the mall. In its place, Apollo Mansion settled slowly atop Victory Hill, its footprint meeting perfectly with the gaping foundation beneath it. The ground shook as the weight of the house settled, and a puff of masonry dust arose all around it, pale in the moonlight. The crowd redoubled its cheers, and the members of Team Bigfoot looked around at each other in amazement. Wentworth was there by then, his fingers wrapped in white bandages. Next to him, also wearing various bandages and braces, were Norick, Muckthatch, Troy Covington, and the rest of the disabled players. Geoffrey Kleinschmidt burst through the front door in his pyjamas, his hands raised as if the crowd was cheering solely for him. He made his way down the walkway and joined the team where they stood beaming at one another, happy for the moment beyond words. Go on in, Ophelia Wright cried out, nudging James forward. Check out your new digs. See what the view looks like from Victory Hill. You too, Jasmine called, turning to the reserve players from the other houses. All of you, tonight you're all Bigfoots. Watch your mouth, Warrington replied, frowning. But he didn't argue when the gathering pushed him up the footpath towards Apollo Mansion. James thought that the building had been transformed somehow. It looked exactly the same as it always had, just a big blocky mansion perhaps a little too symmetrical and rather lacking in embellishment, but now, seated atop Victory Hill, the things that had once made it boring now made it regal. It's the angle, he thought, looking up at it as he approached, smiling with pride and triumph. This is where it was originally built. I'd bet my scrim on it. This is how it was meant to be seen. This thought was interrupted, however, even as James put his foot on the very first step of the main entrance. A very loud, very strange noise fell over the entire campus, shocking the crowd into silence. James glanced back, alarmed. What's that? Zane began, but was drowned out by the noise as it sounded again. It was a sort of metallic creak, long and ragged, followed by a rumble and a distant tinkle of breaking glass. Is that still the march of the houses? Ralph frowned, his eyes wide and nervous. Next to him, Warrington shook his head. No, that's coming from over there, just past Admin Hall. It's the medical college, a voice cried from the crowd. Something's wrong with it. Look out! The crowd began to move then in that alarming, sluggish way that only large groups of suddenly frightened people can move. They pushed and clambered, backing away from the corner nearest the beige bricks of the medical college. 
James looked, remembering what he had seen earlier, the small gathering in front of the medical college's main entrance, Uncle Percy, Lucy, Izzy, and the group of wizarding court agents. The arbiter, Albert Keynes, had not been in sight, but he had to have been there somewhere. "'What have you done?' James asked under his breath, his eyes widening. He realized with no real surprise that the question wasn't addressed to Keynes. As he watched, the lights of the beige building flickered, flashed, and then fell dark. Inside, monstrously, that awful noise sounded again, creaking and groaning, rather like a beast in pain. And then, with no warning, most of the windows on the nearest side of the building exploded outwards. Glass tinkled and flashed like confetti spreading out and down into the nearby trees. Another noise followed, a sort of massive crumpling crash, and the face of the building changed. It sucked inwards, distorting the shape of the structure as if it had been punched by a gigantic, invisible fist. Bricks and broken masonry showered down into the bushes. It's imploding, Zane announced, both frightened and amazed. What could make it do that? Not a what, James thought, but didn't say. A who? Debris rained down from the face of the medical college, but the noise fell away. The event seemed to have spent itself. A moment later, James sensed movement at the far edge of the crowd, closest to the distorted building. The gathering was parting, spreading away from some moving nucleus. James stood on tiptoes, trying to see who or what it was. From his vantage point atop Victory Hill, he could finally see. It was, of course, Petra. She was walking away from the medical college, her face pale and calm. Accompanying her, one on each side, were Izzy and Lucy. Both younger girls looked around at the parting throng, their eyes bright in the darkness. James broke away from his friends and moved down the footpath of Victory Hill, meeting Petra as she emerged from the crowd. No one had tried to stop her or even to question her. Perfect silence hung over the scene as everyone watched, inexplicably breathless. Petra met James's eyes. She looked tired and drawn, but otherwise perfectly normal. She was holding Lucy's right hand and Izzy's left. Slowly, she glanced aside at the broken statue where it lay nearby, glinting in the moonlight. "'Congratulations, James,' she said weakly, and offered him a small, affectionate smile. "'You won.' A ripple of commotion moved over the crowd as realization dawned on those closest to the front. This was Petra Morganston, the one who had attacked the Hall of Archives and cursed Mr. Henrydon, the one who had been escorted to the medical college unconscious in preparation for her imprisonment. But they gave her the poison apple, someone whispered harshly. How'd she wake up? She's a criminal, another rasped. She's dangerous. And another, look what she did to the medical college. A low clamour arose from the crowd, spreading to a rabble. Then louder voices called out in commanding tones. James looked up and didn't know whether to be relieved or dismayed to see Chancellor Franklin approaching, shouldering through the throng. Professor Jackson and Mother Newt were close behind, their faces grim. Inexplicably, Albus seemed to be following along in Professor Jackson's wake, his eyes shining with the excitement of it all. Miss Morganston! Franklin announced as he broke through the crowd. What are you doing? Return to the medical college at once. Where are your guards? I'm sorry, Chancellor, Petra said, and James heard in her voice that she truly was. I'm sorry for everything that's happened, but I won't be going back. Perhaps I will be able to repair everything, but not now. There are more pressing matters. There are no more pressing matters, miss. Jackson proclaimed grimly. James saw that the professor had his wand in his hand at the ready. Albus peered avidly around Jackson's elbow as he went on. You are a convicted criminal. You understand that we cannot allow you to leave this campus. And you understand, I think, that there is no way you can stop me, Petra replied almost apologetically. Jackson raised his wand. Franklin saw this and raised his as well, his face strained. He opened his mouth to speak, 
but Mother Newt interrupted him. What is it that you need to do, my dear? she asked, moving ahead of the two men and smiling curiously at Petra. Petra looked aside at James. We have a journey to make, she answered. Not far, and yet, I think, very far indeed. Are you still with me, James? James nodded. But how do you know about that? I never got a chance to tell you. I know because you know, she said, and James understood the silver thread. It ran both ways. She may not have understood the plan before her arrest, but she did now. James could see it in her eyes as she looked at him. And what, if I may be so bold? Mother Newt asked, still smiling faintly. Is the purpose of this journey? James answered this time. To find out the truth, ma'am. Franklin shook his head firmly. No, I cannot allow this. Professor Newton, you do not understand what it is they intend to do. They mean to open the Nexus Curtain. You see that Apollo Mansion once again stands atop Victory Hill. Given the proper key, they may succeed in passing through into another dimension. The young lady means to escape into a realm where none will be able to follow her. That's not true, James called out moving to get in front of Petra. Petra doesn't need to escape because she's not guilty. He stopped and then glanced back over his shoulder, his brow knitted. Uh, are you? Petra met his gaze but didn't respond, at least not with words. Chancellor, Mother Newt said, as a matter of fact, I'm inclined to disagree with you. I do not believe that Miss Morganston means to escape. I believe that she is telling us the truth about everything. All evidence to the contrary, Professor, Jackson said, his wand still raised and pointed at Petra. How could you possibly know this? Mother Newt's smile broadened as she continued to stare at Petra. Call it woman's intuition, she said with low emphasis. Besides, I suspect that she is right about one more thing. I don't believe we can stop her, even if we wish to. She is... Mother Newt paused and narrowed her eyes. Unique. Professor Newton, Franklin said, shaking his head again, making his square spectacles flash in the moonlight. We cannot simply allow this woman to leave. She is a convicted prisoner of the Wizarding Court of the United States. But she isn't leaving, not technically, Mother Newt replied lightly. If you are right, Chancellor, then Miss Morganston will simply be entering Apollo Mansion. She can still be said to be confined to the campus. None would deny that fact. Thus, I believe, we can be honestly said to have performed our duties as well as could be expected under the circumstances. Madam, Jackson began, but Mother Newt stopped him with a quick backward glare. Put down your wand, Theodore, she said, her voice suddenly steely. Don't be a fool. We are teachers. That is, as they say, well above our pay grade. She is a prisoner of the Wizarding Courts, Franklin insisted urgently, lowering his own wand. And we are not arbiters, Mother Newt answered, sighing. Let the young lady do what she means to do. She will return, won't you, dear? She asked, addressing this last to Petra. If I can, Petra answered, and I will submit to whatever consequences there are when I do. I'm hoping that things will look a bit different by then, to all of us. Franklin's face was red with tension. Jackson's appeared to be balanced precariously between raising his wand again and submitting to Mother Newt's suggestion. Thank you, Professor, Petra said to the older woman across from her. Please, Newt said, smiling in a grandmotherly fashion. Call me Mother Newt. Petra turned to James again and then glanced aside towards Ralph and Zane, who had also approached, their eyes wide and grave. I guess I'll go and get the unicorn horseshoe. Zane suggested in a hushed voice. It's still buried under the warping willow. No need, Petra said. She let go of Lucy's hand and reached into a pocket on the front of her drab dress. James would have sworn that the pocket was too small to contain anything so large, but when Petra withdrew her hand, she was holding the silvery horseshoe. It glowed faintly, and a low murmur of awe and fear thrummed through the crowd. Dear God, a voice said faintly. James glanced back and saw Chancellor Franklin staring up at the horseshoe, his face draining of color. He's figured it all out, James thought. Just like that. 
is one smart fellow. I didn't expect we'd be doing this in front of the entire school, Ralph muttered, accepting the horseshoe as Petra handed it to him. It doesn't matter, Petra said, smiling wanly. She turned to Lucy and Izzy. You both stay here. There's no need for you to come. Izzy made no effort to let go of Petra's hand, and James understood that Petra's suggestion was merely perfunctory. There was no way Izzy would consent to staying behind. I want to come, Lucy said, looking from Petra to James. I want to see. I don't know anything about what's going to happen, but I'm in on it now, no matter what. James expected Petra to forbid Lucy, but the older girl merely nodded. She looked back at Ralph, who still held the faintly glowing horseshoe. Let's do it, Zane announced stoically. Let's get it over with. Together the three boys and three girls turned and walked up Victory Hill, approaching the corner of Apollo Mansion. The remainder of Team Bigfoot gathered silently around them, but at a careful distance. All of them could see the horseshoe shape engraved in the building's cornerstone, divided by the crack between the main house and the permanent foundation. What's this all about, James? Jasmine asked quietly. James glanced back at her. It's a long story, he answered after a moment, but it's not a bad story. Petra is my friend. I have to try and help her. You'll tell us about it when you get back, right? Wentworth suggested, frowning slightly. Definitely, Ralph nodded, producing his large wand. Its lime-green tip glowed dimly in the moonlight. You want us to come too? Gobbins asked. Because we could, you know. The rest of the team, even the reserve players, murmured agreement. No, James replied, smiling. But thanks. Phew, Norick breathed. Good luck, then. Wherever you're going, and whatever you're gonna do when you get there, good luck. Muckthatch let out an encouraging woof. Ralph turned around and held the horseshoe up, measuring it against the shape carved into the conjoined cornerstone. Petra? James asked quietly, turning to look at her. What happened back there in the medical college? What happened to Keynes? Petra met his gaze thoughtfully. He's still alive, she answered simply. James sensed her thoughts and sensed that this was the truth. It wasn't all of the truth, he knew, but for now it was enough. He moved a step closer to her so that no one else would hear. Is it true, Petra? he whispered. Are you a... a sorceress? Her eyes hadn't left his. Yes, she mouthed, and shrugged faintly. Tears stood in her eyes, shining dully. She tried to smile, but it faltered. James nodded. For now, there was nothing more to say. With a soft grating sound, Ralph pushed the unicorn horseshoe into the shape engraved in the cornerstone. There was no shocking noise or burst of magical light, and yet the crowd responded. A sigh of awe washed over the quadrangle. James looked up, as did the rest. A faint rose-coloured light glowed from every window of Apollo Mansion. It shifted softly, seeming to hint at every colour of the rainbow, and even some colours that James had never imagined. "'I guess we go inside,' Lucy suggested her voice an octave higher than usual. Is that it? James nodded. He reached out, took Lucy's hand in his right, and Petra's in his left. Slowly the group began to walk towards the main entrance of Apollo Mansion. Boys! a voice called suddenly. James paused again with one foot on the first step. He looked back and saw Chancellor Franklin peering up at him, his face lit with the soft, rosy light. If you see Ignatius Magnuson, Franklin said earnestly, tell him, tell him to stay away, tell him not to come back. Will you do that? With those words, James thought he finally understood Franklin's reasons for wanting to keep the Nexus curtain closed for good. Magnuson, despite being Franklin's friend, had been a monster. If he had escaped through the Nexus curtain, then perhaps, hopefully, it had been a one-way trip. Perhaps the only way the murderer could ever return would be if the curtain was opened again from this side. Franklin had made it his life's mission to assure that that never happened. He won't be coming back, Chancellor, Ralph answered stolidly, raising his voice just enough to be heard. Trust us. 
Franklin studied Ralph's face for a moment and then nodded slowly. A moment later, Zane reached for the door handle atop the short stoop of Apollo Mansion. He gripped it, thumbed the latch, and pushed it open. The mysterious, pulsing light covered every surface inside, shifting hypnotically. All of us together? Petra said, squeezing James's hand. Everyone hold on to someone else. I think the moment we cross over the threshold, we'll go through. I think the whole house is the portal. Ready? James gulped. Ralph shuddered. Zane said, You all go on ahead. I'm just going to pop back to Hermie's house for my camera, okay? Ralph grabbed the blonde boy's hand and Zane gripped it, tittering nervously. As one, the six stepped through the doorway into the faint rosy light and vanished. James's first step into the world between the worlds nearly tumbled him headlong over a rocky, black cliff. Petra and Lucy were still holding his hands on either side, and they pulled him back even as his foot dipped into empty space. He gasped as he drew his foot back and wobbled on the ledge. The six travellers peered carefully down into the misty distance. They seemed to be standing on the lip of a shallow cave worn into a cliff of sharp black stone. A hundred feet below, monstrous waves slammed against the face of the cliff, sending up explosions of white water as if in slow motion. Beyond this, steely grey oceans stretched off towards the horizon, heaving beneath a low white sky. James shuddered. I nearly fell into that, he commented wide-eyed. This isn't the most convenient place to put a portal, Zane nodded. Even if you survived the drop, who knows what kind of monsters swim around in an ocean like that? None at all, Petra answered, her voice calm but emphatic. There's nothing alive in that water. Nothing at all. You can sort of feel it, can't you? Lucy frowned. It was almost a grimace of disgust. Yes, she answered. It's like this isn't really a place at all. It's more like just a kind of window dressing, something just to take up the space. There's no... no taste to it, no life or colour at all. It's like chewing on cardboard. Or like taking a peek behind the curtain of reality, Ralph agreed, his face tense. Like it's here just because something has to be, but it's not meant to be seen by anyone. I think it makes sense, Izzy said, still holding Petra's hand. Petra agreed. It's not really a world, after all, she mused. It's just the world between the worlds. Look, Zane suddenly pointed, raising his arm towards the distant horizon. It isn't all just water. There's something out there. James followed Zane's pointing finger. Very faint and distant, a dark shape clung to the horizon. Is it a boat? Lucy asked doubtfully. Ralph shook his head. It's an island, I think. But not like any island I've ever seen. It looks almost like a big, giant footstool. It's a plateau, Petra said. Just like this one, I think. Look over to the right. There's another one. There's more on this side, Zane added, peering around the boulders of the cave's left edge. James leaned carefully out over the rocks of the cave's mouth, scanning the length of the watery horizon. The shapes were grey in the ocean mist, so far off as to be almost invisible. But once you began looking for them, more and more of them seemed to appear. They were eerily similar, rocky plateaus, oddly flat on top, rising like giant stepping stones out of the monstrous ocean. What are they? Izzy asked in a hushed voice. They're portals, Petra answered, and James did not doubt her. Like this one, each one leads to a different universe or dimension or reality. Some of them would be almost exactly like our own. Others would be so different, so alien, that we could barely look at them. They're awful, Lucy proclaimed with a shiver, hugging herself. No, Petra countered. They're just themselves. They aren't good or bad. They just are. Ralph asked, Do you think this old world is covered with them? Petra shook her head. It isn't a world. It isn't round, and it doesn't have an end. But yes, I think all of it is like this. On and on, infinitely. If one had a boat, just think of the places they could go, the things they could see. James shuddered again at the thought. The idea of taking a boat out onto that strangely disastrous, unnaturally flat ocean was horrible. 
Looking out over all that distance and those endless, bland islands, James wanted nothing more than to crawl back into the shallow of the cave and huddle into a ball. He turned around and was both amazed and relieved to see a door standing in the shadows of the cave. It was framed with wood, and James recognized it immediately as the front entrance of Apollo Mansion seen from the inside. It hung open, and through it James could still see the slope of Victory Hill, the broken werewolf statue, and the crowd congregated on the quad behind Administration Hall, milling uncertainly. "'I guess that's how we go back when we're ready,' he said, gesturing towards the doorway. The others turned and looked, and there was a palpable sense of relief. The view of the dark quad and the familiar campus was very comforting after all that bright, blank vastness. Lucy finally let go of James's hand. So what do we do now? James glanced around nervously. I guess we just look around, he ventured. The whole reason we came here is because this is the one place that someone could hide something as powerful as the stolen thread from the Vault of Destinies. If we can find the thread, then perhaps we can find out who really broke into the archive and prove Petra's innocence. Not to mention, Zane added suddenly, as if the idea had just occurred to him, if we find the missing thread, maybe we can put it back into the loom. Maybe that would set everything back to rights again. After all, our loom was switched with one from another dimension, right? If it got stuck here instead of reverting back to its own universe, because whoever broke into the vault stole the crimson thread from it? Remember what Professor Jackson said? He said that the switching of the looms between our dimension and some foreign one changed everything, and maybe even broke the balance of the destinies. He made it sound like if the thread wasn't returned, eventually things would break down into complete chaos. Maybe if we put it back? Then all of our destinies will snap back to the way they were before the break-in happened, James said, completing his friend's thought. I wonder, is that really possible? Perhaps Petra will never have been arrested, Izzy suggested, a small ray of hope alighting on her brow. Maybe if we replace the crimson thread, Zane replied thoughtfully, then none of this will have happened. The gathering was quiet for a moment as they all considered this. Finally, James nodded decisively. All right, then, he announced. Everyone take a look around. Let's see if we can find any evidence that someone from our world was here recently. Ralph blinked. Like, maybe a candy wrapper or something? Why? Zane asked. Do you see one? No. Ralph shook his head and then pointed. But there are some stairs carved in the rocks by the ledge over there. Maybe somebody dropped something there. James peered around the larger boy, looking towards the right corner of the cave's mouth. Just as Ralph had said, a series of worn, narrow steps curved around the boulder, leading out into the dull light. Lucy asked, Where do you think they go? Petra took a step towards the stairs. Up, she said simply. She let go of James's hand, renewed her grip on Izzy's, and moved towards the nearly hidden stone staircase. The rest followed in silence. The stairs did indeed go up. As James followed Petra and Izzy into the strangely flat light of the world between the worlds, he saw the stairs rising unevenly before them, carved into the crags of the cliff. The steps were worn smooth with age and were wet with mist, so that James gulped as he began to climb them. He felt the pull of the distance on his left side, heard the shuddering crash of the surf as it reached up, up, trying to drag them all down into it. To compensate, he leaned against the cliff face on his right, nearly hugging it as he climbed. Behind him, Lucy, Zane, and Ralph followed closely, shooting worried glances into the hungry depths. Several minutes went by. The cliff was remarkably high, and James felt that the steps had taken them some distance around the strange island. Finally, unexpectedly, the six travellers reached the top. Petra and Izzy moved a few paces out onto a flat plateau, and the rest gathered around them, clustering unconsciously against the gaping white space all around. James realized where they were even before he saw the black castle. He remembered the hissing shush of the yellow grass and the march of the clouds as the wind pushed them. He had seen it all in Petra's dream visions, and had assumed it had only been a figment of her subconscious mind. 
Now, standing on the solid rock of this place, feeling the salty mist on his face and the feather of the wind as it combed through his hair like fingers, he felt the subtle shift of destinies. Here, everything was possible. The six of them were standing on the raw bedrock of reality, from which all dimensions sprang and grew. Here, every footstep had the potential to shake universes, and somehow, deep in the basement of Petra's mind, she had known. She had sensed they would end up here, and because she had known it, so had James. He just hadn't made the connection. I sure wasn't expecting that, Ralph breathed, staring with astonishment at the black castle. It stood on the distant ledge of the plateau, defying gravity, encrusted with turrets and conical roofs. Its windows were tall and narrow, glassless, black as doom. That's where we need to go, James said, not at all wanting to go there, but knowing it was their destination nonetheless. Beside him, Petra nodded. Someone's there, Lucy said in a low voice. Zane peered up at the castle. Looks empty to me he commented, a little hopefully. It almost looks sort of dead. Nice, Ralph moaned. Petra spoke calmly. If there is someone there, then they're expecting us. This is what we came for, isn't it? Let's go, but keep your wands handy. You never know. The group began to make their way across the gentle hump of the plateau, wading through the whispering yellow grass. With a sinking jolt, James remembered that he had dropped his own wand during the last seconds of the Clutch Cudgel tournament and had completely forgotten to retrieve it afterwards. He cursed himself silently, but reminded himself that he was walking alongside one of the most powerful people in the magical world. If Petra proved unable to confront whatever was to come, then his wand surely would not be of any help anyway. As the minutes passed, the castle grew gradually closer. It was rather small, at least compared to Hogwarts, but nearly fantastically tall, scraping its towers at the grey clouds. James noticed that, just as in the dream visions, the castle was perched on the ledge of the far cliff, jutting partly over it in complete defiance of gravity. Perhaps magic held it in place, or perhaps it was simply balanced there by habit. Either way, it was very disconcerting to look at. James felt that the mere weight of his gaze might be enough to send the structure collapsing backwards into the waiting waves below. What's that? Izzy asked suddenly, stopping and pointing. James turned and saw an object protruding from the grass some distance away in the shadow of a low outcropping of boulders. Silently, the troop angled towards the object, cautious but curious. James was the first to reach it. He peered at it trying to make sense of the shape of it. It was quite large, but low and streamlined, comprised of wood and metal, and draped with tangles of thin, silky rope. It lay tilted onto its side, nearly buried in the grass. It looks like a boat, Ralph suggested uncertainly. But how could it have got up here? It's not a boat, Zane called from some distance away. Look at the hill next to it. See all that old fabric? James looked. Next to the boat shape was a pool of wrinkled blue fabric, faded almost white. It clung to the rocky hill like a skin, poked through in a thousand places with tufts of grass. It was an airship, Lucy said, her voice filled with awe. Someone came here by air, a long time ago by the look of it, maybe decades ago. Maybe even centuries, Petra added. There's no way to know for sure. There are no bugs here. Nothing to rot the cloth or wood, nothing to corrode the metal. It looks almost like the day it landed, except that the balloon is flat and destroyed by the grass that poked up through it. Travellers from one of the other island dimensions, you think? James asked, approaching the wooden hull and peering in. The inside was nearly empty, save for a few seats and a large rudder handle which protruded crookedly from the rear. One traveller at least, Petra hazarded. I wonder what dimension he came from, and if he made it into our own world. James noticed a series of symbols painted onto the hull of the ship, faded almost into obscurity. Among them was the unmistakable shape of a unicorn, white and stern, its horn a pale purple. Ralph and Zane joined James there and saw the same thing. The rider, 
James said quietly. The one from the tapestries in Erebus Castle. This was his ship, his and the unicorn that came with him. How can that be? Ralph queried in a low voice. When the rider came through, he arrived somewhere back home, in Europe in the Middle Ages, didn't he? James shook his head. These portals aren't like normal doorways, he replied. I don't think time or distance make much difference with them. The Nexus Curtain may always be there, connecting to our world, but it probably looks different every time it opens. It may open up into entirely different times and places in our world. There's no way of knowing. Zane was barely listening. He was moving along the hull of the abandoned airship, studying the symbols painted onto it. Look, he said, touching one of the drawings. The unicorn that came through with the rider wasn't just a regular beast. You can see that just by looking at the way it's painted. It was smart. It wasn't the servant of the rider. They were partners, Ralph agreed, leaning to peer at the drawings. They were explorers. James shook his head darkly. Too bad their explorations led them here. They knew the dangers they faced, a thin, ghostly voice said in James's ear. The three boys startled and spun around, their eyes bulging. Behind them, staring at them with sad curiosity, was a wispy grey shape, almost invisible in the flat light of the plateau. It was the figure of a woman, young and moderately pretty, with huge eyes and a small, sad mouth. Sorry, she said faintly. I didn't mean to frighten you. Are you a g-g-g- Ralph stammered, his face going white. A ghost? Oh, good grief, Ralph, Lucy said, approaching and shaking her head. You had a ghost teacher for the last two years at Hogwarts? Yeah, Ralph admitted a little defensively. Well, it's one thing to have a scheduled class with one. It's another thing to have one whisper in your ear when you're exploring some weird dead island. Sorry, the ghost said again, drifting backwards. It's been so long since I've seen anyone. I forget what it's like to deal with the living. Who are you, miss? Petra asked, tilting her head thoughtfully. My name is Frederica, the ghost answered, and made a dutiful curtsy with her transparent hands. Frederica Staples. I've been here ever since I— She paused before finishing, as if she was embarrassed or reluctant to admit it. Um, ever since I died. Frederica Staples, James said, his eyes widening. You're the one who— the woman that Magnuson— uh— The ghost nodded and pressed her lips together, obviously not wishing to discuss the topic. Who? Lucy asked, but James shook his head. She died on the campus of Alma Alaron, he answered quietly. She was a muggle, and she got mixed up with the wrong dark wizard. I'll tell you the rest later if you really want to know. I don't, Lucy said quickly. Pleased to meet you, Miss Staples, I think. But I thought there weren't any ghosts to Alma Alaron, Ralph commented. Zane shrugged. I don't think we're in Kansas any more, Toto. Ralph rolled his eyes. I don't know what that means. Lucy said, it means we aren't at Alma Alaron any more, are we? The regular rules don't apply. Perhaps, Petra mused, as if to herself. Perhaps this place is the reason there are no ghosts at Alma Alaron. Perhaps the portal into the world between the worlds is like a ghostly magnet, sucking them in or driving them away, or even both at the same time. But that can't be right, James said. Nobody can get through the Nexus Curtain without the proper key. I think that's only true for the living, Izzy commented thoughtfully. The dead can get through all kinds of doorways that were closed while they were alive. The ghost of Frederica Staples nodded. When I died, there was a huge white light. I knew I was supposed to go to it, but I didn't want to. I wasn't ready to leave yet. I was engaged to be married, you see. My life had barely just begun— and I didn't really know then that I had died. Not really. The light drew me to it, but I resisted it. And then, as I pushed back from the white light, something else began to pull at me. It was like the opposite of the white light. It was a black hole, sort of. It was strong, and I couldn't control it. It pulled me in, and, and then suddenly I was here. At first... I thought this was the afterlife, but not for very long. 
It wasn't either heaven or hell. It, it was just here. And there were people here sometimes. James blinked. You've seen people here. Frederica looked at him and then gestured towards the ancient airship. More of the ships came once, a long time ago, she said in her thin, far-off voice. They looked just like that one, only bigger. They saw me and spoke to me. They traced the journey of the ones who came in that ship and asked me about them. I told them I was sorry that I didn't know anything about their missing friends. Then they used their tools to learn the truth that evil, magical people had captured the man and the unicorn and killed them. And then they discovered that the same had happened to me. They learned more, though. They learned that not all of the people from our world are like the ones who committed those acts. There are good ones among us, always fighting the bad, but the balance of power is forever changing. They determined that our world was too dangerous for them to explore and built the Black Castle as a warning. It's been there ever since, empty and silent, until very recently. You saw someone else, Petra said. It wasn't a question, but Frederica nodded anyway, turning her attention to her. I saw, but I didn't approach. I hid. I knew it was safer that way. Being a ghost has its benefits. Hardly anything can scare you any more, but some things are worse than death. I hid, and I watched. Petra seemed to understand this. They went to the castle, didn't they? Frederica nodded, unwilling or unable to say any more. That's where we're going, James said, and swallowed past a lump of fear in his throat. We should keep moving before it gets dark. It never gets dark here, Frederica instructed blandly. Nothing ever changes here at all, not even time. Come with us, Miss Staples, Lucy suggested. Maybe we can help you get back to our own world. Frederica considered this with obvious longing, and then shook her head. I can't go into the castle, she said. I was afraid to go inside even before she arrived. Now I can't even bear to think of it. Petra said, Do you know where the staircase is, Frederica? The one that leads down to the cave portal. When the ghost nodded, Petra smiled. I think you'll be able to get back yourself if you really want to. As long as we are here, the portal is open, and it'll take you back to our time and place. Perhaps you can get through and stay there if you try very hard. Frederica looked heartbreakingly hopeful. Do you really think so? I don't know, Petra answered, but James thought she did. Either way, it's worth a try. Good luck, Frederica. Good luck, James added, and the others joined in. Thank you, Frederica said faintly. I think I'm ready to go on now, into the light, if I can, and whatever is beyond it. Maybe I'll see you all again on the other side. Later rather than sooner, Ralph said quickly, and the ghost smiled her understanding. A moment later, she turned and seemed to fade from view as she drifted across the plateau. The gathering watched the ghost of Frederica Staples vanish, and then stood in the constantly shushing grass for a long moment, silent and thoughtful. Finally, still wordlessly, James turned back towards the castle. It stood tall and ominous on the near horizon, casting virtually no shadow in the diffuse light of the world between the worlds. The others turned around as well, and looked up at the stark shape, weighing their own secret thoughts and fears. Slowly but surely, the six travellers resumed their journey. Chapter 24 Through the Curtains As they neared the castle, the silence seemed to develop its own strange inertia. At first, James merely felt that there was nothing to say, and then, as the minutes passed, he began to feel as if spoken words would somehow spoil the moment, not because the moment was beautiful, of course, for it certainly was not, but because there was a brittleness in the air a tension that spun out like spider's silk that James was loath to break. As the gathering finally approached the cliff's edge upon which the black castle stood, James finally realized the truth of why everyone had grown so quiet. They were all afraid that there really was someone inside the castle, someone powerful and terrifying, who might hear even the softest whisper and come out to greet them. 
When they stood before the massive open gates of the castle, however, speech became necessary. James rasped. Do we just go in? Should we knock, like? We just go in, Petra replied, her own voice hushed. But keep a sharp eye out. Someone's watching, Lucy nearly moaned, peering up at the overhanging balconies. Petra nodded. I know. They're waiting for us. James stepped alongside her as they moved into the shadow of the entryway. Do you know who it is? Petra shook her head and pressed her lips together. The inside of the castle was almost entirely empty. One enormous room yawned before the travellers, leaping up into shadowy vaults and stretching off towards pillared archways on the far side. The group's footsteps echoed loudly in the darkness, making stealth impossible. The stone floor was covered with decades of blown grit and drifts of dead grass. As the troop crept into the centre of the space, moving in a nervous huddle, James caught a hint of movement on the far wall. He peered into the darkness, squinting without his glasses, and made out a large, framed shape. It was much larger than a man, and filled with shifting shadows, a gently billowing curtain. I have a bad feeling about this, Zane muttered, looking in the same direction as James. Ralph nodded. There are more of them, all around the room. I see at least a dozen. They're escape routes, Petra said in a low voice, placed here by those who built the castle, for those unfortunate adventurers who might end up marooned here. Each curtain will take the stranded traveller back to the dimension from which they came, although the where and when might be a bit tetchy. Nervously, Lucy asked, How do you know these things, Petra? Petra shrugged. I don't know. So they're all like mini Nexus curtains, James said, looking around wonderingly at the gently billowing portals. Ralph seemed heartened by this news. So all of these will take us back to our own world? I'd beware of them. Petra warned. They're under the influence of she who has taken this castle. They will do what they were made for, but not without her capricious tricks. You may find yourself in the bottom of the Dead Sea, or a hundred feet over a live volcano. Beware of these portals unless there is no other hope. Good advice indeed, a woman's voice said brightly. The sound of it echoed all around, rendering it huge and directionless. James startled, as did the rest of the group. All eyes scanned the dark space, seeking the speaker, but no one was evident. Who are you? Petra called out. And why have you attacked our world? That's not the question you really want answered, the voice replied, still echoing broadly around the cavernous room. Here time may not mean much, but I assure you, in the world from which you come, it is still marching along as always, and there are always things we must attend to, you and I. Let us not waste precious minutes on trivialities. James raised his voice and ventured, Where's the crimson thread? A better question, the woman's voice answered, smiling. And a thin beam of light came into view, cutting through the heights of the room and alighting on a previously unnoticed scene. James turned towards it and was surprised at what he saw. A collection of utterly prosaic furniture was laid out in the unmistakable arrangement of a bedroom. There was a narrow bed and side table, a chest, a desk, and a high-backed chair turned so that it faced away from the travellers. Petra's hand squeezed James's suddenly, nearly hard enough to hurt. The thread is there, the woman's voice echoed in answer. James squinted towards the light. A small silver jewellery box sat open upon the desk. Visible just inside it was an opal brooch. Spooled around this, glinting in the light, was a length of metallic red thread. Zane gasped. The missing thread! Petra moaned. My father's brooch! James broke away from the group. Stealing himself, he approached the desk which stood nearest of all the furnishings. When he reached for the brooch, however, his hand froze. He felt the veins of his fingers go brittle a moment before the flesh cracked white all the way up to his wrist. Tendrils of icy vapour trailed behind as he yanked his hand away and hugged it to his chest, crying out in shock and fear. That was unwise, the woman's voice said, snugly amused. But instructive, I am quite sure. Only she who owns the brooch may approach it. 
"'Why are you doing this?' Petra demanded, striding towards James and taking his hand into both of her own. After a moment, James cried out again as the feeling returned to it. He flexed his fingers experimentally and then glanced thankfully at Petra. "'I am not doing any of it,' the woman answered, and James finally thought he saw her. A figure stood disguised in the shadows beyond the beam of light. Even in the darkness, he recognized the shape of her, the hooded robe framing that beautiful, arrogant face. It was the woman he had first met in the halls of the Aquapolis back at the beginning of their journey. It was Judith, the Lady of the Lake. "'You are right, James,' the woman said, as if reading his thoughts. She stepped forward slightly, so that the light reflected up onto her features. "'But only a little. I have taken the form of the woman that Merlinus once loved, but I have also adopted a trace of the woman your sorceress friend bargained for. If she looks at me closely, she will see it.' Petra peered past the beam of light towards the woman on the other side. Her face paled. "'Mother?' she whispered. "'I am both, and I am neither,' the woman answered lightly, waving a hand. "'I have borrowed from the shape of Merlin's Judith and your own mother, my dear, partly because it amuses me, and partly because it was the condition of the bargain.' "'The bargain?' Petra said, still whispering. "'But I didn't kill Izzy. The dreams I had at the beginning of our journey were wrong. Izzy didn't die in the lake on that night. I called it off. The bargain was never completed.' "'You didn't kill Isabella,' the woman corrected. "'But you did kill. "'You sent your stepmother into the lake in your sister's place. "'By doing so, you only changed the conditions. "'The bargain itself was fulfilled. "'Your destiny insisted upon it. "'Thus, rather than recalling your beloved mother from the afterlife, "'you got me. "'I arose from the lake on the night that you murdered your stepmother. "'You recalled me from the mists of the netherworld, my dear, "'in the place of your mother. I wish I could say that I was sorry, but, alas, I am not. Who are you? Petra asked again. This is still not the question that begs to be asked, the woman replied impatiently. But if you must know, I am a fate. There are three of us, although not in the way that you might think. The other two fates do not know their own identities, and for now that suits me just fine. My true name would be unpronounceable to you, so you may simply call me Judith, or the Lady of the Lake. I enjoy both titles. Why are you doing this? This time it was Lucy who approached. She stood next to James. Why? the woman said, raising her eyebrows in a surprised smile. Because it is my destiny, and because I enjoy it. Need there be any other reason? She laughed. "'The truth is, I've been working towards this end for nearly a year by your time, "'almost since the moment I arose from the lake's surface. "'It took me some time to find all of you, "'but once I did, I knew that you would lead me to where I needed to be. "'I even assisted when it was absolutely necessary. "'And, sure enough, you led me to Alma Aleron "'and that delightful device known as the Vault of Destinies.' The rest was eerily easy. James felt Zane and Ralph join him now. The group was once again complete. Petra's voice turned cold as she said, What is it that you want? Still the wrong question, Judith scolded, her smile turning brittle. Soon I will grow impatient with you. Stop wasting our precious time. We have work to do. Zane spoke up then his voice trembling slightly. "'Give us back the crimson thread!' "'That is a demand, not a question,' Judith sneered slightly, turning her pretty face piggish for a moment. "'And I cannot grant your demand at any rate.' Petra made to reach for the brooch around which was twined the tantalizing thread, but Judith chided her warningly. "'I would not be so bold, dear one,' she teased. The brooch can only be taken by she who owns it. But I own it, Petra exclaimed. It was nearly a plea. James took one more step forwards, placing himself at the head of the group, his hands still intertwined with Petra's. Will you? 
he asked, framing the question with great emphasis. Give us back the crimson thread. That's the question I've been waiting for, Judith cried out, clapping her hands with glee. And I have an answer for you, James Sirius Potter, you wonderful, bold young man. The answer is no. Why not? James demanded, barely stopping himself from reaching for the thread-twined brooch again. Because that is not the crimson thread, Judith exclaimed delightedly, and because the real crimson thread does not wish to go back. As Judith spoke, James perceived movement inside the beam of the light. He turned towards it and saw that there was someone else in the castle with them, someone who had been there the entire time, seated on the high-backed chair, turned away from them. A pale hand moved on the arm of the chair, gripping it as the figure stood, arose to her full height, and turned around. "'You wonderful fools!' Judith breathed triumphantly, gazing at the young woman who now stood in the beam of light. "'You failed to understand the true meaning of the loom. That length of thread you see wrapped around the brooch is only a symbol. She is the true crimson thread.' drawn through the vault of destinies from her own dimension, just as the symbolic thread itself was plucked from the loom. As long as the symbolic thread stays here with us, so does she. James was speechless. He stared into the beam of light, unable to take his eyes from the young woman standing there, smiling weakly. Her hair was long and dark, framing a face he knew very well except for the eyes. There he saw only a hollow deadness, lurking just under a pall of misery. Except for the eyes, the young woman standing inside the light, at home in that odd bedroom assembly, was Petra herself. Is he? the other Petra said, her voice cracking into tears. I'm so sorry that I killed you. It was you I dreamed of. Petra said, staring at her sudden twin. Not me. In your world. You were too late. You killed her. The other Petra nodded slowly, not taking her eyes from the Izzy that stood just outside the light. So that's your brooch, James said, nodding towards the jewellery box. You never went on the ocean journey with us, so you never lost it. This is not the Petra you know, James. Judith replied, finally moving into the light. In her world, she never came to your home seeking refuge. Instead, she gave herself over to the destiny that claimed her on the night she killed her sister. She has abandoned good and forsaken love. She has nothing left, which is why she was so willing to join me. And after all, why wouldn't she? I am her mother. She paid for me. She paid very dearly. The other Petra responded to this by leaning her cheek onto Judith's shoulder. Petra! James called out sharply, speaking to the young woman in the light. That isn't really your mother. Haven't you been listening? She's some evil beast from the netherworld, bent on creating chaos. Petra, she's not even really human. Don't call me that name any more, James, the young woman in the light said sadly. Petra is no more. Now there's just me, Morgan. Judith nodded slowly and smiled. My daughter and I have been very busy ever since I drew her into your world. You see, the rules of the Nexus Curtain do not apply to either of us. She is not of your dimension, and I am not human. We may pass through as we wish, although doing so does have its consequences. Dimensions don't respond well to two of one person occupying them at the same time. Whenever my Morgan passed into your world, your Petra fell asleep. In truth, I suspect she even faded from your world and slept here, on this very bed, trading places with Morgan. I suppose they could exist at the same time in the same world, for a time at least, but it would not be without its own strange consequences. The fabric of existence would reject such a duality, and would strive to annihilate one of the dimensional twins, all in the name of balance. But this is neither here nor there. The fact is 
we have passed through into your reality on several important occasions. We have, in fact, had quite the busy little lives in your world. James suddenly thought he understood. He narrowed his eyes angrily. You! he exclaimed, pointing. You killed the leader of the WULF and took over. You're their new leader. Oh, my, no! Judith laughed again, delightedly. No, 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 you silly boy. I'm not the leader of the WULF. She gestured affectionately towards Morgan. She is. She killed Edgar Tarantus. Frankly, she was doing the man a favour. He had grown so very political in his old age that he was very nearly a joke. More importantly, she killed the muggle politician. They'd had other plans for him, of course, but Morgan here can be quite persuasive. In death, Senator Fillmore will serve a much greater purpose. And besides, American politicians are, as they say, a dime a dozen. She laughed as if she'd made a small joke at a party. Why couldn't you just stay in your own dimension? Lucy called out suddenly to Morgan, her face pale but stern. I'm sorry that you messed it all up and killed your own version of Izzy, but why do you want to go spreading your misery around to somebody else's dimension? Why, that's simple, Morgan said, raising her cheek from Judith's shoulder. She shook her head, as if amazed that the answer wasn't completely obvious. Because... In your world, Izzy is still alive. Mother told me so. Here, I can get her back. And then, with horrible suddenness, Morgan made a beckoning motion with her right hand. Izzy jerked away from Petra and flew into the light. Morgan caught her and instantly drew a hand down over the younger girl's face, putting her into a deep sleep. Izzy slumped. I'm sorry, Iz, Morgan said, nearly sobbing with relief. I won't ever let you go this time. This time I'll keep you safe. Petra was rushing forwards into the light, but she was completely unprepared for the bolt that struck her, emanating from Morgan's outstretched hand. Petra flew backwards, bowling into James, Zane, and Ralph, who toppled behind her. Stop this! Lucy cried, running forwards with her wand in her hand, pointing wildly ahead of her. She had nearly made it to Izzy, was reaching for the younger girl's limp hand when Judith acted. James saw it, but was helpless to stop it. He opened his mouth to cry out, but it happened even before he'd drawn the breath to scream. Tie, little one! Judith laughed and flicked a finger at Lucy as if she was merely a fly. A bolt of green exploded against Lucy's side. Her head jolted sideways as her body flew into the air, turning almost gracefully. Lucy flew out of the light, dead in midair. Her wand fell from her hand and clattered to the rug, making no noise. There was a rolling thump as the girl herself dropped onto the shadowy stone floor fifteen feet away. There was a pause of completely shocked horror. For one long, terrible moment, James refused to believe what he had just seen. Then, with perfect finality, the reality of it fell upon him, and he cried out, using the very breath that he had drawn to warn his now-dead cousin. No! he shrieked, screaming the words so long and loud that sweat sprang out on his brow and his vision doubled. He saw Judith laughing at his horror, saw Morgan clutch Izzy even closer to her, ignoring the dead girl on the floor nearby. Zane and Ralph were clambering to their feet, moving as if in a daze. Between them, Petra seemed too stunned to speak. Her eyes were so round, her expression so utterly transfixed with shock and rage, that she looked as if she couldn't even move. And then, as Morgan and Judith carried Izzy towards one of the waiting curtains, Petra did move. She pushed her way through the makeshift bedroom, shoving furniture aside almost without touching it, chasing after the departing women. Wait! James cried out desperately, grabbing at Petra's arm. What about Lucy? We can't just leave her here! Petra seemed not to hear. Across the vast room, Morgan and Judith passed through one of the billowing portal curtains and vanished. Petra began to run. Her dress streamed out behind her, and coldness beat from her in waves. Petra! 
James shouted, turning his plea into a hoarse demand. We can't just leave Lucy! He caught up to Petra, clutching her arm so hard that she finally stopped and spun around. When she turned her gaze upon James, he stumbled backwards. Her eyes were horrible, flashing like diamonds in a winter sun, yet dark as tombs. She blinked and seemed to recognize him, although her expression didn't soften. I'm sorry, James, she said. There's nothing I can do for Lucy. She's dead. But Izzy is still alive, and she needs me. I can't stay here. James buried his face in his hands, overcome with helpless misery. He glanced back and saw Zane and Ralph kneeling over Lucy's body, lifting her hands as if to help her up. They didn't understand yet, or were simply refusing to believe it. But she killed Lucy, James exclaimed, crying out with such affronted wretchedness that his voice splintered. Then they should pay for it, Petra said, and her voice rang in the high chamber of the room, building on its echoes until it sounded like a chorus. James looked back again and saw Zane and Ralph crossing the floor to join them. Lucy's body hung limp in Ralph's arms, and Ralph, James saw with real surprise, was crying. Tears streamed down the big boy's face, making shining tracks on his cheeks. We did everything we could, James, he said pleadingly. But we ran out of ideas. Even my one won't do anything. And I tried. I really did. James found himself nodding at his friend. I know, Ralph, he said, and tears filled his own eyes, tears of mingled misery and rage. I believe you. Let's go get those two witches. Zane seethed in a low, fierce voice. His face had gone as pale as a gravestone. Neither of them are witches, Petra said, turning back to the wafting fabric of the portal curtain. But that won't help them when I find them. With a shuddering breath, James moved alongside Petra and gripped her hand once more. It was so cold that it almost stung. Together, with Ralph in the rear still carrying Lucy's body, the four strode towards the curtain and vanished into its sweeping folds. When the curtain swept back from them, James blinked into darkness. Noises rang out all around, scufflings and shouts, the whoosh and crackle of spells, all forming the unmistakable clamour of a magical fight. A streak of green lit the space, and James saw a man nearby, dueling a wildly grinning witch. Where are we? Ralph called, his voice frightened. The Department of Mysteries, Petra replied grimly, striding forwards. But not in our time. Don't touch anything. Don't even raise your wands. This is not our destination. It's only a trick. James matched Petra's stride, but couldn't avoid looking around. What he saw sent a chill deep into his heart. The dueling man was his father's godfather and one of James's namesakes, Sirius Black. His black hair clung to his face in sweaty tangles as he manipulated his wand. Give it up, Bellatrix! Sirius grunted, jabbing forth with the disarming spell. You've always been far better with your tongue than your wand! The wild-eyed woman cackled eagerly, deflecting the spell and parrying with another green curse. We are not real to them. Petra called out, walking directly between Sirius and Bellatrix as they battled. Unless we stop and take possession of this reality, it will not recognize us. Don't interfere. There is another curtain straight ahead. That is where the Lady of the Lake and Morgan have gone. We must keep on. James looked and saw what Petra meant. Straight ahead of them, no more than fifteen paces away, was another Nexus curtain, identical to the one through which they had already passed. Petra strode towards it purposefully, and James matched her stride for stride. James! Zane exclaimed, grabbing at his friend's shoulder and pointing. Look over there! Is that— James knew the story of where they were. He knew what the battle was about and what was about to happen. Sirius Black was going to be killed, sent through the veil that wafted even now behind him, the veil through which, ironically, James and his companions had just come. And yet, as he looked towards where Zane was pointing, James was stunned almost to a standstill. His father moved at the perimeter of the battle, engaged in his own struggle. His glasses were crooked on his face, the famous scar marked his forehead. He appeared to be almost exactly the same age as James himself. We could stop it, he said, reaching out to grasp Petra's arm. 
We could stay here and stop it all. We could save Sirius and stop all the terrible things that happened afterwards. James, Petra said, pausing only for a moment. You've been here before. It's the bargain of the gatekeeper all over again. We can't change what's been done, no matter how much we might want to. History will find a way to happen no matter what. Our destiny is elsewhere. Come. Reluctantly, James agreed. The troop moved through the battle, unscathed and unseen, and stepped into the soft folds of the second portal. As he went, however, James couldn't help looking back. Sirius was taunting Bellatrix for her failure to strike him, and she was raising her wand, her teeth bared in fury and black glee. And then, thankfully, the fabric of the curtain swooped around James, and he felt that reality drop away behind him. This time, when the curtain passed over the travellers, they moved into the noise and heat of an even larger battle. James recognised their surroundings immediately. It was Hogwarts, although not quite as he knew it. Witches and wizards crowded the hall, engaged in outright war. In the near distance, James saw Bellatrix Lestrange again, only this time she was duelling his own grandmother, Molly Weasley, her face nearly unrecognisable with grim ferocity. More faces became visible in the fracas. His long-dead Uncle Fred, whom he knew only from pictures. Ted Lupin's mother, Tonks, even a much younger version of Oliver Wood, fiercely battling alongside Horace Slughorn. The floor vibrated beneath James's feet, and enormous legs moved beyond the windows. A giant was just outside, its club rising to deliver a blow to the decimated castle. A snarling shape leapt over the crowd in a blur, landing directly beside James and flashing its bloody teeth. With a jolt of terror, James realized that it was the infamous Fenrir Greyback, the werewolf. None of it can harm us, Petra called out, approaching a third wafting curtain. So long as you do not engage in what you see, try not to look. James heard the reluctance in Petra's own voice, however. If not for Izzy's kidnapping, she herself might have stopped and joined the battle, regardless of the consequences. The travelers stepped into the third curtain. Screaming met them this time. It was a woman's voice, and James saw her almost instantly. She stood before a wooden crib, clutching a baby to her chest, shielding the tiny shape with her hands and arms. At her feet lay a dark-haired man. He stared unseeingly up at the ceiling of the small room, dead, and James recognized himself in the man's features. It was his grandfather, of course, James Potter I. A high, cold voice overwhelmed the woman's screams, and James found himself walking directly in front of the figure of Tom Riddle, still young and bursting with malevolent strength. Make it easy on yourself, Lily, the Dark Lord instructed, raising his wand. In a moment there will be nothing left for you to live for anyway. Go, James screamed out, pushing Petra towards the next curtain, which wafted in the doorway of the room's small closet. Either stop him from killing her or go! Go! I don't want to see it! Lily Potter continued to scream, and James fled through the curtain, tears of helplessness and rage blurring his vision. A flash of blinding green light followed him, briefly but memorably. And then they were in a small, dingy kitchen. A woman was seated at a rickety table across from a man James recognized, Lucius Malfoy, although much younger than James had last seen him. He was drawing a cloth-wrapped object from his robes, placing it onto the table next to his empty teacup. Unwrap it, Mrs. Agnellis, he said quietly. It is for you. She did, and it was a singularly ugly dagger, its blade tarnished nearly black, as if it had been rubbed with soot. No, Petra moaned this time, pausing. No, Mum, don't do it. He's lying. James touched her shoulder, drawing her back. It won't change anything, he urged softly, hating himself for doing so. You were right before. It's all a trick. We have to save Izzy. Petra nodded, but didn't take her eyes away from the woman at the table. James saw the resemblance between the two. It'll only hurt for a moment, Lucius said soothingly. Go on, Zane said, nudging Petra gently. One more curtain. There's nothing we can do here and you don't want to watch. Petra nodded again, but still she did not move. 
Finally, she shook herself. She glanced at Zane, Ralph, and James, even at the sad bundle of Lucy's body in Ralph's arms, and then sighed deeply. She turned, saw the billowing curtain in the corner of the kitchen, and walked towards it. Somehow James knew that it was the last of the portals. They had passed through the gauntlet. For better or worse, whatever was about to come, there would be no turning back. When the final nexus curtain unfolded around them, the travellers were once again met with the noise of a crowd. James blinked, his eyes dazzled with flashing lights and monstrous hulking structures. People pressed in on him from all sides, thronging and jostling. It took several seconds for James to realise where and when he was. New Amsterdam, Zane called out, raising his voice over the noise. Why are we here? Is it the present day? Ralph asked. Our present day. Next to James, Petra swayed on her feet for a moment, as if disoriented. She clutched James's shoulder, and he covered her hand with his. Are you all right? She nodded uncertainly, and then seemed to recover herself. We are back to our own day and time, she said with grave confidence. Morgan is here. We are both here together. Suddenly she turned and led the group through the throng, angling towards bright lights ahead. Ralph looked up at the looming skyscrapers and the rain of parade confetti. But why are we here, in New Amsterdam? Petra stopped at the perimeter of the crowd, where the view opened onto a section of the closed-off city street. Because this is where she wants us to be. James jostled to get next to Petra and saw. They stood on the edge of the Memorial Day parade route, which cut straight through the main thoroughfare of the great city. Flat wagons lined the avenue, covered in festive decorations and oversized tableau, most decorated in red, white, and blue colours. The floats were stopped now, halted by a police helicopter which sat incongruously in the centre of a wide intersection, its rotors revolving slowly. The parade watched with avid interest as policemen in riot gear moved in an urgent circle, their weapons raised, surrounding two men. The men stood in the centre of the street, flooded with spotlights, their arms held over their heads. James recognised both of them. One was Titus Hardcastle. The other was his father, Harry Potter. That's them, a woman's voice called out, heard by the entire crowd. James glanced wildly towards the sound and saw Judith herself pointing, her chin raised and her eyes bright. They killed Senator Fillmore. I saw it myself in that basement hideout right behind you. His body is there even now, next to their names, written in his own blood. Look, they're terrorists and murderers. Arrest them! Nearby, Morgan stood at the edge of the crowd, still cradling Izzy against her shoulder, as if the girl had fallen asleep while waiting for the parade. The police approached Titus and Harry cautiously, hunkered low, their weapons raised. Near the helicopter, two men in black suits spoke urgently into a handheld radio, and James recognized them as the men from the Magical Integration Bureau, Price and Esposito. Harry and Titus did not attempt to flee their captors or use spells to escape. There were far too many muggle observers. Television cameras surrounded the parade route, installed on tall gantries, even now broadcasting the event live to the entire country. James marvelled hatefully at the perfection of Judith's plan. "'She means to have your dad arrested, James!' Zane cried, pushing James out onto the street. "'Stop them!' "'I can't!' James shouted back. "'The whole muggle world is watching on TV! "'The giant disillusionment spell that hides New Amsterdam from the muddles "'won't work on magic we perform right in front of them. "'It'd break the law of secrecy. "'Why do you think Dad and Titus are just going along with them?' Look! Ralph shouted suddenly, pointing into the air over the street. James looked and felt as if the entire world had dropped out from beneath him. One hundred feet over the New York intersection, floating like a cloud of bats and hidden from the muggle observers below, were dozens of broom-born wizards in black robes. It was the WULF waiting for their moment to strike. They could be stealthy, James knew. They simply had to wait for the helicopter to rise into the air, bearing their enemy, Harry Potter, and they could strike it down easily, 
perhaps freezing its rotors or cursing the pilot dead in his seat. To the observers below, inured by the city's massive, constantly refreshed disillusionment charm, the crash would appear as a freak accident. Judith knew that Harry Potter and his auras were her greatest enemy in her pursuit of chaos. She didn't just mean to see him arrested. She meant to see him dead. We can't let it happen, Zane insisted, staring up at the swirling dark wizards. But we can't use magic, James insisted. The vow won't let us. We couldn't do it even if we wanted to. Some of us can, Petra said, her voice as flat and cold as iron. With that, she stepped out into the street and raised her right hand, her fingers splayed. A crackle of light exploded from it, but Petra did not aim it at the helicopter. Instead, she flung it out over the avenue towards the young woman who held her sleeping sister. This time, it was Morgan who was unprepared for the attack. Petra's bolt struck her in the shoulder and threw her backwards into a lamppost, which bent ominously at the force of the blast. Izzy flailed from Morgan's arms, but did not fall. Instead, she floated in the air, levitated by Petra herself, as she strode out into the street. "'Wake up, Iz,' Petra said, lowering her sister gently to the ground. "'Come back to me, love.' Izzy blinked as her feet touched the pavement, and the crowd backed away all around her, frightened by the blast and the sight of the magically floating girl. "'Petra! The helicopter!' Ralph called out, hoisting Lucy's body in his arms. The crowd was becoming agitated, progressing towards raw panic. "'Drop your weapons!' an amplified voice roared out. James spun towards it and saw a policeman in riot gear pointing an electric bullhorn at his father who held his wand in his upraised hand. Behind the policeman was the Magical Integration Bureau agent named Price. He was pointing at Harry Potter's wand, instructing the officer to take it from him. "'Miss Morganston,' a man's voice declared suddenly, coming from directly next to James. He glanced up and was shocked to see Merlinus Ambrosius. The big man stood at the edge of the crowd, his eyes locked onto Petra, as Izzy rejoined her in the middle of the street. Headmaster, Petra said, taking Izzy's hand in her own. Strangely, she didn't seem terribly surprised to see him there. I know what you're thinking, Miss Morganston, Merlin said, and I understand. I have been following your progress, all of you, very closely. I applaud your ingenuity and spirit, but this must end here. You big sneak! Zane suddenly exclaimed, glaring up at Merlin. You kept the third shard of the Amsera Serf, didn't you? You've been using it to listen in on all of us. Merlin ignored him. To Petra he called, Come back, my dear. Join us. We cannot stop what is about to happen, but we do not have to watch it. We have all seen enough terrible things. But we have to stop it. James exclaimed, boggling up at Merlin. They mean to kill my dad. You're Merlin. Stop the engine of the helicopter with your magic. Freeze it to the ground or something. The woman who calls herself Judith has foreseen every possibility, Merlin answered, gravely apologetic. Their combined magic is like a shield around the helicopter, preventing even myself from interfering with it. It will take off, and it will have your father inside it, along with Mr. Hardcastle. What happens after that, I'm afraid, is beyond our control. I'm sorry, James. In the intersection, the whine of the helicopter began to cycle up. The rotors spun faster as Harry Potter and Titus Hardcastle were led to it, surrounded now by the police in their armoured riot gear. Grit and confetti began to spiral up from the intersection under the force of the helicopter's backwash. Petra did not move to join Merlin at the edge of the crowd. Ralph! James cried suddenly, turning and grasping the bigger boy's shoulder. Give me your wand! James expected Ralph to waste several seconds asking for an explanation, but to his credit, he simply hugged Lucy's body to him with one arm, dipped into his back pocket with the other. Wordlessly, he handed his oversized wand to James. It wasn't the first time that circumstances had required such an exchange. James gripped Ralph's wand and leapt into the street. He pointed the lime-green tip towards the police helicopter 
even as the doors shuttled closed on its side, enclosing Titus Hardcastle and his father. Protego! he shouted, putting as much force into the command as possible. Rather than the bolt of bluish light he had expected, enveloping the helicopter with a spell of protection, Ralph's wand merely emitted a muted flicker, hardly brighter than a muggle camera flash. James stared at it furiously, and then levelled it again at the helicopter. Congello! It was a freezing charm, meant to lock the helicopter onto the ground or seize up its engines. Instead, there came only a puff of cold air, which blew back into James's face. He tried again, crying out in frustration, Salvio Hexia! Stupefy! Confundo! He felt the magic of each spell snuff from the wand the moment it appeared. Nearby, parade watchers observed him with worried confusion, wondering at the odd boy with the green-tipped stick. Let me try, James, Petra said firmly. She raised her hand again, fingers splayed. Petra? Merlin warned sternly but the bolt of light shot from her hand even as she spoke. It leapt towards the helicopter, but exploded after only a few feet, illuminating the street around Petra brilliantly but briefly. The crowd recoiled in alarm, but the scene around the helicopter remained unchanged. Morgan's power is identical to yours, Merlin roared. She's preventing you from interfering. There is no way to thwart their plan. If there were, I would do it myself. "'Don't listen to him, my dear,' Judith called out suddenly, cupping her hands to her smiling mouth. "'He is weak. Only you know how weak he is.' James glanced helplessly towards Judith. Next to her, Morgan had regained her feet. She had been hurt by her encounter with the lamppost. Blood trickled from beneath her hair, staining her face, but her eyes were clear and cold, studying the scene before her. Petra narrowed her eyes thoughtfully at Merlin. "'Don't let them hurt my dad!' James cried, unable to contain himself. "'Please, Petra!' "'I don't intend to,' she answered immediately, her eyes still locked upon Merlin. "'There is nothing that can be done, Miss Morganston,' the headmaster announced, raising his voice. He stepped into the street now, moving to get between Petra and the police helicopter. Awful as this may be, Morgan's magic is far too great for us to defeat by subtle means, and the consequences would be disastrous if you intervened using overt methods. There are too many observers. You must recognize that. When Petra spoke again, her voice was calm, yet unnaturally loud. You're wrong, she said flatly. And then, to James's surprise and dismay, she turned around. Together, the two girls began to walk down the centre of the New York street, away from the police helicopter, as its rotors whooshed faster and faster, turning into a blur. Petra! James called again, but his voice was drowned out by the increasing whine. Merlin's voice, however, rang out as clear as thunder over the packed, watching street. Petra Morganston! he called. Stop! Return to me! I think the lady is right! Petra declared without looking back. Your strength is in the vast expanses of nature. Here, in the deepest heart of the city, you are cut off from your powers. You are diminished almost to the point of helplessness. It would be a mistake to assume that, Miss Morganston, Merlin warned, and yet Petra walked on, increasing her stride as purpose seemed to pour into her. At her side, Izzy matched her sister's pace, hand in hand. I am different from you, though. Petra called out. I am a sorceress. My power does not come from the wastes of nature. I sensed this truth the first time I set foot in New Amsterdam. My power comes from the web of the city, from the interconnected knot of humanity that lives and strives here. The thrum of their lives empowers me. I am a new kind of sorceress, and this is my element. Here you are no match for me. Here I will do what no one but me can do. I will protect those who have protected me using whatever means are necessary. Petra raised her hand, and one of the halted parade floats jerked sideways, sliding out of her way. It rammed into a line of dumpsters with a rattling crash. The crowd observed this with growing alarm. Throngs began to break out into the street, running in all directions. Oblivious of this, 
The police helicopter first tilted forwards on its skids and then began to float upwards, its engines falling into a steady roar. Above it, the WULF agents swirled into position, raising their wands. You are mistaken, Merlin cried out, beginning to follow Petra down the broad thoroughfare. Petra, remember the era of Eve. You will do far more harm than good. Enough killing, Petra said with calm ferocity. Enough death. No more. I cannot allow it, no matter the price. Petra, Merlinus cried and raised his staff to strike her. A bolt of white light sprang from it, connecting with the slight girl, but it had no effect upon her. Neither Petra nor Izzy looked back. Above the din of the crowd and the roar of the rising helicopter, James heard Judith laughing triumphantly. "'Go forth, my sister fates!' she cried shrilly. "'Do what you were made to do! Together you are more powerful than life and death! Call forth the chaos you have earned!' She laughed again, and at her side Morgan blinked. She looked askance at Judith and frowned. Oblivious of this, Petra raised her hand again, and a second parade float lofted into the air, spinning gently. It crashed into a petrol station, knocking the canopy over and shattering the windows of the small convenience store beneath it. Another float flew over the crowd and smashed against the columns of a bank before crashing onto the steps below. Muggle New Yorkers ran in all directions, screaming in panic. James was jostled from all sides as the crowd fled around him. He peered up, looking in the direction that Petra was walking. The avenue stretched away before him, wide as a river, leading towards the night glitter of the ocean. Framed between the buildings, shining in a grid of spotlights, was the Statue of Liberty. Suddenly, for no reason, James thought of his ride on the Lincoln Zephyr, and his conversation with Chancellor Franklin about the conjoined muggle and magical cities that had even then unrolled past the train's windows. The new Amsterdam Department of Magical Administration requested assistance from a foreign ally, Franklin had said, in the guise of a very unique and gifted witch. Petra Morganston! Merlin roared, stopping in the street, his staff held aloft next to him, and his left hand raised imploringly. Stop! Remember that the heart is sometimes a liar. You do not know what you are about to do. And to James's surprise, Petra did stop. Next to her, hand in hand, Izzy stopped as well. They looked up at the huge, shining statue in the distance. A uniquely talented foreign witch, James thought wonderingly, amazed in spite of the circumstances, whose only job is to maintain the world's most perfect disillusionment charm. When Petra spoke, her voice rang out as loud as a cyclone, yet as clear as silver bells. She spoke in the language of the giant witch before her. Cher madame, she said, lifting her chin to the distant statue. Baisez votre torche. Dear lady, lower your torch. The entire crowd heard it, and paused even in their panic. Every eye turned towards the great woman's statue where it stood over the ocean, glowing greenly in its web of lights. When it moved, the metallic groan and creak carried through the clear air. Lady Liberty first turned her head, looking over her monstrous shoulder towards the city behind her. Her calm eyes spied Petra and Izzy where they stood in the centre of the avenue, and then, so ponderously that the entire action seemed to occur in slow motion, the statue's raised right arm began to lower, bringing down its lit, golden torch. The crowd gasped. It was a long, terrible sound, punctuated by the creaking moan of the distant copper figure. The arm lowered, lowered, and Lady Liberty began to hunker down, her great flowing robes pooling beneath her. She dropped her calm gaze to the ocean waves around her, and then, with irreversible, balletic grace, plunged her torch into the ocean, extinguishing it. A silent grey explosion of water came up around it. From this came a sort of invisible, penetrating shockwave. It spread over the entire city, leaving a stunning numbness in its wake. All around, the crowd had fallen completely quiet. 
Every eye blinked, looking around the city as if seeing it for the first time. Next to James, a man in a tweed cap peered up at a nearby skyscraper. There, he breathed, his voice a high, worried tremolo. There, they're flying! James understood. The entire Muggle city was seeing for the first time the magical city that overlay it, covering it like a blanket. Eyes bulged up at the flying highways of brooms and magical buses, the heretofore unseen entryways, facades and bridges built directly into the sides of Muggle skyscrapers. And nearby, delightedly, the Lady of the Lake cackled. Television cameras swiveled atop their gantries, zooming in on the sudden magical city which had appeared inexplicably out of nowhere. The police helicopter dipped dramatically as the pilot became aware of the sudden wizarding air traffic that surrounded his craft. The whine of the rotors rose to a distressed scream as the machine wobbled back down towards the intersection, struggling to avoid the nearby traffic lights and power lines. The landing gear touched the pavement and scraped along it, sending up a screech and a curtain of sparks. A moment later, the machine ground to a halt and the rotors began to power down. Doors shuttled open on the helicopter's side, and bursts of magical red light shone from within. Titus Hardcastle jumped out, brandishing his spare wand, and firing it immediately into the WULF assassins above. They shot back with red and green curses, but were suddenly distracted by a spray of gunfire. Fortunately for Titus, the Muggle police below had recovered enough from their shock to remember their weapons. The officers scrambled behind a line of nearby vehicles, shooting randomly into the air at the swooping hooded figures. Harry Potter followed Titus out of the helicopter and strode purposefully towards Price, the magical integration bureau agent who shrank away from him. Harry reached for him, but only to pluck his own wand from the man's inner coat pocket. Pandemonium erupted throughout the street, echoing the clamor that arose throughout the entire city. In Times Square, traffic snarled to a messy halt around dozens of accidents. Cabbies leapt from their stalled vehicles and turned their faces upwards towards the dozens of enormous magical signs that had suddenly appeared, hovering over them. Dominating them all, completely obscuring the muggle Coca-Cola neon, was a monstrous grinning woman with clockwork arms, mechanically raising and lowering a car-sized tin of Wimnot's wand polish and enchant enhancer. Every ten seconds her teeth sparkled magically, popping like a gigantic flashbulb. In Central Park, horses spooked and bolted before their carriages as an amateur clutch cudgel match suddenly sprang into view over the lake, producing screams from the nearby joggers and feeders of ducks. Along the newly erected elevated expansion of the New York City subway system, a conductor encountered the shocking sight of a magical train as it barreled straight towards him, popping into existence along the same length of track. Panicked, the muggle conductor jammed the brakes. Light flickered throughout the crowded compartments as sparks flew up from the locked wheels. The subway train squealed, lurched, and then derailed. Passenger cars jackknifed into zigzag patterns on the raised tracks, still screeching forward under the force of their inertia. Windows shattered and screams filled the cars, even as the magical train before it leapt into the air, spun sideways, and vanished beneath the elevated tracks, zooming onwards. Lincoln Tunnel became the site of a forty-car pile-up as motorists suddenly confronted the shocking sight of a flying hippogriff and its rider swooping low over the traffic, its wingtips brushing the roofs of buses. At LaGuardia Airport, alarms sounded at every terminal. Klaxons rang out over the runways, forcing planes to brake even as they lined up for takeoff. Airliners suddenly pulled up in mid-landing as warning beacons lanced out, warning pilots of the thousands of unidentified flying objects which had suddenly appeared, crowding the New York airspace. Throughout the entire city, muggles clamoured to the windows of their apartments and office buildings, gaping at the strange flashing lights, alien billboards, and flying magical traffic. Some became alarmed enough to produce guns and make their way into the streets, demanding answers from the strange people that had suddenly appeared. Shots rang out, mostly aimed into the air at the mysterious flying traffic, although, thankfully, very few bullets actually struck their marks. Across the country, televisions tuned to the event.
Muggle viewers sat awestruck, disbelieving their own eyes as the networks interrupted their normal broadcasts, preempting them with live footage of the incredible scenes in New York City. Around bars, living rooms, and hospital waiting rooms, televisions were turned up as viewers fell silent, slack-jawed. CNN showed a live shot of the Statue of Liberty, suddenly and shockingly hunkered on her base, her torch plunged into the ocean up to her copper wrist. The running banner along the bottom of the screen read, New York Senator Charles Fillmore found dead. Unexplained mass phenomenon overwhelms New York City. And in the center of the Memorial Day parade route, Merlinus Ambrosius moved through the rioting throng, gathering James, Zane, and Ralph close to him, looking down at the pathetic form of Lucy Weasley, dead in Ralph's strong arms. Harry Potter pushed towards them through the crowd, his face stern. Behind him, shooting stunning spells up at the swirling WULF assassins and the running looters that had suddenly appeared, stalked Titus Hardcastle. Merlin surveyed them all gravely, and then turned his gaze to the pandemonium that was unfolding all around. "'What happened?' Harry called out, surveying the rioting crowd. With grim composure, Merlin replied, "'Miss Morganston has relieved the world of its ignorance.' "'Just like Eve,' James thought, frowning sadly. "'She isn't evil, just mistaken. She ate the forbidden fruit from the Tree of Knowledge, and then she gave it to the rest of the world.' He shuddered as another thought occurred to him. Merlin glanced down at him, and his face suddenly looked very old. What is it, James? What do you know? James sighed. I was just thinking about Petra and Eve, he replied, and then met the old man's eyes. I was thinking about how people have always called this city the Big Apple. Merlin nodded. The fruit of knowledge, he agreed morosely, offered to the rest of the world. From here, just as with Eve, there will be no turning back. All around, the muggle crowd roared and rioted, boggling up at the magical city above them. Car alarms blared as people abandoned the footpaths and clambered over vehicles. Glass shattered as store windows were broken, inundated by people seeking refuge from the frightening sights all around. Harry Potter and Titus Hardcastle continued to fire their wands into the air, stunning the remaining WULF assassins or chasing them into hiding. Merlin spoke once more. Do you know what else they call this city? he asked. Without waiting for an answer, he went on. They call it the city that never sleeps. With that, he raised his staff in both of his hands, gripping it so tightly that his knuckles whitened. He coiled himself, uttered something incomprehensible in his ancient mother tongue, and plunged the staff back down again, driving it into the pavement like a spike. A massive flash blinded James. It seemed as large as the sun, but heatless and silent. When James blinked and looked around again, he saw the flash still, like a dome of light. It spread along the canyon of the street, growing larger rippling noiselessly over the thousands of muggles gathered there. As it passed over them, lighting them for a moment with its bony glow, they froze in their tracks. Within seconds, the milling, heaving muggle crowd fell silent and still, petrified by the receding blast, like ten thousand statues. The television cameras shut down. Every electric light in the city flickered, buzzed, and went dark. Stoplights winked out over intersections, and the cars rolled to gentle stops, knocking bumpers dully on the crowded streets. Silence fell over the city as wizarding New Amsterdam surveyed the suddenly inert body of its sister, Muggle New York, silent and dark as a crypt below it. James turned back towards Merlin and blinked in surprise. James, Ralph, Zane, Harry Potter, and Titus Hardcastle stood in a circle around the space where Merlin had been standing only moments earlier, but the big wizard himself was nowhere in sight. In his place, still vibrating faintly with the shock of its planting, was the rune-covered staff. The runes no longer glowed with their faint inner light. Now they were completely dark. Oh no, Harry said into the sudden silence. He shook his head in woeful negation. James looked around at the frozen tableau of muggle humanity, and then glanced helplessly up at his father. 
Harry wasn't looking at the human statues that filled the streets, however. He was looking down at the dead figure of his niece held in Ralph's arms. Lucy, he said, his voice barely a whisper. Gently, he took her body from Ralph and cradled it in his own arms. The woman is gone, Titus declared somberly, scanning the petrified crowd. And her protege is dead. James blinked and followed Titus's gaze. A figure lay on the ground amidst the sea of human statuary. A hitch rose in James's chest as he broke away from the group and moved towards the shape. When he reached it, he knelt down. Morgan's hair had fallen across her bloody face, obscuring it. James could see immediately that the girl was dead, just as Titus had declared. Protruding from her back, its jeweled handle glinting maliciously, was a silver dagger. For the third time that night, James's eyes blurred with tears. Morgan, the Petra from some other, less fortunate dimension, had merely been Judith's pawn after all. Petra and Izzy, Judith's unknowing and unwitting sister fates, had been the real prize all along. Once the Lady of the Lake had finished using Morgan, she had disposed of her quickly and without a second thought. Morgan's eyes were open, staring calmly at the heel of a petrified man who had frozen in the act of jumping over her body. James bit his lips sorrowfully, and then reached forward. As gently as he could, he closed Morgan's eyes. We must go, Titus said from behind him, addressing the group. Malinus's petrification spell may only last a few hours. James stood up slowly and turned around. Harry drew a deep breath, and then, still cradling Lucy's body against his shoulder, lifted his wand to his throat. Attention all magical denizens of New Amsterdam, he called, sending his amplified voice echoing up into the canyons of the buildings. You must leave this place immediately. It is no longer safe for you here. The city of New Amsterdam is now a compromised zone. Soon the muggle city below you will reanimate. When it does... Here, Harry paused and drew a deep, reluctant breath. When it does, it will be unsafe for you to be here. For the immediate future, you must evacuate as quickly and as calmly as you can. Take only what you need and attempt to be gone by morning. Overhead, the magical city began to rumble nervously. The flying highways and byways, which had paused in alarm during the massive flash of Merlin's petrification spell, fell into frantic zooming motion. Harry pocketed his wand and took James's hand in his own. I've sent word to your mother, he said. She and your brother and sister will apparate here soon to meet us, and your aunt, uncle, and cousin Molly will follow them shortly. He looked aside, inviting Ralph and Zane into the conversation as well. Tell me exactly what happened, all of you, so that I may be prepared to give Percy and Audrey this awful news. James drew a deep, shuddering breath, but Zane answered first. She died trying to save Izzy, he said gravely. There's a lot more to the story, but that's the most important thing. That's the only part that really matters. Together, as the group set out towards the nearby waterfront, weaving through the throng of muggled statues, the three boys began to tell their tale. The Lady of the Lake was gone, vanished away into hiding, as were Petra and Izzy. Morgan, the unfortunate Petra from another dimension, lay dead with the ugly dagger protruding from her back. Confetti still sifted down into the eerily frozen, suddenly darkened streets. And Merlinus Ambrosius was no more. Chapter 25 Those Who Stayed Behind Deniston Dollarhoff chose to remain in America, at least for a time. An envoy from the Crystal Mountain had met Harry Potter and the rest on the docks that very night, the night of the unveiling, as it soon came to be called. Benjamin Franklin was among the representatives from the American Wizarding Government, as was Professors Jackson and, to James's surprise, Persephone Remora, who was looking decidedly less composed than usual. Together, they extended their official condolences to Percy, Audrey, and Molly for their loss. Percy accepted this somewhat blankly, as if he was in shock. Audrey refused to look at her visitors or anyone else. 
Her eyes were red and swollen as she hugged Molly to her. Molly, James noticed, was sucking the first two fingers of her right hand, something she hadn't done since she was five years old. Next, the envoy acknowledged Harry and Titus's innocence in the death of Senator Charles Fillmore, but warned that this would be rather harder to prove to the Magical Integration Bureau. Franklin vowed to do his diplomatic best on their behalf, but made no promises. Finally, the envoy turned their attention to Deniston Dollahoff, who had side-along apparated directly to the harbour with Percy Weasley. James was surprised at what they said. They officially requested that Dollahoff remain with them for the immediate future to help with the security and ambassadorial demands of the coming days and weeks. Being an expert on muggle magical security, as well as a squib who had been raised among muggles, Dollahoff was just the sort of individual to assist in the daunting task at hand, that of protecting the city of New Amsterdam and explaining its existence to the muggle New Yorkers beneath it. Somewhat reluctantly, although not, James suspected as reluctantly as he let on, Dollahoff agreed. James would have liked to have had more time to say goodbye to his friends, but it was an emergency situation, and he understood. Bye, Zane, he said, reaching to shake the boy's hand where he stood on the dark pier. The ship will be here any moment, so... Zane threw an arm around James's shoulders and drew him into a fierce embrace. When he released his friend, Zane's face was pale and tense. This changes everything, doesn't it? James shrugged and then nodded. That's what Merlin said back when the vault was first broken into. Do you think the old man's really gone for good? James did. He nodded. See you, James, Ralph sighed. I wish I didn't have to stay behind. You'll be back soon enough, James assured him. Just be careful. Things are likely to be pretty dodgy around here for a bit. Ralph nodded morosely. I know it probably won't be much better back home, but still, this is where it's all beginning. I'd really love to just put the old mess behind me for a while. Sorry, James said seriously. I know. Try to get home soon. A foghorn echoed over the dark water of the harbour. James turned and saw the silhouette of a low ship approaching, weaving its way through the much larger ships moored nearby. Soon the magical ship, not the Gwyndamere this time, would be at the dock. He and his family would climb the gangplank to its deck, leaving the rest of his travelling companions behind. His heart was low as he turned back to his friends once more. Take care of yourselves, he said. We can keep up via the shard. You have mine and I can use Dad's. Don't forget. We won't, Ralph assured him. Tell Rose and the rest we said I. James rolled his eyes, dreading the task of explaining all this to Rose, but he nodded anyway. The ship swept slowly into position alongside the pier. Ropes thumped to the dock and were secured to nearby bollards. The gangplank appeared. It took only a few minutes for the Potters and Weasleys to climb aboard. Apart from a few hastily packed bags gathered by James's mum, they had left most of their things behind, abandoned, at least for now. Shortly, the ship was under way, gliding smoothly across the black waves beneath a cloudy night sky. James and Albus's owls, Nobby and Flynn, had flown to meet them at the pier, and now circled the ship like silent kites, alighting occasionally on the ship's masts. James leaned against the stern railing and watched. The New York skyline was eerily dark, lit only by the relatively dimmer lights of New Amsterdam. Why do you think she did it? James asked quietly. Next to him, also leaning on the railing, Alba shrugged. To save Dad and Titus, right? James shook his head vaguely. I don't know, he thought for a long moment, and then said, She could have done it some other way, don't you think? She could have... I don't know, battled Morgan right there on the street and broken her spell over the helicopter. Or perhaps she could have just thought all those WULF killers to death. She can do that kind of thing, you know. She doesn't even need a wand. Albus nodded. Yeah, he agreed doubtfully. But I guess she'd just had enough with death, don't you think? James sighed deeply. He thought of the journey Judith had forced them to take through the Nexus curtains, all the killings and mayhem she had made them witness, all the loved ones murdered for the sake of the struggle against evil. Even that had been part of Judith's plan, pushing Petra to make her final, ultimate decision. She wasn't just trying to save Dad, James finally said. She was trying to change it all, 
It was probably a huge mistake, and it'll probably end in even more death. But perhaps she was just tired of things being the way they are. Maybe this was just her final act of rejection. Albus frowned. Rejection of what? James shook his head. Everything, he said grimly. Just everything. Albus considered this. After a minute, he stirred and dug his hand into his back pocket. Here, he said, holding something out to James. My wand, James said, taking the wooden shaft from his brother's hand. You found it down on the clutch field. Albus shrugged and leaned on the railing again. I thought you'd want it. I went looking for it after you lot went dimension hopping. James shook his head slowly. I'll never figure you out, little brother, he said appreciatively. Don't even try, Albus replied. James nodded and rejoined his brother, leaning on the railing and watching the oily black waves. Below decks, James knew, his mum was putting Lily to bed, probably singing a nighttime song to her just as if everything was normal. Elsewhere, probably in the captain's quarters, his father and Titus Hardcastle were discussing what was to come. Uncle Percy and Aunt Audrey had gone down to their berth immediately, doomed to sleep in the same ship that bore their dead daughter. Molly had already been asleep by then, held in her mother's arms. James guessed that Aunt Audrey would probably not let go of her for the entire night, but would sleep sitting upright on the bed, leaning against the headboard, taking what comfort she could from the sleeping breath of her surviving child. Lucy was dead. It struck James as completely impossible and ridiculous. Reluctantly, he replayed the memory of her last moments, recalled the horrible helplessness of watching Judith raise her hand with murder in her eyes. Lucy had been trying to save Izzy, and had acted almost without thinking, rushing forwards into the teeth of her own doom. With a shudder and a dry sob, James realized two things. That Lucy really was gone, and that he had loved her. It hadn't been the same sort of love that he felt for Petra, but it hadn't merely been the love of a cousin, either. Could he have done something to save her? Should he have acted sooner, or held her back somehow? Heat rushed to his cheeks as he considered this, and felt the first deep pangs of regret. I'm sorry, Lucy, he said in his thoughts, in the deepest depths of his heart, almost as if it were a prayer. I should have done something. I should have stopped her from hurting you. Forgive me. In response, he remembered Lucy on the day of the Valentine's dance, when he had almost kissed her for the first time. I forgave you that very night, she had admitted shyly. I can't stay mad at you. But it was only a memory. Lucy's voice was stilled forever. Tears pricked James's eyes, but he refused them. He knew that if he let them come, they wouldn't stop coming for a long time, and he was just too tired to go through that now. He rubbed his eyes with his thumb and forefinger, pushing the tears away. Next to him, purposely not watching, Albus sighed sadly. Beneath them, the ship cut a smooth wake through the harbour, heading out into the ocean and leaving the half-dark twin cities behind. James felt terribly alone. Somewhere out there, falling further and further behind them, were Petra and Izzy. And what of Judith, the Lady of the Lake? Had she retreated back into the world between the worlds? James thought not. This was her world now, her chaos. She wouldn't miss it, no matter what. James had a strong, sinking feeling that none of them had seen the last of her. Eventually, the pressing darkness became too much for James and Albus. Without a word, they walked along the deck and found the doorway that led below. They followed the corridor until they discovered the berth that belonged to their parents. Harry was there now, along with Ginny, who was indeed singing to Lily as she drifted to sleep. At least they were still all together. That counted for a lot, if not everything. That night, the five of them stayed together in a single berth, piled like cats on the two large beds. The next morning, James unpacked what clothes he had. They had been hastily gathered by his own mum from his dormitory room before she had disapparated to meet them at the pier. She had forgotten his favourite pair of jeans. He sighed, reminding himself to ask Ralph or Zane to send them to him, 
and was about to toss his duffel bag beneath the bunk when he noticed something tumbling loosely in the bag's bottom. He raised it again and peered inside. In the darkness was a small bundle of parchment, closed so tightly that it didn't show the slightest seam. James recognized it immediately, and his heart trip-hammered. He touched the packet briefly, but nothing happened. No overwhelming visions or telepathic blasts. Carefully, he retrieved the packet and laid it on the small table of his room. Feeling a strange mixture of hope and trepidation, he tapped the packet with his wand, whispering the spell that would open it. The parchments unfurled, blooming as before, like an origami flower. But the pages were no longer covered with Petra's handwriting. Now there was only one line, written in the center of the top page. James leaned over the parchment, his brow furrowing as he read. Remember the silver thread. You didn't let go. For better or worse, I'll never forget that. She hadn't signed it, but then again she hadn't needed to. James closed the parchment packet again and simply stared at it. Finally, after nearly a minute, he picked it up. He put his wand in his right back pocket and the parchment packet in the left. There he carried it from then on, until the very last time he ever saw her.